Yeah, and I'm not sure if you can see us and hear as well, but we're going to start and we are about to start the Pi Geek of 2022. Ladies and gentlemen, hello, hello, hello. I'm happy to greet you here. I'm Ed Nedian from Geekel and these guys from this company uh, too. And we're happy uh, to announce third Python event from yep. Geekel. Hello, and let's get it started. Ooh! Yeah, uh, we try to do it like you know in an energy way. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm happy to see so many people here in our chat and our stage. And please let us know where, uh, where are you now? Uh, what city, country, room? Maybe you have your dish machine uh, working now, and uh, you don't hear as well. Like re uh, write everything you want here in this chat, just to greet us and support us. So we begin this conference and uh, we cannot start it without our community manager as always, Julia. Fantastic, Julia, please join us this stream. 
Hello, hello, hello. Yeah. I'm Julia Voloshka and I'm a community manager of PyGeekle Summit. This time we gain together incredible speakers. Uh, I'm excited to be here to be here and uh, it's amazing to uh, gain together all of yeah. us and uh, I hope you will enjoy our event. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for yeah, we will we'll disclosure more and uh, Paul with us here. Paul is uh, our partnership uh, uh, VP of partnership people. He he works with all partners uh, of Geekle to to help us create these um, uh, events and Nick everything techno uh, uh, what is about tech about broadcasting about like organization of this event is on his uh, uh, he's in charge of that. Hello, Nick. Yeah, hi everyone. So we have a pretty packed day ahead of us. Uh, so let's hear a bit. Let's hear a, bit, a little bit about uh, what what we have today. So Julia. Yeah, 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 Julia. Yeah, uh, tell us what three main, I mean, key points or main topics or main ideas of this event today. Yes, sure. It's all about Python. Oh, uh, <laughs> I knew that. I knew but, that yeah. right. but we have we have our three main focuses, and the first one it's our tool and practices in Python, and it's a deep dive in these tools. We have many ambassadors, many advocates, and we will describe everything about the new topic in tools and practices in Python. So, so for for less, wait, wait a second. I, I'll just uh, exp uh, explain. Um, for the last six months, we've been searching, talking, discussing, fighting about yes. what's new in tools, what's new in practices, what new, I don't know, frameworks and uh, everything. And uh, and we combined all these speakers together. Am I right? Yes, sure. What's next? <laughs> Next, uh, it's our topic blocks about uh, data analysis and uh, data analytics and uh, all things with uh, data. Oh, that's cool. That that's really deep. I don't know about that much. Yeah. So <laughs> let's go to the you next. You should one. know more in our conference. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll watch it definitely. Yeah. Yes, and the, the our last thing it's our data science, machine learning topics, and it will be very interesting. Wow, wow, wow! I hope it will. Okay. Um, how many speakers you managed to gather like on all these conference, and how did you? Oh, it's a uh, thirty-four speakers. Almost thirty-five speakers. My God! Yeah, that's that's awesome. That's great um, lineup. And how many speakers today, and how many speakers tomorrow? It's sixteen today, eighteen tomorrow. Cool, 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 cool. Thanks. And uh, I also know we have sponsors, and uh, uh, yeah, Paul, it's it's your time. Yeah. Hi, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us. And. Uh, Today, we're going to have uh, two sponsors during our event. And thank you very much to Influx Data and Scout. And by the way, uh, Jake Clifford, the developer advocate from Influx Data, he will be one of the first speakers, uh, actually the, the very first speaker during uh, our um, opening block. And the topic will be very practical, very cool. And uh, he will talk about building an IoT app with Influx Data. Uh, on Python, Flask, and Plotty, and uh, yeah, and uh, surprise, That's surprise, cool. I'm, I'm going to be the actually the first moderator of the event as well. So, yeah, uh, and you invite is uh, inviting us to 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 keep uh, to stay with you all this. Yeah, yeah. stay yeah. with us. It, it, just a couple couple of seconds after this, we will continue with with the with the talks. And also, I wanted to mention that. Uh, we partnered with Influx Data, as you probably know, because you probably received this email that we're gonna have a, a super special, like welcome, like autumn opening giveaway. So we decided to to make a giveaway, a raffle together with Influx Data, and we will be giving out twenty tickets to one. You can choose uh, any event, and you can win yourself a ticket. And for that, you need to fill in the form that we will post. Uh, in the chat, and also we are giving out an iPhone 13. iPhone and, uh, 13. I want iPhone 13. I don't have it. Me too. Me too. Please. I actually do Android, but why not? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, yeah. So if if you happen to do the Android, we will have the option for you. Uh, basically, if you happen to win, one plus, please, uh, one plus. 
<laughs> you can you can actually uh, you can actually let us know that you want the cash equivalent, and oh. uh, I guess this this is an option as well. Yeah, oh. uh, if you don't. Yeah, do but yeah. So, so, sorry. Yeah, I see so many countries here. Uh, thanks everyone who supports us in chat. Uh, keep writing. Um, thank you. I, I see. I see what, what you read. Uh, what, what you write, and we'll read it uh, later. Uh, am I right, Paul? Yeah, sure. We'll, yeah. We'll, we'll and what, what's next? Sorry, sorry for this interruption. Yeah, what's next? Uh, so basically, uh, we will have uh, throughout the course of the first day, uh, we basically did didn't want to narrow it down only to the senior day, only to the paid participants. That's why we're doing it during the first day. So basically, we will post this special form in the chat. And basically, you just uh, write your name there. And uh, I believe during the last block, uh, in order to facilitate all the time zones, because we have people uh, starting all the way from India and all the way to the United States. So we cover pretty broad time uh, time time field, I would say, time zones. And yeah, and we will have then a randomizer that will basically uh, choose... Uh, 21 winner so stay tuned and please uh stay with us during the course of the uh of this first day in order not to miss your chance to to enter the raffle oh that holy randomizer thank you yeah. thank you paul thank you and nick uh, wh what are you gonna say about all this organizational stuff of this yeah event? so 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 everyone would, should know this is a 12 hour live stream we have ahead of us today so it's pretty packed for of topics and Q and A sessions. So uh, I'm looking forward to see lots of you at the end of the day still sitting with us. But of course, everything's going to be recorded. Don't worry, you'll be able to watch it later. But you will probably miss the the raffle for the iPhone. Uh, so I think well, it's going to be either before the last block or before or a bit earlier. Well, uh, well. We'll do the proper announcement and you will know when the raffle will start and we'll announce the winner so don't worry but but but, but, look, but the, 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 uh, the sorry the, the raffle uh, will work for me if i'm uh, at the stream right so if if of i course, of course okay. you'll need you need to find the link that we'll post in the ah, chat and register why. first ah, that's why yeah. okay yeah but, but basically if you like if if you use the uh the link and you participated, but it's three o'clock at night and you're somewhere in Bangalore. Mm -hmm. I mean, like you're, you're still a winner. So I guess if, we're going to post a couple of times in the chat. So, uh, yeah, we, we will make sure to let everyone from every time zone to participate. So we want to be register first. Yes. Pretty fair about this. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I have two kids, by the way. <laughs> they will, they, they yeah, will you, you, register you, you, you and, and see them account. learn Python. <laughs> Why not? Okay, okay, uh, that's uh, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, uh, Nick, maybe something else? No. Uh, well, just want to have everyone know that, uh, like, if you if you miss that tomorrow, we have yeah, we have even more content tomorrow. If you haven't registered, that there is still links in the description on our website. There's senior track. There will be more advanced topics and uh, definitely consider joining if you haven't already. If you go to the agenda, you can actually take a look at the at the, at the list of the topics. Uh, and even for today, if you haven't taken a look at the agenda, go go take a look and uh, add uh, topics to the calendar so you don't meet them later today if you don't have the time for the whole live stream. Yeah. And uh, please behave yourself well. Like we'll be moderating the chat, mm -hmm. and if you're watching this on YouTube, you can actually go and watch this through our platform. We have our own chat, and this is a place we can you can tag a speaker, and our speaker uh, they also will be watching the event there, so you we'll, you'll be able to communicate there. Uh, if you're watching this from a platform, there's a Q and A tab for you to put your question there. We'll be collecting them for the Q and A session. So yeah, keep those, uh, keep those, keep asking those questions. Uh, that's why we're doing those Q and A sessions for you. Cool. Yeah, panel Q and A sessions is when uh, speakers come uh, come together, like two or three or five, or I don't know how many speakers come yeah, together. Yeah, we'll, have, we'll and... have four and five speakers on on each Q and A. Session. Cool, and yes. people people oh, no, answer discussion. your questions. That's a panel discussion of your questions, guys. So just 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 uh, type them. 
Well, no more chatting. Uh, I think we need to jump to the, to the content itself. So yep. right. good luck to every speaker. Good luck to every moderator. And uh, I, I'm waiting for that raffle too. And um, yeah, let's get it started. Yeah, it's good to unmute yourself when you start. <laughs> All right, everyone. Welcome to Python uh, Summit, once again, to Play Geek Online Summit 22. And yeah, and let me introduce our first speaker, Jay Clifford from Influx Data. Hi, how are you doing today? Hi, Paul. Yeah, doing great. How are you? Nice doing intro, awesome. by the way. Yeah, excited to, to start uh, this event. Excited to have some really interesting practical topics and cases. Yeah. And thank you once again for joining us uh, as a speaker and as a sponsor. And uh, yeah, thank you for uh, letting us to uh, to basically, uh, yeah, to to hold this event. And uh, I guess without any further ado, the floor is yours. So let's start the presentation. Thank you. Fantastic. Let's see if I can share these slides and rock and roll. There we go. The slides are okay. To, is that okay for everyone? Fantastic. So hi, everyone, and welcome to building an IoT app with InfluxDB, Python, and Flask. So I'm Jay Clifford, and I'm a developer advocate at Influx Data. So in my past life, I was a sales engineer for industrial IoT solutions. I have a passion for OT, robotics, and vision-based projects, and I'm driven to make IoT accessible to all. That's the project for today. And in my spare time, I enjoy a bit of swimming, yoga, and wakeboarding. And I'm currently pay, playing Total War, Warhammer 3, um, the new beta release campaign, which is so awesome. If you haven't tried it, try it out. So for today, we're going to try and jam pack a lot into half an hour, but hopefully we can get through it all and we'll see how we get on. And hopefully the demo gods are with us and we can deliver a demo. So we're going to start with device setup. So we're going to have a look at the device we're going to be using and the sensors that we're going to be using to collect our data. We're then going to be looking at how you can set up your development environment to work with InfluxDB and your device and the Flask application that we're going to be building. We're also going to be creating our Flask application. So we'll be covering a lot in terms of how we write to our Flask server and how we create querying from InfluxDB back into our Flask server. Next, we'll be looking at some visualizing. So that will be including data frame and Plotly basics. And lastly, we'll be doing something a little bit more interesting. We'll be going, we'll be looking at some more advanced topics going forward where you can make use of some more interesting features from InfluxDB alongside Flask and use them in combination with each other. And then, of course, at the end, you know, as InfluxDB, as InfluxDB, we're a massive provider of open source code. So all this code I'll be showing you today will be will be provided to you at the end so you can try it yourself at home. So what are we actually doing today? Well, the plan is to basically monitor your household plants with your own sensors. So essentially what we're going to do is we're going to wire up four sensors and each of these are gonna send the sensor data from these sensors to our Flask server. And they're gonna be written to a Flask server endpoint where we're going to enrich that data before we send it along to InfluxDB for storage. From there, we can then query that data back, visualize that data, and also alert on that data, which is, uh, which is pretty cool. And this can all be run locally on your device, or you can actually host it within the cloud as well. So this, this is you know, very modular on where you want to host your application. It's great for a home server. It's what I use at home. Um, but today, I'm actually just running it on my Mac just to show you today. So let's first talk about the device. I'm not going to touch too long on this because, uh, you know, we're here to talk more about Python. But uh, what we've done is we've actually given you the schematic within the source code. And I've also left the, the code uh, within the source code to run on the microcontroller. So we're actually using an Arduino microcontroller to do this. Um, and we're using four different types of sensors. We're using a DH11, which is a digital sensor for temperature and humidity. We're using a photoresistor to measure light. And then for the soil moisture, it's a DS18 
and I can't remember the last two numbers. It's a it's a long uh, title for a sensor. But the main difference with this sensor, this temperature sensor, is it's there to monitor the temperature of the soil, so it's waterproof. And lastly, but not least, is one of the most important sensors is a soil moisture V1.2 sensor. And that enables us to measure, measure the moisture um, within our soil. So we'll see if our plant's thirsty or not. So moving on a little from the device, let's talk about the environment setup. First of all, what we're going to be needing is InfluxDB, and we're going to be using InfluxDB to store our data. And if you didn't know what InfluxDB is, it's a time series database. Um, and essentially what that means in a nutshell is it's a, a database dedicated to storing data with timestamps. And if you're dealing with IoT data, especially sensor data, you are more than likely to be dealing with timestamp data. Let's consider the temperature sensor, for example. You know, it's great having a value, but there's not much credit to that value if we don't know when that value came from. So imagine over the course of a day, you wanted to know the temperature of your room. That, of course, would have a timestamp assigned to it. So you know exactly when you receive that temperature value. So in most cases, you will receive a timestamp with IoT data or at least be assigning a timestamp to IoT data. And this is where dedicated time series databases come from. So it's not to say you can't use a conventional database to store data, but typically on average, dedicated time series databases are four times faster than NoSQL databases when dealing with time series workloads. And they are and they require five times less storage for your data as well. So, you know, that's kind of what you get for using a database dedicated to the cause. And more specifically with InfluxDB, InfluxDB comes with a number of services on top that sort of enable you for quicker development. So whether that you, whether you're using our inbuilt data scripting language called Flux or using our task automation engine for automating those tasks, so automating those Flux queries, um, it sort of helps improve how you're interacting with your time series data. But more on that later, we'll be using that incorporation with our Flask server. So, and lastly, in conjunction, the last component that we will need is the VS Code Flux extension. So I highly recommend this extension if you're using VS Code. It essentially allows you to integrate your InfluxDB instance into VS Code. So you can run some of your administration from directly within your IDE. So that's whether that's creating new buckets, which is considered databases, or you know, you're wanting to interact with tasks, you want to create flux code. Um, it's a great extension to use in conjunction with the rest of your development environment. And we'll be doing a little bit of that during the demo. So, and lastly, for, and not least, just to finish up the environment, sum up the environment, you can actually sort of get set up in four really easy steps. It should take you a few minutes. Create a free InfluxDB account, or you can download InfluxDB OSS. Generate a new all access API token, add that within your VS code. This will give you, this will give VS code full access to your InfluxDB instance. And we're going to create a new bucket. So a bucket in our terminology is a database. Um, we're going to call this plant buddy. And then you'll be able to see a list within the VS code panel of all of the buckets and all of the other environment components, such as tasks uh, you need to InfluxDB within your VS code. So now that we have our environment set up, let's start getting uh, a little bit dirty into some Python code. So when designing this project, what I wanted to do was have a standard way of any Arduino device, no matter what type of network hardware that they're using, whether it's LoRa, whether it's, um, whether it's just a Wi-Fi module, whether it's Ethernet, I just wanted a standard way to collect data from the device so people can just use it no matter what device they had. Um, and the easiest way I sort of came up with in the end was actually just directly using uh, the USB um, cable for the Arduino. So essentially collecting the data over serial. So the, pack, the Python package I actually fell upon, uh, which saved the day is PySerial. And now PySerial is an awesome library, which 
actually caters to a, quite a niche now within um, within Python. So a lot of the time, people don't always need to interact over USB or serial. Um, but within the industrial sector, especially within IoT, it's still quite a big thing to do. So you know, this is this tool is great for interacting at a low level with your devices. So what you can do with this is you can actually connect across OSs. So you can interact with your USB and serial ports across Linux, Windows, and Mac OS. Um, and it's a great all-round tool from working at a low level, um, but abstracting those low-level commands to an easy way of using it within Python. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at some of the basic um, coding part, basically some of the basic command lines that you need to, to, to know in order to create your Python code with, um, with uh, PySerial. Now, when dealing with Pi Serial, you kind of have to think of you kind of have to think of a lot of wrapper and catch clause code about working out what could go wrong with someone using a USB device. A great example of this is imagine if I connected a USB device, but then my dog came along and pulled out the cable. How is your code going to handle a USB device being pulled out and being plugged back in again? So a lot of the code that you will see is around handling that. What we're going to do is just abstract the Pi serial basics. So the first thing that you need to do is you actually want to connect to that serial device. In order to connect to that serial device, we use a serial object that has three different parameters. You have the port, you have the board rate, and you have the timeout. Now, the port is basically your pathway to your USB serial device. So in, with our application, we're going to actually search and automatically find which port that we need, but you can actually specify them statically as well. So in an essence, like I think on Linux, most of the time it's under slash dev slash, and then it'd be something like TTY for the serial ports or USB and some um, ID for the rest of them. So you can statically specify which ports you want to, pull, to connect to and pull data from. Next is the board rate. So the board rate is, is essentially how many bits per second we can a device can deliver over a channel. So for instance, if we have a board rate of 9,600, that means we can transfer a maximum of 9,600 bits a second across that channel. And so that, you know, our device needs to know what to expect when it, when it comes to collecting data from, from these microcontrollers. And lastly, but not least, timeout, a little bit self-explanatory. So timeout is essentially um, just how long Pi Serial will wait to see if there's any interaction from the device before it decides to cancel itself out. So that's a bit of basics when it comes to collecting, that basically comes to connecting to your device. Next, of course, is actually reading data from your device. So in order to do this, we've created a function there simply called read. Um, and essentially what you do is you ask, you ask Pi Serial to wait to see if data is coming. And essentially we've got this if clause here within the red box that says if sir dot in waiting. So if we see data in waiting, then we will carry on and carry on reading that line. In order to read that line, we'll do a self dot sir dot read line. And that will bring in the string, the, the string, but uh, string bits from the device into our Python code. From there, we actually need to convert the string of uh, string of bits from its basically its codex form in ASCII and bring it back into a form that we can understand for our application. And that's why we use the decoder within Python with ASCII specified to decode back into um, our string form that we can read ourselves. And what you'll see is a format that looks like this on the right. So you can see 01 SM00. And so what we're trying to show here is when you're working with microcontroller devices, keeping the keeping your payload simple is really effective and really and keeping your overall output from these devices is the more efficient way of doing things. And then adding metadata, adding enrichment later on when you deal with, a, say, a gateway device or, you know, a server that can provide more throughput, more performancing, adding more enrichment to your data. 
So essentially 01SM00 means 01 is the device ID, SM stands for the sensor that data is coming from, so that's soil moisture. And at the moment, you can see the soil moist, the, the sensor must be out of the soil because it's giving us zero, zero, zero. So that's giving us the uh, zero percent in terms of moisture that it's detecting. So moving on from our moving on from our uh, bridge. So just just to let you know, so that bridge essentially takes that serial data and writes it and converts it to, um, sorry, sends it to a HTTP client. So that can be directed to any network-based server. And in comes our main event, the Flask application. So the Flask application is gonna be the center point of our IoT application. And so what we first need to do with our Flask server is we actually need to define an endpoint for our serial bridge to write to. And so if you're familiar with other APIs, if you work with other APIs, this is exactly what we're building here using Flask. So a server route is essentially that us build, building an endpoint that will allow our bridge serial to talk to it. So we've got our server route here, which is slash write and our method post. What this is essentially saying is we're only providing a post method since we only expect our data to be writing, our sensor to be writing new data to our server. And we don't need to be, and we, we shouldn't need to expect to send any data back to our sensor. So we'll use the method post. The, the function write allows us to basically handle any incoming data or any incoming interaction to that endpoint. And there's two sub functions or two child functions that handle the incoming data from our bridge. You have influx pass line and you have write to influx. So essentially what pass line does is this is where we start to take our very basic data sample that we saw from the previous slide. And we start to enrich it within a, a more Python like structure. So within this case, we're using a Python dictionary and we're providing the actual device ID, the full sensor name, the value, and now we can enrich it further with who's ever logged into the Flask server. So we will provide a username as well. And that data is returned back up to the write function. And then from there, we call write to influx. So with write to influx, this is where we actually deliver our data to influx DB. To do this, we've actually constructed what we call a point object. And a point object is specific to InfluxDB. It creates line protocol, which is the data that um, InfluxDB understands. And so we've created a measurement called sensor data, two tags, which is metadata. This allows you to quickly filter by your data that's stored within InfluxDB and your field. So your field is your actual sensor data itself. So your field would be something like temperature and your value. Your tags are your user and your device ID, since you could have many devices and many users. So moving on from there, now that we're writing our data and storing our data within InfluxDB, the next thing to do is actually query our data back so we can look to visualize it and do other interesting things with that data as part of our Flask server. So the great thing about this is this is where our Flux extension comes in. We can use that as part of our, part of our basically query experience before we create our Python code. So what you can do first with the Flux extension is create a Flux file. Now a Flux file is our data scripting language. So and its most basic form, Flux is a query language. So you're querying in FluxDB, you can pull out some data and there you go. In its most advanced form, Flux, the Flux language allows you to modify, prepare data, do some basic forecasting and some even some data smoothing on your data and some anomaly detection. In this case, we're gonna keep it really simple. We are going to, collect data from our bucket for the last 24 hours. We're going to take it from that measurement sensor data, and we're going to filter by a device ID, and we're going to filter by a specific sensor that we want to collect data from. So my apologies that the graphics are a little bit small on this one. Don't you worry, when we get to the actual demo, you will be able to see it a little better. 
Um, so what you can see here is essentially you have the table which is produced from running measurement sensor data, device ID 01 and field light. So, and you can see the results from our light sensor there. Now, this is great if we're dealing with static data, but essentially what we're, you know, say if we're going to run the same like flux function over and over, we would get the same data back over and over. What we want to do is be able to provide a more dynamic experience. And this is essentially what parameterization allows us to do. We can parameterize um, our flux function and we can add that within our Python code, which you can see here. So we can specify variables within our parameters which we can add to our query API, and then we can send those parameters along with our Flux function to InfluxDB and bring back dynamic data based on what we want from our Flask application. So moving on to visualizing data. So since we now have collected our data back into our Flask server, we're going to use two different libraries that you probably have all heard of. They're really popular libraries within uh, the Python community, Pandas and Plotly. So in short, Pandas is a, so we're going to be using Pandas data frame, which is a which is a basically a structure um, for building two dimensional data um, and its corresponding labels. Imagine it like a SQL table, that's how it appears. And Plotly, which is a data science visualization tool, essentially lets you build out graphics really easy. It's a great low code option. If you don't want to have to deal with something like D3, this abstracts you away from that and allows you just to work with your data and build out the visualizations with this library. So essentially why we need to use both libraries is Plotly, Plotly JS, or sorry, sorry, Plotly, uh, Plotly Dash, requires pandas data frame as its data input. Um, so we first need to have our data as a data frame. Now, luckily part of the InfluxDB client library for Python, we can actually automatically convert the data returned from InfluxDB into a data frame. And you can see a visualization here of what the data looks like. So this is the data visualized within a table, and you can see that we've returned our data frame. Next, what we can do is we call actually call px.line. And so what px.line is, Plotly Express, we're going to create a line graph object. And so we're going to provide that data frame, and we're going to specify its x and y axis. So in this case, we're going to use the column x as the time, because we're dealing with time series data. And our Y column is going to be our value. And lastly, you can specify a title. So I'm just using a common function within data frame here, which basically finds the first row and takes the first value from that column in field. So that would be light. And so here's some of the results, but I'm going to quickly skip through these slides for time because um, I'm going to actually get onto the demo and show you this in action. So if I quickly jump on. So let's jump into the demo and I can show you some of the, the code that we see here. So if I share my full screen, this should work. Hopefully you can see that okay. Yeah, it looks like we're good. Fantastic. So here is the application code. And so you can see we have our Python application here. This is our Flask code in our main app. Why? Let me see if I can just increase the size for you guys a bit here. So what we're going to do first is we're actually going to start our, our, um, our Flask server. So let's quickly run this app server here. And hopefully the demo gods are with us. As you can see, that's us booting up our Flask server. We're running on port 5001 on localhost. And next, what we're going to do is we're going to run our serial bridge. So if we jump into here, like this, you can see this better. And if we run our Python serial, you can see we're skipping over the ports that we don't care about. So our Bluetooth ports, and we're connecting to our USB modem here, which has got our serial device connection. And as you can see, we're now collecting data. 
So I don't know if you can see us on my camera or not, but we actually have uh, Dennis, our plant for today, and our microcontroller, which we're collecting data from. So if we now jump into our browser, we can now see, if I refresh this, we can now see our plant buddy dashboard and we're collecting data over time. We can navigate between tabs as well. So if I quickly jump into this tab here, you can start to see that we're collecting moisture data over time and we're also collecting air temperature as well as room humidity and light. And a more advanced feature that we can do is a great feature with um, Plotly Express is you can actually create integrations into, so you can create interactivity back into your graphs. So if we want to, I can specify soil temperature here and hopefully regenerate this graph and it will change what my graph is seeing. So you can create some really interactive dashboards really quickly with Plotly Express. So this is great if you're going to be looking at your dashboard all the time. So if you want to keep checking up on your plants all the time, this is great. But what do you do when you want to be a bit more um, proactive with your data? Well, we can do that with a task and we can do that with an alert within InfluxDB. So let's first have a look. And this is my homework for you guys as well after it. Once you pick up the source code, if you can finish this off in Python, this will be really quite an interesting little project. So we have a task here and we call this plant buddy moisture HTTP. If I activate this task, essentially what we're doing within the flux code I edit the task here, is we're collecting the data from the last successful task run. So we're running this task every 10 seconds. We're checking the moisture level. So if, um, if the moisture level drops below 30%, then what we're doing is we're actually sending an alert to a HTTP endpoint. So hopefully, if you can think about it, we could actually send a alert directly to our Flask server from Influx to notify our Flask server or notify our user of the Flask server that there's a problem with one of their plants. So at the moment, we're definitely above, we're definitely above 30% since we have our moisture in. And I can check this by jumping into a our graph here. And if I quickly run this code here and then do this, and then if we go cloud, You can see we're quite high here. So we're on 39% or above. If I remove our temperature sensor, and if I quickly try and dry this off, we should hopefully soon start to see an alert to say that we are not getting any moisture through. It always takes 10 minutes for the, sorry, takes 10 seconds for the sensor to update. See, I think the demo gods are not with us today, but that's okay. But I will navigate. No, that's okay. Um, so normally this would trigger an alert to say that we our sensor data has not come through sorry, that our uh, moisture has dropped below 30%. So that's kind of just giving you an overview of the sensor overview of the data here. What I'm gonna quickly do is jump back into slides and see how you can get started uh, yourself. So if I jump in, uh, I hope I can go back to the slide. And if I jump this way, and we'll skip through these a little. What you can actually do is you can try it yourself. So I'm a massive practitioner of giving the code a go yourself. You can pull it directly from our Influx community Git repository. Um, you'll have all the code there, including the Flux code you need, um, all the setup instructions, the blueprints for your Arduino device, uh, and of course, all the Python code that you need. So this is still a really basic project and it's for something for you to build upon which will be really great for you to see great for us to see 
The next thing to do is also check out InfluxDB University. So if you want to learn more about InfluxDB and how you can do some more advanced things with it and look at other more deep dive into more specific parts of InfluxDB, come join our InfluxDB University where we basically have a set of courses and you can earn merits and medals um, and sort of bring those into your LinkedIn space to show that you're being trained with InfluxDB. And then lastly, I would be thought if I didn't say it, uh, come join our Slack community. This is where me and all the other DevRels hang out. We love to hear about your open source IoT projects and any other projects that you're working on in the time series space. Um, you know, we provide support there um, and we help uh, and, and basically we help with all your support queries. So please come and join us. We'd love to see you there. And, you know, thank you for having me. Um, it's been really great to be with Pi Geekle. The some of the pro, some of the talks that you're going to be seeing today look absolutely fantastic. I'll be I'll be sticking around for most of the GPU and the video talks. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing you guys in the Q&A later. Um, I think it should be a really good show. Awesome. Thank you, Jay. And uh, it wouldn't be a conference day if your neighbor is not drilling something. So pardon if, if you're hearing if my headphones picking up some, some noise. But uh, yeah, thank you uh, for the presentation. And we will be waiting for you during our Q&A session. And uh, so everyone, if you have any questions to Jai, uh, and also, uh, I guess we will have your, uh, maybe your... Um, What's the name for that? Your GitHub or so? Yeah, sorry, the GitHub repo. So I guess yeah. we can provide. I can provide a link to that into the chat if that awesome. um, if that helps and, and get everyone awesome. So there. everyone, if you need a link, uh, look for it in the chat. Jay, thank you once again, and we'll see you. We'll see you soon. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Paul. Catch you later. All righty, and we have our next presentation, and our next presentation will be from Jacob uh, Tomlinson, and uh, it will be a recorded presentation. He is a senior software engineer from NVIDIA, and due to the difference in time zones, so uh, Jay provided us uh, Jacob provided us with, with the recording, and yeah, let me uh, pull it up to the stream, and yeah, please enjoy. Hi everyone, my name is Jacob. I'm a senior software engineer at NVIDIA, but I mostly work on distributed systems. So I work a lot on a Python library called Dask, where we distribute computation across many machines on many machines with many GPUs. I don't spend a huge amount of time working on kind of low level GPU programming. So I thought, while I've been at NVIDIA, I've been learning a, a ton about this topic. It's really interesting. And I'm really like well positioned uh, to be like an insider novice within NVIDIA that I can learn from my amazing colleagues and then share that knowledge with you. So in this talk, we're going to work through a bunch of kind of low level GPU programming stuff that I've learned in the last couple of years. And hopefully um, I'll be able to answer the questions that I had going through this. Um, and those will be the same as the kind of uh, questions that you have as we're going through. So I specifically work within a group in NVIDIA called Rapids. Let me just move that away so you can see the logo. So I work on Rapids, which is an open source suite of Python libraries. You can go to GitHub and find all of our libraries on there. You see things like QDF, QML, QGraph, QSignal. These are all GPU accelerated Python libraries um, that fit into the PyData ecosystem. So if you've worked within kind of sciences, data sciences, uh, and written Python over the last few years, this plot should be familiar to you, and a lot of these packages should be familiar. So one of the things that we're trying to do in Rapids is to either take these libraries and add GPU acceleration to them, or create drop-in replacements um, that are GPU accelerated to allow you to like, get the best out of your hardware without having to change your workflows too much. So. In like a typical data science workflow, you might have something that looks like this. You're going to load in some data, do some preparation, you're going to do some model training, and you're going to visualize the output, and then feed that back around again to ask more questions and more questions of the data until you get out the, the thing that you want you know, to action within, within your business. And it's common to use libraries like Pandas, Scikit-learn, NetworkX, PyTorch, TensorFlow, Matplotlib, etc within this space. And if you want to do distributed computing, it is, uh, folks often reach for Dask. If you have a look at Rapids, 
it's the same slots, often, mostly with the same libraries. But if you want to do kind of data frame manipulation stuff, instead of using pandas, you'd use QDM. If you're going to do machine learning, instead of scikit-learn, you'd use QML, uh, network X, QGraph, etc. Um, there are like most popular deep learning libraries, PyTorch, TensorFlow, um, XGBoost, these kind of libraries are already kind of GPU accelerated, and we just contribute a bunch to those and really focus on making sure that all of these things integrate nicely and work well together. But yeah, and what, once you want to scale out beyond your, your GPU, once you switch your workload over and start using QDF, you can really push your hardware further. But at some point, you'll reach the, the limit of one GPU, and then maybe you want to either scale out to multiple GPUs in your machine or multiple GPUs that are over multiple nodes in your cluster. And so to do that, you could use Dask. Um, and Dask works with all of these GPU libraries as well. The other side of uh, things that we see with GPU acceleration is that once you start making your computation faster, you shift towards the network communication either between machines or, or, or other GPUs. Um, that becomes the bottleneck. So we also contribute a bunch to a project called UCX, which allows you to leverage uh, high performance interconnects as well, whether that's InfiniBand or MVLink or something, um, to really allow fast communication between uh, nodes or, or GPUs within your, within your cluster. So if you're down in this kind of bottom left quadrant, again, let me move out of the way, um, and you typically use NumPy, Pandas, that kind of thing, um, you can scale up with Rapids, leveraging faster hardware. You can scale out with Rapids and Dask onto multiple machines, uh, multiple GPUs. We've got a few, I've got a graph here just to show kind of the performance gains that you can expect. Um, I'm not going to bore you hugely with stats about this because what I really want to get onto in this talk is to focus on what is GPU programming? What does that look like? What, is it, what does it actually mean to write code that runs on a GPU? Um, one of the things we really try and achieve within Rapids is to provide you like drop-in replacements where the API feels familiar. You don't have to change your thinking too much. But I really think that having some understanding of how code gets executed on a GPU is really beneficial to like integrating into this kind of new world of, of accelerated data science and, and science computation. So let's start right back at the very beginning of like what is a GPU and why is it like a useful thing for us to be using? So if you've heard of GPUs in the past, usually you either hear of them in the context of playing video games or in the context of doing some kind of interesting machine learning, deep learning kind of thing. This is a little video from um, Galgan, which is like a, a star transfer. Um, image generation network where you can give it like a big blocky painting on the left and it would generate you photorealistic scenes that match that kind of structure on, on the right. But these things kind of feel a bit um, beyond your grasp, right? It's, the, it's either the domain of video game developers or the domain of kind of folks who are really in the deep learning space. But GPUs are, are really um, general purpose computing hardware, and you can use them for a variety of tasks. So let's talk about like what that hardware is and how you can use it. So if you open up a machine with a GPU in it, you'll often see there's a CPU, as you can see on the, on the left, and the GPU on the right is generally like an extra card that you see slotted in to the machine. That also has a chip in it with a bunch of extra memory. It's effectively like a separate machine going on inside. This is a great YouTube video um, that I'm not going to what playing all of now, I encourage you to go and Google search um, Mythbusters NVIDIA. This is on the NVIDIA YouTube channel. Um, you can see you've got the, the guys from Mythbusters here kind of demonstrating with robots what the difference is between uh, a CPU and a, a GPU. So here we have this uh, CPU style robot, right? It's a paintball gun on a robot arm and it's painting a picture by shooting one paintball at a time. It's doing one operation at a time to, in order to draw a picture. And now they're unveiling the, the GPU-style paintball machine, which is much larger, much more complex. It's a little bit less uh, versatile, right? You can't modify it in, in as many ways. You can't get it to do as many different tasks. But this is going to be far more optimal for doing this one operation. This is going to paint a picture um, with paintballs. So I'll just skip ahead a little bit here. Each one of these paintball tubes is loaded with a different color paintball. So, but every single tube is going to roughly do the same operation, but the configuration of those tubes allows it to do like an overall different uh, kind of workflow. Right here, we are painting the Mona Lisa with a variety of different paintballs, and so this maps on quite nicely to um, 
how we can program GPUs, right? GPUs are general purpose hardware. They are very useful um, for doing all sorts of different things. But instead of having a CPU with, with a handful of cores that you can kind of send off in different directions using threads or processes to go off and do different things, the GPU has many, many cores that kind of can go off and do different things, but they have to be kind of roughly doing the same operation. Uh, and I'll kind of get into what that, what those differences are as, as we go. But like, one of the first questions that I had when I was approaching this is, this all sounds great. How do I write lines of code that run on a GPU? What does the actual process look like? And a mental model that I found really helpful is thinking of it like, um, what does it look like if I want to write some code on my laptop and run that code on a server or some other machine, a VM in the cloud or something? I have to write some code, and I usually have to have some data to work with. Um, I write that on my machine, and then if I want to run that on another machine, I have to remotely connect to that machine, either via SSH or remote desktop or something. I need to move my code and data over, so I might use SCP or FTP or some kind of data transfer protocol. And then I need to execute my program. I need to tell my program to, to run. And I would do that via the, the SSH connection. If I was writing Python, I would you know, SSH a Python file over, uh, SCP a Python file over, use SSH to call the Python program. And using a GPU is kind of a similar concept, except instead of using protocols that you know, like SSH and FTP, um, we use CUDA. Now, CUDA is like an, an overloaded term. You see it used in a bunch of places. but one of the things that the CUDA is, is it provides this communication that allows you to move code to the GPU, it allows you to move data to the GPU, it allows you to then execute that code on the GPU, and it allows you to move data back, as in the same kind of way as if you were working on, on a remote machine. So often when people say CUDA, you think of CUDA C++ language extension, right? It's, oh, you have to program GPUs in C++. Um, and that's not true. CUDA, while CUDA is a, a language extension to C++, there are also other ways of dealing with CUDA, and CUDA represents other things, like um, the actual protocols that I, I just mentioned. So if you don't want to write C++, you don't have to. You can do something else. As long as that something else does all of the things that CUDA does, right? as long as it allows you to construct code to run on the GPU, move things around, um, then, then you, can, you can use it. So let's have a look at doing this in Python. Now, for this example, I've gone and grabbed Rapids. You can install Rapids. Uh, you know, Rapids is a, is a whole suite, right? We have a meta package that you can install via Conda, which just installs all of the packages, or you can pull down a Docker image. Um, but the main thing we're going to be working with here is, is a package called Number. Now, Number, uh, you may have come across it in other contexts before. It's a really great Python library. It does just-in-time compilation of Python to give you performance benefits. So uh, typically in a CPU world, you'd write a function. You decorate that function with the number JIT uh, decorator. And when that code runs, the first time that function is called, number will compile that code down into something lower level that will run much faster. Um, and then every time that function is called again, it'll use this very fast compiled version. So if you've got a function that does some kind of complex, um, slow operation that you need to speed up, and you're going to do it many, many times, number is a really great option for that. But because number has all of this machinery of taking Python code and compiling it down into something much lower level, um, there is also a CUDA target. And so you can go from Python code down into CUDA code that will run on a GPU as well. So in all of these examples, let's have a look. So I'm not going to do uh, exactly live coding here, but let's have a walk through some uh, canned examples that I've got to show you what it's like to write some code. So writing uh, a code for the GPU. You'll hear all sorts of new terms. I'm going to introduce a bunch of them now. Um, this is one of those big hurdles that put me off when I first uh, started learning about this stuff, because there's like a whole vocabulary that comes uh, with GPU programming. So let's unpack some of these, these, these common terms that you'll hear and, and get a bit more understanding about those. So one that comes up a lot is a kernel. Right? Now, this isn't the Linux kernel or anything like that. This is basically a function that's going to run on the GPU. Right? You talk about kernels, CUDA kernels, these are just functions. Um, but there's a couple of caveats that comes with 
writing functions for the GPU that justifies giving them just a slightly different name. So one of the things that we have to think about is a kernel on a GPU can't return. And this is because what we're going to do is we're going to write a piece of code, we're going to write this function, and then we're going to say to the GPU, execute this 100,000 times in parallel. Right? That's going to be like a lot of data to return um, in like a normal return statement. Where does that go? You, the GPU isn't going to be able to just handle giving all of that data back. Each of those threads might end at a different time. Um, the onus is put onto the, you, the developer, um, to actually decide what, what happens with the output of this function. So generally what we do is you create an array of data in memory on the GPU. We'll run the kernels on that array of data where maybe each kernel is reading a different element from the array. This is kind of what I was going back to what I said before about the big paintball machine from the Mythbusters video. Each of those paintball tubes was the same, but it was preloaded with uh, a different color paintball to paint this picture. We can do the same with an array on GPU. We can preload the memory with an array that's got different values in, and then our function can take different paths with if statements or, or whatever um, based on the values that it's reading in. But in order to output, we also typically give uh, an output array, which is has some shape and size. Sometimes that's a one-to-one -one mapping um, with the number of kernels we're executing. Sometimes it's not. Um, but each kernel execution will read in a bit of data from memory, do something to it, and write it back out somewhere in memory. Um, so instead of returning, we modify uh, memory in place. And then the other thing we have to do, we have to specify something uh, called a, th a thread hierarchy, uh, which is often referred to as a grid, which is a, a combination of threads and blocks that represent how many times you want this to run. Now, threads and blocks and grids and warps is like a big topic to unpack. You can go and read the, the Nvidia documentation on this. It's taken me a while to wrap my head around it, so please, um, by the time I get finished explaining this, uh, if you're still not clear on what I'm saying, don't panic. This is like a, a strange concept to get your head around. But when we call our function, we're going to want to call it many, many times. So we want to call it a million times um, to operate on our data. This is kind of where the power of the GPU comes from, is being able to execute your function many, many times in parallel. But each GPU themselves can only actually execute a certain number of threads. Uh, it's going to be in the thousands, but um, GPUs have hardware inside them that is actually going to do this, this processing. Um, and so what we do to make things a bit easier and a bit more transferable between different GPU models is we have blocks of computation. Right? So usually this is a grouping of like uh, 512 or 128 or something. It's like a round number uh, in binary of threads that we're going to pass to the GPU. And it's going to work through as many of those blocks as it can in parallel. It just depends on the GPU and how many uh, multiprocessors it has. Um, but if we want to do a million computations, we might break that up into you know, 10,000 blocks of 100 threads. Um, and we'll pass it these blocks through. So all you need to kind of understand as a developer is how many times do I want to call my computation? And usually, that's going to be some relation to the input data uh, and output data. Um, but then we just need to provide that as two numbers. So we'll have a number of threads per block, a number of blocks overall that we want to run. Um, now, that's not the, the easiest thing to get your head around. But there's some really great rules of thumb in the number documentation that help you make at least some reasonable decisions about this. So. I said you need to choose how many overall threads you want, but then you need to decide well how many how many threads are in each block and how many blocks do I need to cover my overall um, iteration. And so the rules of thumb that we tend to follow are that the block size should be a multiple of 32. Um, and this is to do with something called a warp, which is, is around like shared memory and shared caches on the GPU, but we're not going to dig into that topic. Um, but it, the documentation says a good place to start is somewhere between 128 and 512. So that sounds great. Let's pick the number 128 and just move on from there, which is to assume that each block is going to be 128. Maybe we want to do some benchmarking in the future to see whether we can do things more optimally. Um, but as a, as a good starting point, we can choose 128. Now, to do things in Python, we can just import CUDA from number. Uh, you know, we, we've installed everything with our, our Rapids mess package. Um, you can just do from number import CUDA, which we're going to import NumPy, uh, NumPy because number uh, understands a lot of NumPy stuff. Now let's make some arrays that we're going to work with. 
So uh, we're going to make an array of zeros, and we're going to make some output arrays as well. Now, uh, oh, these are these are all the output. Array. Yeah, these are all going to be output arrays in this example. Apologies. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to pass each of these arrays to our kernel, and our kernel is going to update different values in each of these arrays, so we can figure out like a little bit of get a bit of understanding about what our, our kernel is going to do. So here's our actual kernel itself. Like I said, it's just a function. It's a Python function that's been decorated with this CUDA.jit to say, when you run this, can you please compile this down into a CUDA kernel that we can run on the GPU? Um, and you notice there is no return in there. So this is following that, that kernel thing. Um, and what this function takes is it takes three arguments. Each of these arguments is an array, our NumPy arrays from before. So every invocation of the kernel is going to have a pointer to the whole array. And each we want each kernel, uh, each thread that runs our kernel, to do something different. And the way that we do that is we have this uh, really useful function called CUDA.grid, where we say, within our big grid of, of executions, say we're going to run this a thousand times, each thread can go and ask CUDA.grid, which thread am I? What is my index within this, this overall computation? Um, and we're, we're asking for a one-dimensional index here, but you can do two-dimensional or three-dimensional indexing as well. If you're doing image processing or something like that, it, it makes more sense to think about these indices in multiple dimensions. But say we're going to do this a million times. If I do CUDA.grid uh, of one, the first thread is going to get the index zero. The last thread is going to get 999,999. Um, and all of the threads in between are going to get a unique index. And here we're just assigning that to like the absolute position. Where am I absolutely within this, this array? We can also ask for the specific thread index and block, block index. So say our million uh, iterations have been broken up into blocks of 128. You can say, well, which number am I within this block? And which block number am I? So here we're just get, assigning those to thread and block. And then we're putting these numbers back into that array. So we're, we're kind of saying um, this is a 2D array. So each row is going to represent uh, one block. And we're going to update and say, well, you know, I'm block two. So row two, and I'm thread number seven within this block. So that point within my array, I'm going to update that with my absolute position within the overall um, grid. And the point of this kernel is to show you this one function will be executed however many times. We're passing it different values, um, different arrays. No, we're passing it the same array to work with each time. And each thread is going to get different numbers from CUDA.grid and CUDA.threadindex block index, and it's going to update different elements in the output array. And this is where we get that flexibility of, of having our kernels do different things. It's roughly the same thing, but it's different things. It's working on different areas of memory. Then the last thing we need to do is run the kernel. We need to actually execute our function. And the way that we do that in, in Python with number is we need to tell our kernel, right, my kernel is my, my function here that I defined, we need to tell it how many blocks we want and how many threads should be in each block. And we do that using square brackets. So that's an unusual way of calling a function, but we're kind of using, we're overloading that in Python to configure our function and say, right, this kernel needs to be run this number of times. Um, just for kind of clarity here, we're assigning that to another variable, configured kernel, which will be called a set number of times each time you use it. Um, but often, you just leave the square brackets in. You know, you'd have my kernel square bracket chunk, round bracket chunk with the with the arguments. Um, and so we're configuring here to say, right, I want you to do eight blocks of eight threads for this example, and then I'm going to call the function uh, the kernel with my my numpy arrays that we we created before. And then if we have a look at the output of the absolute position, we can see thread number zero, put the number zero in that top uh, left-hand corner. Thread number six, put the number six into the correct position. Right? Each of these different invocations of the kernel put a different number into this array. Um, but they could have done different, wildly different things uh, if we wanted it to. And we can also see the thread and block position here into the thread and block arrays. Um, you can see the thread position is you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 going across the threads, and block is, is saying this is block 0, block 1, block 2, block 3, etc. So let's have a look at our, our kernel again. You can see this is kind of how we've updated these arrays. 
Now, one question you may have, if you've been kind of watching closely, is how did the GPU update my NumPy array? NumPy is a CPU Python library. The data, when I did mp.0s, that will be on my CPU. So what happened? I just passed it. Uh, I just passed it my NumPy arrays, and the GPU modified those. And the way that it did that is that the when when you call a, a CUDA kernel and give it something like a NumPy array, um, number will be clever enough to go, oh, that data is not on the GPU, so I'm going to copy it from CPU memory to the GPU, do the operation, and I'm going to copy it back again. This is really useful when you're first starting out, but it's not ideal in terms of performance uh, in the long run. So one thing we can do is we can say, right, I'm going to create an array on my CPU, and then I'm going to use CUDA.2Device to intentionally push that data down to the GPU. And we might want to do this because we might want to call multiple kernels, kernel after kernel after kernel. We don't want that copying back and forth each time. We just want that data to stay on the GPU. Um, so let's have a look at another quick little example here. Um, this is kind of the same function as before, but instead we're just uh, getting the absolute position and putting that into an absolute position array. Um, we can see with our, our output array that we put onto the GPU intentionally, if we try and inspect that after the operation has happened, we just get this pointer saying, this is a CUDA device array. This array is still on the GPU. So we then need to also intentionally ask for that data back so that we can look at it. So we would do uh, copy to host on a device array that's going to copy that memory back uh, onto the CPU. Now, hopefully that's given you like a bit of a, a, a quick view into the low-level APIs of how we can interact with the GPU, how we can write some Python code, and how we can have that Python code execute on a GPU and do different things. Um, but often you are already accustomed to other high-level APIs, NumPy, Pandas, etc. So let's have a look at what the Rapids high-level APIs look like. We don't have to worry about threads, we don't have to worry about blocks, we don't have to worry about any of that. All of that's being handled for you under the hood. You can see here, if you use CuPy, all the operations, all the API looks exactly the same as NumPy. I can generate random arrays the same way. I can use the linear algebra um, submodule and everything. And CuPy will handle dispatching everything to the GPU and getting everything back. You can just follow the same standard NumPy API. I just find personally that it helps to have an understanding of that these things are going on at the low level, um, even when it's been abstracted away from you. Uh, and again, here's QDF, which is a drop-in for pandas. So we can create a pandas data frame, um, and we could move that down onto the GPU with QDF. Um, and then we could do like merge or something and see that that also goes much, much faster. Now again, to recap, Rapids is everything that we're doing in Rapids is intended to like slot into the existing PyData ecosystem where we have all of these wonderful libraries and we're either trying to enhance or complement them um, to make this overall workflow faster, more, more efficient for you, the, the developer. But by meeting everybody where they are, by, by re-implementing NumPy or by re-implementing Pandas, um, we're trying to reduce the amount of upskilling and, and knowledge burden we have to take on. The other thing we're also focusing on is once this data is on the GPU, can we swap between high-level libraries? Um, and so we have a couple of different protocols for this that we, we develop and, and contribute to. One is called DLPack, one is called CUDA Array Interface. And the great thing about this means that, uh, especially for CUDA Array Interface, any libraries that support that um, API means that you can just cast the type, the array type, from one library to the other, and it won't copy the data back off the GPU. It will just kind of switch the clothing around. So we could have a, a PyTorch tensor, and we could hand that to CuPy or Number just by casting between them. And we can see a very quick example here of taking some NumPy data, moving it to the GPU with Number, switching it over to be a CuPy array, and then bringing it back to the CPU using the CuPy API, right? the device uh, mem memory was only created once. We had a number representation and a CuPy representation of the same array in memory. And that's thanks to CUDA Array Interface. And it just means that you, as a developer, you can learn all these different libraries that support GPUs and GPU acceleration. And you can just kind of swap between them as that um, as your workflow goes through. If you need to change tools, um, you're not like locked into one specific tool. GPU acceleration is GPU acceleration. So very quick recap. Um, if you want to write code that runs on the GPU um, at a low level, we can write 
functions uh, that we call kernels that can run many times in parallel, but they can't modify, they can't return data, they must modify things in memory. Each time these functions get called, um, each one gets a different index, so each function in theory could go off on a different path, do some branching, make different de decisions. And we can do all of this in Python, we don't need to learn C++, we don't need to go to that low level. But we may want to think a bit about memory copying and how um, we are moving things between the CPU and the GPU. And then if you're already in the PyDate Rico system, there are many APIs out there that are, have GPU accelerated flavors um, that will abstract all of this away and means you won't need to worry about it. So thank you very much for watching. I really hope this has been interesting. If you have any questions about any of this, please hit me up on Twitter. I'm sorry I can't be there to do this, this live today. Um, but if you do have questions, please, please tweet at me and, and I'll get back to you. So have a great rest of the conference. Awesome, awesome presentation from Jacob. And uh, if you have any questions, please ask them in the chat. And also you can uh, ask your questions uh, in Jacob's Twitter, as he said. Yeah, and let's let's uh, move. And uh, let me introduce Brad Webb from uh, Australia. He's one of those speakers who's, who's joining us pretty late for him. So it's around eight o'clock, I believe, at your place. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I'm actually in Bangkok at the moment, so I'm a few oh. hours earlier. <laughs> awesome, awesome. But thank you, anyways, for joining us, and thank you for the uh, for the presentation. We will have uh, more topics about uh, analytics and data science, but we will start with your topic about how to use S3 in this. And uh, the floor is yours, I guess. Without uh, any further ado, thank you, Brad, for joining us. If you need any help with the presentation uh, to pull it. Uh... Just let me know if it's coming through. Yep. Perfect. There we, go. there we are. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction. Um, as was mentioned earlier, my name is Brad. Um, I work majority in analytics and data engineering um, and sort of wanted to have a little bit more of a chat um, today about um, sort of the power of using S3 buckets, um, especially using uh, pandas uh, data frames um, to interact within it. Bear with me. So here's the basic details of myself. Um, so as I said before, mainly working in analytics and data engineering. Uh, the two main languages I code in is Python JavaScript um, and uh, mainly uh, working with cloud technologies at the moment. Uh, details of my social is um, on here. So GitHub and LinkedIn is the best places to reach me. Um, and feel free to uh, clone my project at the end of this and have a play around if you like it. Um, it's available now, I will be honest. Um, the README still hasn't been updated, um, but that's sort of tonight's job after I jump off this. So just to give um, everyone a bit more of sort of the background um, to this presentation is in data science and analytics, uh, Pandas King, it's, it's used everywhere. Um, there is some uh, sort of other big players in the market um, but sort of the longer that I go on, um, the more I'm the more I'm seeing um, <laughs> sort of more and more people moving towards Python um, and away from the other players. And something that's uh, sort of quite noticeable, definitely in the last few years, um, and is only ever going to ramp up moving forward, um, is uh, sort of the use of cloud technologies. Uh, so I think sort of I, I don't know any um, company or any person um, these days that's actually sort of trying to work with on-premise um, and it seems that there's a, a massive push towards cloud um, in sort of all aspects um, of the the data world so I just have to say I'm a big AWS fanboy I've been using their their products for quite a while um, and sort of uh, hopefully I can, I can go through um, some of the things that I've learned so far um, and help you out um, moving moving forward ah. Apologies, I just dropped my mouse. So just to, to sort of set the scene as to um, where the, the space is in analytics and data science at the moment is um, R seems to be um, sort of, I guess, the, the other major player in the market. Um, it definitely is sort of more popular with um, uh, sort of um, intellectuals. Um, so you definitely see it a lot more with um, sort of university um, graduates and statistics. We used to have a bit of a joke um, in one of my last workplaces that anyone that used R is most likely sort of studied a PhD 
Um, there is uh, Databricks or PySpark, um, where Databricks is built off, um, that is a distributed um, uh, sort of big data platform. Um, it does have some limitations that it's sort of quite hard to start, um, whereas Pandas, given the sort of pro um, proliferation of um, Anaconda, um, is just sort of made it a lot easier for people to start start playing with, um, which I think sort of been a big um, boost to its uh, sort of success recently. Uh, a newer player on the market that's quite interesting, um, I'm a big fan of it, um, is Dask. Uh, one of the limitations with Pandas is, is actually that it's single-threaded. So uh, essentially you can't uh, utilize all of the CPU cores and the RAM um, effectively, natively, should I say. Um, there is sort of packages in Python that will allow you to um, to run it multi-threaded, whereas da Dask is native multi-threading. Um, one sort of other mention to note is that uh, a few people recently have been um, mentioning and, and sort of bringing up to me about a new uh, Python package called AWS Wrangler. Uh, I've played with it a little bit over the last sort of month just to, to sort of get my head around it. Um, now, the good things about it is it's really simple. Um, I find that I can jump on and actually interact in four or five lines of code to get the things done um, in Python code versus uh, uh, trying to sort of write something in, in the SDK, for example, which which definitely is sort of a lot more um, time consuming. The only issue with it is it's sort of, uh, I think they're trying to um, sort of do everything. So the issue that I see there is that uh, the, the size of the dependencies, once it's been installed, is uh, 350 meg. So it's it's quite a large amount of data and it is quite limiting, especially in the context we're talking about today. So um, there's a, a file size limit, there's a, sorry, package limitation on Lambda functions um, using layers, which means you can't have more than 260 meg of total size. So instantly, if you were to use AWS uh, Wrangler in your Lambda function, it, uh, it it's just too big to, and you'd have to run it in a container, which adds sort of more complexity. So what's the problem um, we're looking at here? So um, given the sort of the um, the the size of pandas um, and AWS and its use in the industry, um, I, I have a lot of problems um, and had a lot of problems in the past actually connecting the two up. And it's funny that sort of talking with people and um, working with others, it seems that the the easiest way is to, to use the command line interface um, to just copy the CSV or a data file out of the, the bucket locally and then just import it with pandas. Now that's sort of uh, problematic, um, especially in regards to versioning control, it's uh, security um, issues if you're working sort of an enterprise organization, which definitely um, doesn't make it ideal, but it's one of those uh, sort of uphill battles that most people um, sort of have the tendency of taking the, um, the, the easier option, which may not sort of be the, the best moving forward. So before I sort of jump into it, I do I do want to mention some limitations here. So I don't uh, believe that this is actually the um, the the savior of all of the the problems. Um, there is sort of some some limitations here as to the approach that I'm taking. Um, definitely in regards to having um, secret key and answers um, and key value pairs from AWS is um, amazing to interact with the. Um, the CLI, but a lot of uh, companies sort of aren't aren't allowing that as part of their enterprise policies these days. Um, definitely, when you start working anything in AWS, you are going to have a, a massive learning curve in regards to the IAM permissions. Um, it is uh, a sort of a, a an interesting, time-consuming um, task trying to error handle. <laughs> error handle some IAM permission errors where essentially all you're seeing is a is a access denied and you're having to sort of go and backtrack uh, through your your code and, and the um, IAM policy and roles to try and work out exactly um, where the where the issues come from. Um, another sort of point here is that I guess if you come from more traditional analytics background, um, or, or data science is that you're, you're probably used to error handling 
in um, a Jupyter Notebook or or maybe like a spider if you're using the Anaconda distribution, um, which does sort of make uh, error handling of, of things locally much easier. Whereas, for example, if you've got an error in your code and it's um, being picked up in CloudWatch rather than sort of on any tests um, in your system, um, you then have to um, redeploy the, the app to AWS. And um, it's, it can be time consuming to um, to sort of uh, try and error handle it uh, bit by bit. So just keep that in mind that it definitely is a, a sort of a, a move away from the more traditional, I guess, data science-y um, Jupyter Notebook or um, another IDE style of a, approach. Um, but I just I just sort of wanted to, to talk about this way. The other thing as well is I guess the, the more you start using um, a, AWS's um, CDK, so the Cloud Development Kit, is uh, the Python CDK does have some limitations. The documents aren't as robust um, as the TypeScript CDK. And uh, I do find myself sort of more moving towards um, using TypeScript a little bit more, pretty much only for the, the AWS CDK. But just to sort of put it out there that there, it isn't, uh, it isn't the savior of the world, but there's some, some cool things happening here. So I guess what I'm going to do is break it down into four parts. Um, so the first one being is the AWS CDK stack. So this is essentially how you can programmatically using infrastructure as code, build your AWS resources um, uh, out without having to interact with the, um, the console or, or the CLI. Um, and the beauty of that is it actually um, is quite simple compared to the other options. Once you, you get a bit more of a handle, as to to how it works, you'll find the simplicities of setting up AWS infrastructure infrastructure if you're using the CDK. Um, the second part to this is uh, reading the data frame from Botto three, which is the AWS SDK, so the software development kit. Um, the third part being a very simple logic process. Um, so I'm sort of not here trying to um, sort of explain to everyone how to use pandas. There is so many YouTube videos that are, are going to be far better at me than doing it. Um, it's just mainly putting a bit of a logic gate in as to um, a way to treat files and and how you may interact um, with the, uh, the S3 buckets um, in that manner. And the last part is actually saving the data frame from uh, pandas back to S3. So just to give everyone a bit more information as to the, the approach of what we're doing here is essentially you have an object which could be anything, but for the purpose of uh, this uh, session today, it's just a, a CSV file or a couple of CSV files. So essentially what happens is that you're putting that CSV file into an S3 bucket. And what it does from there is it, it triggers a Lambda function, which is an AWS serverless compute. So what that means is that you don't have to worry about um, any of sort of the back end of setting up a server. Um, Lambda functions are available for whenever and whenever you like it. Um, and it's it's charged by the millisecond, I believe, as well. So they're actually quite cheap compared to having a, a server provisions that's running all the time that you may not be using full capacity. So that Lambda function executes some Python code, manipulates the CSV files um, as per, per the code and then outputs them to a separate S, uh, to a different S3 bucket um, that then you can interact with um, through maybe a, a Jupyter Notebook, for example. Whereas if you were um, combining files in a concatenation, then you could um, sort of have a single output in the end that you're importing into your, your notebook to, to do your, your data analysis or your machine learning models on. So I'm not going to pause too long on this. This is a screenshot of the um, code. It's I'm going to jump into VS Code and show everyone what it what it looks like there. I've just mainly put them in for after the presentation if people are sort of um, needing to go back and understand it a little bit more, just to um, uh, sort of mark them a little bit for the presentation. Um, if anyone sort of I guess coming from more traditional um, data data analysis style coding, so spaghetti coding with Python. This may look a little bit daunting, uh, but the beautiful thing about uh, the AWS CDK is actually that it does all this for you. So you don't have to worry about the, the file structure um, 
or sort of any of the the higher sort of object orientated style coding is you're just um you're just handling the the parts in the middle here which is about provisioning the resources so here's the details about loading the data frame um you're sort of passing an information from lambda a lambda function which which has a json object that's sent that has sort of the details as to where the files are and how to um and where to locate them so that's that's the main part of the code here the main thing is i want to point out in the end here is that it's just a simple pd.readcsv so as you're you're sending the the file details to pandas um and it just reads it in as a data frame the same as you you would um in any process um that you would you would run usually using pandas here's the the basic logic i was talking about it's literally a pd.concat so it's just around um uh, adding the two files together if if there's two files and if there's not it'll just create a single file output um in the end and it just does this that you can add multiple files on top um, and it'll keep concatting them until the end of the day which is the the rule that's been set up for this project um so that um it um it, it gives you a single file per day if, if you're having multiple files uploaded um, and then the last one, which is a little bit more complicated. Now, I'm I'm not going to act like I know exactly how this works, but essentially you're setting up um, a with statement, which means it closes the file after it's done everything, um, sending it to S3, um, as well as the string IO is something that could be interesting to look at. Is it, It's a generic um, a string um, file object. Um, that just sort of puts a little bit more parameters around the the data in the data frame so that it's uh, more reliable when up, uploading to S3. Now, that's about as far as I've gone down the rabbit hole with that. It's always one of those things that you can get lost on on some of these more in-depth uh, coding, coding principles. Um, but that sort of seemed like it was enough for me um, uh, for the purpose of, of this and sort of some of the other coding that I do. So just to take you through a, a bit of a working example, I'll um, I'll bring up VS Code now. So this is essentially um, the the um, the layout that the um, AWS um, CDK sets up when you initialize um, the the CDK. Um, so it sets everything out um, into a sort of a, a fairly um, uniform file structure um, and and you just sort of add in um, the parts that are needed there's not too much in regards to this app.py that's fairly standard except i've just slightly um, i've commented out this in regards to um, um, yes i guess you can um, but the problem with um, uh, I'm answering a question in the chat here, which is like, can you directly um, upload to S3? Is essentially you would have to um, put the file into some form of CSV somewhere and then upload it from there. Whereas this is just doing away with the idea of having to um, upload the, uh, sorry, to, to put into a CSV file before you're actually uploading it to S3 with the um, AWS CLI, for example. Um, so having a quick look here, um, I'll show you what the, the bucket stack looks like from the previous example. So essentially, all of the um, constructors are done through the CD, um, CDK, and I've created two buckets here, which is um, the input and the output bucket with um, the arguments that are being passed are essentially blocking access and versioning that's true, um, but you just sort of put a slightly different naming convention here. This is setting up the, the Lambda function um and uh, what what you're doing is um essentially assigning the um the lambda details and telling it exactly where to look um and then putting a notification um on the s3 bucket to say activate the lambda function when a file has been um put in um you then you then set the um the details of the event notification um and that it's it's for an object created put so when an object gets put in the bucket it'll automatically trigger the lambda function to do this processing 
Um, now, the good thing about the AWS CDK is that um, you, um, I guess, don't need to, to dive as deep in regards to the IAM permissions um, to um, allow sort of access to different resources. So here, for example, I'm allowing the Lambda function read access to the input bucket and uh, read write access to the output bucket, which if anyone has used the um, creating roles and policies, um, it, this, is, this is far simpler um, in regards to, to how to set this up. Um, so just quickly, here's the Lambda function. I ran through this before, but this is sort of, I guess, more um, just uh, fairly reasonably simple Python code. There's nothing too crazy in here. Um, that sort of most people I think um, could follow through depending on on your backgrounds um, and it's definitely something that you can um, can pull apart as well and to answer a question in the chat is yeah I'll put the the github link um, up um, after after this so you can actually clone the repo and go from there so just um, quickly I'll show you that it um, sort of how it how it works here um, I will be completely honest with you guys. It was working this morning until I made some slight changes um, and I didn't properly test them. Um, and it does seem to be having a little bit of an error in regards to uploading, uh, sorry, in regards to the concatenation of the CSV files. But I'll have a look at this um, after the, the chat and update the Git, GitHub repo with the readme um, uh, probably in the next day or two. So then it should be working 100%. But all it is is just a, a slight formatting error in re in the CSV files of the concatenation in the end. So bear with me. So essentially what I'm doing here is um, I have a, a working example over here for you guys. Um, there's just two CSV files um, that we, we're going to upload here to... Ah, sorry, thought I'd fix this. Um, to the, um, sorry about this, um, the S3 bucket. So what it is, is um, using the AWS CLI, which I have installed. So what you can see here is that the, the files have um, been uploaded. And just to, to check the details, Gonna be problematic. Apologies, guys. I thought I had it copied in a way that wasn't gonna do this. And as you can see, there's four CSV files in there. I didn't um, delete them before. So what you would then do is have a look in the um, output bucket, which is um, this one over here. Um, Apologies, guys. I thought I'd done this one a little bit better. Um, so what you can see here is this one here is the, the output bucket. Um, and it should have... Uh, it's, always, it's always how it is when you do a live example. Here we go. So as you can see here, 0609 2022 output.csv. Um, so the, the the purpose of this, I guess, is essentially if you were to um, uh, sort of trying to um, minimize the workload um, on you if you're doing sort of lots of mile fat, ma blah, 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 manual file interventions as part of your um, your day-to-day -day process, maybe you've inherited some legacy legacy processes um, that sort of may not be, be as automated as you'd like. Um, all of this can also be run locally as well. So if you wanted to, um, if you were working sort of on a local machine and had the AWS CLI installed, um, you could, um, as, as long as the, the correct Python um, versions were connected up, you should be able to upload directly to um, the S3 bucket from Jupyter Notebook, for example, using the exact method that's um, 
in the the lambda handler um, function that's there. So I guess sort of um, the the big takeaway from this in a um, bit of a wrap up is um, that sometimes using pandas and um, AWS together isn't as sort of simple um, as it could be. Um, and the the code solutions out there sort of aren't that mature at the moment. So I would probably suspect that sometime in the near to distant future is there will be um, sort of some, some new um, players in the market or um, sort of some improvements into the, um, the current um, uh, libraries that are there that will, will enable um, AWS connections if possible. Um, I seem to have rushed that a little bit quicker than what I timed this morning. So um, I'm finishing up a, a few minutes early, I think, from what I intended. Um, but hopefully this was um, a little bit informative um, as to sort of some of the options in regards to automating Python functions with file uploads to S3, um, as, as well as um, if you would like to grab the code, which I'll be, be sharing the GitHub link to, um, you can you can pull it apart and, and have a look and see if uh, any of the um, upload or um, download um, code is, is sort of suitable for your needs as well. Just pop the the repo in. There we are. So I've uh, I've shared the GitHub repo. Um, with Nick, so he'll he'll pass it around to everyone. And as I said, I'll um, do the last couple of things on it uh, tonight and tomorrow. So it should be um, it should be um, sort of up to date and working from then. Not exactly sure what to do here. Um, I'll see what else I can take you through, actually. So, Brad, excuse me for a second. So, I, I, I was just grabbing myself a, a cup of water. So, are <laughs> you? So, you finished with your presentation, or yes. I might have missed this. Okay, okay. So, uh, awesome. Uh, then I guess. Um, We'll uh, we'll be waiting for the for the questions, and uh, I believe you will be able to join us for the Q and A session. Is that That's right? Correct, yes. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So then, uh, everyone, please uh, stay active. Ask your questions if you have something to ask Brad about, and uh, yeah, look for the uh, for the link for the GitHub wrap up both in our chat on the platform and also on the YouTube. And we'll see you in an hour and 20 minutes, roughly. Thank you once again for the presentation. And now we will have a quick announcement. And then after that, we will continue with Adam with his presentation. Thank you, Influx Data, for sponsoring this event and for joining us as a presenters. And just a couple of words about the InfluxDB if you happen to miss Jay's presentation. So basically, if your app or the product that you're working with is using time series data, then for you, this is a very cool solution because you know that building real-time apps with legacy databases, it can be just a nightmare as uh, you have to spend more time basically managing the infrastructures instead of shipping the code. But with InfluxDB, the leading time series platform, which was built actually from ground up to handle massive volumes of timestamp data produced by sensors, applications, and infrastructures, InfluxDB empowers us as developers to build real-time IoT, analytics, and cloud applications with ease. And you can easily start and scale InfluxDB 
and it will give you the time to actually focus on the features and functionality that give your app the competitive edge. You can focus on things that you are best at and let the influx to be do the rest. And you can get started for free today using the link in the chat. So it's influxdb.com slash cloud. And don't miss your opportunity to grab it for free right now. All righty. And uh, now we have our next presenter. We have Adam Hopkins with us. Good day or good afternoon. Let me check your your time zone. Okay, good day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, afternoon afternoon here. Um, okay, let How me... How are you doing um, today? Great, doing real good. Awesome, awesome. So let's uh, let's share your slides. Let's share your presentation. Is this the one that we should start with? That's it. Okay, so I guess we will be hearing about uh, how we uh, we will bring our own queries uh, with uh, non RMSQL clients. <laughs> All right, absolutely. So, okay, uh, hello everyone. Yeah, um, then the floor is yours. Great, great. Um, hope uh, hope everyone's been enjoying the conference so far. Um, so, I'm going to talk to you about this project that. Uh, uh, that I created fairly recently called MIME. Okay, so first, um, let me give you a little bit of background about myself. Um, I work for uh, Packet Fabric. Uh, we pr provide uh, networks as a service to, to customers. Um, and I'm also pretty active in the open source community, mainly with the SANIC framework. Uh, if, you're, if you're familiar with it, um, uh, it is a async uh, IO uh, tool for building. Uh, web platforms. So that, that's where sort of my, my main open source fo focus comes from. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about this project MIME. So what is MIME? The, the sort of idea behind it is actually that it's kind of like an ORM. It, it's not an ORM. Um, so, so, you know, what it does is it provides you sort of this you know this functionality where you can have this object where you're going to be making you know calls to and it's going to give you objects back python objects back um but why is it not an orm so let's jump a little bit into what i mean by orm um for those that don't know it stands for object relationship uh, manager or mapping um and the idea is really it provides functionality and, and these sort of these bottom two are the, they're sort of the the pinnacles of what they do uh, on the one hand um, they're going to provide uh, sort of an api for taking data out of your database and putting it into a python object and then the reverse of that so mime really does all this except for that last step and the idea is mainly to provide a sort of first class support on this step here, on what it means to take data out of your database and put it into objects. So uh, here's sort of like a visual representation of what ORMs do. You know, they 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 kind of work back and forth on, on the left here. Um, they generate some SQL queries on the right, they're going to give you Python objects, and then they're going to give you methods on those Python objects to kind of go back and forth, ping back and forth and back and forth. And, and MIME is sort of only a one-way street. Uh, you have to generate all of your own queries. So that's what BYOQ stands for, bring your own queries. Um, and the idea is it's going to execute and then hydrate those into Python, uh, Python objects. So what would a ORM traditional ORM look like. Let's say we've got a couple of tables. Uh, we've got a department table and employees, employees links back. So simple structure. Um, with an ORM, usually what's going to happen is you're going to have these Python objects that are going to have some sort of methods on them. Let's say you got a get method. And that get method is going to go and figure out what is the SQL that I need to run to be able to get this object out of the database. And it's going to kind of you know, sort of work under the hood, not really. Uh, give you so much insight into how that's operating. Um, uh, MIME sort of does part of that. So this is what an application might look like. Uh, we've got a model. Uh, we've got this thing called an executor. We're gonna we're gonna talk a, little, a lot about these. Um, but basically, just think of it as an object that you're gonna build out in your applications. That's going to have methods, and those methods are going to get you your data. 
So we've got a method here that says select person. It's going to take some sort of an input. Oops, jumped ahead. And it's going to give you back sort of this object. Um, so in high level, this is really what we're doing. You know, we're executing some SQL statements. Um, but the sort of problem with this, um, and while this you know works and this is a valid pattern inside of MIME, um, you know, I was talking about how I really wanted to create sort of that first class support for running raw SQL commands. Now, most RMs, they will provide this functionality. This isn't something that that, that isn't already available, um, but um, I don't want to write SQL in Python strings. You know, I want, I want to be able to do something a little bit, a little bit more, um, um, you know, flexible, a little bit more that works better for my workflow. So what if I've got a whole bunch of SQL files and I want to run those? Well, that's really what we're going to try to do here is, is MIME, the underlying idea is that you have SQL files. It's going to load those SQL files, and then it's going to provide you a, a, a type annotated platform to be able to access and, and access your data. So sort of a, a you know, project structure might look like this. You're going to have you know, some, some Python code. Uh, this will be sort of where your executor, that that object that we looked at real quickly earlier, is going to exist. And relative to there, we've got some some SQL queries. Now, important to note, we've got this pattern of you know select all cities dot SQL. So that name, we're going to see that pop up again in a minute. So let's say I've got this SQL file, query slash SQL select all cities. That's SQL. Now I'm going to create myself a model. So here's all the different data points that are getting pulled out and that executor. OK. So this is really the heart of what this application does, is it provides you with um, tool, a set of tools to create definitions. And these definitions is really going to just basically be, I've got this SQL file called select all cities. It needs two inputs, limit and offset. So let's go quickly take a book, back a look, and we see here it's going to take limit and offset as parameters. OK, and once you're done you know, running, you're going to tell my what I want to get back is multiple cities. So I don't want just one object, but I want a list of them. And those are these objects that we defined here. Um, and then you'll notice that I've got an ellipsis here. Um, you could put a pass statement, you could put a doc string, but the whole point is that you're going to have this function that's going to have no content to it. And the idea is that MIME is going to basically go out there and take this definition and going to fill in the rest for you um, at runtime. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate, I'm going to instantiate this object. I'm going to run select all cities and voila, I've got access to, 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 my, to my, my objects now. It's going to look something like this. All right. So the question then is, you know, sort of why why are we doing this? You know, if if ORMs can go through and generate all these uh, SQL statements for me, why would I want to go this route? And and you know, there definitely is you know, long-standing debate, you know, do you write your own queries? Do you use an ORM? I don't really want to jump into that that debate. Um, I don't want to say here also that ORMs are bad because they're great tools and they and they certainly work well in, in, in certain circumstances. In other circumstances, you really want to have the control to to write your own query. So so that is the real use case that that um that I'm targeting with this with this uh, package um, is you know when you need to do something that's a little bit uh, more complex. When you, when your data model might be a little bit messier, you've got a lot more relationships. You've you you know you need to um, maybe you need to access um, you know use foreign data wrappers. You know you've got stored procedures that you want to run. Um, you, you know it it sort of provides you by writing your own SQL queries. You have a lot more flexibility and a lot more control than what most ORMs are going to give you out of the box. Um, in addition. You're going to have a lot more visibility into exactly what is happening, right? Because you're 
you're generating your queries. So you can handle performance issues a lot better. Um, if, if you've been around ORMs, um, you know, you might know that there's sort of this concept of n plus one. And what does that mean? Um, n plus one queries is sort of the idea where I've got an object. Um, let me go back a couple of slides, you know, so let's say I've got this, you know, this, this table structure here, um, where I've got this employee and I want to fetch, you know, this employee. Well, I also want to get access to the, to the department. So you may, you know, inadvertently run one query to get this object and run a second query to get this object. And, you know, it's sort of uh, a problem that is pretty prevalent in, in a lot of ORMs. And so, um, you know, there's tools to work around them, of course, um, but uh, you might, start running uh, your application and all of a sudden you start realizing over time things start slowing down and you're not exactly sure why. Um, and that's often the case, um, you know, a source of a pitfall. Okay, so let's, let's take another look at another example here. So before we had a model that was basically just a city and we're gonna add that sort of nested structure here, right? Um, but we want to avoid the n plus one problem. So we've got a country and it's going to reference a capital city. Okay, well, one of the things that being able to write our own SQL allows us to do is write one query that's going to fetch all this data at once. And we can fetch it for any number of objects. So let's say we want to paginate, um, we want to get you know the first 100 objects or something like that. Um, we can do this all within with one query, query, and what's going to get out on the other end is basically a big dictionary, a Python object um, that we want to then um, hydrate into objects. So, uh, you know, potentially we're taking all these queries and and, and pulling them down into to um, to just one. Um, you know, it's also um, it, once you realize that you're not just limited to the structures of the RM and, and you, you get a little bit more freedom to work uh, directly with SQL queries, you can start doing uh, rec recursive stuff. Um, or you could start um, um, doing some more, um, you know, putting more sophisticated and complex queries um, without having to get the database performance issue. So, so here we've got an example. Let's say I'm building out um, uh, like a family tree and um, uh, you can only see part of the query here, but you can see, you know, I'm joining on parents and then those parents are gonna have other parents. And so I wanna get, you know, one query that's got me, it's got my parents, got my grandparents, goes back 10 generations. And I wanna do this all in one qu query. Um, you know, it's super simple to do with um, in, in Postgres. It'd be a little bit harder to do um, outside of that. Okay, so what what is this thing, the executor, and what's this all about? So, as you saw at a high level, it's basically just uh, an object um, that you're creating a set of definitions on. Um, I should definitely point out that uh, it's all async uh, based, so it's a it's an async I/O um, uh, tool. Um, it currently has support for Postgres, uh, MySQL, and SQLite, um, and and you're going to basically create methods that look like this. Um, but you know, we want to be able to to really give ourselves the most amount of flexibility and the most amount of control over our SQL files. Like that's that's the most important thing here is is the SQL files. So under the hood, um, it's going to provide you this executor with the ability to to modify it, um, to look for different types of patterns. Uh, if you want to put your queries in some other locations, um, you know, this is this is really up to you to control. So you're not sort of locked in to this pat one pattern. Okay, so what about if you've got to create dynamic queries? Um, so this is an example where I've got a function uh, 
um, you know, I want to pass into this this method the ability to look up a city by either its name or uh, by an ID. So I can't just have one SQL file because that SQL file might need to get generated on the fly. So this is obviously a pretty simple example, but you can obviously imagine, uh, you know, maybe you need to uh, define what is what are the objects that are being selected. Maybe you need to define what are the, the tables that need to be joined. Um, whatever it is, the idea here is I want to generate um, my SQL statement on the fly. Um, so sort of in our previous examples, I told you we're going to leave these methods without any code inside of them. This is where we're going to start putting some code in them. So under the hood, this is basically what MIME would do if you left it as an empty method. Um, you know, it's going to go and fetch your your uh, your statements, and then it's going to run this execute query. Um, so you know what I'm showing here is the idea that you know we need to you know sort of let let the, the platform know if you want to fetch one object, if you want multiple objects, you're going to pass in your your uh, parameters here. And this is actually probably a good point where I'm going to add my little um, you know warning statement. If anyone uh, has ever done this sort of thing before, you know one of the things you really need to be careful about when generating SQL statements is not accidentally um, adding um, input into these and um, that hasn't been sanitized and you want to sort of avoid the SQL injection uh, risk. So really what you want to do is anything that is going to be coming into this function, which generally would be the the parameters in your, your method up here, you want to pass them directly into this params function here. Don't try to try to add them into your, your, um, your statements. That's just a recipe for pain. OK, so that sort of has a problem, right? Remember earlier I said the whole idea of this project is we don't want to have to write SQL statements inside of strings because it's ugly. You know, If I'm putting all my SQL statements into a file, um, I have a huge you know, few benefits. Um, number one, my ID is going to give me syntax highlighting. Um, which makes it a lot easier to start generating queries. Um, number two, um, I could have some um, um, autocorrect, and my ID can can start popping up with suggestions of um, you know of different tables or or column names. Uh, number three, it's can I can uh, auto format, so all my queries are formatted the same, and and um, you know have some nice linted and and um, easy to maintain queries. Uh, and then sort of number four is because they're just SQL files, you know, while I'm sort of grokking this whole thing, I can just go pop into, you know, a, a database and start running these queries without having to run the application because it's just a, it's just a file. Um, so it makes it really simple, uh, you know, if you want to want to sort of reuse queries that exist from different places. So um, here we're going to generate a that exact same same query dynamically but instead we're going to go and we're going to look at these little fragments here so these fragments you can imagine are different select statements they're different where clauses so they're they're not full statements necessarily but they're going to exist somewhere else outside um, where i can still have some of the some of the benefits of uh, syntax highlighting and formatting and stuff like that um, and i can just kind of compose them together as i need to all right. So what happens then? Um, so the 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 first step is executing, um, and and the real sort of magic happens. Well, great, I've got my my raw data, but I need to convert that now into to something usable. Um, and and that's sort of where the where where this whole idea of hydration comes from. Um, so a hydrator. Um, out of the box, you don't need to do anything with these. Just just to put that out there, uh, out of the box, it, it comes with a hydrator that's going to work with data classes. It's going to work with pedantic models. You don't really need to do much. But you know, what if you do need to do something a little bit more complex? You know, in this example, 
you know, let's say I want to be able to return city objects with populations not, um, you know, that are that are in terms of million units. So I want to see, um, you know, the population of of New York City with, uh, you know, whatever, whatever, it, you know, divided by one million as opposed to a, a more exact number. Um, or you can imagine, let's say you want to. Um, um, you know, kind of stitch together maybe different types of um, uh, information or you want to translate information from, from one data type to another. So this is sort of the, the place where you can add repeatable logic that is going to act upon your ability to tra transform this data, which is just a, just a dictionary, into a model. Uh, if anyone has used Pydantic in the past, it's um, a really uh, great tool to create models for you. Um, and this is sort of uh, a way you can really you could you could use your existing models and and turn them into to queries. There's nothing special you need to do them. There's nothing you need to add to to MIME. There's nothing you need to add to Pydantic. You can just kind of stitch them together and just use them as their turn statement here. So in this example, because um, 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 defining my model here as this pedantic model. When, when I'm done with it, it's going to run and it's going to give me back uh, this as an instantiated object. Um, but you know, what if you want to use different models? Um, let's say you want to use something like Marshmallow. Let's say you want to use um, um, adders would work, actually work out of the box as well. Um, but what if you want to use uh, some objects that um, where you're not just passing in um, sort of a string of arguments like this? Um, so in this example here, uh, I'm showing how you could create a, a, a hydrator that's going to use Marshmallow to sort of validate your data. Um, you can imagine that this could, um, you could put in a whole lot more logic here if you wanted to turn into different types of uh, structures as well. Um, but what we're doing here is we're going to say that, you know, unless otherwise specified, this is what you, we want you to use. So we're going to tell MIME, this is your default hydrator for everything. And, and it's going to expect some sort of a schema object. This is, this is a, a Marshmallow uh, class. OK, so you know, next what we, we're going to do is look at sort of you know, um, different ways you could use these objects. Again, I'm, you know, for some simple scenarios, you might not ever even need to touch these. Um, but if you want to create you know, some additional um, flexibility, you can define them at different levels. So here we have application-wide. So every single um, object is going to use this. Um, unless it's got something more specific. Um, in this example down here, we have this executor that has its own hydrator. Um, so this is something that's going to be a little bit more specific. And then you can go even further down and add attach them at the method level. Uh, so there's sort of three approaches, and uh, it's going to take obviously the most most specific one that's that's applicable. So as you can see, it's pretty simple library really all we're doing is taking sql statements and turning them into to python objects but you know what if you actually want to build something real with this so i mentioned at the beginning um, i uh, uh, managed the sanic um, web framework project uh, so so naturally there's going to be you know ability to integrate with sanic so let's say let's look at how this could operate so one of the things that sanic has is this um, um, API called ex, uh, Sanic Extensions, where um, we're basically passing it some sort of an object. And here, this is going to basically be a way that we can define, you know, how you access the the, the pool, how we're going to create some, you know, create um, our our interface to to the database. Here's all of our executors. Um, it's going to handle. All the lifecycle stuff. So when the uh, application spins up, it's going to create your your pool. When it turns down, it's going to sever all the connections, um, and it's also going to add some dependency injection. 
So when I've got a route handler down here, and you can imagine, um, you know, I've got some sort of a API route that's being hit. It's going to inject my city executor directly into um, this handler and it's ready to go. And sort of the beauty behind this and sort of, you know, in my opinion, really where this shines is everything's using type annotations is so, so once I've got this object here annotated, uh, my ID is, is going to be able to pop up and let me know what are all the different methods that I need to, that I can apply. What are all the parameters that I need to pass in order that I can pass in. Um, and I, and I got this fully typed object, uh, which is really nice to work with down here. Um, but um, in addition, um, you know, this is not limited to just SANIC. Like that would be, you know, this is this is a much more a broader applicability um, to even just web applications. But um, um, you know, there are are extensions here for Quart and for Starlet if uh, you're using either of those. And it's going to do a lot of the same thing, where it's going to out of the box kind of manage the lifecycle events for your application and and start up and shut down the database pool uh, as it needs to. Um, so, you know, the, the last, last kind of thing that I want to, you know, talk a little bit about is sort of kind of where this idea came from and why this even exists. Um, so, um, um, as I mentioned, you know, ORMs are great. Like they, they are a solution for, 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 for a lot of problems, just not every problem. Um, and when, uh, I, I wrote this book, um, um, that came out earlier this year. And what I was going through and talking about how to interface with databases in an application, I really wanted to show that you're not limited to just ORMs and that that there really is a way that you can provide that first class support for your SQL statements and do more complex logic that in, in, in my opinion, you know, once you start putting, you know, production level applications together, you know, generally you're gonna need um, uh, at least for, for the stuff that I work on, some some more complex um, um, power under the hood. Um, so one of the chapters in there actually sort of built out this whole idea um, in, in, in this book. Um, and it goes kind of a little bit more in depth into the ideas behind it and why it exists. Uh, and then after the book came out, uh, I released it as its, its own project. Uh, but, you know, I'll give myself a little, uh, you know, plug here if you're interested in learning more about um, um, uh, I got a link down here to my book. I'll probably put um, um, also in um, um, a, a discount code probably on my Slack channel uh, if you want to, or, or not in my Twitter uh, feed. So if you follow me on Twitter, uh, here's my handle. Um, you can get access to discount code there. Uh, also, we'll put all these slides up in to um, uh, my GitHub repository, and uh, you know, if you get a, get a chance, you know, take a look at the the documentation here. Um, you know, there's a you know, I, I really only touched on a, a small breadth of of what's possible uh, with this platform and sort of the flexibility that provides is and and really, you know, the idea is to try to give the the power uh, to the application developers to to build um, a, a flexible platform that can handle any sort of complexity that, that they need to throw at it. Uh, so I guess the, um, that's the end of my presentation. That's all I got. So um, look forward to your questions if you have any the Thanks, next session. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we'll, we'll gather those questions uh, and cool. uh, we'll have them during the RQ&A session. Yeah, and uh, we will, if you don't mind, please send the, the handles to, to your social to our uh, Backstage chat and Nick will post them to. Uh, maybe it will be easier, uh, sure. like just to copy them. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All righty then. Uh, yeah. Talk to you in like forty minutes, and we are waiting for our uh, next uh, presenter. So uh, we're expecting to. We are expecting uh, Albert uh, to join us another software engineer from NVIDIA. And uh, we will be hearing about how to upload data performance to the GPU with Python and NVIDIA Delhi. So let me check if, if we have our next speaker.
Yeah, I think we have another like three to four minutes. So maybe let's uh, have a short break. Maybe grab yourself a coffee or a bottle of water. And yeah, we will be back in, uh, in two to three minutes with our next presentation. So stay tuned, everyone.
Right, welcome back, everyone. Dzień dobry, Albert. Hey, hello. Dzień dobry. How are you doing today? Great, thanks. How are you? Doing good, doing good. So uh, looking forward to your presentation. So I guess we started with an intro to GPU development uh, for Python, and now we're you know looking to how to al offload uh, data processing to uh, with help of NVIDIA, DALI, and Python. So I guess without further ado, floor is yours. Thank you. OK, thanks a lot. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Albert, and I work at NVIDIA on a library called NVIDIA DALI. Uh, and I would like to tell you a bit about what it can do and maybe some interesting, more esoteric advanced GPU features that it allows you to use uh, from Python. Uh, OK, so the bit of agenda of what I will talk today. First, like deep learning data preprocessing, I will establish the problem that DALI was designed to solve. Uh, then a bit of Python code, uh, how to use DALI. And then I will discuss a couple of uh, couple of technologies that DALI uses to make everything performant. Uh, OK, so when you look into the more or less every DL uh, workflow, what you can see is that you have your data somewhere, maybe storage, maybe network. This data needs to be loaded and possibly decoded if you are handling images, uh, videos, audio. Uh, and then there is this step of augmentation, maybe some other pre-processing, normalization. Uh, sometimes you do some feature extraction. And then generally when the data is ready, you feed it to your model, maybe neural network, maybe uh, something else. Uh, but when, when we look at the, at the whole workflow, we see something, something like that. Uh, and uh, in the beginning, all parts of this workflow were handled by the CPUs because that's what we had uh, back then. And then there was this like brilliant idea, let's move the neural network to the GPU since GPUs are pretty good at uh, multiplying matrices and that's what neural network is all about at the computational level. By the way, these are the car, exactly the cars that were used by Alex Net back in 2011, 2012, uh, dual 530s. And it allowed to uh, speed up the whole workflow significantly. And so since then, we went pretty hard with this idea. We throw more hardware at it and better software. Uh, and at some point, we arrived here when where uh, neural network preprocessing was so fast and so well optimized that uh, this data preprocessing part became a bottleneck, where the neural network or another ML model needed to wait for the data to be ready for the next iteration. Uh, couple reasons for this. One is basically what I discussed before. So we have more hardware, better hardware, 
we spend a lot of time optimize, optimizing the software that runs on this hardware. Uh, the other is that people started to experiment with more uh, complex, more advanced, more computationally intensive uh, pre-processing uh, and augmentations. Uh, and that's why we have this, this gap. And that's what DALI tries to solve. Basically, uh, DALI wants to replace this whole part uh, of data pre-processing which usually would be run with something like NumPy, OpenCV, FFmpeg, if you are into video, et cetera. Uh, and DALI moves all of this to the GPU. Uh, so base, basically it reads data from whatever, uh, hard, whatever storage you have, and then does the pre-processing and integrates with uh, whatever popular, uh, deep learning framework you might be using, TensorFlow, PyTorch, MXNet, Paddle, etc. So going back to the lovely drawings, uh, Tally takes your workflow from here uh, to here. So it replaces the OpenCV NumPy uh, that you might be using before, moves everything to the GPU, and now uh, and now the neural network does not have to wait for the for the data because while it processes one iteration, DALI asynchronously prepares uh, data for the next one. So uh, training iterations can go one after another without any delays. So that's that's the goal, uh, and that's what DALI was designed to do. And now a bit of Python. Finally, uh, this is maybe not the easiest example, but I picked something uh, something that is like real life example because this is a pipeline for ResNet 50, which is somewhat famous model in, in image processing. Uh, and like execution model of DALI is like state-based uh, for those familiar with TensorFlow uh, basically, this is the same thing where we have a graph or pipeline. We define how we want it to look like. Uh, we build it and then we use it to run graph computations again, again and again uh, to get some data. Uh, we start usually by importing uh, something from NVIDIA DALI package. And then we, we define our pipeline in this uh, functional um, manner. Uh, as you can see, we have some ops that are more or less uh, directly uh, understandable. We read some files, we decode some images, then we resize them, uh, we do some normalization, and then we return them. Uh, and then uh, what we do is we use this uh, pipeline definition decorator which does some magic in the background to tell DALI that this function is actually pipeline definition and uh, it adds some arguments it uh, basically translates this api to to c plus plus that runs under the hood uh, to build the pipeline so usually next step we create pipeline object and as you can see, uh, this decorator added some argument, like usual uh, usual argument like batch size and maybe not so usual number of CPU threads that we want to use and uh, device that we use, the device, so GPU that we want this pipeline to run on. Uh, this is useful when we have like uh, multiple GPUs in something like DGX or, or something like that. Then we need to build the pipeline. So this is sort of the initialization step that allocates all the buffers, uh, prepares everything and uh, fills some prefetch queues. Uh, so the pipeline is ready to, to be run and to provide some outputs. And finally, we can call pipeline run over and over and over again to get batches of data. And you can feed them manually to the uh, model, 
but we also provide uh, assortment of connectors for all of the popular deep learning frameworks, uh, as I showed before. Uh, okay, so this is the whole example. As I said, maybe it's not the uh, simplest, but it's actually a real life. Uh, and as you can see, like every line of this code, oops, uh, basically, basically corresponds to the, uh, can we go back to slides? I don't know if, I, oh, thanks. Uh, every line of this code basically corresponds to the uh, round box, which is a node in our um, pipeline. And every return value is a data that is returned one by one node and passed to, to another. Uh, and uh, I would like to point out as well that, that here we pass mixed uh, as a device and that just means that this node uh, has its inputs on the cpu and outputs on the gpu so this is this is the place where we move the preprocess we move the data from the gpu to the to the cpu uh, okay uh, after this simple example i would like to show you a couple of uh, more interesting technologies uh, available on the GPUs that Tally uses to make everything work. Uh, and one of them is NVJPEG. So NVJPEG is this like C library that basically has its, has its description as its name. It's NVIDIA uh, library to decode JPEGs. And it works on two levels. First level is that uh, it has some quite efficiently written CUDA kernels to decode JPEGs. Uh, of course, not all of the decoding uh, is suitable for parallelization, but the parts that are uh, were, were parallelized and, and uh, they use regular CUDA cores uh, and parallel processing. But since uh, Ampere, and A100, uh, some of the GPUs have this JPEG decode uh, unit. So this is like actually separate part of the die uh, that was specifically designed to decode JPEGs. And NVJPEG gives you access to this as well uh, if you have it on, on your GPU. And DALI uses uh, NVJPEG to accelerate JPEG decoding, since usually in 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 any DL preprocessing where you decode JPEG, this decoding is a significant significant part of the of the processing. Uh, and from the code perspective, this is very easy in DALI. You just use our image decoder and. Uh, if you say that it should output on the GPU, it will use NVJPEG uh, for the decoding. Another interesting uh, feature that that we we discovered is very useful, is that uh, even though this hardware unit is very fast, uh, we can still put some performance on top of that uh, because we have some spare cycles on CUDA cores. So some of the images can go uh, to regular CUDA cores. And to, so we have basically have these two decoders working in parallel. One is this hardware specific unit and the other is just regular uh, CUDA kernels. And this uh, additional argument hardware decoder load uh, can be used to basically load balance between the two. In this, uh, in this case, it's like 75% of the images will go to the, to the hardware unit. Uh, and basically this is just to uh, provide the user with the ability to fine tune because depending on what JPEGs you have, what are the sizes of the images, uh, optimal setting for this parameter will, will be different. Uh, and just to show some some performance graphs, basically in V100, uh, when there was only QDATI code, 
uh, we were able to hit around 2800 FPS uh, decoding JPEGs in this particular benchmark. Uh, and then moving to A100 and using only this hardware accelerator, uh, it rises to around 5K FPS. But as I said, we were able we are able to squeeze a bit more throughput on top of that when we have this uh, dual mode for both uh, decoders working uh, in tandem. And uh, this is the this is the last green bar on the right. Uh, okay, very similarly to NVJPEG, uh, Nvidia has something called Nvidia Video Codec SDK. Uh, and this is uh, basically existing for quite some time under different names, uh, but uh, maybe uh, maybe you didn't know that, but for quite some time, NVIDIA GPUs have uh, specific parts, uh, specific units on the dies to, uh, to decode and encode videos. Uh, and NVIDIA Video Codec SDK is basically the, the C++ library to control those units. Uh, and those units allow for like quite efficient hardware encoding and decoding. And uh, DALI uses uh, Video Codec SDK for video decoding. Uh, like alternatively, uh, Probably, if not that, you would be using something like FFmpeg to decode the videos and then feed them to the to the model. Uh, and again, just using our video reader, you have all of this uh, all of this uh, hardware working for you. Uh, and since uh, people who train models on the video. Uh, like to control which frames uh, want to in the model and what should be the spacing maybe we want to skip some frames this reader like provides all of this uh for you to to customize uh, i will show maybe a bit more how it works during the demo uh, just as a cherry on top of that uh, there's another another part of uh of GPU that maybe you were not aware of, and it's optical flow engine. Uh, so basically, this I think exists since Turing, uh, and it allows to calculate uh, optical flow with hardware acceleration. Uh, again, Dali just wraps it and has it ready for you in one uh, uh, simple operator called optical flow. Uh, and basically, for those unfamiliar, optical flow looks at adjacent frames and tries to figure out what change and what motion was depicted on the video. And again, like uh, FFmpeg or OpenCV have uh, algorithms to do that, but DALI allows you to do that on the GPU with hardware acceleration. Uh, Okay, so uh, another maybe interesting, more esoteric uh, technology that DALI gives you access uh, from Python is called NVIDIA GPU Direct Storage. Uh, and this technology uh, basically allows you to skip the uh, bounce buffer from the CPU when you load your data. So basically, regular in the regular situation uh we have this like right uh, left side uh diagram where you have some nvme drives or other drives for that matter you load data from the drives to the cpu memory and then you load it back via pci to the gpu and then you can do some processing and of course, if you don't plan to do any processing on the CPU, this uh, this intermediate stage of copying to RAM and then to GPU RAM is, is just a waste of time. So uh, GPU direct storage is a technology that allows you to skip that. And what you can do is you can directly load your data from the drives to the GPU. 
Uh, of course, you need not only GPU, but the whole box that supports that. Uh, so for example, something like DGX uh, will, will support that and you can sort of directly load data to GPU memory. Uh, in DALI, uh, we expose something called NumPy Reader, and this basically allows you to uh, save NumPy arrays as files on your drive, and then uh, you can load them directly as tensor to your GPU, maybe do some pre-processing, resizing, normalizing, uh, another, uh, another kind of transform, uh, and then you can load it to DL framework or just consume it in any other any other way. Um, okay, and with that, I think we can switch to the demo. Mm, okay, thanks a lot. Uh, okay, uh, I prepared simple demo to show some of those things in action. Uh, and as I said before, first step. Uh, is to import uh, something from DALI. Uh, here we have this uh, this function that defines our pipeline. Here I tried to keep it as simple as possible. So we have uh, some something that reads files from the drive, and then we have some uh, image decoder. Uh, and since we put mixed, it will be using NVJPEG under the hood to decode the images. And we return images and labels uh, from this pipeline. Uh, so let's define that. Mm, and now we are ready to create a pipeline object. And as you can see, something, something happened. Uh, and now there's this step that we need to build this pipeline for it to be ready uh, to be used. Uh, and now after calling run, images and labels are our outputs. So images um, looks like there's some decoded image uh, here. And I just would like to point out that this is something called tensor list GPU. Uh, and this data resides on the GPU. And uh, if we had like any other proper pre processing further, we could pass it directly on the GPU. Okay, he, here I just prepared some uh, simple matplotlib uh, showing functions to convince you that these are actually images uh, and we can pull them to the CPU if we want. So here are uh, lovely dogs. And uh, the same goes for video decoding. Uh, here I experiment a bit with those arguments that are used for uh, frame selection. Uh, next, usual DALI steps, some deprecation warning, uh, and we can run and show the videos since patch size is two. We got uh, two samples. So let's show the first one. Maybe those videos aren't that interesting as the dogs were, but we use them to make sure that we have all of the frames. And since I used stride two, as you can see, uh, we got every other frame. Uh, and uh, step is one, and this step is basically offset between the starts of the of the samples. So the second sample will also have every other frame, but starting from one. Uh, and that's uh, that's it for the video. And uh, now something I, I have not discussed uh, during the slides, DALI can also work with, with audio uh, because another important modality in, uh, in deep learning uh, is audio. Uh, so again, we define some pipeline. Here we have some audio decoder that returns audio and sampling rate. 
uh, we can run that. Another set of usual tally steps. We can run it. Uh, as you can see, we obtain some sampling grade of the audio sample that I, I, I have. Uh, and here, just to make sure we can do this simple visualization that probably there is some audio there. Uh, okay, I think that's that's end of a demo. So we can go back to, to the slides. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, okay, so uh, if you have any more questions about DALI, uh, we have quite extensive user guide online, which shows like there's a lot of tutorials and examples of everything that DALI can do. Uh, we have more um, more transforms, more operations that you can do on the data. The ones I picked to show you today, uh, I just picked them because I thought maybe they are not as well known and uh, maybe they might be useful and interesting to you. Uh, but DALI can also support all of the regular things that you might want with images or audio. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. We also have some like full end-to-end -end examples for various uh, DL networks. Uh, we have some uh, something for ResNet 50, YOLO, efficient that SSD. I think uh, we have something for super resolution on videos. So if you want to uh, check that out. Uh, please visit our our user guides, our docs, uh, and there's a lot more information there. Uh, and uh, just a side note, DALI is fully open source. So first, if you are interested uh, in how any of these things are implemented, you can go through the code uh, and look, for example, how we use uh, NVJPEG, how we use uh, Codec SDK, uh, how GDS is implemented, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if you have any questions and would like to get in touch with us, uh, we try, please leave us an issue on GitHub. We try to stay on top of that as much as we can. Uh, and uh, and the, in the end, if you are willing to contribute, we are very eager to accept community contributions. Uh, there is some list of things that you might want to do. Uh, so if you want to open a pull request, we would be happy to uh, to include this with Dali. Uh, OK, I think our time is up. So thanks. Thanks a lot for your time. Awesome. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Albert. Thank you for uh, joining us. Thank you for preparing the presentation. And uh, yeah, I guess uh, it's time for us to uh, to start our uh, Q&A session because we, we do have some questions for all of you. And a quick announcement before we start our Q&A session, the, uh, the giveaway, the, the raffle for the tickets and for the iPhone will happen at 5 p.m. Uh, GMT. So it will happen like in five hours or so. And uh, Nick, uh, who's our technical director, he will be uh, he will be basically helping us with with the giveaway. So if you have not entered the raffle yet, please join and let me uh, let me invite to the stage our speakers: Jay, Adam. Nice to see you. Brad, nice to have you back with us. So yeah, we have some interesting questions and uh, let's let's start. So, uh, and if the questions, if you think that you can actually contribute something to the answer of the question, and let's say it was question for Jay, and, but you still have some knowledge about this topic, you're welcome to, to join after the, uh, the original author of, of the presentation finishes his answer. So we'll, we'll start with Jay. So the question is, Jay, when would it make sense to use Django instead of InfluxDB plus Flask? 
Um, so I think that really sort of defend sort of depends on your preference and sort of what sort of boilerplates you want to use in order to develop your web server. I mean, sort of Django is is there to develop a, a as a source, like it, it's it's one way of doing things, but it does run into its own limitations. Um, Flask in itself is, you know, it, it's quite a raw way of developing a server and, you know, the endpoints behind it. So it's it's really to decide what sort of fits your product and your application. The, the things I was doing with Flask would relate over to integrations with InfluxDB and Django completely. Um, so you could use that as your as your background there. There are other boilerplates and there are other um, server backgrounds that you could use instead of Flask. It was just one very common example to, to use as your server background. I don't know if any of the rest of the guys have comments there. Yeah, I, I don't like to take preference over libraries too much. It really sort of depends on the developer's tool set. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the answer. And we have another question for Adam. Adam, how do SQL fragments for Miam look like? I don't remember you showing them. Sorry for my Miam was <laughs> not the right Miam. <laughs> My aim, my aim. It's a, <laughs> okay. it's a, it's a, it's a Hebrew word that that means water, and so the idea. Okay. Of hydration and water, kind of. That's where the word comes from. So okay, so uh, that's because I didn't actually show them. Um, so uh, you can just imagine um, a fragment would just sort of look like um, a you know select statement. Maybe you just have select, um, or maybe. You know, you're going to have uh, sort of nested. Um, you could have some nested queries or something like that. So you would just think of it as some small subsection of of what the query will, will look like, whether it's just a where clause, a join statement, something like that, that you would stash that away in some sort of file so that you could reuse it in multiple places and uh, sort of compose them. OK. Um, I think. Um, if you do take have a chance to take a look at the documentation online, uh, it should have some examples of what that looks like. I didn't put them in the presentation though. Okay, so I believe this this one, uh, this one is uh, hmm. okay. So th this one is for our last uh, presentation, I believe, and I guess everyone can share their opinion. Please share your opinions about. Uh, systems on a chip like M1, M2 for, uh, from Apple and uh, their dedicated ML cores and uh, things like, uh, I believe th this is what we discussed with Albert and uh, uh, another presentation from Jacob um, using JPU. And what about dedicated cores? What's your opinion on that? Cool, love it. More, more dedicated ML hardware, the better. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but like that's just my like personal opinion. And for example, we also on the GPUs have like tensor cores, so it looks like the whole industry industry goes a bit that way. I personally think it's it's cool. Uh, so so that's it for me. Probably not the super uh, super interesting answer to that. So, so the question the the question was during the when you were showing this whole uh, the graph where the you have the the MVME and then you have the memory and how it like so the, the yeah. I, I believe the question is uh, related yeah. to this since you have the SOC and you have the memory and everything in one package. So. Yeah, yeah. Pro, pro, like for example, you can do that multiple ways, and I think that in some cases it does make sense. For example, if you are on the edge, you might use something like, uh, like an SOC and that works very well. Maybe uh, if you need like, if you have like huge data center and you are not as much interested in uh, latency as you are with the general throughput, maybe it's not uh, that useful at the moment because software needs to, uh, needs to catch up a bit. But yeah, generally, I think it's the, the more various technologies we can use, the better. So we can fit it to the to the particular case that we have. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that's 
that makes sense. Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Anyone else? Adam, Jay, Brad? That's above my pay grade. <laughs> Anecdotally, I'm super happy with the M1. That's actually what I run as my main main computer is the M1 Mac. And um, I'm surprised at, yeah, how how good it is. Like, I actually, I play games on it sometimes, and I'm surprised how uh, it, it actually holds up for a, for a MacBook Air. Cool, cool. Okay, so let's let's continue with another question. It's going to be a long one, and I will need your help to identify because the, the this one I believe is still for for Albert or maybe for Jacob. But I believe Albert will uh, will be able to 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 answer this one. So, part one of the question out of three. So I was unable to get it right. Is there a way to keep code in the GPU for an extended period of time and then send a stream of data to process and then getting results? I understand that it's always about copying bytes and not about running a function and returning the results of it. However, I didn't get if I can just have a generator in Python and then being able to stream all for processing as it's being generated. <laughs> okay, so it looks to me like something about uh, various ways to run GPU code uh, from Python, right? Because the, the previous presentation was about that. Uh, and basically, I would say that from my experience, any kind of copy of anything from the GPU to the CPU is a big no-no uh, if you want to do something in a performant way. Uh, and I guess the specific question depends on the specific technology that you are using, right? Because there are a couple of ways uh, to write GPU code from Python. There's like uh, Namba, uh, there's PyCUDA, there's uh, QPy, uh, there is uh, Tally, if, if you will. There's it's, it's some way of writing the uh, GPU code on, from Python. So like to specific answer, we I think we would have to have the specific code sample. Uh, but basically, a lot of those technologies works like you do some scheduling on the CPU and the data goes straight from one GPU part to the other, to another, to another, because that's the, the performant way to do it. So I guess that sort of maybe is a partial answer to the <laughs> multi-partial question. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, OK, so can we just directly upload to S3? What do you say, Brad? Uh, yeah, well, there's multiple ways to directly upload to S3. So I guess if you're using the um like aws cli for example um you can upload files to csv um but from a notebook if you were to use the um export snippet and i'm have it i guess detailed in the readme is that yes you can from a um jupyter notebook um as long as you have all the the permissions and credentials set up you can um export or you can upload directly to s3 I guess sort of the, the purpose of the project was to show sort of some more of the automation you could do using the same tools within the AWS um, ecosystem. But yeah, no problem at all. You should just um, split out some of the code that I wrote from the automation and use the snippets in your own sort of um, to help you get there as well. Okay, thanks. Uh... Okay, I, I believe this is the part of question to Adam, uh, but we will have to guess. Is there anything else besides this this line? What about using a NoSQL? Um, so that's actually that's a good question. So uh, I have had some requests from people to add Cassandra support. Uh, so I've looked into it a little bit. I don't know 
very much at all about Cassandra, but uh, I've been asked to do it, and, and and from what I can tell, it would be pretty trivial to add. So I'll probably add that to my roadmap at some point uh, in the near future. Um, same thing goes from for other um, um, you know sources. It, it, really, the idea is is that anything where you're going to have some sort of uh, of a statement where you're you're issuing some sort of a statement against a database, it'll be able to support that. Um, I've played around with it also sort of using um, like JSON query against, you know, big JSON blobs and stuff like that. Uh, I haven't released anything specifically towards that, but it's definitely on the roadmap and, and it, it's pretty, pretty extensible. So uh, at some point there'll probably be a lot more NoSQL stuff in there, mm -hmm. but awesome. right now it's all, it's all SQL based. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Here's Actually, another one. Actually, it looks to oh. me that that Cassandra is picking up some traction because uh, some time ago we got a uh, community contribution with Cassandra support for DALI. So probably something interesting yeah. happening there. Yeah, I, I mean, I sort of, you know, the, the queries, you know, kind of look like SQL and I mean, they kind of operate for, for, from, from what I can tell somewhat similarly. Um, so adding support for that um, also, um, I used to do a lot of work with, um, you know, a couple of different graph databases. Um, so uh, I definitely have that that in, in my mind of, you know, it, it's really sort of a matter of, of just finding the right drivers for it. So, so right now, um, I guess maybe one thing I didn't really explain is that uh, it doesn't sort of ship with any of the drivers itself. So the idea is you would go and install PsychoPG or, you know, um, um, so AIO SQLite, or you know, one of those one of those sort of async available um, drivers to that would give you the access, and then it just uses those under the hood to to. Um, um, so, if there's an async driver, it, it'll it'll work. Thank you. Yep. Uh, okay. Question for Jay: Is there an extension for PyCharm as Flux is for VS Code? I'll keep this short. Sadly, not at the moment, guys. So VS Code was our first sort of jump at this. Um, we kind of wanted to see what the community thought about it first, and that was our decision. VS Code was an easy win. It's really simple to create an extension for VS Code. Um, but if there's enough need for PyCharm, then, you know, drop it, like send us an issue, um, and we'll have a look at seeing what it takes to create an extension for PyCharm. OK, quick answer, then another one for you. Uh, how does InfluxDB handle aggregations over bucketed time periods, week, month, years, etc.? Is it still optimized for analytics over streaming data? So absolutely. So I mean, the the, the way so we store data is a column away. We're storing data on disk. I mean, we handle frequencies of thousands, a hundred thousands of metrics per second into InfluxDB. The idea is correct here, though, is the fact that as you start dealing with your historic data over time, you start providing, uh, providing aggregations and windows on your data. So you might say, OK, well, if I'm taking data in every second, um, but, you know, it, it makes sense for the plant here is that I don't actually need to know about my plant's health every second of every day. So I could maybe roll it up into a day's average or I could roll it up into, you know, the maximum or lowest for that. So you can look at aggregating your data over time. And, you know, I mean, that's a day science worst nightmare, I know, but it just really depends on the, the scope of your data. Um, other things you can look at if you need like streaming uh, and use the same capabilities rather than not just looking at your historical data. You can also look at Compassitor from InfluxDB as well. There, that's more live streaming. But if you want to handle real time streaming data, then I highly just recommend keeping that within your Python code and looking something at sort of, you know, looking at forecasting opportunities with TensorFlow or something like, you know, uh, the stats model library. Um, keeping those real-time things within your Python code would definitely be more performant. Thank you. Uh, this one is for Adam. Is it possible to get an S3 bucket for free, say for practice purposes? Maybe you happen to know. Or this one is not for Adam. This one is yeah. for Brad, I believe. Uh, yes, yeah, so AWS actually offers a really good 12-month um, free tier package 
So you can sign up. You do have to put your credit card down, but you get um, access to a lot of their services free for 12 months. So, um, for example, you can essentially have an EC2 instance. So one of their servers um, running the entire year. It's a micro, but it still sort of does the basics. Um, I think uh, after my free tier service um, expired and I run multiple systems, I'm only paying four or five US dollars a month for the services there. So... Um, yeah, definitely jump on, have a look at the free tier. It's um, it's pretty fun to start playing with with some of the cloud tech. And if you do want to spend some money sort of straight off the bat as you can spin up anything you want, um, you usually got to tick the little disclaimers to say that you accept the, the risks. But um, yeah, it's all available there um, pretty much from the get-go. Okay, okay. So uh, this one is for Adam. Uh, if the Maim supports Oracle databases or not? Um, good question. Um, I don't really know too much about Oracle. Um, I've never worked with it so. But um, again, if there's a if there's an async driver that's out there, uh, it's probably you know a twenty minute pull request for somebody to get it to get it working. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we have another. This is just a, a comment. Flask has real bare bones. I like it over Django's huge learning curve. <laughs> so, just a, just an opinion, not n not a question. So, okay, um, Albert, we have another question for you. How do I deploy this libraries in containers if I need to run it in clouds? functions or API? Uh, okay, so uh, basically uh, NVIDIA releases uh, something called, we call them containers, but there is a long name that you can Google. And basically we provide uh, Docker containers for various DL frameworks like TensorFlow, PyTorch, MXNet. I think we are starting with uh, some Jack support, and basically this is the this is a ready to use container. It has all of these things installed and configured, uh, and for example, it has Dali, but it's, it also has all of the other libraries that you might want in DL uh, DL workflow, and it has uh, optimized version optimized version of the of the um, DL framework, so like NVIDIA TensorFlow, which is optimized for GPU support. Uh, and it even has some ready to use samples that you can start with. Uh, so Google uh, NVIDIA Deep Learning Containers uh, or something called NGC, which is the registry that we use to distribute them. And you mm -hmm. should be good to go. All right, and this is a blitz question, I guess. Dali can probably be used only with NVIDIA hardware, right? Uh, it can be used with, uh, we, we also have something called a CPU only mode. So you can, if you don't have GPU, uh, you can do everything more or less on the CPU, barring the fact that some things like NVJPEG, NVIDIA code and stuff like that are not available. Uh, but uh, this is, aimed mostly for uh, people who want to do some development on some machine without the GPU and then deploy it to the to some kind of hardware that supports GPU. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's sort of the answer to that question. All right. So uh, another one for Brad. Where is the work uploaded to in the Lambda S3 bucket version? If there is a size limit on Lambda, I'm not sure I understand what those limits now are. And this is the second part. Is it just RAM and pandas uh, is loaded differently and the data is just streamed? Can Here's you go back the first. to the first question yeah. read it again? Um, so what it, what it comes down to is the, the application has a limit um, using layers of 262 megabyte, I believe it is. Um, so I think they they came out and said it was something in regards to to better performance in cold starts, um, but they are essentially saying that the the project um, the total size of the project can't be above two hundred and sixty 
um, Meg, including the dependencies for it to be run um, in that way, which is just a layer. It's just one way of adding um, the Python dependencies. So if you actually design an application, you want to run serverless that is above um, the 262 meg limit, you just you just build it into a container and you can actually run Lambda off. Um, is it? It's ECR, I believe it is, Elastic Container Registry, where you can actually store your container and just um, every time Lambda run it, it, it invokes from there. So there, there is workarounds. It's just for the um, easy, I guess, way of doing it with the Py Python CDK. Um, um, AWS Data Wrangler just isn't isn't fit for purpose. But if you wanted to build a, a Docker image um, with it and upload it to the AWS account, then yeah, that's that's fine if you're going above it. All right. And since shots were taken, how about this? Oof, oof. <laughs> um, I guess the the biggest reason I. I hate Jupyter Notebook is the fact <laughs> that um, just the lack of ability to use it in any other situation. So, for example, if you have multiple um, analysts or um, people working on a project and one person has written it in nice, beautiful Python code and someone um, writes it in a, a Jupyter Notebook, um, you're essentially <laughs> stuck with their their code depend uh, their code as it is. So I know there's libraries that you can actually um, sort of get get the Jupyter Notebook back to Python code, um, but it just means that you're sort of forced to use their, um, the, the notebook rather than sort of your preferred um, IDE to, to run with it. So I just find it's most people get um, caught in it and can't leave, whereas as soon as you actually sort of, I guess, code more in in proper IDEs with linting um, and sort of code snippets, um, you just realize how easy it is, whereas Jupyter Notebook is just like a shackle um, to sort of hold you back in coding. But that's just my provocative um, provocative opinion, I guess. Adam, your opinion on Jupyter. <laughs> um, well, so my main work is all building web applications so i i uh you know when i'm building something almost always i want to build up i want to spin up uh uh a server and then start hitting with a with you know an api client or something like that so i have almost no use for them whatsoever but <laughs> i i don't know that i would go so far that to say that i hate them or what i mean you know going back even to the conversation about you know django versus flask uh whatever it, it's you know, they're, they're different tools that provide different purposes, right? So, so you, you find you find what works for you for your solution for what is the task at hand right now. Um, you know, maybe tomorrow you're going to have something different. Uh, so, so having multiple tools under your belt, I think, is is always a good thing. Um, you know, the the success of the project obviously, you know, um, shows its value. Um, I, purposely, I just don't have any use for them. Okay. Uh, okay, maybe uh, maybe Jay, you have something about this, and Albert, just to to hear the opinion of everyone. Yeah, so it's quite an interesting one because we actually built an alternative into InfluxDB, which is like it looks like Jupyter Notebooks, and it's just quite an interesting thing to see what developers want if they want to use it or not. But um, I've always seen it quite as an academic tool. Like, so it's for people that don't want to, this is the way I see it anyways, that didn't want to really get into the crooks of developing real sort of production ready Python code or samples. And they wanted to be able to provide examples of how their parts of their code might, might work or show off visualizations or data modifications. Um, and so it's quite academic in its approach, um, but yet, I understand it's it's a brilliant way of showing people quick examples of things running and you can play with it. Um, but yeah, in terms of, tran I, I agree, in terms of transferring it into anything where you can use it in terms of a real application, then you're basically copy and pasting potentially Python line codes out and trying to build your own application from it. So that's, yeah, I completely get the idea of it not being quite as transferable as other applications. Albert, maybe you're here to save the Jupiter. <laughs> uh, uh, like in my regular work, I 
write a lot of C++, so <laughs> not Jupyter-friendly environment. But actually, we have some interesting use for Jupyter in DALI because Jupyter is how we generate our docs. We have like Jupyter notebooks uh, and we run them in CI. Uh, and that's why we make sure that our code samples are staying current and working. And then we're just using Sphinx transform these uh, render Jupyter notebooks to the, to the docs that we publish. So I think that's, it's definitely over complicated, but cool <laughs> solution. That is so, a pretty cool solution. Like, like you always, you always see like there's always, you know, a problem when you're when you're generating documentation for for a project is is how do you make sure that the code snippets are always up to date? And, and that's a common common thread that I, you, you see open source maintainers talking about all the time. So that's pretty that's pretty cool. Okay, so we have a question for Jay. Can we use InfluxDB for e-commerce application in which we need some timestamp information like which product has more orders in particular time? So, so yeah, so this, this comes back to my age old question of using the right database for the right use. So the, in terms of what you're asking to do with InfluxDB, which is more of an analytical approach of looking at your time, your data over time for e-commerce, then definitely other times when people go, hey, can I fit my e-commerce use case into InfluxDB and use InfluxDB as a sole backend? Um, I would be like, no, use something like NoSQL, even SQL to, to build out the, the rest of your backend. It really depends on using the right database in the right situation. Um, and that's the power. That's the great thing about using Flux is we actually support SQL as well and also support CSV ingest. So you don't just have to use InfluxDB as a backend. You can also use other mm -hmm. data sources in conjunction with your time series data. So again, it does really boil down to using the right database for the right situation. Um, for looking over your information, like which products have more orders in a particular time. Yeah, so I mean that you're analyzing your time series data over time there. So yeah, that's stuff something InfluxDB would definitely be able to do quite quickly um, through Flux functions. Mm -hmm. And another quick one, uh, is it possible to use RESTful, RESTful architecture? So I think we tried answering this in the chat if I sort of kind of came back to it. And I think it might have just been a sort of a clarity thing. So essentially what we was doing with Flask there was building out um, of like I, I showed a very simple example of saying you were going to use a right endpoint and we're going to post to this right endpoint. So we are building out a RESTful architecture. Um, there's lots more that you can do. And I was using a very minimal example to, to get that that across to writing sensor data to the Flask server. Um, so, so, so yes, essentially. Um, I don't know, Adam, you're the, the web developer expert here. So is there anything you wanted to add to that one? No, no. So, okay, we have uh, two more questions for Albert and then we have a couple of general questions. So Albert, what what's the link to the Jupyter page for us to try? Uh, so okay. So okay, <clears throat> okay. So and... I, I, I maybe I can answer that as well. I, I encourage to go to the docs because the Jupyter I prepared is a bit sketchy, and I just uh, I just put some data together on my PC. But uh, this uh, user guide that I showed it has a lot of Jupyter notebooks with various uh, more detailed information. So I can I encourage to to go there. Okay, and the another one is that we automatically load the data from data source to NVIDIA GPU and run processing there. Yep, that's that's the the main gist of of Dali. Uh, if you configure everything correctly, which should be not that difficult, it should run like that. Yes. So and uh, this one, I believe the the answer is. Pretty simple. It's i5, but I wanted to validate it with all of you. Okay, so another one. What ID do you prefer for Python and why? Just a quick blitz answers. So I use I use VS Code, but it's only because I'm stuck there because I can't find a theme that I like for for Emacs, which is where I really <laughs> would rather be. All right. 
Yeah, agreed. VS Code just just for extensibility and the amount of community plugins there are. Brad, uh, I agree with VS Code. Um, that's where I sort of build a lot of architecture. But if I'm doing data um, analytics, I'll be using Spider, which is the um, IDE for Anaconda. Okay, Albert. Yep, I use VS Code as well, mostly because like we have mixed C++, CUDA, Python code base, so it can mix all of that together and supports even across language debugging, which is super cool feature for projects like, like ours. Cool, cool. Thank you, everyone. This is, this is it. We have another question, but we're out of time. Very intense Q&A session. We need to have a short break before the, before the next uh, block of speakers. Uh, and thank you very much, Brad, Albert, Jay, Adam, and uh, so uh, Albert, if you happen to be in communication with Jacob, please uh, send them our regards and thank you for the presentation, for the first presentation that we had. Of course. And yeah, we, we will hopefully see you next year uh, at our PyCon, uh, well, uh, our PyGeagle. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you everyone once again for, for joining us and for the presentation. Have a nice, uh, have a nice day, everyone. Thank Thanks a lot. Bye. All righty. And we're going to have a three to five minute break. And after that break, we're going to have another block of uh, talks and we will have a new moderator, uh, Shahil. And uh, yeah. From here, I would like to say thank you, everyone, for joining us. And uh, yeah, look for the uh, for the link uh, uh, to register for the giveaway uh, because uh, it's it's a good uh, chance to get yourself a ticket for one of the conference. So you can pick uh, whichever you like. So you can pick software architecture, or maybe QA, or maybe React if you're doing any kind of development besides Python. So yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and let's have a short break. Also, we want to say a huge thank you to our friends from Scout for joining us once again and sponsoring this event. And as the application engineer landscape continues to evolve, the state of observability has become more and more exciting. With tools like Scout, you can get insights into your stack without having to be an observability expert. So with open telemetry, with a new open source project providing an unified standard for telemetry data, such as metrics, traces, and logs. Now, with the open telemetry, Scout is building a new observability platform to help simplify telemetry data into actionable insights and is now accepting beta testers. If you want to know more about open telemetry and become a beta tester for Scout's new observability product, go to scoutamp.com slash observability to learn more and participate. Link is in the chat.
Whether you're developing apps for healthcare, IoT, finance, or the cloud, the only relevant data is time series data. Any data with a timestamp is time series data. Take stock prices, for example. When you place a trade, that happens at a specific price and at a random interval. The price of the trade is an event. If instead of these trades, we check the stock price every 10 minutes, we'd have metrics like this. InfluxDB handles both, giving you all the flexibility you need for your apps. Tracking events and metrics is the best way to get accurate information. If you only collect metrics in an interval and something happens in between, you'll miss it. If you only track events, you might think major swings are happening when they're really just anomalies. You can also generate metrics by averaging at an interval between events. Today, virtually every sensor, computer, system, and application generates timestamp data. InfluxDB enables you to easily collect and act on that data, improving your time to awesome. Learn how at www.influxdata.com. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone enjoying the event so far. So uh, uh, let's, uh, wherever you are from the world, good evening, good afternoon, and uh, good evening. So let's enjoy the next speaker. So he's a Thomas Nebayer. Uh, he's a CTO of uh, Quicks.ai, the top uh, from the Czech Republic. The topic he's going to cover is live build of a Python service that tracks, transforms, and delivers heart rate data in a real time using the open source components. So let me introduce the Thomas on the stage. Hello, Hello Thomas, everyone. how are you? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm really great. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, you ready for also... the you ready for the talk? Yes, uh, I think that we have forgot Javi, which is uh, who is speaking with me today. Okay. Here I am. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Javier. So I will do, I'm just going to share the, I think one of the slide one, right? Slide yes. one? Yes. Okay. So Javier and Thomas, are you all ready? We are. Okay. No worries. So I will hand it over to you. And the stage is yours. Thank you. Amazing. Then, hi, everyone. And welcome to the most heartbreaking demo ever. Because we are going to see today how to work with real-time data, but not just any real-time data. I'm right here wearing a hard one. This is monitoring my heartbeat. So that's the data we are going to be working with uh, to test how to do transformations on real-time data on the spot. I am Javier Blanco. I'm the senior data scientist at Quix. And in this demo we will be doing today, I'm going to play the role of a data scientist. And I have Thomas here with me today. So, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Thomas, uh, CTO and co-founder of Quix. And previously, I worked in MacRam, uh, where I was connecting F1 cars. And I will be a data engineer slash software engineer um persona in this in this demo nice so i said we were gonna talk we were gonna work with real-time data specifically my heartbeat so for that we are gonna be using a streaming technologies and for those of you listening who don't know much about streaming we have prepared a little presentation to go through the basic concept and the traditional way to present a streaming is as opposed to the more used batch approach. So let's think of that river that you see over there as some data flowing. So any system in your company that is generating data in real time, like uh, your clients or your customers have just accessed your app, that's generating data in real time. And that's our river over there. In a traditional batch approach, we will be storing that water into a bucket, uh, somewhere static, and then throwing it to a bigger place, to a lake, where we do the processing. 
That is, in batch approaches with batch processing, a set of data is collected over time, and then it is fed into the analytic systems for processing. However, in a streaming processing approach, we sort of build um, a pipe between the river and, and the next place. So we process the data piece by piece. As it is produced piece by piece, we process the data. Let's think in this um, comparison just one slide more. So here you have an aggregation operation. Uh, at the beginning, you see the raw data coming in. And under the traditional batch approach, we will first load the data into a database and then access that data to process it and do the aggregation operation that we are looking for. However, in the, the streaming approach, as soon as we get a new piece of raw data coming in, we are able to aggregate it. So there's no one better than the other, as in many cases, just different applications for each. When you need the historic data, the batch approach is going to do good for you because you will have all the historic static data for you to uh, train a machine learning model, do some transformations that require historic data. And it's also quite easy to work with data that is static. However, if you want to react to the data fast, uh, then you need to go for a streaming because we are not inserting any de delay there. Also, streaming can be lighter as it uses less resources in the storing and loading. That's an introduction to streaming. And now that we know about that, uh, we have quick focus on streaming. So Thomas, since you were there as a founder, can you tell us a bit more about what is Quicks? Yeah, thank you, Javi. So basically in MacRam, me and my fellow co-founders, we were connecting F1 cars to the cloud. So engineers of different type can react on data fast in real time in a factory, whatever the, the race was happening, and uh, send their decisions back to the garage to do things. Now, uh, that was quite challenging uh, use case because we were sending uh, roughly 30 million values per minute per car. Uh, and we quickly find out that none of the database solutions that are available will handle the data for storing and uh, querying at the same time. So we, we landed on the streaming tech, and this is where we learn um, Kafka. We learn how to use Kafka and Kubernetes together. And this is where our passion to streaming really began. And um, we also saw some of the difficulties which um, are we going to discuss today. So um, our approach to uh, streaming is, and Javi, can you move the slide? Yeah, so our, our approach to uh, solving a real-time application is, first of all, using a microservice approach, uh, a pattern that is, for more than a decade, quite uh, uh, established in software engineering teams. But it is not really in data teams, and um, and it has its own benefits. So that's why we propagating it. Then a, a marriage of Kafka, Kubernetes, and Python. Now uh, Python is a language for um, data uh, driven problems. There's a uh, lots of libraries, a machine learning like ecosystem is living there, um, and it's quite easy language to learn. So that's why we chose. Python as well. Although having said that, um, it's not the only option. Um, so can I get on the slide? Um, so the number one um, concept to graphs to understand streaming is to understand pop and sub service. Uh, pop and sub service is subscribing to input variables, loading those into memory, do any sort of transformation that could be very simple normalization. It could be um, data cleaning, data filtering, uh, up to calling ML model um, uh, inside. And then 
publishing the result to the output topic. That means that this service really doesn't care how it are coming into, this, into the system and who or what will do with the output. The only sole responsibility is to transform this input to the output. Now, why this is a good idea? Well, first of all, it's a very scalable solution. Now, it scales in terms of transform, trans, uh, transform, uh, sorry, um, sending data over because input topic and output topic is in actually in real scenario composed from smaller topics. We call them partitions. So imagine that this topic could have 8, 16, 32 partitions under the hood. And those partitions are redistributed in a cluster of, of a different node in Kafka. That means that data coming in are distributed to different machines. And if you have more data, you just add more partitions and more nodes into your broker. And you scale pretty much uh, unlimited to horizontally to more and more load. The same uh, is for the output topic. And then you have compute scaling in the middle. So Kafka has a system of consumer groups where you can deploy your service multiple times and it will, Kafka will assign a portion of partitions to each instance. So imagine in this case, if you would have, for example, nine partitions on both sides, each instance would have three partitions to handle. So if you would have um, uh, a 90 streams coming into this system, each partition will have 10 of those streams, roughly. And, and this is how you scale the whole pipeline as you go. Another advantage of pop and sub approach and a combination of Kafka and Kubernetes is this very fault tolerant system, both from getting data between the systems and microservices, but also in terms of compute. So first of all, um, Kafka allows you to set replica system on each topic, which means that each partition will be actually sent twice, three times. So if you have an underlying hardware failure, the other nodes will take the job and streaming will be ensured. Equally, if you have a hardware failure or maybe even bug in your code, in a compute, Kubernetes will restart the service. And until that happen, the others will take the load of the restarting service. It is also resilient because topics have queue system in, in them where you can say, OK, I want to keep data in this topic for 24 hours, which means that if, if you have any sort of downtime, like your services are not processing, you will never lose requests as you would with API. They will just be processed later. So if you order the food and you have two minutes downtime in, a, in your backend, the food order would be sent to the restaurant just two minutes later. It will not be lost. And um, this is basically um, working all together to, to give you a very resilient system that is not sensitive to spikes in, your, in, a, in, a, in the usage, because again, we have a queue system in place. So always in the worst scenario, it will just take longer to process. And, um, and it's going to be the, the backbone of what I'm going to show you right now. Cool. So before we go further, uh, let's discuss how the following project that we're going to build here with Javi would look in a batch scenario. So we're going to build this um, uh, application that's going to take the heart rate from Javi's um, sensor and send it to the phone to the system. And we're going to calculate calories that he is burning by sitting over there um, real time. Now, in an old batch scenario, we will send this data to the database and then use some Spark type of framework to load the data in batches, calculate the calories, and send it probably to some another database where it will be collected by some backend API. Now, we're going to do this differently. So um, 
first of all, uh, can you probably move a bit further? So first of all, we're going to send data from the phone into our system. And I'm going to share my screen. And hopefully, you're going to be able to see that. Um, Cool. So I hope you can see it. Uh, it's, yeah, that seem, seems like it. So um, here we have a mobile application gateway, which is just a WebSocket interface for the phone that Javi is now having on his desk. And here you can see that we are getting data from the phone. It is um, around one kilobyte per second. I can also look at the messages here where I'm getting certain data from that phone. I can export the output in our visualization so I can get the stream here, which is uh, Javi's phone. And first of all, I can get the GeForce data. So Javi, if you would please just shake your phone. There we are. So um, you see that uh, data coming from the phone. If you put it on the desk, it's calm again. Another interesting sensor data is his heart rate. So right now, uh, his heart rate is 88. Very good. So this is how you get data into the platform. And um, this is actually a topic in a Kafka uh, that we're looking at right now. And we have proven the, the live connectivity. But to build really anything, we need to see the bigger picture. We need to be able to analyze the data quality. Um, what we're actually getting, what features we're getting there, and etc. For that, you can go to topics, and here you can enable um, persistence on this topic. And at that moment, um, it will give you um, this data catalog. And if I go to a uh, phone data, here we can see that there's 80, 28 minutes long stream that. Javi was streaming, um, so he started a bit earlier than the actual um, um, session. And here I can see the same parameters. So if I get a heart rate, there we are. So at certain point, he reached 115, and the lower was 82. This is using influx DB under the hood. By the way, that was the previous session and other databases as well, because kind of there's not a single bullet for all data types. So based on the what you sent, we save it to different databases. And then um, you can also, with a click of a button, get this code into Jupyter Notebook. So if I go to uh, a call-up and uh, Open the Jupyter Notebook here and just press this button. The same, um, the same code will, sorry, the same data will be loaded into Panda data frame in this uh, Jupyter Notebook. And then you can do any sort of analysis, uh, visualization, or you can use it for model training uh, and create a pickle files. So here you see that we have heart rate in Panda frame and time sent to it. Cool. So that we are almost almost there to understand the data. So imagine we did the analysis. And now we're going to start building in memory pipeline. The good thing is, as I'm going to show you um, in the slides here, the good thing is that although the data are now coming to the database, to build this pipeline, we don't need a database. It's no longer in the middle of the architecture. It's just serve a purpose of historic view. But we're going to build everything in memory. Now, Javi will show you how to build actually calories. I just want to here create an empty template, what I was trying to explain to you in the previous slides, of a pop and sub service. So here, we have a library, which is open source. Um, repository in GitHub that basically contains a template code that will be pre-configured for your infrastructure. 
and therefore it will be ready to go. So if I save this, I'm getting a Git project, which I can clone locally and use the Visual Studio Code, for example, and debug it line by line locally. Or if I don't want to do that, um, I can also use this Kubernetes powered development environment, which gives me all the runtime and SDKs I need for Python. It has a pip uh, uh, system in it. And then I can have, I have autocomplete and running capabilities. So for example, if I now gonna run this code without a single line of code, this will be connecting, there we are, to Kavi's phone. And if I stop it for a moment, you can see here a column heart rate 81. So it is now without any coding working uh, with this um, stream. You can check the messages or data lineage if you want. And the last thing I want to explain before I hand over to Javi is if you can read this and I will make it a bit bigger. Um, the all magic really is in this method. Here, we're getting on input a Panda data frame with the data, with all the columns that you saw in the visualization. Then we do any sort of transformation here. And then the modified frame, we output here to the output. Our library called Quicks SDK will deserialize, serialize, encrypt all of the data for you so you just basically concentrate on what to do with the data. So thank you very much. And Javi, can you please take over and um, build the calories calculation? Thank you. Sure. Um, yeah, I'd like to share my screen now. Um, can someone from the organization do that? There we are. Nice. Thank you. So. Let's recap on what Thomas has just built. We have now some real-time data coming in from uh, my phone. We saw that it was real-time, we visualized it, and we saw how to store the data if we need it. We also saw that we could react to that data and do some transformation. And that's what we're going to uh, focus on right now. And as Thomas said before, I'm going to try to calculate the calories that I'm burning. Uh, by no means I'm an expert in this field. In, in calculating the energy that we spend. But uh, there are two main ways in which we spend energy. One is just by keeping alive, uh, respiration, thermoregulation, all those inner process take lots and lots of energy. And then we also spend energy moving. So without going into much detail, there is this Nox et al formula that gives you the amount of calories spent um, over a minute considering an average heart rate. So we are going to use this formula. Um, for that, I'm going to create a new transformation that will read from this data. So I'm going to add new transformation. And this is the place where Thomas was before. This is the open source library where you can contribute. And um, the idea of this library is to make a streaming developing as easier as it can be. So here, for instance, we have this interpolation item. Now preview the code. Uh, I'm gonna call it, uh, yeah, interpolation. This is going to be listening to the phone data topic that we saw before. It's going to be output into phone data heart, and it's going to be interpolating over the heart rate parameter. I have the documentation here. But basically, I'm going to just hit deploy. And this is building a microservice for me, with me having to, to care about anything. Now, what have I just done? Uh, what I have just done is um, a necessary step since we are working with real-time data. If we were working with a batch of data, that is, if we were reading data from a database, we will have all my heart rate points at different timestamps. And we could calculate the time deltas uh, just with a window operation. So T2 minus T1, T3 minus T2, and the average heart rate will be also very simple. However, 
with the streaming data, we only have the latest point of data available. So what that library element that I have just selected is doing is, is keeping in memory just the amount of information that it needs to perform the calculation. So in T2, it's keeping information from T1, and it uses that to calculate the time delta and interpolate the parameter selected. In T3, uh, it will do the same, but we don't need T1 anymore. In T4, we don't need T2 any, anymore. So we are reacting to the data as soon as it is produced, uh, and we are keeping in memory just the little amount of information that we need. Whilst I was telling you this, we see that working. We see that at least it has deployed. It seems to be um, incoming some data, now putting some more. And if we click the messages, you will see that uh, this is the type of data that is coming in. Heart rate. And now this is the type of data that is going out. We don't just have the heart rate, but also the delta time in seconds and the interpolated heart rate, which was exactly what we needed. Now let's do a final transformation, and we will use these delta times and the average heart rate to calculate the calories over, over each of those delta times. I'm going to start with an empty transformation. So yeah, I'm going to select Python, and I'm going to go for this empty template. And in this case, I'm going to edit the code. I'm going to call this calorie calculation. And this is going to be listening to phone data hard. And it's going to be outputting two hard calories. These are topic names, Kafka topics, that we are listening and outputting to. Now, I'm going to paste here doing that magic sum function. And if you recall the formula that we saw in the slides, this is exactly it. This is a very simple Python function that will use the average heart rate over a period of time and that time delta to give you back the estimated amount of calories burned. With that there, I'm going to do some more copy and pasting to ease the process. So, um, copy. So what is going on? As you see, we are reacting to the new data here in line 19. First, we are using the parameters in this data frame, because by the way, the, the data coming in is transformed to a data frame to ease the, the transformation. And we are calculating the calories with some of the columns in that data, as we saw earlier, and the function that we have just created. Then I'm printing that into the console. I'm adding a new column to my data frame with the amount of calories burned that we just calculated and printed. And then just like that in line 45, I'm outputting to the output Kafka topic. So I'm going to commit this code and I'm going to hit run. And if everything has gone right, we will just see there in the screen, there we are, this is this is it. This is the amount of energy I am burning now as we speak. We are calculating the calories that I'm burning without them to go through any database. Here we are. And that finishes our quick intro to streaming. Um, I think uh, this is a field with enormous potential. We hope you have enjoyed it. If you do, um, please check the link. Um, feel free to sign up in our free developer account. Our nice colleagues from marketing have prepared a nice bonus. So if you sign up following that code, you will basically have twice the typical amount of free credit, which means you will be able to build anything you want. So thank you for listening. Um, that's it for us. Yeah, if you have any questions, we are here to answer them. Thank you very much, Thomas and Javier. It was a fantastic and insightful talk. So I hope everyone enjoyed it.
uh, if anyone has any questions, please type it into the Q&A box. So we will having a dedicated Q&A section after a couple of speakers. So thank you very much, Thomas and Javier. Thank you very much for your wonderful time. So we are going to get the new speaker on board. So the next speaker uh, is just a second. So the next speaker, yeah. So the next speaker is Boyan Milatic from Serbia. Uh, he is a CEO of the Soft Terrific. So the topic he is going to cover is getting started with async. So let's welcome Boyan on the stage. So hello, Boyan. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing great. How are you? Are you are you excited for the talk? I am. Yeah. Okay. Can you please share your screen? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just a second. Uh, I have to restart the browser. Okay. So just a moment, guys. If anyone has any question for the previous talk, please type it into the Q&A. We are having a wonderful Q&A session after two or three speakers. So please get ready with your questions. So I hope everyone is enjoying the speakers and the past speakers. So here you go. The Boyan is back. So you ready, Boyan? Yes. Sir. Yep. I will add your screen on the stage. Uh, so the stage is yours, Boyan. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, today I will be going over async and how to get started with it. I'm not going to go in very in depth about it because it's a quite complex uh, technology and piece of Python. What I'm trying to uh, accomplish with this presentation is basically allow you to do some really, really simple code that's going to speed up enormously your application. So let's get started. Now, uh, one thing about uh, programming we have to discuss first is concurrent versus parallel programming. In parallel programming, uh, we can uh, execute multiple uh, work on multiple processors. While on concurrent, we are executing multiple tasks on one processor. There is a very good metaphor on Stack Overflow that says concurrent uh, programming is basically serving two queues with one uh, server, and parallel is serving two queues uh, with two uh, servers. Uh, now, since we are working in Python, we need to be aware of uh, JIL. Uh, JIL is global interpreter lock. This means that at any given time, there is only one thread running. So in Python, we don't have uh, multi-threading as in other uh, programming languages. Uh, even if we run multiple threads, only one thread is going to run at a single uh, given time. When that thread releases the lock, then another thread uh, can start uh, working. Uh, instead, if we want to do some parallel processing, we need to do uh, create multiprocessing instead of threads. As I mentioned, threads are a bit uh, deceptive at, at how they are defined in Python. Now, uh, when we are doing very CPU heavy stuff, uh, threads are not going to help us. Async uh, is also not going to help us. Uh, for computation heavy stuff, we want to break down everything to work on multiple uh, cores. And for that, uh, we need to use multiprocessing uh, or uh, even uh, scarier, create a C objects, uh, C modules that we're going to call and handle threading inside them. So, Anytime you have a calculation that is uh, doing some slowing down your program and you can parallelize it, you're not going to use async. Now, uh, for blocking code, which is much uh, more often uh, in Python, we're going to have uh, database queries, HTTP requests, and reading files. All of these operations have in common that majority of the time is spent waiting. Uh, for example, when you make a database query, you have a, your connection, you open it, 
uh, then you uh, send a query to database, then your code is waiting, 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 then it gets a response from the database and continues. Same when uh, making HTTP request. Uh, your code uh, ask uh, DNS server, uh, can you tell me where is this uh, HTTP, where is this domain? DNS server responds. Then your code uh, uh, makes a request to that IP address. That IP address responds with uh, data. And all the while, your uh, entire program is just waiting there and for something to happen. Uh, now, uh, there is a very interesting stuff uh, for blocking code you're going to use threads. For non-blocking code, you're going to use async. Now, if you are not quite sure what's blocking and what's non-blocking code, it's going to be explained quite uh, soon. Now, uh, for this uh, lecture, I decided to use getting cupcakes recipes as an example, because everybody loves cupcakes. Now, uh, the sync version, uh, is going to be quite uh, simple here. One note, I'm not uh, doing live uh, coding because every time I try to do that, something catastrophic happens. So you're going to have to trust me with uh, execution numbers and stuff like that. <laughs> so uh, here uh, we have a very simple call. We're going to make a time slip. And this is basically uh, mocking our if we had a simple server, that is another API, which our current application is calling. It takes one second and we get all the ingredients for a perfect cupcake. And here we have a basic normal uh, Python function. We have a start time, we define some cupcakes, and for all those 10 cupcakes, uh, we make a request, then collect them and run them. It takes about uh, 10 seconds for that because uh, we're waiting one second per, per request and you have 10 uh, requests. Uh, now here, um, as you can imagine, almost 99% of these 10 uh, seconds is spent not doing anything at all, just uh, pure wait time. Uh, what we would like to achieve is to have uh, our code tell to another code, okay, I'm waiting now, you can do your stuff. Uh, and basically like a Starbucks, you order your coffee. And now instead of uh, blocking other people from ordering the coffee, you sit on the chair and you wait them uh, to call you and get uh, your coffee. Same thing here. Uh, now, uh, here, uh, things are changed a little bit in order to use async and tell people uh, I'm waiting for my coffee, you can go order your own. Uh, we have to add await async.sleep. Uh, now, uh, this is a quite interesting change because we can't use time.sleep uh, because that's a blocking call. Uh, entire execution is going to stop there and wait for it uh, to finish. If we wanted uh, to use uh, time sleep, or uh, requests uh, get something, uh, we would need to use uh, threading. But with async, we have to use non-blocking uh, call. That is uh, async.sleep. Uh, for HTTP request, uh, we can use uh, AI HTTP, uh, which is non-blocking uh, HTTP library. So, uh, and here's our function. We uh, made this a sync, we add our await, and in order to execute the async function, you can just run async.run. And uh, we are gonna uh, collect all the results, get all the recipes. Now, execution time is pretty much the same, which is weird because we tried using async and with async, everything uh, should have been super, super, super fast. Now, before we continue, uh, we need to discuss about core routines. When we do async uh, keyword, we transform our function into the core routine. Core routine is basically a function that can uh, return some intermediate result, uh, then uh, let it resume uh, and continue working. Uh, if you know about the generators in Python, 
that's basically core routine. You can return uh, your result. Next time your function is called, you don't start from the beginning, but resume from that. Same thing with uh, await uh, syntax. You execute until await, and then you tell uh, to your uh, event loop for async, is there anybody else uh, who wants to do something while I'm waiting? Somebody raises a hand, and then they are working. And when they hit uh, wait, uh, they, uh, then they ask, uh, OK, who wants to continue working? And uh, you, if you have uh, completed your waiting and got results, then you can say, OK, now I'm working. All the time, there's only just one thread. There are no multiple threads. So uh, unlike uh, threading, it's quite deterministic when which one is going to finish if you are no how long execution takes. Now, uh, another interesting concept uh, that we need to know about core routine is that we can work with the code for which uh, we don't know exact uh, result. Uh, for example, when we call something in unsync, uh, we, get, uh, we create task from it, and uh, the task doesn't return a uh, value. It returns a future. Now, in JavaScript, uh, that's called a promise. But we don't like JavaScript, so we call it the future. It's much more better. And uh, future uh, says, at some point in the future, uh, this thing is going to have a value. But until then, uh, just keep it like this. So when you want to transform future into a result, we just said await in front of the future. And then the code is just going to wait. And we get everything we ever wanted from that. So here's a new and improved code. Reason why earlier uh, everything was running uh, at the same time, because we use cupcakes in a cupcake, and we run uh, a, you use async run to get the cupcake uh, recipe. And that was behaving the same as everything was uh, synchronous. Uh, however, here we change that. We don't wait uh, for async uh, to finish execution of this uh, function. Instead, we create a task. And each task uh, creates a future. This is this uh, result. And this just keeps uh, running. It doesn't wait for execution. It collects all the future recipes here. And uh, for that recipe in the future, uh, we want results. Now, while uh, we got here, when we hit await, then it asks uh, the first function, OK, what are you doing? And it starts executing. It hits await. Then uh, second function starts uh, doing their stuff, and so on and so on. So here, if we hit the recipes, uh, we're going to get uh, all the strings uh, like this. Otherwise, if we uh, tried to hit a result here, we would get a uh, future object. So after running this, we get the execution of only one second, uh, which is super nice. Because as you can see, we're uh, having here a slip of one second. So none of the functions. Uh, run one after another. All 10 of our calls were waiting at the same time. Oops, wrong direction. And uh, now uh, there is one more interesting uh, stuff that we can uh, work with. Uh, in async, instead of creating tasks that are wrappers around core routines, uh, we can use async.gather uh, and send them a list of functions, core routines, and everything uh, that you want executed. And uh, that is going to return a list of uh, futures. And here, we can just use await. Uh, and this is going to collect, generate everything we need and we get recipes that is a list of strings. This is equivalent to the code uh, above, but is uh, much easier uh, to get your hand around it. 
now uh i originally started working with async uh, when we started using uh, fast api because everybody was talking about how fast it is because it had async support and I honestly didn't know uh, about tasking, so I wanted to get the maximum performance about uh, from it. Now, regarding libraries, uh, I'm not uh, sure if uh, current SQL Alchemy supports uh, async mode of execution, uh, but uh, for example, Postgres uh, has an async library that you can use in your code. So your database call are not gonna be blocking, which can, speed up uh, quite a lot of things. Also, uh, Redis uh, has the support for um, non-async library, uh, for uh, async library, MongoDB as well. Your HTTP uh, has it, and we also have that uh, for files. But for me, uh, basically, having opportunity to just run this code uh, without any issues is super nice. And also there is a very nice library called async, uh, which you can use to map up uh, stuff, which can do uh, the split of the workloads. For example, if you're using uh, heavy CPU code, you can mark it, uh, this function is CPU heavy and it will start a separate process instead of running it in the event loop. Because as we discussed earlier, uh, everything that is CPU heavy uh, will block the thread. You cannot, uh, I think it's not gonna help you. Uh, one a very good tip before going into async, because it can be intimidating, is always profile your code run the profiler and see where uh, the majority of the stuff is happening. Uh, usually for me, that happens to be waiting for something, which is why I think it was for my use cases uh, quite uh, enough. Sometimes it's gonna be computational issue. And in those cases, uh, you have uh, two choices. You're gonna go multiprocessing if it's possible, uh, see maybe if uh, threading is possible, or uh, try to use uh, C modules and rewrite everything. Another thing to note is that uh, there are a bunch of libraries uh, for databases uh, and other stuff that are not async uh, ready. Basically you cannot use this syntax for making call to them. For those, you're unfortunately going to have to uh, use it in a thread. Uh, and async has a support for uh, that. Basically, we have a method async to thread that you can pass the function and it will execute in a separate uh, thread. Uh, okay, I think uh, I finished much faster than I expected. <laughs> uh, do we have any questions? No questions, excellent. Well, um, dum, dum, dum. thank you well very done. much, Boyan. Uh, it was a wonderful talk. So it was very detailed and explained. You you did the explanation very well. So I hope everyone enjoyed it. So if anyone has any questions, please uh, type it into the Q&A section. So we are having after two speakers, the dedicated Q&A sections. So thank you very much, Boyan, uh, for your wonderful time. So we are welcoming the next speaker. Uh, so thank you very much. So the next speaker we have got is uh, Thomas Sweeten from Poland. Uh, he is uh, uh, he's going to talk about the ML operations with Python on Google Cloud. He is a strategic uh, cloud engineer. So let me welcome Thomas on the stage. Hello, Thomas. How are you doing? Hi, hello. I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. Are you ready for and excited for the talk? <laughs> yes, definitely. We can yeah. we can start. 
Yes. Okay, no worries. So I will share the presentation on the board. So the Thomas, the time is yours. Uh, I will go off self. So stage is yours. Thank you, Storm. Thank you very much. So uh, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome on my talk, ML Operations with Python on Google Cloud. So first, let me talk a little bit about myself before we go on to the topic. So I'm a strategic cloud engineer in data and AI team of uh, Google Cloud Professional Services. So every day, I'm working with Google Cloud customers, supporting them, and using Google Cloud Services by uh, designing um, architectures, planning data migration strategies, or optimizing existing workloads, which are already running on Google Cloud. I have a background in Python and Golang development, and I've worked in multiple industry, uh, industries and with multiple cloud providers in the past. So let me share a little bit of what I wanted to talk about today. So first of all, as uh, I acknowledge, not everybody has to be familiar with MLOps. Um, I wanted to talk to you more generally about what it is and why even you should care about it. Uh, then I will go through the components of MLOps approach. Next, I will share with you how MLOps is supported by different Google Cloud services. And lastly, I will show you how easy it is to create MLOps pipeline using Python and then deploy it on Google Cloud uh, using built-in tools. So let's start. So starting with a basic question, what exactly is MLOps? In the simplest words, MLOps is an attempt to give structure to the process of creating production-grade ML. And it does it by attempting to unify ML development, the dev, and the ML operation, ops. It strongly advocates automation, monitoring, and infrastructure management at all steps of the ML system, from building a model, through integration and testing, to releasing and deploying of the model. It aims to provide a set of processes and tools for developing, deploying, and operationalizing ML systems in a rapid and reliable way. Developing, so uh, ML engineering, like data processing, model development, and uh, testing and validation. Deploying, uh, so building CI-CD pipelines, uh, integrating the model into a larger system, like running integration tests, and creating a scalable and reliable deployment and also operationalizing. So implementing continuous monitoring and alerting, user feedback loops, and continuously improving the model by retraining it with new available data. And uh, all of those aspects, all of those activities should be uh, parts, are and should be parts of life cycle of any production machine learning application. So, should we care about it? When we, when you are working on uh, ML research or just experimenting, so creating of a, of a model, creating a model or having your model code ready even, is more or less the end state of your work. However, if your goal is to use machine learning in a product, creation of the model is just the beginning. That is because ML engineering should not be developed in isolation, but instead it should leverage existing investment in data ops and DevOps and integrate with the data engineering and app engineering to be effective. Uh, so building an ML enabled system is a multifaceted undertaking. While the focus of any ML system is most probably on the ML engineering part, we should recognize how tightly coupled this process is with data engineering and application engineering. Data engineering focuses on ingesting, managing, 
and processing um, processing data to prepare data sets and features which will be leveraged by the ML, as well as other downstream tasks like data warehouses and uh, business intelligence systems. On the other hand, app engineering involves using the deployed model and integrating it with your applications and systems. That is because models do not operate in silos. They are always components of or support a large range of applications. Integrating an ML model into an application is a critical task uh, that involves making sure first that the deployed model is used effectively by the application and then monitoring model performance by collecting and monitoring relevant application KPIs. For example, click-through rate, revenue uplift, and uh, user experience. So taking all that into account, uh, we can see that the creation of ML code is just a small piece of a larger production ML systems. And uh, MLOps provides us with the ability to give those really complex systems a structure. And this in turn can enable us to shorten development cycles and as a result, uh, shorten time to market, improve collaboration between the teams by uh, sharing model data, metadata between different organizational units, increase reliability, performance, scalability, and security uh, of and all systems, and simplify operational and governance processes. As, M as MLOps is a structured approach, let's go through its components. MLOps lifecycle is a representation of different activities that we already talked about that are part of MLOps and, the and also the relationships between them. It can be broken down into six iterative processes on the outside of the circle and two cross-cutting processes in the middle. So starting from the top, ML development, so developing and prototyping your ML models. Training, operationalization, so automation of continuous integration and deployment of training pipeline, so a CICD pipeline of MLOps pipeline. Then we have continuous training. So retraining your product models with new data. And this is actually an element which distinguishes MLOps from DevOps and more on that uh, in a second. Then model deployment. So continuous integration and delivery of your models. Prediction serving or inference serving. Identifying and predicting model performance. Um, uh, sorry, uh, hosting ML models as services uh, to serve online predictions or as a part of a batch prediction system and continuous monitoring, identifying and predicting model performance, degradation, data skews uh, or outliers. And, and the heart of this process is a data and model management system, a central system, a central function for gov governing all machine learning artifacts. And it's allows you to audit, trace, and check uh, all the artifacts for compliance, as well as share, reuse, and discover any other ML assets or artifacts created in any of the steps of the MLOps lifecycle throughout your organization. If you are familiar with DevOps methodology, the MLOps lifecycle probably looks familiar to you. There is, however, one additional element to MLOps, which does not appear in the standard DevOps lifecycle consisting of continuous integration and continuous delivery, and that is continuous training. So continuous training describes the additional process of reacting to changes in data, for example, for example data captured in production serving or uh, model design and architecture. But let us, let, let's go back to the MLOps lifecycle. Because uh, the steps of the MLOps lifecycle can be captured in a form of a pipeline also, which allows us to illustrate how the processes interact with each other what are, and what are the artifacts created in each of the steps. 
So first, the ML development step. Uh, in where you use data sets from data and model management system. The output is the source code and configuration of the training pipeline. Then the training oper operationalization step takes this source code and configuration um, and it is a CACD step as we mentioned for the pipeline code. So it would be triggered as usual for the code uh, so, for example, by a commit or a tag in a repository, it builds, tests, and deploys the pipeline to its execution engine. The components, once again, can be stored in data and model management system. Now, based, so on this step, we have a ready to, uh, ready to run training or retraining pipeline. Now, based on uh, training or retraining triggers, and training can be scheduled. Uh, it can be triggered when the new data arrives. It can be scheduled, it can be triggered on events, notifications, like alarms. The continuous training pipeline is executed and the continuous training pipeline outputs a model, which is also registered in the uh, data and model management system as an artifact. Based on your model, management workflow, you can execute now your model CICD pipeline to deploy your ML uh, model. And this is done on the step of model deployment. Now, the output of this, uh, of this step is a package which is ready for serving. And depending on how you, uh, depending on how you run your predictions on your model, you might also be fetching values from the data and model man management workflow for serving. Uh, but now that you have your serving deployed, you also want to uh, you also want to save the serving logs, because these serving logs are used by the continuous monitoring to evaluate the model performance and identify any data uh, shifts uh, and drifts. If you identify any data shifts or drifts, this would lead to updating information about the model in the data model management system, in the model registry. But it could also send a notification to data scientists or ML engineers to examine the model via an alerting system. And as we've said before, this alerting system could even, tra could even trigger the step of continuous training. So this is where our loop, our retraining loop would close. Now, MLOps had been described in the Google white paper titled Practitioner's Guide to MLOps. Uh, this white paper provides full overview of MLOps lifecycle, uh, MLOps processes and capabilities, and describes why MLOps is important in much more detail that I just mentioned to you now. What I provided to you was a high level overview, but for more in-depth information, I strongly encourage you to take a look at the uh, at the white paper. Um, so now let's let's talk about how to build such a pipeline in Google Cloud. So first, let's talk about how to even do ML on Google Cloud so that we know which tools we could use. So as you can see, there are a lot of them. But to simplify it, on a really high level, there are three basic ways in which you can work with ML or AI on Google Cloud. And depending on your use case, so whether or not you want to use your data and your model, or use your data, but use a model developed by Google, or uh, use models developed on Google data, you can leverage many different Google Cloud services. Vertex AI is one such a service, and uh, it is a unified platform, which is a central hub for doing any ML-related work on Google Cloud. Now, Vertex AI offers um, multiple specialized services. It offers building blocks for different applications, like vision and video, 
natural language translation of structured data. But it also offers for users who want to get a deeper in the custom model development and managing model operations at scale, it offers core services for data science, machine learning, and also MLOps. So a part of Vertex AI, which is used for running MLOps pipelines is Vertex AI pipelines. Now, Vertex AI pipelines is a managed Kubeflow service. And Kubeflow is an open source tool which is used for managing MLOps pipelines. It is Kubernetes native, so it can be run on any Kubernetes cluster also. It provides a Python SDK for building pipelines, uh, which we will see how to, how to use that later. As shown on this diagram, Vertex AI pipelines integrate with multiple other Google Cloud services like BigQuery and uh, Cloud Storage for storing uh, your data sets or artifacts, data flow and data proc for uh, data processing, and but also other Vertex AI specialized services, which I mentioned, uh, which are used for specialized ML tasks like training, hyperparameter tuning, or serving models for prediction, as well as also managing machine learning metadata. And this allows Vertex AI pipelines to cover all steps of MLOps workflow using other Google Cloud services. You can use Vertex AI pipelines to run pipelines that were built using Kubeflow Pipelines SDK, but also using TensorFlow Extended. Now, Kubeflow Pipelines is an open source uh, solution for deploying and managing end-to-end -end ML workflows. And it allows for building portable, scalable ML workflows, which are based on Docker containers. Now, the goals of Kubeflow, of Kubeflow pipelines are simple end-to-end -end orchestration, easy experimentation, and reusable components. Uh, also, Kubeflow is quite generic, uh, quite generic um, in a way that it allows you to run models created with multiple frameworks like scikit-learn, PyTorch, TensorFlow, etc. Now, TensorFlow Extended is an open source effort by TensorFlow team, and it aims at provide, providing users with tools for building production-grade ML workflows. It provides a Python framework for building machine learning pipelines, and it aims to empower users to build scalable and reliable components uh, having keeping ML and Python best practices in mind at all times. It allows for running models created not only with TensorFlow, but with also other frameworks. So also scikit-learn, PyTorch, uh, Exibus, etc. many others. The main difference between those two is that TensorFlow Extended is agnostic to the orchestration engine that it's running on. Currently, it offers multiple options like Kubeflow, which as I mentioned, uh, is the engine um, of Vertex AI pipelines, but it also supports Airflow, Apache Beam. Now, Apache Beam, uh, this is Airflow. Apache Beam um, is engine of another Google Cloud service, which is called Dataflow. Um, TFX, so TensorFlow Extended, also allows for running locally using Python execution environment. Okay, now that we have all that necessary information, uh, let's build an example MLOps pipeline on Vertex AI using first Kubeflow Python, Python SDK and then TFX. So starting with Kubeflow Python SDK, the fundamental building block of Kubeflow pipelines are components. Pipeline components are self-contained sets of code. They perform one part of the pipeline workflow. So it can be data processing or data transformation or model training. Now, components are composed of sets of inputs and outputs, but also information about the execution environment, which we'll see in a second. You can build custom components and you can reuse pre-built components um, for 
many features of Vertex CI, like AutoML or any uh, other Google Cloud um, services, there is a set of pre-built components called Google Cloud Pipeline Components, which is basically a Python library of, as I mentioned, pre-built components, um, which uh, provide you with production quality, consistent, performant, and easy to use uh, components to use in Vertex CI pipelines. So give you, to give you an example of how the custom component looks like. As I mentioned, um, component would be a plain Python function accepting inputs and uh, outputs which automatically integrate with the execution environment of Vertex CI pipelines. So here we have an output which allows us, sorry, to create an artifact in Vertex CI metadata store. A uh, component is initiated on a play find Python function by using a decorator from the Kubeflow pipelines SDK, and it specifies the execution environment. You can specify, for example, packages which needs to be installed in the container, and also the base image of the container, as well as many other parameters. So in this custom component called uh, we import scikit-learn, we um, create our uh, data set, we split the data, then we create our model and train it, then we test it and upload the results of the tests to the Vertex CI metadata store, as plain as that. So let's take a look, uh, let's see how creating a pipeline would look like. And just like the component, a uh, pipeline is defined as a plain Python function with a decorator uh, holding some additional information. So we would like to create an example, example pipeline, uh, in which we ingest data from Google, uh, Google Cloud Storage bucket. It would be images. We would create Vertex AI data set, image data set, then train machine learning model on those images using AutoML. In the end, we want to create Vertex AI endpoint, which would allow us to, um, to uh, host our model and get predictions from the endpoint. Uh, and then we would like to deploy the model onto this endpoint. OK, so first, like we said, we want to create a Vertex AI data set out of the images which we have, which we were provided. So all we do. Uh, is we provide a we pro we provide a path to the GCS um, so Google Cloud Storage uh, object and the the component will create a Vertex AI data set for us. There is a predefined we are using predefined Google Cloud component in this case. Next, for using AutoML, we once again have a can use a predefined uh, Google Cloud component. Uh, and as you can see, we can use output of a previous component as an input to other components. And Kubeflow Pipelines SDK will automatically create an execution diagram based on how we pass the outputs between the components. We don't have to specify it manually. Um, now, this this custom com this uh, pre-built component is using AutoML. Uh, just shortly, Google, uh, AutoML is a Google Cloud service, and it allows for training model using your custom data, but it uh, it utilizes some of the proprietary Google models and model architectures to do that. So after the model is trained. Um, we pass it to the uh, to another predefined component, as well as we pass the endpoint, which is created in another component. Now, creation of an endpoint and of the data set will be done in parallel, and we will see that in uh, as in a second. And this endpoint, as long um, as well as model, are used uh, in a single operator to deploy the model to the endpoint. So as we are 
as we are going to be running this on a Kubeflow environment, Kubeflow, um, Kubeflow requires um, to create a pipeline definition file in a JSON format uh, to run on it. So this is what we, we need to compile our pipeline function into a JSON file. And then we can use Google Cloud uh, library to run uh, to run the job on the Vertex AI pipelines. So this is how the deployed pipeline looks like when it finishes. We can see the components which we defined right here, as well as between we can see the artifacts which are going to be stored in the metadata store. Um, so we can see a data set, a model, and endpoint artifacts are going to be stored uh, both in their respective uh, services, which we used to create them, but also in the metadata store, so we can track their lineage uh, and history. As you can see, uh, like I said, the endpoint is going where was created in parallel with the rest of the operations, and we did not have to specify the execution diagram manually. Vertex CI did that automatically. Now let's try and develop a similarly simple, simple pipeline using TFX. Now, like I mentioned, TFX uh, uses a bit different approach than Kubeflow Pipelines SDK. And that is because TFX uh, is a portable implementation of ML workflow. It can be run, TFX Pipeline is a portable implementation of ML workflow. And it can be run on various orchestrators, not only Kubeflow, so Vertex CI, but like we mentioned, also on Apache Airflow, Apache Beam, so Dataflow, um, and also in the local environment. And because of that, the architecture of the pipeline is more abstract. Uh, there are specific types of abstract components which you have to be, which have to be used in the pipeline. Um, of course, those components can be implemented with the custom code by the user. But there's also a lot of ready-to-use components available in the TFX components library, and those components are really generic, allowing you to still use them in your uh, pipelines in many cases. So let's go and create a pipeline. And similarly to Kubeflow Pipelines SDK, the pipeline can be created in a plain Python function this time, we don't even have to use decorators because, as we can see, the function will return a pipeline object. And uh, this time, we'll, we are going to create an even simpler pipeline, which ingests data from Google Cloud Storage, uh, then use custom model training code to train the model, and finally save it to another location in another Google Cloud Storage. Save the model in a Google Cloud Storage location. So there is a ready-to-use uh, TFX component, uh, which, as I mentioned, as you can see, is probably quite abstract because it allows for reading from multiple uh, from multiple data sources. If we pass a string containing the GCS path, it is able to read from GCS directly. We do not need to specify any other parameters. Then for training the code, we can use the trainer component. And in this case, it accepts as an input uh, path to a module file, Python module, that is. So basically a Python file. Um, and the code, the training code inside of this file has to be defined in a specific way in order for training component to be able to use it. Um, now we pass the module location to the pipeline function um, here, and then to the trainer component. And as a training component so generic, uh, you can see probably that we can use it to train many different types of models also. We can finally use the pusher component to push the created model to different destination. In this case, we want to save the file to a location in Google Cloud Storage bucket, which would be a file system destination for the pusher, which is defined with the file system class. Finally, we define which variables point to components of the pipeline. 
So we define uh, which classes, which objects are components of the pipeline. And then we uh, pass those components to the pipeline object, um, which we then return from the, from the function. And at this point, and let me drive this point home, we need to remember that TFX is a, is a tool which allows you to deploy the same pipeline onto a different execution environments. So we need to provide, uh, we need to do additional step of compiling our uh, pipeline class using a specific, uh, what's called DAG runner. In this case, it would be Kubeflow DAG runner in order for us to get an output of pipeline definition file. And it would be the same file. Uh, it would be a same or really similar file to what we get when we just use Kubeflow pipeline SDK. Then what we do is we just run it exactly the same way with Google Cloud uh, AI platform uh, libraries. And uh, here is the end result. So as we can see, or once again, the execution diagram had been created uh, automatically with appropriate metadata uh, created for each step. As you can see, the metadata differs. That is because with predefined components, both for Kubeflow pipelines and both TFX, um, the component itself defines what metadata it will produce. So it depends on the implementation of the component. The pre-built component are built in a way to uh, provide this particular component. So also be mindful of that. And uh, that will be all. And before we finish, let me just quickly summarize. So first of all, what is MLOps? Uh, so MLOps is an attempt to give structure to the process of creating production-grade machine learning. Google Cloud offers a tool for TXCI pipelines which allows for execution and orchestration of MLOps pipelines and integrating them with many other Google Cloud services, as well as other tools. And uh, a lot more has been described, as I mentioned, in the white paper titled Practitioner's Guide to MLOps. I, I encourage everybody to download it and uh, yeah, get a look, get acquainted with the content side. So with that, uh, Thank you very much for your attention. It was my pleasure to present to you today. Thank you very much, Thomas. It was a wonderful and insightful talk. So I hope everyone enjoyed it uh, with the demo. So I think very uh, thank you very much for your time as well, Thomas. So we are waiting for the next speaker. So. So the, uh, he's a Jim Dowling. He's a CEO of the HopeWorks. He's from Sweden. Uh, topic he's going to cover is build and operate free serverless ML systems with Python. So let me introduce Jim uh, Dowling on the stage. Hello, Hi. Jim. How are you doing? Hi, Zahil. Nice to be here. I'm I'm very well, thank you. Uh, are you excited <laughs> for the talk? Of course, of course. Yeah. Could you please share your presentation? Absolutely. I'll just share my screen now. And hopefully everything is good to go. Yep. Just a second. <clears throat> I read it on the board. So, OK, Jim, so the stage is yours now. Thanks very much, Sahil. OK, hi. I'm going to talk today about how to build a serverless machine learning system. I call it prediction service. So it's going to take some data in, it's going to make predictions, and it's also going to show you the results of it. And to do that on services that are free, so where you don't have to pay to operate and run this system in the background. And before we start, I'm going to show you what I'm going to uh, go through today so you get an idea of what it will be. So we can see here this serverless machine learning system, it will have some data to train with. So it's, I'm going to talk about the data in a minute. It's for it's a, a problem related to surfing. So surf reports, the height of waves at beaches. Uh, but that's the data we're going to use to train a model with. So training of models is not an operational thing. You can do it offline. You can do it on a notebook, on Colab, and, and push it to a platform. Um, but you do need some compute. So you will need to run Python programs to uh, create features. And we'll also need to run Python programs to make predictions. So I'm going to go through that. 
We'll also need to, when we're making predictions, we'll need to give an output. So in this case, we're going to have a graph of the, the height of the waves, and we're going to publish that to a user interface. And in this case, we're going to use GitHub pages. So the only thing you'll need to get started is a GitHub account that many of you will have. But we're also going to introduce a platform uh, for managing your features and your models called Hopsworks. So you would need an account on Hopsworks as well. Both platforms have very generous free tiers, so unlimited time unlimited free tiers. Many of you probably use GitHub already. Hopsworks, you can store 10 gigabytes of data for free. Um, and if you want to jump ahead, you can just Google CJ Surf and GitHub and you'll find uh, the code I'm going to talk about. So let's get started. Um, and before I get started, many of you will be thinking, why are you using GitHub Actions? Well, there are a lot of alternatives for serverless Python. And I've listed many of them here, and there may be some that are missing. Um, so I'm not going to, it's not at the exclusion of other platforms for running Python code in a serverless manner. Um, but there aren't really any other alternatives to Hopsworks for managing your features and your models. So although we call, many, many people will think serverless is Lambda functions in AWS, serverless really means that you don't have to manage the infrastructure, operate the infrastructure, upgrade it. It's just running in the cloud. Think Dropbox, think Trello, think GitHub or Gmail. These are serverless services. You don't need to install anything. You just go ahead and use them. So for Python, there's many options out there, and many of these have free uh, compute layers. But for the models and features, um, there's not too much, so we're going to use Hopsworks. For user interfaces, I'm using GitHub Pages, um, but there is Streamlit as well, which is quite a, a nice uh, Python-based user interface. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about the problem domain now. So we're interested in this problem of surfing. I love surfing. Um, I'm from Ireland originally, and I even wrote a paper that was published at the top one of the top AI conferences called ICML way back in 2005. Um, and what we did was we, we took uh, predictions of the height of a wave in the open ocean. Let's call a swell. So we looked at how big they would be at a certain distance from the coast of Ireland, a few hundred kilometers away. So the Americans have these buoys or buoys that uh, are located in the Atlantic Ocean, and they measure the height of these swells and the direction of the swells and the gap between them or the period between them. Uh, and they make predictions of those swells over the next two weeks. Now, on a beach in Ireland, there's also a person who uh, reports every day at the same time uh, the height of the waves at the beach. So we, we, we wrote a paper about this, and we even built a system um, that we put online uh, that I'll get into in a minute. But just a little bit about the problem domain first, and um, that you get it maybe if you're interested in it, you'll get a feel for it. Uh, we can see here that on this picture, this, this photograph, this is what we call a point. And the waves are somewhat higher at the point because... The, the wave is coming down from the north, the direction is the north, and the waves first hit the point and then they compress. So what actually happens is that the, the period or the time between the waves stays the same, but the gap between them decreases. And that results that the height of the wave will increase. Now the opposite is happening at the beach down here. We can see that the, that the, the gap between the waves is getting longer. Um, and that means that the height of the waves is decreasing. So predicting the height of a wave at a beach is not trivial. You need to know the period, the gap between the waves. You need to know the height of the swell, and you also need to know the direction, and then the characteristics of the beach. You could do a lot of feature engineering around this, um, but it's easier just to collect data and do machine learning. And this is where we got data from for this problem. Um, we get data from this buoy out in the Atlantic, and the data looks like this. It's by NOAA, the American uh, organization who, who manage... Uh, um, atmospheric data and oceanic data. And we get this tabular data. So we have the height of the swell, we have uh, the period of the swell and the direction which the swell is coming. And you can have many different swells in the Atlantic uh, at any point in time. And these are these two different columns, one for two different swells uh, arriving at that buoy. And we then have, we scrape some data from a web page. Uh, this is the Hinch Surf Shop. Uh, every day at the same time, they release uh, these uh, observations of the height of the wave. That's all we need now to solve our machine learning problem. And way back in 2004, we built and, and ran a website uh, called CJ Surf. And uh, it was producing web heights at uh, the Hinch Beach. And it was quite successful. Um, I ended up moving to Sweden, and, and the other person, Kieran Lee, who worked on me, ended up uh, co-founding Intercom. And uh, we didn't have any money. So this LAMP stack architecture that we had, it cost, you know, I don't know, a couple of hundred dollars a year to run, and we didn't have the cash, so we just let it slide. So the hope is that, you know, um, can we rewrite this LAMP architecture in a Python-only application in 2022 and not have to pay to run it every day? 
And the answer is yes, of course. So just if you're curious about the tech stack, we're, before we had Java um, to collect the data and actually to do the, 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 the predictions with a, a K nearest neighbor model, and we use a MySQL server to store the predictions and the features. Um, and then we had a PHP web page to show you the results. So we're going to do a slightly different stack today. It looks like the following. <coughs> Excuse me. We can see that we have um, we have serverless compute on the left. That's going to be GitHub Actions. And I have three notebooks. Two of them download data from the two different locations, one from the NOAA buoy and one from the Lynch web page. And then a third notebook will make predictions. It's going, to, it's going to use a machine learning model to predict the height of waves uh, at the beach in the hinge. So, so th that's the compute that we have. Training models we can do offline. You can do that on uh, Colab if you want to keep on the serverless paradigm. And um, when you train a model, it will create some state. So it's going to create a model. You need to have that model somewhere. It needs to be available for your GitHub uh, action to run. Now, you could check it into GitHub. Uh, repo and then just read it from your GitHub from your GitHub program here. That that would probably work as well. Um, but we're using a model registry because model registries give you the benefit of, of versioning the 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 models, and you can also have artifacts associated with the metadata and all the good governance and access control features that you would need typically in a, a machine learning system. So um, the other state that we need apart from the models will be the features. So we need to know this tabular data related to the height of waves and to the, the predictions uh, related to the direction of swells, the height of the swells, and also uh, the period of the swells. So we're storing that in this thing called the feature store. Now, you may have heard of a feature store before. It's basically a platform to manage features for machine learning to train models with. So we can see here that the train model is pulling features out to train the model with, but also to make predictions. So our batch predict surf program will read features from the feature store. It'll read the, the predicted swell heights, and then it will generate the predictions of the wave heights, and it's going to write them back in here. You're going to store the predictions back in here. And then the other part of the predictions is this, this image with our predicted wave heights. We're just going to push it back to GitHub, and then GitHub pages can view it. So this is the three parts of any serverless machine learning system that, that you build. We'll probably have a compute layer. You'll have to have some sort of serverless state layer to manage your not just models and features, but also the predictions and the logs and, and so on that get produced. And then you'll probably need some sort of user interface by which uh, users can interact with your model. Of course, you can may have downstream applications that access with it, but that's fine. Now, we're talking primarily about batch, but the exact same principles hold for online. Uh, models and Hopsworks also supports online models, so you can do all of this with online models as well. Now, the feature store is kind of a novel part of this architecture, so I'll briefly go through it. Um, a feature store, the Hopsworks feature store is it was the first uh, open source feature store, and it's now the first and only serverless feature store. But basically, you can create an account and you can write data frames to it. And we're talking primarily about Python today. There is support for SQL and Spark and Flink. Um, but in Python, you would create data frames and write them to uh, tables in the feature store. And that's where your data will be. And then you can go to the feature store to download training data in data frames or in files, maybe a TF record. Um, uh, or you'll also retrieve uh, data that you want to make predictions with, so batch data, batch inference data. Now, there's a bunch of things you want to do before you store data in a feature store. You want to maybe take the original data, and uh, you might want to compute aggregations or dimensionality reductions or validate your data. Um, and one thing to, to point out here is that often uh, the transformations of our data will happen after we store them in the feature store to maximize the reusability of those features. Because if we normalize a feature before we write it, well, every time we write it, we're going to have to recompute the mean for that you know, numerical feature and, and uh, change all the existing feature data there. So, um, and also the same goes for reading that, those features to, to try, use the features to train different models. Um, you won't be able to apply your own normalization technique, or you'll have to use all of the training data. Not, you won't be restricted to using a certain time-bounded range of data. But we'll get to that in a little bit. OK, so the basic idea of the feature store is that we can write these data frames into these things we call feature groups. They're tables of features. And then when we want to use those features to train models and serve models, we can read them by a logical feature view. So you just select the features you want from the different tables. And you say, well, I want to use these features to train my model. And then there's an offline API, which will get you the uh, training data 
uh, for training the model with or batch inference data. And if you have an online model that needs low latency access to those features, so millisecond access to them to make predictions, you can use the online API. So that's where we're gonna store the state, the features, uh, and we'll also get to the models in a minute. Um, but we'll look at first at feature engineering. What do we need to do here? So in the surfing problem, there's a little bit of feature engineering you have to do. Um, the, the, the predictions are made, as we can see, several hundred kilometers from the coast. So it takes some time for the swell to arrive at the coast. So we, we can compute that and estimate it because the velocity of the swell is actually calculated by multiplying the swell period by 1.5, and that will give us the velocity of the swell. So if the, if the swell is, is coming in at an angle of 90 degrees, it'll take um, the, you know, the, the period of the wave will probably 1.5 uh, seconds. That's how fast it'll be traveling. And we can estimate exactly when it will arrive at the coast. So we do some feature engineering. We also look at the angle of the swell window coming into the beach um, to remove swells that won't come in there. But what we then want to do is we will end up with a data frame. And remember, we, I said that the prediction problem is just take the height of our uh, way, of our swell, the period of the swell, and the direction of the swell. And then the, the observation will be the wave height at the beach. But these are the three features for predicting. Um, so we can write them to this feature group. And the feature group we can see here, there's a lot of you know uh, metadata around it. Well, first, we're gonna connect to Hopsworks. We're gonna um, get back a reference to this feature store and create the feature group called La Hinge. Um, we have a, a description for the feature store. It's gonna be available online. You don't have to always. Um, there is a primary key, the beach ID, because maybe we have multiple beaches that we're um, writing these uh, predictions for. We're going to look at, at expectations in great expectations to validate the data coming in here in a minute. And then we can automatically compute statistics, so descriptive statistics for the data we write, so histograms, correlation matrices. Um, and we can also say that, that the rows uh, have a certain uh, observation time. So this is the time at which this data was arrived at. And I'll get to that in a little bit. It's something called point in time joins. But this is the, the table or feature group, and we just insert the data frame into it. And that's all you need to write in Python. You can run this on any Python client and we'll write to this serverless feature store and your data will be there. Now, you often want to validate the data coming in. And this is an example of using a framework called Great Expectations. So we need to create something called an expectation suite in Great Expectations. And here we're going to validate the height of the surf at the beach. So we know that it's never really going to be higher than 20 feet at the beach. That way, that particular beach doesn't have a hold waves higher than that. Um, and it's never going to be lower than zero. So we basically say that the, for the wave height column, the minimum value will be zero and the max will be 20. So every time our program, our pipeline, this feature pipeline that's pulling down the surf height and writing it to the feature store, if it writes a value that's not between zero and 20, we'll get an error. And we'll get, we can get notified or alerted in the platform that there was a problem with this pipeline. And that's what you have in a production system, that data sometimes coming in may be incorrectly formatted, it may be uh, corrupted, and then you'll get a warning or an error. So in our case, we, we, what will happen is the write will not succeed, and you, you'll check out and say, well, what actually happened? Look through the logs. So um, <clears throat> this is what you see in your UI. So you can see that the, you know, it's successful expectation one, one, and then if you get a failure, you can see it and, and dig in to find out what the problem is. And you can also set up then um, in, in the serverless platform, you can set up an email alert that will tell you when you have a problem. So you don't need to watch this uh, pipeline running every day. You get an alert whenever there's a problem. Now, once you've written uh, your data to the platforms, your data frames, and you're happy, and the pipelines are running in production and, and everything's good, um, you need to create training data to train a model with, right? So what we're going to do is select some features from the feature groups. So we're going to say, I want this feature from this feature group and that feature. And I create a feature view with them. And with that feature view, I can create training data. I can also get batch inference data to make predictions later on. So there is a challenge, uh, a technical challenge that the feature store helps solve, which is quite a complex challenge, which is what happens if I select, in this case, I'm selecting, you can see four features from our two different feature groups. So I'm selecting the, the height of the swell, the direction of the swell, and the period of the swell. And I'm also selecting the wave height as our label. So the wave height is coming from this uh, surf report uh, table. And then the swell height and direction and period are coming from the boy or NOAA swells prediction data. One of the problems I'll have here is that, in fact, the pipeline or feature pipeline that's updating the surf reports, it runs only every 24 hours. So we get a, a new observation every 24 hours. But for the swells, 
we get observations every six hours. So in fact, one of the problems you can have is that, well, what happens if um, you know, I, I predict that the height was this and the direction was this and the period was this, and then the observation of the height was this. But if you, if you have what we call data leakage, if you have future knowledge of what the appropriate uh, swell height direction and period was for a particular wave height, so maybe the swell um, uh, uh, row had a, had a later timestamp than the uh, beach uh, observation time, well, then, you know, maybe your model will either perform worse or will seem to be much better, but it's not actually learning correctly. So this is a very uh, subtle uh, problem or bug that can be introduced. Um, and what the feature store will do is ensure that you don't have what you call point in time uh, or data leakage. And what you have is a point in time correct join. And if we take the first row, what it basically means is if we look at it, that the timestamp is 2004, 1st of January, 10 a.m., and this is the observation that we can see on the first row up here. This is the observation, and the height was one foot at the at the beach. But what we want to find in the swells is the most recent um, uh, uh, swell height, direction, and period given that timestamp. And we don't want to be too far in the past because then it'll be inaccurate. We're assuming it's going to be updated every six hours. So what we get in that case is um, before that particular timestamp, it's going to be this one. It's going to be the, the first row. So we get 125, 88, and 9.8. And you can do the same for the for all these other rows. The labels are coming from this table, and we get the timestamp for those. And then we find the appropriate features um, that are the most recent, but prior in time. Uh, now, to write this code yourself is quite challenging. So we have a domain-specific language um, in Python to help it make it easier for you. So what you basically do is you say, when you want to train a model, I would like the wave height from the uh, surf reports in the hinge feature group, and I want the swell height period and direction from the swell predictions feature group. And I create this object called a query object. And you can you know, get the data back, have a look at it, inspect it. And if you're happy with it, you can create something called a feature view around that. And it's just a logical uh, grouping of features. You can also associate transformations functions with these features if you want at this point so that those transformation functions get applied when, when you read or, uh, the data from the feature store. But basically, uh, and then you also specify the label, so which which particular, which which columns uh, or features, uh, in this case, are the labels. So a problem when you're, you're, you're running with online uh, machine learning is that you can sometimes have what's called uh, 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 training serving skew. And I'll explain what that is in a second. And the reason why we have it is because typically we don't perform transformations on features before we store them in the feature store. If we did, it would be very difficult to reuse features because then if I want a slice of data from a feature group and I want to create training data out of it, well, it won't work because the, the, the feature was normalized over all of the data in that feature group. Or if I want to apply a different normalization, uh, or sorry, different transformation function to a given feature, well, I can't do that. <coughs> so typically we'll, We'll store the data um, untransformed in the feature groups. And then when we read it, we'll apply the transformations. And that maximizes reuse of features. So the pro so an example of this would be the height and period and distance uh, uh, in our features and for surfing. You know, if we if we normalize them, we can see that we get a, get a uh, uh, we get an improvement in the um, root mean squared error. I think it should be lower actually. So um, here's what it looks like in code, this uh, problem that we have related to what we call um, serving training skew. So when, it, when, when you're, and this is for online models in particular. So when you're training a model, you're going to read the data frame from your feature view. You're going to apply, in this case, we're applying a scalar, a min-max scalar uh, transformation to, to the features. Um, and then we, we we train a model. And that model we're going to, we're going to, we're going to store in the model registry. And we'll also um, you know, we can also uh, save the um, the scalar object itself because um, it has all the statistics related to the transformation, and we're going to need them later on when we want to scale the the input values that come untransformed from the feature store. So you can see here, there's a bit of work to do if you do this in Scikit-Learn. You need to save your transformers. Um, in this case, we're picking them. We're going to have to push them to the model registry along with the model. And then when we've downloaded the model, we'll also download these transformation objects or pipeline objects, so I can learn pipeline objects, and we will apply the transformation. So it's the same object. Everything's good, but I have to ensure that 
the you know the version of the uh, transformation fun object is correct, um, and you might want to make sure that 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 you know you have a code review and test to ensure everything is correct. So there is a slightly easier way, which is if you use the feature store to apply these transformation functions on the features in your feature view. So when you create a feature view, you basically say, well, for the height, I'd like to apply the standard scalar, for the period, the standard scalar, and for direction, standard scalar. So um, when I'm reading the features in the feature store, those uh, transformation functions get applied transparently. So the client, when it's retrieving the feature values, will apply those transformations. And also when you're reading training data, to um, you know, to uh, to create to train a model, um, at this point, so when you call train test split, um, it'll it'll actually apply all the transformation functions, and they're they're applied as Python UDFs on the data. So there's a question about if Hopsworks supports feature versioning and linking feature versions to training data models. Yes, it does. We can see like um, that. I just jump quickly, but we when we create our feature view, uh, you have a version here associated with feature view, and the same with feature groups. Uh, and the same, of course, with models. So um, I think I have a couple of minutes to, 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 to go through a quick demo of what we, we've just talked about. Um, we've gone through uh, the main parts, and I'll, I'll just show you the, um, the the code itself, which is available at uh, GitHub. Um, but what we went through was, was, was just some pipelines, feature pipelines, and batch prediction pipelines, and a training pipeline. Um, and they need to run on serverless infrastructure, feature pipelines and, and, and prediction pipelines we're running in GitHub Actions, training pipeline we run on demand, and then we're storing the features and the models on this platform called Hopsworks AI. If you're curious, it's you know you can go to app.hopsworks.ai and you can register for an account. It's time unlimited free tier. Like I mentioned, you've got 10 gigabytes of uh, storage. And let's have a look at, 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 at first at the system itself, and then we look at, at Hopsworks for a little bit more detail. So this is a GitHub repo, as we can see here. And the notebooks that I mentioned already, you can see there's a one, two, three, four. Um, this is just the latest prediction. So what I'm actually doing is I'm writing out the prediction to uh, that folder in GitHub. <coughs> and then the UI is quite simple. The user interface to see the predictions is basically it says live predictions of Surfy. It's using, um, you can see it's using, <coughs> it's using uh, GitHub pages to see the live predictions. So, you know, this is not the most beautiful code I've ever written in my life. And you can see that in the graph, we can see the on Wednesday, which is today, the height is predicted at three feet. And um, the weekend, which is the important time, it looks like it's going to get good uh, on Saturday, uh, between Saturday and Sunday. So, four foot is quite good for surfing. If you're curious, that's probably head high surf. This is Lahinch down here, and this is where it's located on the west coast of Ireland. Um, and if you're curious, there's a little bit more detail on the infrastructure. You can see it here. Um, I, there is also a Streamlit UI, so it's not just the uh, GitHub Pages UI. And you can see we have two feature groups. We have one feature view, and we have the model repo in the platform. And then actually, we store all the predictions as well in the platform in a in another feature group. So we can log all the predictions and all of the, the features. Um, you can backfill your, if you're interested to get started with this, you can backfill some training data um, to make it quicker. You can train a model with several hundred observations. And then there's also the code to pull from the live sites. So let's have a quick look what it looks like inside the platform. We look, we, now we've had a look at, um, you know, at, at what it looks like in GitHub. So for the feature store, so we, we you know, we run our notebooks and you can run them in, um, like I said, you can run them to test on Colab. And if you're curious to get started and you come in here, <clears throat> the first thing you should do is just run this first notebook. So run a Colab notebook. Um, and what it will do is, first it will ask you for an API key when you, it'll install our library. And then when you, when you connect to the platform, it'll ask you for an API key, but then you just, It'll give you a hyperlink and you can connect and paste it in there. And then what it will do is it will write some features to the feature store. So it's going to write a data frame in Pandas. Now, the, 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 the feature groups or data frames I have are these are the surf reports. Uh, these are the swells, the predictions of the swells. And then we have the predictions that were made in our batch prediction pipeline. So it stored the predictions there. So if we look at the predictions just because that's easy to get started with. We can see here's some predictions. This is just a random sample. Uh, some of them are from our old days set in 2004, and some of them are from this week. So we can see here that we have, you know, wave height two feet uh, as a prediction for tomorrow. Um, 
the surf reports are in here in the hinge and if we have a look at them we can see our features that we have the event time primary key we can see provenance where they're used uh, our expectations and all of the uh, reports and any alerts i haven't set up alerts um, and we can also get statistics so it's quite nice to look at the statistics of the wave heights you can see they follow this distribution uh, the max height and the min height um, and uh, you know um, and this, so the, we have a max height, a min height, and also the actual estimated wave height as well. So um, there are some other statistics computed if you want by default. We get feature cor a correlation matrix if you want to, you know, testing out to see if there's highly correlated features. And obviously, you know, max height and, and wave height and min height are quite correlated because often um, the people just report one height. Sometimes they report the max height and the min height. Sometimes they report just the, the height. Um, and then finally, if we look at Swells Exploded, which is uh, which is a lot more features, we can see that because remember it's two weeks worth of predictions. We have a lot of features there, so we actually have four hundred. And um, we can also see activity on this feature group. So you can see over time all the writes that came in and uh, how much data was added and removed. And then we have our feature views here, uh, and then we have the models. So the model looks like this, and you can see some more information about the model. These were some statistics over its accuracy that, that I computed and stored here. And you can have metadata as well. So um, I think I'm running uh, close to the end. So um, like I said, if you want to try out this platform, Hopsworks, you can just go to Hopsworks AI, register and create an account. The best way to get started is to just try out some of these notebooks, uh, run them in Colab, and they'll, they'll register features and so on. And I'd like to finish just with one last uh, thing. Um, you know, I, I, I work at KTH University as a professor and an associate professor there. And I love um, you know, teaching about some of the new concepts. So the feature store is really a new segment, and but it really enables you to build these serverless machine learning pipelines. It's really the next step from training models and notebooks is actually building these end-to-end -end prediction services. So what, we're, what we've done is started a course, and the course is going to run in this month so it's going to start in about two weeks time and it will go through the whole process of building serverless machine learning systems with uh, mostly open source and uh, free serverless services uh, and it's a free course of course um, so you know if you're interested you can go there and register and um, it'll be run primarily through github and there's going to be videos and homeworks and a project um, and the projects you know we have a lot of cool ideas for things like electricity price prediction you know air quality prediction, a lot of data is out there and is free and real time. And you can build great prediction services on them today. So if you want to learn how to take that next step uh, beyond notebooks, uh, please register for the course. And um, I'd love to see you there. So with that, I think I'm, I'm kind of uh, out of time. Um, do we have? Uh... Hello, Jim. Hi. Thank you very much uh, for your insightful and detailed talk. I think everyone enjoy it and ask so many questions as well. So I think we are having a Q&A session now. So thank you very much, Jim, for a wonderful time. Uh, have a nice day. I'll just I'll stop sharing here. I'm, I'm on the Q&A as well. So I think I'll, I'll hang on here. I'm not yeah, sure yeah. how that's, yes. that's going to work. So guys, we are having a Q&A session now. Okay, just a sec. I think we are waiting for a couple of more speakers. Uh, Thomas and Boyan, could you please get online, please? Thomas is here. Uh, no, the Thomas N Nebier. Okay, sorry. So while they are coming, so thank you very much wonderful is thank you very much for your time it was a wonderful talk so i hope everyone enjoyed so we have got a couple of questions uh, coming up on the board so i think we'll waiting for the thomas so we'll start with the uh, jim uh, for you so the question does hopeworks support feature versioning and linking that feature version <coughs> to a specific train ml model Yes, uh, the answer is yes, and um, this is this is really this is I, I said we're going to have a course on serverless ML, and really one of the key parts of the course are the principles of ML ops. So with ML ops, we mean you know machine learning operations, and principles of ML ops are really related to automated testing, versioning, and then being able to do things like deploy new features, deploy new models, 
and keep the whole thing running, right? So if you're building a system and that system is going to run live, it's going to be a production system. Maybe it's an online application. Maybe it's a batch application that's making updates to an online application. You need to be able to you know, track the lineage and provenance of any asset that you have, whether it's a feature, a training data set, a model. Um, so when you deploy a new model, it can use different versions of your features. You know, when you train a, a model with a training data set, those training data set features can come from different ver versions of features. So you have to track it the whole way. And, you know, just partial tracking won't, won't cut it because you won't be able to then, when you deploy a new model, be able to have this, the goal is a big red button that when you deploy a new model, and it plugs into the feature store to get the new features and there's a problem the big red button will just revert to the previous version and the previous version of the model will use different versions of features and it just should just work so you need to have all that automated for it to work okay <clears throat> so the question for uh topaz uh this one the given the slides of the all the services with the within the ml ops is there any prioritization of one service over other what would you focus on to get an mvp working uh sure so uh, you know, from the the way in which we look at it in google cloud ml ops have different phases of maturity so you should not attempt to automate all the things at the same time at once, right? So your next step should depend on your current state, definitely. But to define a specific next steps for you, um, it, it, there is a need to for more in-depth understanding of the current system or the current processes you have. But the best approach is to break down the parts of ML journey, MLOps journey into manageable, uh, manageable chunks and into implement them one time. And actually I have a documentation link, which I can share, but uh, where could I share it? In the comments section or in a, in a chat? I think in a chat, if you can share it in a chat, so I think everyone can see it. So let me know if that worked. No, no, in the in the public chat. So uh, yeah, I'm only seeing the comments and the private chat. Yeah, put so. it in the comments. I think you have to be registered to to be able to write to the comments, and many of us are not registered; they're not logged in. Yeah, I did not log in as a. Yeah, with, yeah uh, that's fine. Uh, that's fine. We will we will uh, post it after the in the break time. I think Nick will uh, post it to the audience. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very so much. We got man. it. We got it in our box. So the next question here is for Javier and Thomas. So the Javier and Thomas wouldn't uh, would not stream processing be slow then? Uh. I'm wondering about the context of the question, but uh, I would say that stream processing will be always faster than uh, database approach, chiefly because uh, you don't have to do IO operation to the disk and everything's happening in memory. And we have seen that um, basically, if you compare the same uh, use case uh, between the batch and streaming, it, it could be even order of multitudes more efficient how much data you can process uh, per core and gigabytes of memory. Um, and also, the um, I think the stream processing by nature, because it's using, we show the architecture, Microsoft architecture and Kafka and Kubernetes, is actually scalable to basically unlimited amount. Databases, <laughs> even the other ones, have some limits. I hope that was the question. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, but that was asked in that way. So sorry about that. So the next question is, I think for, I think for Boyan, is how to perform upgrade Elastic Beanstalk 
platform version when it's created from SDK and has custom name? Is there any answer for that? Um, sorry, I actually don't know the answer to this one. I think it, uh, anyone else, Thomas? No idea. Okay, uh, we'll pass that one. So the next one is for Thomas. Uh, what KPI metrics are quoted to stakeholders when justifying developer time, effort, cost on ML ops? Sure. So, yeah. So the result or the output of you know ML ops journey, so migrating or maybe automating your ML pipelines to go into more into MLOps direction. So it depends definitely on how it's implemented, right? But in general, the goals which we would expect or the results which we would expect to see uh, would be to shorten development cycles, so shorten time to market, uh, improved collaboration between the teams, uh, and this is the crucial part, which uh, I think Jim also mentioned, so the sharing of model and um, ML metadata, right? So the versioning, for example, and the tracking of lineage uh, and the discoverability and shareability uh, of the component, different components of the pipelines between different teams in the organization. Um, also increased reliability, performance and scalability of ML systems by you know, having a structured approach into how you deploy and host your models. Um, and, you know, simplification of uh, operational and governance processes. And the hope is to, all of this can lead to uh, increased return on investment for MLOps projects. Yeah, okay, I think everyone got the answer. So thank you very much, Thomas. So the question for Jim, how 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 works is different from others? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question, right? You know, I mean, there's if you're coming new into this space, there are so many systems and so many platforms. It's hard to really understand what to do. What I presented today was serverless machine learning and you can do it for free. Um, and Hopsworks is the only serverless feature store today. Uh, it's actually also the only serverless um, free. <laughs> I mean, you, you, there are uh, model serving. There are some, you know, clouds who have free serving tiers. So I won't uh, get into that. Um, but it's it's a unified platform for managing models and features, and it provides a Python native way of doing so. So it's the only feature store really today that's Python native, where you can take your feature engineering pipelines that you have today in Pandas, and just write the output to. Uh, the platform as a as a as a, a pandas data frame, and that makes it easier to fit in with many people's existing workflows where they just work in pandas. And some of the challenges that that Hopsworks really excels at are how to how to interact or go with data in the modern data stack. So in Databricks, Snowflake, BigQuery, Redshift, how to get that data both into the platform from Python and how to get that data out of the platform from Python. So as I said, we write. You can write with data frames, but if you're reading, you know, I showed in the talk some of the complex challenges related to point in time uh, correct joins. So to prevent data leakage when you have different features updated at different cadences, um, that is basically we do it with a uh, with very simple Python code that gets translated into SQL at the back that we run at the back end. So they're all things I think that we're doing uniquely. Um, and um, I think you know if you're interested, just give it a try. And uh, if you like Python, I hope you'll you like the new version. Okay, fantastic. I think everyone got the answer for that. So the Thomas, I think somebody was asking if you can get the share of the white paper you described. Is that any possibility? Uh, yes, definitely. So uh, you can uh, Google it out. But let me. Let me also provide a link in, in a chat. So if you can post it later on a, in the comment section, yes, it would be Fantastic. great. 
yeah we'll do no problem and i think everyone on the uh, on the q and a if you can share any recommendation or document for reading or any references could you please type it in the chat box or something so we can address to the audience i think that's a question asked from the public so just requesting you so okay. yeah this is the one i i was asked so i was just wrapping that up so the another one i think for boyan or i think boyan or thomas is the phone alone able to pick up these signals from the body or maybe it works hand in hand with the smart watch so so basically um the strap that kavi was wearing on its uh, on himself is sending bluetooth and amp plus uh um, wireless data and in a in a phone It seems we've lost Thomas. Oh, oh yes. Uh, there, there we have you. Go on. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Much the yeah. Yeah. So sorry. Sorry for interruptions. I was saying that the the the, the blue the heart rate strap that Kavi was wearing on himself is sending Bluetooth and Ant Plus signals that are collect. They are picked up by phone where we just have a simple application We're collecting this heart rate data and sending it to quicks uh to the web circuit connection it's like a companion app uh smartwatch would do basically the same job as mobile application in our demo um and you can obviously connect different sensors it doesn't have to be heart rate it could be a for example speed from the bicycle there's lots of devices using this protocol Okay, I think everyone got the answer for that. So thank you very much, Thomas, for that. Um, the another one is, I think, is for Jim. How could you effectively correct a data leak leakage after training a model? I don't think you can correct it. You know, like so, that's something you have to avoid. Um, so data leakage is is just the problem that the few when you when when you have an observation. And you're trying to train a model that these were the features at the time of the observation. If those features are coming from the future, well, then they're helping maybe you predict that whatever it is you're trying to predict, right? And there's no way to correct from it. It's a subtle bug that will appear in models that 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 they'll perform well. You'll fit a great on. You'll get a great you know accuracy in the training set, and. Um, then when it comes out into production, it won't perform as well. So I, I don't think you you know you 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 correct it after training a model. You have to address it before when you're preparing your data for training your models. Okay. <clears throat> the another one is this one. I think is for I think for everyone. Do you think that Python can be more involved in mobile software? I mean, operative operative system operating system. I think this is generic for everyone. I, I'll have a go. I'm a systems guy, so I don't think I don't think it has a great role right now because um, mobile phone devices uh, are resource constrained, and um, often they're multi-core. So one of the issues with Python is that Python native code is not efficient. It's not um, energy efficient. It's not particularly high performance. And then we have the global interpreter lock, which means it's hard to write multi-threaded code. And you know, if you're on Android and you're using the native kind of development environment and writing code in their version of Java, uh, or if you're in Objective C in, in Apple, that those are just higher performance languages. I, I don't I don't see anything in the near feature. Please someone correct me if I'm wrong. For the general purpose, general code. Anyone else? Thomas, no. Javier? Boyan? No? Okay, I think that's it for now. I think we are wrapping up the Q&A session. So all the questions are done. So thank you very much, Jim, Thomas, uh, Thomas Winton, Boyan, and Javier for your wonderful time. And I think everyone enjoyed so far so good. So please, all the audience, please stay connected with the speakers on the social medias like LinkedIn, Twitter, Twitter, whatever you feel ex excited. 
and please give big hand to all the speakers and we are having a quick break and then the, we are jumping to the next round of block of the speakers very soon so thank you very much all the speakers uh, you all have the wonderful time and enjoy the rest of the evening thank you very much thanks everyone bye everyone thank bye, you, bye bye So thank you guys. Thank you very much. That's all for my day. I think I'll have, uh, there is a I think quick break we are having, and I will hand it over to the next speaker and the next moderator. Thank you very much. See you. Bye. Also, we want to say a huge thank you to our friends from Scout for joining us once again and sponsoring this event. And as the application engineer landscape continues to evolve, the state of observability has become more and more exciting. With tools like Scout, you can get insights into your stack without having to be an observability expert. So with open telemetry, with a new open source project providing an unified standard for telemetry data, such as metrics, traces, and logs. Now with the open telemetry, Scout is building a new observability platform to help simplify telemetry data into actionable insights and is now accepting beta testers. If you want to know more about open telemetry and become a beta tester for Scout's new observability product, go to scoutamp.com slash observability to learn more and participate. Link is in the chat.
Open telemetry is the game changer here because it's basically created a lingua franca for observability. So until now, the way it worked is that if you did a vendor implementation, they would give you an agent, give you an agent to install in your environment, and they were in control of that, and they would, they would collect the data from your system. With open telemetry, you are using an open source technology that you can configure yourself and you can decide what you want to send, whether it's to a vendor or a third party or collect it yourself and analyze it yourself using open source tooling. So, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Anna and for the next three speeches, I will be with you like your moderator and I hope you have some fun. So, first of all, I want to remind you that we have a kind of giveaway yeah, about iPhone 13. So, uh, the result of this giveaway, you will know right after my blog. So, Nick will join and let you know who will get it. So, yes, also, I want to remind you that we just started our season and we call this season should be really, really hectic for us and for you as well. So please check our website and I hope that you will find so many interesting events for you for the next few months. So now I don't want to take time from our next speaker. Uh, it will be Jerry. Uh, Jerry has really amazing speech. 
Uh, also, I have to mention that this speech will be recorded, so he will join us for Q&A session. His topic is modern and robust Python with type hints. I'm sure that he will tell about himself in the intro of his speech. So, uh, stage is for the jury, and I'll join you soon. Hello, hello. My name is Jerry Busnen, and today I will show you how to write modern and robust Python with the help of type hints. I'll give some tips for how to type your own code, how to deal with your dependencies, and how to start typing existing projects. If you're already using type hints and are familiar with them, that's great. Hopefully, you'll still learn something new from this presentation. Before diving deep into the types, a couple of words about myself. So I'm a staff engineer and Python competence lead at Waltz. Walt is a technology company mainly known for its food delivery business, but we are actually doing plenty of other things as well. Python is a central part of our technology stack, not only in the data related operations, but also in the web backends. All right, let's start with some motivation. So here you can see some runtime exceptions reported by Sentry in one of our Slack channels. So yeah, these are real world exceptions, bugs in our code, basically. Yeah, our code is not perfect, unfortunately. But yeah, th these are exceptions that probably every single one of you have seen at some point while developing Python applications or more precisely when running your Python applications. These three examples are similar in the sense that some variable has a type that you probably didn't expect it to have while developing the application. And that then results in crash during runtime. Another very similar and typical one is when something is none when you expect it to be something else. I guess this is maybe one of the most frequent runtime exceptions that you see in Python applications. But how could we protect ourselves against these sorts of type errors and other similar exceptions? How could we catch them before they hit our production systems and maybe even affect our end users? Well, simple answer, use type hands and static type checker. But what are these type hints and how do we use them? Let's have a look at a simple example which showcases the power of them. So here you can see a piece of semi-dummy code. It's actually buggy, which you will see in a minute. So basically there's a main function which calls calculate discount price and then prints the discounted price and the original price. Let's run this to see uh, how this behaves. So if the price is 250, the discounted price is 225. And the calculation goes such that there is a separate function for calculating the discount percentage. And then the discount is basically reduced from the original price. But like I mentioned, there is a bug and it's somewhere on this area. And we can pinpoint that by trying this with something less than 100. If I now run this, we'll basically crash the type error unsupported operand types can't divide none by int, basically. So this is very similar to what we see, what we saw in the Sentry exceptions. So how could type hints help here? Let's have a look. So let's start by adding some type hints here. So the main is not returning anything, so the return type is none. This is probably int because we are using it as an int there. And this is returning float because there is a division there, so it will be a float. This is int, return type is int, 
So this is how the type hints look like. Will they save us? Is it any different if I run this? No, it's the exactly the same thing. So nothing sa saving us just yet. But the power of type hints comes when we start using them with the static type checker. So basically a kind of a linter that we can run already before running the actual code. My recommendation is to use MyPy. I'll just install it here. It's the go to static type checker in the Python community. There are alternatives. For example, PyWrite from Microsoft, PyType from Google, and then I think Facebook had a one on their own as well. But at least to my knowledge, MyPy is definitely the most widely used one. Right, now that we have installed the MyPy, we can run run it by my by simple example let's see what it says the first time it's a bit slow because there's no cache just yet but yeah <clears throat> it's saying that we are missing a return statement basically this function is missing a return statement so that's maybe already revealing us what's what is our bug so if we don't return within if or the elif, there's actually implicit return none here. If we make it explicit, we kind of show that, okay, it, this can actually return none, although we say it's only returning an int. And at this point, we could already fix the bug because it's quite evident that, okay, we probably should default to zero or something like that, but let's see. If we just fix the type errors one by one, so <clears throat> now we got a different one, incompatible return value type got none, expected int. That's basically fixed by saying that this can return either int or none. This is the new union syntax available since 3.10. If I run it again, now it's basically saying the exact same thing that we hit. Oh, this one. The exact same thing that we hit during runtime. So cannot divide none by int on line nine. And we haven't run the code at all. We are just running a static type checker here. So with this knowledge, it would be rather simple to fix the actual bug here. So if I change this to zero, then ask from my how it's doing. Now it's doing well. Now if I run this, works all good. So problem solved. None of our end users face this while interacting with our application. All good. All right, great. So this is how you add type hints to your own code and then detect potential weak points by using the static type checker. Then you might ask, how about all my dependencies? Do they have the type hints in place? What should I do with them? Well, if you're lucky, they might have, or at least some of them most likely have. And especially now that uh, packages are dropping support for some older Python versions, such as Python 2.x and some uh, early versions of 3.x, more and more projects are starting to introduce type hands. And even if your project doesn't have, or if the dependency doesn't have them baked inside their source code, there's a chance that there's a separate stops project which contains these type heads. So <clears throat> these stops are usually something that live outside of the code base of the actual project. And these stops contain only the typing information for all the signatures that are present in the actual package. 
the official location for this is the type chat. Let's have a sneak peek at that. So here's the type chat GitHub repository. As you can see, it's under the Python organization. So this is the official one. And the first sentence from the readme probably describes it the best. So <clears throat> external type annotations for Python standard library as well as third party packages. So even some of the uh, standard library signatures have their type hints living here. But as we were talking about dependencies, let's maybe have a look at one of the examples. So <clears throat> third party packages live under the stops directory. If I scroll a bit, you may see many familiar packages here. And if I pick one, let's say, let's take requests as it's probably the one of the most used ones. And if I open, for example, the api.pyi, so, so instead of the traditional py files, these are pyi files, and these look like this. So if we, for example, look the get function, so request.get, you can see that there's the function signature with empty uh, body for the function. So basically, like only the skeleton with the type hands. And just to get an idea like how this compares to actual implementation. So if we find the exact same module from the requests uh, source code, so requests api.py, and let's have a look at get. Looks like this. So the classic star star quarks, and then maybe on the doc string defined like what kind of stuff can live in the star star quarks. So when you have requests installed and you have this types installed or the stops installed as well the static type checker knows where to look at for the type information. Then if a uh, dependency can, cannot be found from the official location, the type set, you can of course look from the PyPI. For example, if I search for types here, there are more than 10,000 results. But just, uh, just be cautious with this because these can be basically contributed by anyone. These are not the official ones. They might be out of date or incomplete or whatever. So be a bit more cautious with this. And if there are no type hints within the project nor stops available, the next thing I would do would be to check the issue tracker of the project and see if there's some open issue regarding type hints already open there and maybe open one myself if there isn't. Quite often there is and there's usually some rationale behind like why there are no type hints just yet. And I've noticed that quite often there are types but the package authors just hasn't included the py.typed file in the in the package that they publish and that's required for static type checkers to understand that okay this package has types there's a dedicated pep rela related to this and yeah please help people out with adding the type hints especially now that they are dropping support for older python versions there's basically nothing stopping them to start using type hints if you're still out of luck, you can generate these stops yourself. And actually, MyPy comes with a very handy helper tool, StopGen, which helps in generating these stop files. And if you're generating or creating them yourself, 
usually you are using only a tiny bit of the of the functionality that the library offers. So it might be that you're using only one or two functions. So there's not much that you need to create the stops for. And then if you end up creating stops for the maturity of the project, like most of the signatures, then please consider open sourcing them. It most likely helps others and maybe let the package authors know as well by opening an issue or discussion or whatever they are using with their project. So as a recap with the dependencies, first you might be lucky, no need to do anything. Then MyPy is actually helpful with the second point, it will automatically say if there are stops available in the type chat. Then you can look from the PyPI, check the issue trackers and similar things from projects. And yeah, it's not that bad to create the stops yourself. Great. The next question you might ask, I have an existing project, is it too late to start adding type hands? Luckily, it's not too late. And we actually did this exercise at Vault for a number of different projects a couple of years back. And the main learning from this whole exercise was that you want to be strict regarding types for all the new code. So strict by default. And then to add the types gradually, you want to be loose regarding the files or the modules that are already there. So that you don't need to create a kind of big bang pull requests, which would add types everywhere. That's practically impossible for larger projects. But yeah, let's have a look at an example about strict by default loose when needed, what I actually mean by that. So <clears throat> let's consider this example dummy project. It has two modules. The content doesn't really matter, but the idea is that these don't have any type hands. So these are legacy and you start you want to start using type hands from now on. By configuring MyPy such that it's strict by default and loose when needed, you can achieve that. So basically, this strict is a one handed flag which flips multiple different flags to a stricter mode. So strict by default basically means something like this. Then we can be very explicit that for this module, it's okay if they don't have types. But for all the others that are not explicitly mentioned here, use strict configuration. So if I run my by here, there are no issues at the moment. And as you can see, no type hints anywhere. If I, for example, remove this, run it again, then it's saying that function missing type annotation. So the configuration is working. Now let's say I want to add some something new here. My new feature. Dev my function. For example, like this. If I now run my by here, it's saying my new feature function missing a re return type annotation. So now that we added something new, we need to add type hints for that. And that's that's awesome. We didn't need to touch the old code and we could immediately enforce types for all the new stuff. Then regarding this older modules, 
when somebody uh, somebody for example refactors or touches this otherwise it might be a good occasion to try to get rid of the the my by flag here so add the types before doing the refactoring or before adding the new feature that's very good friday afternoon activity for example so that's strict by default loose when needed. And then there are also tools such as MonkeyType from Instagram, which basically uh, monitors what kind of types are used during runtime and then creates the either the stops or the actual type hands based on that. So in theory, if you have 100% test coverage, you could run your test suite by using monkey type while running it and it would basically give you type hints for, for free this could give you a head start for typing some existing project then you might ask if i have that 100 percent test coverage should i still bother with type hands i would say definitely yes if uh, other packages are if other projects depend on your package. So if it's something that you publish, for example, the PyPI. Because like we saw, we in our dependencies, we need to do something if the type hints are not in place in the actual source code of the project. Even if it's some sort of application that you're not publishing the PyPI, nobody is depending on it. I would recommend reading uh, recent blog posts from the people of Euralib3. That's very mature project and they had 100% of test coverage. But they, they, they found out that when they added type hands, they spotted a number of weaknesses and even bugs while adding the type hands. And your lip tree is the second most downloaded package in PyPI at the moment. So I doubt your project is more mature than that. All right, now we have discussed about your own code, your dependencies. Is there anything else that you should take into consideration? Yes, there is. So now we have basically discussed for adding type hints and uh, checking the types via static type checker offline so basically on your own machine or during continuous integration almost always our own code is interacting with other systems as well for example it might be fetching some data from some external api or fetching data from database or whatever Ideally, you should runtime type check the data that you receive from this uh, external systems. I'll explain why this is important with a practical example. So let's have a look at this piece of code, which basically gives us the exchange rate between two currencies. Currently, it's uh, doing it for from euros to USD, aka dollars. So, if I run this, it's giving me the exchange rates from euros to USD on the date of the recording and um, how it works. The PIV is inside this function. So, <clears throat> it's getting the data from this API that I happen to found from GitHub. And yeah, this is returning exchange rate uh, instance, which is a data class, four fields. You can see them here as well. Uh, from currency and two currency are basically coming directly from here. And then date and rate are read from the payload got from the API. So as you can see, this works, but actually, there are a couple of uh, things here. So as you can see here, in the from currency and to currency are strings and also the date is string and rate is float. 
while in here this is string we might have a bug here because this is for some reason int and then another one this is a date time date while this is clearly a string but it's not crashing during runtime let's see what my pie says so it's saying that argument to currency uh, string expected int so that's helping us with this one we probably want to have this as a string then if we run my by again okay now it's happy however if i run this the date is still a string although we are saying that it's a date time date which is it's definitely not so basically this data is coming from external system from this api and we are telling uh, the static type checker that yes it's a date there's no way for it to know that it's a, a something else that's why we need to runtime type check the things that we get from external systems and for that nowadays there are awesome tools and libraries packages for this I guess the biggest one is Pydantic and it actually has a drop in replacement for the data classes. I'll show how to use it in a minute. Uh, most of you may have heard about Pydantic and if you have been using for example Fast API, it's one of the main building blocks of that. And yeah, it's <clears throat> offering front time type checking out of the box. So basically let's start by installing it and like i said it's a drop-in replacement for a data class so i can simply comment comment this out and then from bydantic dot data classes import data class now if I run this, what is different? So here the date is actually a date. So it didn't crash, but it did some magic here. So it coerced the type to be date because we said that it should be a date. And it was possible to convert this string to a date. So by default, Pydantic does some magic under the hood. If it ca cannot convert to the type that's specified, then it will raise. So for example, if we uh, bring the bug back, so if this would be an int, and then if I run this again, it will raise uh, <clears throat> Pydantic validation error uh, to currency value is not valid integer. So while the data class from the standard library was very happy with this, Pydantic is not. It will raise, which is good. And re regarding the magic it's doing, um, if you want to be strict with the type so that it doesn't do any magic, if I understood correctly, the V2 uh, will have st some strictness options available. And then I think the current version also has some configuration options to make it happen. But in most of the cases, it's actually good that it does some magic, but you just need to be aware of that. To summarize, use uh, type hints and static type checking for your own code and for your dependencies. And then on the edges of your application, when you're interacting with some other systems, use runtime type checking. And basically with this combination, you will 
end up with completely type safe applications. That would mean that no sentry errors in any Slack channels and no waking up during the night because something is crashing in production. Thank you. It was really pleasant presentation from Jerry, and we will hear some answers for questions that you might have after two more speeches. So we'll have common Q and D, uh, and you can think about questions that you would like to ask and write them down now or uh, during the Q and A session. So next, our speaker is Marcel. He is already here and waiting for his time to join the stream. So. Hi, Marcelo. How are you doing? Hi, Anna. I'm doing great. Thank you. How about you? <laughs> I'm also fine. Yeah, it's quite late for me, but it's all yeah. to moderate this amazing event. I really hope that our audience will get something new. Uh, already so many speeches and so many far. So I don't want to take your time. Please, stage is yours. Enjoy it and Thank you. have some fun. See you Thank soon. You. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Marcelo, and today I'm going to talk about uh, what does Starlet really do for FastAPI. Uh, FastAPI has been growing a lot in popularity on the last years, and I think uh, it's a good topic to talk about. <laughs> uh, a little bit about myself. I am currently uh, the top FastAPI expert. So FastAPI has kind of a definition of expert, which is a person that has replied uh, a lot of issues in the FastAPI repository. And I'm the person who has replied most of them. I've also set up the Discord server and I'm ar always around there and also around the Gitter server that we also have. So if you have any questions about FastAPI, I'll be there. And I'm also a maintainer of YouthCorn and Starlet. Yuvcorn is uh, a server that runs uh, FastAPI and applications that have the same kind of interface uh, as FastAPI. And Starlet is the web framework that's going to be the main subject of today. Uh, yeah, so let's go. So FastAPI, uh, I guess most of the people that are watching here knows about it. Uh, otherwise, it's kind of, yeah. So FastAPI is a web framework for building APIs based on type hints. Uh, coding FastAPI is, gives you a, a great developer experience. And I think that's the main reason why the framework uh, got so much popularity lately. And yeah, and Starlet is uh, a framework that is one of the two frameworks that is underneath FastAPI. So FastAPI is built on top of Starlet and Pydantic. Uh, Pydantic provides all the data part of it, and Starlet provides this toolkit of to build uh, the web application itself. And yeah, so this talk it's gonna be about understanding what is from FastAPI itself and what comes from Starlet. So FastAPI uses a lot of Starlet capabilities. So we're going to go to, through some features of FastAPI and understand a bit if it's for really from FastAPI or if it's inherited from Starlet. And the first one would be the background tasks. So just to give a bit of context, uh, background task in FastAPI is uh, a task, a function, a uh, coroutine that's going to be executed after the response is sent back to the client, uh, only in successful cases. So if we see this code uh, on lines six and seven, uh, this is going to be our background task, uh, or it's, it's uh, a sync function, right? And on line 10, we, have, we define this endpoint, which is send notification with an email as path parameter. And on, the on line 11, we have this email, and we also create uh, this background tasks object. It's not exactly created when you see it there. What FastAPI does, it's, it has this background tasks created. And then when it sees the, the signature of the endpoint function, it gives that to you. 
So on line 12, you're really going to have the background tasks object, and then you are able to insert the, the task that you want to run after. And yeah, so is this from FastAPI? So this is actually from Starlet. Uh, Starlet provides this, this the background tasks uh, class and also another class called background task with the, uh, without the S at the end. And just uh, the way to write it is a bit different of how you write in FastAPI. So as we see, like if you just take a look at this, you clearly see that it's a bit more verbose than what we saw previously. Uh, but uh, like if you see the light eight and nine, it's still the same background task, of course. But the way you write it, it's not the same in the sense that you don't have the decorator of the endpoint path. So if you see line 12, the endpoint function only receives uh, one argument, which is the request. And it can be either the request in case of, uh, uh, yeah, it can be either requests or WebSockets, depend, depend, WebSocket, depend on what you uh, are doing, right? <laughs> and on line 13, we see that the developer is actually the one that's going to create the object. So it's a bit different. And line 14 is basically the same, uh, just that as you are using pure stylet, uh, the framework is not inferring the path params for you. So you need to get it uh, on the request uh, object. And on the last line, uh, you have JSON response. And if you remember on the fast API, you do not do this. Uh, you do not return the JSON response object because fast API by default uh, uses the JSON response class. So what we see here, uh, this the line 13, where it returns the, the dictionary, fast API is using the JSON response class to create the object. And here on Starlet, we actually make it uh, explicit that we are doing it. And we are also past the background tasks. Uh, yes, cool. So, and the task line. Uh, if you've wrote a fast API application, you probably have used this uh, like the first day. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. And the thing is that uh, like on this example, we just have an application line seven to nine. It's just a simple endpoint. And on line 12, we just create uh, a test client that's going to have the, the application uh, there. And from line 15 to 18, we have uh, testing this, this endpoint. We just check the status code in the JSON. And this feature is from Starlet. So if you check the source code of Fast API and you check the module test client, you're going to see that is actually reimport from Starlet. And actually a lot of uh, well, a lot of what we, you, we you have on Fast API is actually a reimport. Uh, for example, the background tasks, it's a reimport. And this one as well. So the test is 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 the same also in Starlet. If we check, as I said, the code, it's the same test client. So if we check the code in Starlet, it is also the same. This is pure Starlet application. If you see from line 17 to 20, it's exactly the same as the one before. Uh, just the way to write it, it's more starlet onic uh, in comparison to the one from FastAPI. And yeah, so now uh, I just want to give a small tip uh, because I've seen this a lot. So the thing is that I really wish everybody would test the response body or at least at least part of it and because some cases are difficult to find if you don't do this uh, unless you have 100 percent coverage uh, which you this this tip is not going to be that helpful as you are not going to get through this case so if we see this application uh, from line uh, so line l8 we define uh, users slash user id and on line 10 we check if the user ID, this is sort of just an example. If the user ID is zero, uh, then the user is not found. And then on line 18, we have our test. And we just test that there is the status code is 404. And this actually succeeds. But the thing is that on line 19, 
uh, I'm using user and not users. So uh, we just had the wrong uh, body there. So the body that we wanted is the, what we have now in the screen on line 21, user not found, which is the same as the line 11. And the things that is gonna be resulting in error. So just test the response body and don't have this kind of scenario. There is also another scenario that this can happen and you are not aware. It's not only when you make mistakes, is uh, when you have two endpoints and uh, the reject matches the first one and then the second one doesn't run, but you are testing uh, uh, the wrong endpoint without knowing. Uh, this is uh, an edge case uh, of of also from first API and start it. Web sockets. Uh, web sockets uh, is from first API or is from solid. There is not much to say about this. Uh, it's basically what we have on the screen is an application. It's an, a web socket endpoint. You just accept uh, the connection. You send the text and you close the connection. And this is actually from Starlet as well. Uh, yeah, not always is from Starlet. Eh? <laughs> Calm down. Uh, anyway, so this is from Starlet. And just the way to write it is actually very similar. The only difference is that uh, you write it in, in a way that is more, uh, as I said, Starlet Onic. Yeah, I said that, yes. And yeah, that's it. Uh, the thing is that with FastAPI, you are not able to document uh, web sockets mainly because it fast api is really attached uh it depends it uses open api uh, specification and open api does not support web sockets i'm not talking about webhook the last version of open api supports webhook i'm talking about web socket stuff and there is no way to do this in fast api so you cannot document web sockets uh, natively using fast api but uh, there is a project called, uh, another specification called async API, which does have support for web sockets. It's a bit different of what open API proposes. It's more event driven uh, than restful that uh, in comparison to open API. And well, it's actually not possible yet to use this in fast API. No one has implemented, but I do have a project called fast API async API. Uh, which needs a bit of help. <laughs> if someone is interested on having web sockets documented in Fast API, I would uh, I could ha have some help there. So we're just doing a bit of propaganda. <laughs> uh, it's not completed, but uh, yeah, if someone is interested, it would be cool. So the Open API support. This is another feature uh, of, as I said, from Fast API. It's really uh, attached to it, depend on it. So, is it this? This is it. This is from Fast API or from Starlet. So, this is actually from both of the frameworks. Uh, I think this is the question that most of people would say Fast API for sure. Uh, if you even if you are uh, really familiar with the framework, because you have it's easier to do it on Fast API, and it's not that clear to do it on Starlet, I guess. Uh, so on fast API, you just have a simple application as, as we see on, on the right. Yeah. And, uh, it just adds a description, which you'd see that it's not matching with line 18 on the JSON because I got the wrong, uh, image, but it would be a replacement. Uh, <laughs> anyway, it generates an, an open API schema that it's, it's kind of, uh, what we see on our left and with Starlet, it's bigger. And it's not that out of the box. You cannot infer the open API JSON with the type hints that you add on the fast API application. Uh, so if we see on the home, uh, on the function home on your right, you see that on the doc string contains the, what's gonna be added on the open API schema. Uh, I think some, yeah, I think some Flask uh, doc string extension had something similar as this one. So maybe it was inspired for, uh, from that, I'm not sure. Uh, but not many people uses this feature. And uh, 
we might deprecate it at some point. I don't know. <laughs> Do not take this seriously. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, yeah, as you see, fast API is is it's easier in fast API to do to to document your endpoints. So yeah, so I would say yeah, fast API would be would be the one here. Middleware. So how to create middlewares in fast API? You basically do what you see on line 11. You create, uh, you use the middleware decorator, and then you add uh, which type of middleware you want to create. In this case, uh, an HTTP middleware. And it's the only type supported right now. And I think it's going to be the only one supported uh, ever, uh, like built in from, from Fast API. And this middleware on line 13 receives, uh, you get the request. You call the next middleware or application. Uh, on, on the protocol that FastAPI uses, the concept of middleware and application, application are kind of the same. It really depends on which position they are in the terms of which is called first. And then, uh, well, it depends on the context. So in this case, on line 13, imagine that a request arrives. And then the call next is going to call the endpoint that's going to call the home function that we see on line 7. And then you're going to receive a response. The body of this response already have has the hello world. And then on line 14, we're going to add the headers. And then the client is going to receive that response. And this feature is from Starlet. Everything that we see here is also from Starlet. Uh, not well, line 11 is actually directly from Starlet. Even if Starlet does not uh, motivate our users to use the decorator, this is still from Starlet. But the way to write it and motivate like how we want people to use Starlet directly is uh, inheriting the base HTTP middleware. And then if you see the dispatch function on line 10, it's basically the same as we have uh, on line 12 here. Uh, it receives the same parameters, right? And it does the same thing. And yeah. And another feature that is kind of people are not really aware that it exists, I guess, uh, it's the path converter, uh, which is a feature that is actually provided by Flask and Django. And I think on those frameworks, they are more used than on FastAPI. Uh, so if we see on line 13, uh, we have a slash numbers, a slash, uh, and then the, the number path param. And this, this endpoint is only going to be called if uh, it this matches and if the number is really uh, a number, if it's uh, full of digits, uh, which is kind of different if we remove this path param. So if, sorry, if we remove the converter, if we remove the int at the end of line 13, uh, this endpoint is going to receive requests uh, even if number uh, is not an integer. But the thing is that it's going to fail with a different exception because FastAPI validates the path parameters as well. So on line 14, we make sure that the number is an int. So this is going to fail with uh, 422, uh, unprocessable entity. But the usefulness on, of this in FastAPI is what do we see on line 8, which is uh, the usage of path. So if you want to get a path from an endpoint uh, of, on, on a path parameter, you would ha gonna have to use uh, the converter at some point. Uh, otherwise, you cannot get from, from the path. And this feature, it's from Starlet. Uh, it provides all this capability. And lately, we added uh, a possibility to add your own converters. Uh, we, we make it possible because we implemented the public API to make your own uh, converters. Uh, it can like a useful scenario when you want this is, for example, if you have you use Mongo and you have an object ID and you want a converter to have to to only let you access the root then point if uh, you have a valid uh, object ID. And yeah, this is the implementation on Starlet. As you see on line eight and thirteen, we get the path parameters and. Uh, yeah, it's basically the same, but on line 19 and 20, we have the definition of the endpoint, uh, the, the, yeah, the endpoint path. But then <laughs> what FastAPI brings to the table? So 
So we saw that a lot of stuff from Starlet are being used uh, in Fast API, which is really cool. I don't know if a lot of people know about that. Uh, but the thing is that Fast API provides a lot out of the box, which is really useful and which is something that you really want uh, to use. And I don't know if people were here, but the previous speaker, I think Jerry, uh, sorry if I said your nom name wrong. <laughs> uh, he he presented a picture which he used uh, data coming in, data coming in from the database, and the application protected, uh, uh, fully type annotated and stuff. So this is something that uh, it can be easily achieved with Fast API, as the the idea is to have uh, uh, the data validation in the input and output of your application. So this is something that, uh, this was mainly the reason why I, I choose, I choose FastAPI to work with when like two years and a half ago when I started with the, with the FastAPI community and stuff. And it also provides autocomplete, which I, I kind of know that is the feature that everybody, that makes the, the framework popular because it, makes everybody happy and it's very pleasant to work with fast API because you always have auto completion all the time and it's fast to, to develop. Also the API documentation, as you see in Starlet it's possible, but it's not out of the box, out of the box as well. Less errors and bugs. It's for the, the type annotation capabilities and how it, when you document, you also avoid mistakes, but, uh, it's basically around the other, the other points that we have on this list. And it's, uh, it provides, it's, you, you use async Python with it, you can use. So this is something modern and uh, people have liked a lot lately. So anyway, thank you very much. Uh, this was my presentation. Thanks. <laughs> thank you so much for such amazing presentation. I mm -hmm. hope you shared everything that you would like to and wanted to. Anyway, if you miss something, or audience decided that you miss something, that will ask, <laughs> it was not clear for them. So guys, don't forget that we have Q&A session and you can ask any questions that you would like to ask other speakers. So I think about it now or during the Q&A session. So I want to say a few thank you for your session and I will see you very, very, very soon, right after one more speech. So have a break and I will talk to you later. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you. Yes, and it's time to announce our next speaker. And uh, uh, really, this speech will be pre-recorded and I really hope that uh, you can spend really productive time last next 50 minutes. So our next speaker is Aldor and he will talk about solid principles in Python, designing software that scales. So uh, I don't want to take his time. His presentation is really quite big. Please be attentive and uh, try to get something interesting in you for you. See you. Hello everyone. My name is Aldo. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat and welcome to my presentation, Solid Principles in Python, Designing Software That Scales. So let's go straight to the presentation because we have just 30 minutes. So let's go for the agenda. So first of all, I will talk uh, or I will do a little introduction of my talk. Then I will explain the objectives of Solid. Then we will talk about the basis of software design. Later, we will go to the solid principles. I will explain all the solid principles one by one. And while I explain all the principles, we will see some code examples um, for both um, examples that violate the principles and other examples that fulfill the principles or are strict to the, to the principles. So I will see two versions the wrong version and the right version for each of the principles. So I like to start uh, with a quote from Ken Beck that says, I'm not a great programmer, I'm just a good programmer with great habits. Basically, that means that you don't need to be super smart or super clever or 
even brilliant to become a good software engineer, you just need to follow good habits and study and practice. So I encourage everyone to do it and to put the effort on it. So a little introduction, what is SOLID? So basically SOLID is just an acronym created by Ken Beck that is based on the object-oriented programming principles that were developed by Robert C. Martin in the 2000 in his paper Design Principles and Design Patterns. So basically it's an acronym, acronym for a set of principles. So the objectives of SOLID. Um, basically uh, SOLID serves as a guide to create software that is scalable, maintainable, reusable and stable. So in short, to create quality software. Sc scalable means that we can add new functionalities to the system. Maintainable is that we can keep the system working as it was before and making changes to the existing functionality. Reusable basically means that we can use different parts of our system to create new functionality. And stable means that the software system uh, behaves as expected without risk conditions, without the uh, unit test failing, uh, without knowing the reason or anything that makes the system uh, behave unexpectedly. So basically, SOLID serves as a guide to create quality software. So I like to talk about the basis of software design. So we have two concepts here. First of all, we have cohesion, that is basically the degree to which different elements of a system are united to achieve a better result than if they work separately. So in other words, uh, cohesion talks about how we can bundle multiple software units together to create a larger software unit. And we also have coupling, that is the other um, definition that we need to measure the, the software design or the quality of our systems, that is uh, coupling is the degree of interdependence that two software units, classes, functions, models, whatever, have with each other. So cohesion talks about different units, how they are bundled together to create a bigger one. And coupling talks about how is this relationship between software units. So we have two different concepts here when we talk about the, the software design. And now going to the solid principles, uh, we have five as SOLID has five letters. So the first one is the single responsibility principle and it says that a class should have only and only one reason to change. And this uh, is the principle that is more related to the cohesion definition. So if you look at the cohesion definition, we talked about how things are related to the same unit and single responsibility principle talks exactly about that. So a class should have one and only reason to change. And how can we uh, achieve that? We basically gather together the things that change for the same reasons and we separate those things that change for different reasons. So this is just a definition and to better understand that we can go to the, to the code. Uh, I will show later what is the code and I will share the link. So for now, um, I will just uh, go through the code examples and at the end of the presentation, I will share the link because I just want you to keep the attention here and to follow me. And basically, it's a repo that I have created with the code examples. And basically, uh, you can just check it later and see the code examples and execute it by yourself and play around with that. And it has a readme with how to execute all, all the different examples that are here. And basically, um, this folder has like a diagram subfolder with some uh, diagrams that I have created for the, for the different uh, code examples that you can check later. And also it contains the source code, obviously. And for each solid principle, I have created a folder. For example, for the first one, the uh, SRP, the single responsibility principle, uh, we have like the wrong version and the right version. So I will first show the wrong version and we jump to the right version later to see the difference and see how can we achieve uh, the solid principles uh, step by step. So for the first example in the wrong folder, we have just, um, this would be like the first example where you just have a main module that talks to or has a relationship with a user class. And if we go to the, to the code, basically um, this is in this uh, main file here, 
we basically uh, use, I'm using data classes here, so we need to use Python 3.7 or later. And for those that don't know what data classes are, basically are a way to create um, classes without, without the need to implement um, the init method or the representation method. So it's just a syntactic sugar, let's say, to create uh, classes. So basically the only thing that you need to do is to import data, cl or data class from data classes and you add a decorator here and you say add data class and you say class user and here we can simply define the, the attributes for the user class so we don't need to define any init method and we can later create uh, objects from that class without defining the init method here so it's just syntactic so so this is about data classes going back to our example we have a, a main a main file here and a main function that what is doing is creating a user. So we have here, for example, Aldo equal to user, and we are passing some arguments. We are passing the name, the surname, the age, and the password, as you can see here, Aldo, Sir Turpin, my age and a password here, let's say that it's secret. And the class user has a method that is print info, that basically it prints the information from the user. Also note that I'm using here f strings, so I don't need to concatenate any strings. I can directly put in curly braces the variables that I want to use. And I create uh, this function to paint info from the user. And I also have a function here that is encrypt password, that basically what it does is it iterates for all the charts of the password. It then creates an encoded chart with the, the same chart plus concatenating the length of the password. And at the end, and at, it adds the, the chart to, the, to a list. And basically, at the end, it returns the, the list joined in a single string. So basically, uh, we say Aldo is a new user, and we print information from Aldo, and we say encrypted password of Aldo.name is Aldo encrypted password. And we do the same for Elliot. So basically, we have like two users, and for each of them, we just print some information. Let's see. So if we execute that, to execute that, we just need to go to the readme and there's a section here that says uh, how to execute the examples. You should be in the root folder. We are already in that. So we just copy, paste and execute. And if we just follow the program, basically, as I was mentioned, it first prints the information from Aldo. Then it prints the encrypted password of Aldo is the password. And as you can see, as I mentioned before, for the the super uh, encrypt password algorithm. I'm just um, appending the length of the password to each character. So you can see here is S C secret here and just appending six to each character because secret has six letters. And then we are here printing the information from Elliot that it, it's coming from, from here, Elliot print info. And it's the same from Elliot. The password is I am a great hacker and the encrypted password of Elliot is I19 uh, underscore 19, A, 19, and 19. So you get it. Uh, I am a great hacker has 19 letters. So it just uh, appends 19 to each uh, character or letter. So it says I am a great hacker in code. Okay, so this is like the, the wrong uh, version of the single responsibility principle. And the main problem that we have here is that the user class has a lot of responsibilities. So if you take a look, uh, the user class is both uh, printing information from itself, but is also responsible of encrypting the password. And this is not a good thing because if we want to change, for example, the algorithm to encrypt the password, or we want to provide more than one algorithm, we will need to change the user. And this is not related to the user. This should be another entity or object that is responsible uh, of that. So basically for the, the right version, uh, we go to the right folder and we have like the diagram here. So instead of having just a user class, we have the main module that uh, is related to the string encryptor, a user printer and a user. So the string encryptor will be responsible of encrypting a string. The user printer will be responsible of printing a user and the user class will just have the attributes for the user. So basically, uh, what we can do now is see the or see how the code is structured and the different parts. So for the user printer class, we just um, and also note that here I'm not using data class for this class, for example, because uh, I don't have any attribute. I just have behavior, and if I don't have uh, any attribute and just behavior, I don't need to use data classes because uh, I don't have any benefit right now. So I just use a single. Um, 
old fashioned way uh, class and I just have the user printer with a method that is print user to console and this method what it does basically is it calls uh, the user object user dot get representation and it prints it to the standard output and I also have another mechanism to print users that is print user to file for example that it receives an output file name a user and what it does is it opens the output file name that we passed for writing and we just write the user presentation to the file and just print successfully written user to file and the, and the file name. So, so we have two different ways to print users uh, thanks to the user printer class and for the user uh, we just have the same that we have seen before, the different attributes for the user and the get string representation. And for the string encrypter, this was like the part of the function that was um, responsible of encrypting a, a, a password or, or the password of a user. In that case, string encrypter is not coupled right now with a user because it just receives <coughs> a string that is called to encrypt, that is the string that we want to encrypt. And the function is exactly the same as before in the user class, just that instead of having uh, the dependency with the user, we just have a dependency with an arbitrary string, so we can pass any string and encrypt that string. And if we go to the main uh, file or module of the, the right uh, version, we have uh, something really similar to uh, the older version. We have uh, two users, we have now a user printer, so an object that is responsible of printing the user, and we just simply do user printer dot print user to console, user printer print user to file, and I'm printing Aldo and Aldo here, this to, to the console and this to a file, a blank line, and I'm doing the same for Elliot. I also am creating an instance of string encryptor, as is a standard uh, class, so this is an object of the string encryptor class. And I'm just encrypting both passwords. First one, Aldo password encrypted, a string encrypted, the object that we created, encrypted a string, and we pass the password. And the same for Elliot. So the coupling between our uh, objects is better because we don't couple, for example, a um, user to the encryptor. We just pass a string here. I'm just passing the password. And if we execute this example, we can go to the readme, to the uh, right version, SRP right. We clean that, we paste, and we execute, and we have the same as before. We have like the user information for Aldo, a successfully written user to, to file. This is coming from, from here, uh, from user printer, sorry, this one, user printer, print user to the console. And we also have the print user to console Elliot. So we have the Elliot's information here and successfully written user to file Elliot that is coming from a user printer, print user to file, and we are passing Elliot. No, so we have like the two files for Aldo and for Elliot. And for um, the, the final part that is coming from password encrypted of Aldo and password encrypted of Elliot is the same as before. So is this that we have seen before, but now the responsibilities in different classes. So we have uh, gone from uh, this main just coupled with user, having user a lot of responsibilities. We go to the right version that is this one main with is coupled with the string encrypter and user printer and a user and user does not have any relationship with any other object so user sticks to just the user information so each class has its own responsibility so we want we, when we want to add new functionality or change something we just go to the class that uh, we should change not a whole class with a lot of, a lot of methods that are they uh, in the same class without any uh, clever um, idea or reason to be on the same class. So we just split classes in different responsibilities. So each class is responsible of doing something, something different in that case. And if we come back, let me just uh, close this and let's just let that collapse. And if we go back to uh, the presentation, we go to the next um, principle is the open close principle. And this principle, what it says uh, basically is that a software entity should be open for extension but closed for modification. So uh, how can we achieve that? What we can do is use polymorphism instead of hard coding if else behavior in our methods. So the typical use case of, or the typical example of having a huge method of if something do something else do something or if else, if else, or is else if, else if, else if. Uh, it's like a bad approach to, to make your, your system grow. 
and now we will see we will see what we should do instead. So let's start with the um, again source open colors principle and let's see the wrong version. And for the wrong version, we have something really similar here in the wrong um, diagram. Let's say we have like the main uh, module that is coupled to the same encryptor, the user printer, and the user. So this is like we have seen before. It's the same. But now we are adding uh, new things. For this example, we have also the user is uh, coupled with the admin config file. So think of admin config file just as a class that encapsulates um, what would be a, a simple file with a um, title and a content. And user is also coupled to authorization level. So in this example, what we will do is try to uh, users or make users try to read some admin config files. And depending on the authorization level, we will see if the user can read or can't read the, the file. So for the user, uh, same as before, we have a class user with name, surname, age, and password. But now we are adding, as I've shown you in the diagram, we have an enumeration. So it's a class, but it's it has as a base class the uh, enum from the enum package. So basically, this is an enumeration with three possible values. The authorization level can be guest, register, or admin. And a user has an authorization level. This is uh, the, the arrow that is going from user to the authorization level because the user has as a property or as an attribute an authorization level. So a user can be a guest, registered registered or admin, one of these three values. And basically, we have the same as we saw before. Get string representation is exactly the same. But now we have something uh, new. We have the read file content. So the user receives as a parameter a file, an admin config file. And, uh, and this admin config file basically is a class that has a name and a content. So it's super simple, this class. And the user tries to read uh, this file or this this class, let's say. So we have some info context here saying that the, this user is trying to read the file. So it's just context here. But the important part is here. We have if self dot authorization level is equal to guest, we simply uh, return that uh, the an error saying, well, this is an string, but is an string saying error. The user cannot access the file because he or she must be registered and admin because a regular user cannot access an admin file, admin configuration file in, in this, in this uh, example, let's, let's say. And then we have also another if that say, if the authorization level of the user is equal to register, uh, please note that guest and register and admin are values from the authorization uh, enumeration. So we are just checking the value of the, of the attribute. So for this, in, the, in that case, if the authorization level is registered, we again say error. The user cannot access the file, even his uh, or she is registered because he or she must be admin. And in the last if, we say if the authorization level is equal to admin, in that case, we return the info context, but we say permission granted, the content of the file is whatever. So in, this is the only case where the user can see the admin config file because uh, he or she is an admin. In the other cases, he or she cannot because it's not, it's not an, an admin. So basically, uh, we are hard coding here if, 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 three ifs. And for the admin config file is the, the same as I mentioned, name and content. And for the string encryptor, this is the same as before. So it's nothing interesting to show here. So we have seen that a user is coupled to authorization level, but is also coupled to admin config file because it tries to read the config file. So if we go to the right version of that, we will see that change uh, things change a little bit. We have the same as before, string encrypted, user printer, user and admin config file. So these four elements are the same because the user is trying to read an admin config file. But what is changing here is that user now tries or is coupled to an interface that it's called um, I authorization controller. So this is an interface that has different implementations. So we have the admin authorization that implements the interface, register authorization implements the interface, and guest authorization implements the interface. So basically an interface with three different implementations. So uh, the main idea here is user printer is the same as before, so we will not see it. Um, user is the same as before for the attributes and the get the same representation. But the important part here is that the user right now 
um, when we say user read admin file, when we try to read the file, what we do is we first create the context, this is the same as before, but now what we say file content is equal to self.userAuthReader, so this is an attribute of the user class, but is, in, is a, an interface, and we say that uh, self.userAuthReader read admin file, and we pass the file. So we are delegating the responsibility to an interface, and we try to um, read the file content through the interface, so we are not coupled to the to the implementation details we are just coupled to the interface and at the end of the function we just say return info context and file content so take a look at here that we just uh, delegate the responsibility into an interface and this is uh, really great because now all the logic for reading the files and the if this file if this user can access or cannot access the file is all grouped in the in the same place so we have a, a package called admin config file reader that basically contains first of all it contains an interface and for the subclass hook it's just a matter of uh, python to detect if a subclass is of the of or if a instance of an object is a subclass of, an, of another class so basically you can check out the documentation for the subclass hook but it's not important for this example the important part here is the interface that is defined here is using uh, abc meta as a parent class so i'm using abstract base class here so technically speaking this is not an interface but i am using it as an interface as i'm just defining abstract methods without any implementation so from the logical point of view, uh, this can be used as an interface. So I simply define get authorization level and read admin file. These are the two uh, methods that all the implementations of this interface should provide. In our case, uh, we have three implementation, admin authorization, guest authorization, and register authorization. And if we go to the uh, guest authorization, this is the logic that it was uh, hard-coded uh, before in the user, if you take a look here the, for the guest authorization, this is, remember, this is for the wrong, so we are comparing that now. We had before, if authorization level is equal to guest, we do something. So the logic is in the user, in the wrong version, but now in the right version, instead of that, we create a class that implements the, in the interface and we provide the two uh, methods. First of all, get authorization level, it just returns guest because this is a guest implementation. And read admin file, it returns permission denied because uh, the user can read the file. He or she must be registered an admin. So we provide the implementation here for the guest. We also provide the implementation for the register. It's uh, really simil similar. We just provide the register and also the logic saying that it cannot access the file but also we provide the admin authorization class that implements again the interface and we provide the admin string because uh, it's get authorization level, in that case it's admin and for the read admin file, for this implementation as this class is an, an admin level we just say permission granted, the content of the file is whatever so if we take a look at the main file, how it's using all that, that um, classes Basically, what it does is, first of all, it imports uh, everything, as I shown in the diagram, the interfaces and the concrete implementations. And we say in the, in the main, we just uh, create the different objects for the guest. I just pass a get authorization uh, class, so this is implementation of the interface. For the Elliot, I'm just passing a register authorization. This is the implementation of the interface. And for the Aldo, I'm passing the implementation of the interface. So we have three implementations here. This is one, this is two, and this is the third one. And the user, the, remember the important thing here, if you take a look at the last, last parameter, is expecting an interface. So here is uh, we, where we are uh, leveraging the polymorphism power, because we expect an interface, but we pass a concrete class. And we just say user printer, user printer, we print the users to the console, we create an admin config file with uh, both attributes, and finally we just try or make the users try to read the admin file, yes, read admin file, earlier read admin file, and algorithm admin file. And if we execute uh, that, 
um, in the wrong example, we can see that, as I mentioned, this is the same as before, printing some information for the user, for the user, for the user. The important part is here below. Guest is trying to read the file. He cannot read the file because uh, it must be registered an admin. And for Elliot, is uh, something similar. Uh, he cannot access the file because even he is registered, she also, she also needs to be admin. And for Aldo, in that case, I'm uh, admin, as you uh, can see in the main, because when I created the Aldo object, I said admin authorization. As I'm admin, I can simply uh, permission granted, the content of the file is, and I can read, this is the content of a super secret compilation file. So I can access the file in, in that case. So this is like the, the, the difference between the wrong and the right. For the wrong, we had like a, the coupling between user and authorization level and the logic was in user. But for the right version, we have an interface and different implementations for each, for each uh, case. Um, I will close other. I will go back to the presentation. Let's go for the third one, list of substitution principle. Basically, it says uh, derived classes must be substitutable for the base class. And how can we do that? Well, we must ensure that classes just implement or extend from what they do, not from general behavior. This is the typical case where you have like a huge base class with a lot of methods, and then you have some subclasses that for some of them, they have for some methods, their rise not implemented exception, for example. So different classes um, that are implementing or are um, coming for a same base class, but some of these subclasses does not behave as the parent class. And this is a problem as we will see now. So um, for the list of substitution principle, we just have the wrong version because we will use the interface segregation principle to make a list of fulfilled. So basically, and the list of just have a wrong version and the interface segregation principle has a right version. So for the wrong version of the list of, so we are violating here the principle, we have the, the wrong um, diagram that we have a main class and we have an animal based class that has three different uh, subclasses, bird, fish and human. And for the bird and the animal based class uh, or bird extends from the animal based class, fish the same and human the same. So um, for the animal-based class, this is really simple. Again, this is Python details. Oops, sorry. Um, uh, we have like, uh, let me just do that because I forgot to format the document. So now it's format. Um, I just have like uh, different, different methods here, walk, fly, and swim for what we consider an animal. And we also have a name. So basically, um, we have this attribute and some methods. Okay, we say not implemented for all the methods because this is the abstract base class and we will not have any, any implementation, not implementation, sorry, any instantiation of this class. We will have subclasses that inherit from that class. So we have the, the, the human, for example, for the human, for the walk, it says a human can walk, for the fly, it raises an exception, a human cannot fly, and for the swim, I can swim. And something similar for bird, a bird uh, can walk, a bird cannot fly, but a bird cannot swim, just for this example. Some birds can swim, but let's stay for the simplest example possible. And also for the fish, something similar. We have for the walk, it raises an exception because um, yeah, a, a, walk, a, um, a fish cannot walk and for the fly, it says the same, uh, a fish cannot fly, but for swim, it says uh, a fish can swim. So we have three different methods for each of them. If the animal can do something, it prints, but if it cannot, it simply uh, raises an exception. So um, for the main part, well, we have the human, as I mentioned, that can uh, both walk and swim, but it cannot, uh, or he or she cannot fly. And for the main method, main module, we have uh, print names, make animals fly and make animals swim, swim that basically uh, these, uh, each of these functions, what they do is they receive an animal based class and for each of them, uh, it simply executes a method. So for uh, the print names, it will just um, call to print animal.name. 
For make animals fly, it will call animal.fly. For swim, it will call animal.swim. And for walk, it will call animal.walk. So basically, those functions are iterating over the animals and calling a method for each of the animals. And in the main, we just create animal. So it's a list of animal based class. And we have the human, the fish, and the bird. And we print names, we make animals fly, and we make animals swim. And finally, we make animals walk. And if we simply execute this uh, example, going back to the README, going back to the OCP write, uh, sorry, this was already seen before. So for the list scope wrong, we simply uh, execute that. We go to the to the main, and we say that for the print names that is called here, we just say print names. Um, it prints the names for the animals, but for flies, it tries to iterate over all the animals, but it encounters an exception or an error because uh, a human cannot fly. So we passed a, we passed a list of animal based classes to the function of uh, make animals fly. But as some animals cannot fly at some point, this uh, code will crash. So this is um, making a uh, or pretending that a real uh, system will crash, so a human cannot fly in that case, so it, it returns an error. And for the animals, make animals swim is something similar because a human can swim, a fish can swim, but when we encounter the bird, it says something went wrong, a bird cannot swim. And for the make animals walk is something similar. A human can, uh, a human can walk, sorry, but when it encounters a fish, it says something went wrong, a uh, fish cannot walk because fish does not um, or implement implements the abstract base class, the abstract uh, base class that we have defined for the animal base class. But for this example, for the fish, for example, it raises an exception because the a fish cannot fly. So we are pretending or we think that we can use uh, base classes in everywhere in our code, but this is not true because some subclasses has exceptions or have exceptions for some methods of the base class or the implementation of the base class. So to fulfill that or to in order to make the code the code go go from wrong to right, we need to apply the next principle that is the interface segregation principle. So the interface segregation principle says that many client specific interface are better than one general purpose interface. So how, how can we achieve that? We basic, basically use many interfaces that define few methods instead of defining uh, or, or instead of being forced to implement methods that will not be used. That is something that we have seen now because uh, a human for, or, or a bird had a method that was um, uh, swim that it really cannot swim a uh, 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 fish so uh, uh, a bird. So we have some methods on the base classes that really should not belong to the same base class because we need to split the responsibility. So if we go to the code to better understand that example, uh, remember for the wrong, we had an animal based class that was bird, fish and human. But now if we go to the interface generation principle for the right version, uh, what we have is something different. We have a main class that is coupled with uh, four different interfaces. We have like the swim interface, we have the work interface, the fly interface and the animal interface. And also we have three different classes, the bird, the fish and human, as same as before. But now the important thing here is that the bird interface and uh, the bird class sorry, just implements the animal interface, the, um, the fly interface, but not the work. If you look at the bird, it has a, an arrow to animal and to fly and to walk, but the bird does not have any arrow to, to swim. So bird implements animal, fly and walk. For the fish, it's something similar. It implements animal and it also implements swim, but a fish does not implement the walk interface because a fish cannot walk. And for the human is again similar. A human can be or can implement the, the animal interface. This interface is just an interface that said that an animal has a name. So this is why all the classes implement the interface. This is like to show uh, a common method for all of them, for the example. So human implements the animal interface. Human also implements the walk interface because, because a human can walk. And also the human implements the swim interface because a human can swim. So if we go to the, to the, to the code itself, we see that we have interfaces, the, all the interfaces that I mentioned. So we define the methods 
for the animal is just get name, for the fly it is just a fly, for the swim is just swim, and for the walk, the walk interface is just walk. So little interface with just one method. And when we go to the to the main, uh, we see that we have the same as before, the names, make animals fly, make animals swim, and make animals walk. But the difference here is that uh, when we create the three, the three different um, animals, let's say, we create, we create animals, is a list of all the animals, we print names, and we create flyer animals. So flyer animals is a list of interfaces because or, or implementations of the interface. In the case of the interface for the fly, remember that the bird implements the fly, the iFly interface, and we make animals fly, and we just pass the animals that can fly because it's just an interface. And for the swimmer animals, we have something similar. We have the iSwim interface, and we have the human and the fish classes that implement the interface. So we just pass those animals. And for the walker animals, it's something similar. Again, we have like the human and the bird. So we have just two classes that implement the interface. But the important thing is that the walker animals is just an interface. So if we look at the different methods, for print names is a list of animals. For make animals fly is a list of I fly the interface. For make animals swim is a list of interface swim, and for the animals walk is a list of I walk interface. So we have different uh, narrow interface instead of a general base class. And when we execute like uh, the code here, we can go to the README. We can just uh, the ISP write because we just have the right uh, version as I mentioned because we are. Um, like fixing the violation of the of the last uh, principle of the Liskov. So the Liskov was violated, uh, the principle was not fulfilled here, but with the ISP we are fulfilling the Liskov uh, principle and also the interface generation principle. So if we execute that, we basically can see that um, our program does not crash because we can print the names of all the animals, all the animals that we have passed can fly because we just passed the interface and for the swim is the same we just pass animals that can swim and for the walk is the same because we pass uh, animals that uh, can walk so we just pass the interfaces in each of the scenarios so we we went from something that is common to all the base class uh, the subclasses to uh, different classes that just implement the interface that they need to implement or the behavior that they have not a general one that is the same for all of them because they behave differently, but they were uh, implementing the same base class. And this is something wrong. We should, we should be using narrow interface for each of the behavior. And we can have different com combinations. If uh, an, interface, an interface can uh, encapsulate more than one behavior, we can create an interface that contains more than one interface. But what we cannot do for sure is having a base class for all the subclasses when some of the subclasses has exceptions or have exceptions for some methods of the base class. This is really wrong. And uh, to finish with the last uh, principle, we have the dependency inversion principle that it says we should depend on abstractions, not concretions. And we can achieve that in two different ways. First of all, uh, high level modules should not depend on low level modules both must depend on abstractions and at the same time abstraction should not depend on details details should depend on the abstractions so this uh, said that way maybe it does not make uh, much sense but with the example it will be uh, a lot clearer if we go to the to the example to the last one we can simply uh, take a look at the um, uh, source dependency version in that case we have a wrong version and a right version i will be based on the same example uh, for the right and wrong and in that case for the wrong version we have something similar as the beginning we have the main string encrypter user printer and the user this is the same as the first example that i uh, shown in the srp the single responsibility principle so we have the same base things and we basically uh, have exactly the same so i will not go into the code because it's exactly the same as i mentioned before in the in the srp here, but uh, the important thing is that the, the classes are those ones, string encrypter, user printer, and user. And uh, this is wrong um, regarding the dependency inversion principle. Regarding to the SRP, this is right because each class 
has its own or have its own um, responsibility and the responsibility are split it. But uh, the problem here is that we are coupling um, objects with implementations details instead of with interfaces. So interfaces are a way to think of um, uh, a contract. So an interface says what a class can do and the implementation says how the class do it. And in that case, uh, instead of having that, what we should have is something like that. It looks a little bit more complicated, but just because the main has uh, arrows to all the different elements, so main is coupled to all the different elements. But the important thing here is that um, we have um, the user. The user is coupled to an interface that is string encrypted. So instead of being coupled as before to a string encrypter, so the user was previously uh, coupled to a string encrypter class and an uh, implementation detail. Right now, what we have is a user being coupled to an interface. And string encryptor has two different implementations. It has a random string encryptor and a simple string encryptor. So two, in two implementations for the same interface. And the user, now it's coupled to an interface user printer. So an interface with two different implementations, user printer console and user printer file. OK? So basically, in the code, uh, we can see in the in the mail in the main file, and we see that first of all we import everything. We then create a simple string encryptor. The simple string encryptor, what it does, is is um, defining the same encrypt mechanism as we had before. The simple algorithm that it appends to each character the length of the of the string. So this is the same as before, but now. We also have a random string, uh, a random string encryptor that also implements the interface because it receives uh, the base class in, in here. When we say class random string encryptor, we pass the, the interface. We just say that instead of appending to each char the length of the password, what we do is we create a random number between zero and the password or the, the string to encrypt and we append to uh, each character this random number. So it's not fixed, it's another mechanism to encrypt the, the char or the string, sorry. So it's a different mechanism. This always, uh, the simple string always appends the length of the password, but the random, as the name suggests, is a different implementation that uh, it goes to the random module and it appends a random number to each character. So it's different, but both implements the same uh, interface. So uh, we go to the, to the main and we can see that we have um, the simple string encryptor, the random string encryptor. So the two classes that both implement the iString encryptor interface, that iString encryptor interface, it has just the method encrypt string. Okay, and this is the interface. This is why it has not implemented error because we will not have any instantiation of the, this interface. We will have the subclasses implement the interface and we will have uh, instantiation of objects from the subclasses or the classes that implement the interface. And in the main file, we have basically the two objects. We also have a user printer console. We have a user printer file. So two different mechanisms to print uh, the user. In the SRP example, it was all in the um, in the user uh, printer uh, class. But now it's different because again, we have one interface with the method uh, print user that receives an user, but we have two implementations. The user printer console, it just prints the user to the console, but the other implementation, it prints the user to a file. So it writes the user into a file. So one interface, two implementations, both for the stream encryptor and for the user. So basically in the main, we simply uh, do, um, we create the objects, uh, we create again more objects, uh, the, the encryptors and the printers. We create two users, Aldo and Elliot, with the corresponding attributes. And finally, what we do is user printer console to print user. We print the Aldo and we print the Elliot. And we also encrypt the password, uh, calling to Aldo encrypt password, because now the user has as an attribute an interface string encryptor. And when we say encrypt password in the user, we just delegate again self.string encrypted encrypt string 
So this is an interface that the user is receiving as an argument. So here we can pass, um, uh, when we create the users, we can create a random string encryptor for, the, for Aldo and a simple string encryptor for Elliot. So we can pass different implementations, but both um, implement the same interface. And when we execute the last uh, example, we uh, simply uh, copy and paste for the wrong version just to show that it was working before it was encrypting uh, the passwords and was showing the user information. But for the right version, that is the one that I'm showing here in the code, it will work. Uh, well, I didn't want to copy that, sorry. I just wanted to copy that. And it is the same. We print the user information of Aldo to the console and uh, we print Elliot to the, the file because if you take a look at the code, we say user printer console print user Aldo and user printer file print user Elliot. So Aldo is printed to the console, but Elliot is printed to the file because it's a different implementation, the printer, the object itself. So uh, we have also the, um, the password encrypted for Aldo here and the password encrypted for Elliot. If you take a closer look at here, we see a zero and it's time that I execute that, this changes because for Aldo, the encryption is using the object a random string encryptor, but for Elliot is always the same because we are passing the simple string encryptor implementation. So this is just to demonstrate that for Aldo, it's changing every time. So you, this is different than this, but for Elliot is always the, the same um, encryption. Okay, so we went from something um, like, uh, sorry, we went from something like uh, this, uh, three different classes coupled to implementation details, to something that looks like this, that is uh, a user coupled to an interface and a user coupled to another interface each interface has different implementation. So we are depending on abstractions, the interface is abstraction, instead of depend on concretions that would be the different uh, classes that implement the interface. So this is like the last uh, solid principle. Uh, thank you a lot uh, for your time and your patience. You can find me at GitHub, this is my GitHub, like my name. You can find me at LinkedIn, this is uh, my LinkedIn, just like my name. And the code repo is just in my GitHub. You just go here to my uh, my user and solid principles, Python. So basically, you go to my GitHub uh, account and you go to repositories and solid principles, Python. And you will see that this is exactly the, the code that I have shown if my internet works. And here you have um, the, the repo itself is exactly the same as the folder I have shown all, all the time. So thank you all for your time and see you around. Bye. Yes, it was one more amazing presentation from our speakers. I really hope that uh, you guys had fun the same way how I had listening all that and you could find something interesting for yourself. Um, all presentation I was listening it was quite uh, useful and had so many interesting interesting stuff so it's a time for our q and session and it's time for me to call to this stage all three speakers and let them answer for all the questions that you dropped already during their speech so hi marcella hello hi jerry and hi Adam. hello hello I hope you're doing fine. Yeah, you know, only when a few went live, so you were listening to your own speeches. I hope that it was fine and you didn't find anything <laughs> that could, could, could that was a good question. So I got really a lot of questions, but honestly telling um, so many of them are directed to jury. So I'll start from you and then I will time by time add questions for other speakers and guys also you just listen all those presentations so i know that you didn't have time to drop all your questions so yeah while i'm asking questions to jury please type them and we will ask so let's start from first one i'll add it to the screen so do you use callable from typing library to express type hints for complex types 
Yeah, for, first of all, thanks for all this uh, very interesting questions. I think they they are all great. Hopefully I'm able to answer at least most of them. So callable for uh, complex types, I think uh, callables are mostly used for defining functions. So are the signatures of functions. So basically if you have some callback, callable is the way to define the type hints for that. And when we were talking about complex types, I would be leaning more towards type aliases. So to make some uh, very complex type definitions more readable and understandable. And there's actually a, a keynote from Lucas Langa from the PyCon of this year, which touched exactly this topic. So I highly recommend watching that. It's free and uh, available in YouTube. So Lucas Langa keynote from PyCon this year. Great. Uh, then we have so many other questions. Let 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 to this one. So a quite big one. So in order to promote dependency injection, you want to remove imports, but then you will miss the type necessary to check function permits. How do you manage those cases? Yeah, this is also a great question. So. Uh, I think it's an important point that when you start adding type hands, you can easily run into uh, cyclic imports. So basically your application doesn't even boot up. And uh, it happens, especially if your architecture is a bit cyclic. This uh, solid principle from the last presentation will help with that. But yeah, there's a way to... Uh, avoid importing things which are needed only for the type hands during the runtime with using the, there's this flag typing dot type checking. So you can wrap your imports, like if typing dot type checking import these things. And then when you're using the type hands uh, with that mechanism, you just need to use forward references, meaning that you need to wrap your type hands with uh, like as a string. And there's a Plague 8 plugin, uh, Plague 8 type checking, which helps you to enforce this. So basically, if you want to maximize your runtime performance and not have any uh, extra imports, that's the way to do it. OK, thank you for your answer. Now, next question will consist two parts. So I'll read firstly first part and then second one. So let's go for this one. How can we use something like Pydentic for blocks of data like a data frame as elements and not objects per se? And second part is, it would be great to define the entity as an object, but apply it to block like a data frame. I can show first part again. Yeah, thanks. Uh, th this was interesting one. I had to re read it a couple of times and I'm still not sure if I got it right. So uh, feel free to ask again if I didn't get it right. So uh, uh, is it like uh, you want to define the shape as Pydantic data classes or Pydantic base models and then convert that to data frame because it's easier to process it as a data frame? that you can do for all sorts of data because uh, both Pydantic data classes and base models are very compatible with dictionaries. So most of the raw data can be usually turned into a dictionary, let's say some JSON plot or something. And then you can kind of <clears throat> do the runtime type checking by creating the instances of this Pydantic base models or data classes then convert back to a dictionary, feed that to a data frame, let's say from pandas, and then process it like you want. And you have completely runtime type checked data at that point. But if you're talking about like having a type definitions directly for the data frame columns, unfortunately, I don't have an answer for that or mechanism. 
Uh, I hope you answered. If not, guys, please uh, read, re rewrite your question down. So uh, I, I'll give you like one minute to rest. And I have one question to Marcella. And this question also consists of two parts. So first part is how do you ensure you stay up to date with the open API standard to allow for input into Postman, for example, some packages previously provided a format to import into Postman. And second part is, but structures have since changed and not maintained it in package. How does fast API manage that process? I'm not sure if I get the question. <laughs> uh, I can yeah. show again first part. Yes, maybe you can read it. No, no, you can show me many times that I'm still not be sure if I get the question. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so uh, not sure if it makes sense what I'm going to say, but uh, if it's related to the Fast API, this last part, Fast API has the definition of Open API. Uh, the schema is the version 3.0.2. You cannot have. Uh, it doesn't have support for other versions of open api i'm not sure if that answers the question but that's what i have <laughs> oh, okay again okay. if you need to write the question guys please do it we will get it so now i have one question that uh, doesn't mention in to whom is directed so let's guess uh, who knows? Maybe you can find the question in this in in this answer. So, what are the disadvantages of using single stream encryption for passwords? Is it more vulnerable than the random encryption type? From whose presentation it is? I think I think that that's from my presentation because it's one of Great. the examples that I provided. So, um, in, in my, the honest answer here is none of them, because those were just examples to represent different ways to encrypt the passwords. So, they just like um, toy examples about having different ways to encrypt the passwords. So, um, the main reason to use uh, two different was to show that you at runtime can uh, decide which of them use. So, here the important part is not how the encryption is done. Instead, that two encryptions can be done at runtime, but defining just one encryption at um, development time, thanks to the polymorphism. So, this is uh, why we use an interface. So, this is the example of and the dependency inversion principle that I shown uh, the last part of the of the talk. So the the key idea here was to have just one interface with two different implementations. That the simple string encryptor encryption was one uh, implementation, and the random string encryptor was another implementation. So any of them is like uh, more secure than the other because this is just like to show an example of how to use one interface interface with two different implementations. But the cool thing is that once you have the interface in place in your system, you can provide a new implementation for the interface and choose another encryption mechanism that can be uh, better for your use case. So here, the, the short answer would be none of them, but you are able to switch to another one thanks to the polymorphism that the interface provides. Okay, thank you for your answer. Also, I still have a few questions, but it's time to remind that you still can drop your question in the chat and I will end on them. So don't forget about it. So now I have two questions related relates to solid principles. So first one is, um, bum, bum, bum. does solid principles play a part in data science or not? Okay, I, I guess that this question is uh, directly for me, but I, I encourage uh, everyone to answer here. Uh, but I just uh, will give just my opinion here. Um, this is like the same question, Avi, as uh, if good solid, if good design principles should be followed in data science. So for me, the clear answer is yes. I mean, solid principles are relevant for data science because um, data science at the end of the day is some variant of software engineering, but apply, apply it to data. So if you are doing data, data science, but you are not following good software principles or good software guidelines, you are missing something because you have to stick to the good uh, points that software engineering provides to you. So my, my answer would be that you don't always have to 
follow uh, solid principles strictly. They are just a guidelines to create better software. And for me, if I'm in a data science project, I for sure try to stick to the solid principles to create better software, even if I'm on the data science field. So I would say that my opinion is yes. Great. Do you have what to add? Jerry, Marcelo, do you have what to add or it's completely clear? Okay, uh, so this time, uh, since it's, this question is related to data science, like since I'm working at Google, and uh, I can tell it. So we have data science event that will be in November. Please check our website and I'm sure that you can find a lot of interesting topics and information for you. So those who are interested in data science, please check our website and check our next event about data science. Yeah, it was a short announcement. I couldn't skip that. So, and another question related to solid principles is someone is asking for a suggestion about uh, literature, about solid principles. So please, what can you suggest some kind of? Okay, uh, I already answered that question uh, in the during the presentation, but I will answer again. So I just provided one link um, to one video from YouTube that is uh, really great from a Python um, channel that I will share shortly. And I also have, because uh, I need to find it out because I just closed it. And should I just paste it on the chat right now, for example? Yes, please, of course. Okay, sure. And this, because uh, uh, specific to Python, I would uh, suggest um, the website uh, towards data science because it has a lot of useful materials. But regarding general solid principles, because at the end of the day, those are just concepts that can be implemented in any language. But there's a lot of um, literature on the on the internet. So I'm just uh, copy and pasting some few things that I have prepared here. Just two more links. That one is from uh, Martin Fowler and the other from Uncle Bob. So. Those are good references, so I will encourage to start uh, from them. But internet is full of, of good articles. Yeah, thank you so much. For sure, we will uh, uh, post it Actually, in. Sorry, yeah. Sorry, I don't think they see this those links here, do they? No, no, we we will post it. We ah, okay, sure we'll okay, post sorry. it from our <laughs> chat. Yeah, Nick will post it, so don't worry about that. Um, so we have two more questions now. So guys, please still don't forget to drop your questions. And uh, yeah, let's go. So Jerry, any recommendation on better way to do runtime type checking with a manual way? Thanks, great question. Assuming that manual way means doing some is instance checks, maybe usher this instance and then the type. Uh, well, Pydentic was mentioned and has been mentioned multiple of times. So any like structured data, I would recommend that one. And then there's, uh, for example, type card, uh, project. Uh, so Google type card, PyPI, you will find it, or I can post a link to that. That's a, ha that provides a handy, uh, type checked decorator that you can apply to any function. So if you have some simple types, for example, like this variable should be int and this should be string that can provide that. However, uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned it in the presentation, but I think you only should do the runtime type checking on the edges and let static type checker and uh, type hands handle the middle part of your application. Otherwise, you're running like handbrake on your application because there's a, of course, some performance penalty linked to this uh, runtime type checking. So only on the edges and let MyPy or some competitor, competitor handle the rest. Okay, thank you for your Ante. And looks like uh, we have two more questions related to Solid. So let's start with this one. Uh, so, how would you enforce support introducing solid principles as well as type hints in the company that doesn't yet have any standards procedure for their Python developers? This is a hard one, but interesting. 
so both solid and time hints on the, on the same place. Um, I will go first if you like. Um, I would say that, um, how to say that, um, start easy. I mean, it's always better to make um, baby steps or little steps to enforcing uh, something that is a big change because following solid principles in a big project can seem like a huge uh, effort. But I would go for uh, the least amount of effort that gives the maximum value. So I will start trying to some places of the code, if it's a project that already exists, the core uh, places of the, of the system, for example, I will try to step by step uh, identify places where solid principles can be applied and step by step trying to introduce them as a part of the workflow of the developers. I would not, uh, if I'm on the company, I would not try to enforce to everyone to stick to the solid principles uh, every day, all the time, because at the beginning it can be a little bit difficult, the way you have to change your mind to stick to the principles. But I would say that uh, little steps and the core parts of your system that gives more value, not everywhere at the beginning, at least. If you have what to add, please, because it looks like it's a really painful question. How it is that something that doesn't exist? So if you have what to add, please. Yeah, I think this is a great question. And I think it doesn't really matter whether it be solid or introducing type hands. This is more about like introducing best practices to a company that doesn't have them yet. And I think uh, in general, I would go for uh, like, having some sort of buy-in for that best practice. And maybe that starts from educating people and then maybe showcasing uh, some of the wins. So uh, let's say with the type hands example, let's say you would uh, apply it for some, uh, one of the microservices in the company and show that our runtime exceptions dropped from this to this level and uh, let's say maybe there are some other benefits as well not that easily measured but let's say onboarding a new team member was a lot easier because they knew how to navigate throughout the code base because we had the type hands in place and maybe the buy-in is easier to get when there are some concrete examples about the benefits of these best practices great Thank you. Thank you for this edition. So, okay. And second question that I promise regarding solid is why so many people say that Cupid principles are better than solid? Uh, I don't know. We should, we should, we should ask to people. Well, that yeah. that. <laughs> Those people I mean, who say exactly. we, we should uh, ask people that say that. So uh, as everything or almost everything in the software, in the software engineering industry, it depends on the perspective and, and the use case and the context. So not there's like, I would say that not, for example, not a design pattern is better than other, not solid principles are better than Cupid or the other one around. It just depends on the context and, and the company and the type of projects. So as almost everything on this industry, it depends on the use case and the context. So there's not better or worse, it's just better for this context with great benefits or, or not. So I would say that not a strict answer here. So it depends because it's an easy answer for me. Okay, thank you, Ponte. And we have a few more questions. So let's show this one. Could my type hinting annotation be added to a pipeline enforcing only the changed code? I assume this is for me. So yeah. Uh, uh, if I understand this correctly, this would be basically to have more granular uh, enforcement than a module level. So let's say I change this function in this file uh enforce in the continuous integration that i added type hints for that i'm not aware of any techniques or tools for this and i'm not sure if it would make sense only do it on that uh, granular level but like i went through in my presentation you can definitely 
configure things on the module level. And well, you can check with uh, Git diff like which files have been changed. So you could basically quite easily build something that dynamically runs my by only against those files. But I'm not aware of any like more granular uh, mechanism. If I may, uh, there, is yeah, a tool called, there is a tool called Darker. In, it's in Python. Uh, it's, yeah, it only gets the, the diff. And then it basically runs on the, the, the files that were changed. And then it, it only, only outputs on the lines that were changed. That yeah, I, I think the problem with like if you just add the type hints, there's like you're not checking that the callers of that function are actually calling with proper uh, <laughs> arguments. It doesn't make sense. You could just full bar types there, and like my pie would be still happy. But the tool exists. <laughs> but yeah, I see what you mean. <laughs> Great. So we have next question that is really long one and has so many other questions included in that question. So be ready. It's for Jerry. At least it's mentioned like that in the question. So Jerry, regarding translating to a dictionary and then to a data class pedantic object and back, is it not going to be less performant? I know Python now supports slots and uh, second parties, which removes a dictionary, which improves the performance. How would you suggest balancing performance for this method if I'm dealing with millions of rows of data? Thanks. I guess this is a follow up to one of the earlier questions. So first of all, uh, while talking about dictionaries, I didn't mean like I didn't uh, mean the internal dict of a class, but plain dictionaries. So slots are not really related to this. And uh, for kind of for the balancing act, it of course depends on the use case. So if it's a user facing API, you probably won't be processing millions of entries. And if it's some sort of ETL job or some data engineering thingy, then it depends on your requirements, like how fast it has to be. But uh, <clears throat> if you can uh, kind of spend the time for making sure that it works, I would spend the time. Usually the time requirements are not that tight that you couldn't do runtime type checking and mangle the data a bit back and forth. Of course, memory might be the issue if you try to create millions of uh, identity base models objects at the same time, but maybe some sort of uh, batch processing might help with that. Great. Thank you. So for now, we don't have any more questions, but I have my personal ones that I usually like to answer, to, to ask. So I just want to ask you one small advice that you can give to junior developers that are watching us, maybe that, that might help their career. And yeah, just one small advice that is from your heart. Who would like to start? I can start. Please, Marcel. Yeah, please. <laughs> uh, being part of an open source community helped me a lot. Uh, I don't like. I didn't know a lot of stuff, and then I started, and then I started getting knowledge and talking to people. And even if I didn't understand a lot of stuff that they were saying, I started understanding, and at some point, uh, yeah, it helped me. <laughs> some more advice. Okay, go on, Jerry, but I, I see that you were about to talk, I will wait. <laughs> go. Right, thanks. Yeah, I have actually similar suggestion, but maybe a bit more specific. So uh, you tend to open this GitHub repositories like, OK, this is some new cool thing. I would advise to also have a look at the source code every time you 
find a, an interesting repository, not just the readme, but open also the source code and check like how it's implemented. I think I've learned the most myself that way. Yes, I completely agree. And also, as I work at Red Hat, I really encourage to the open source uh, way to learn things. So uh, it really uh, helps you to, first of all, understand better things because the community all, all, almost all the time is there to help. So you can contribute and at the same time learn. And an uh, advice to not repeat one of from my colleagues, I just would say that um, apart from learning technologies and frameworks and cloud providers and whatever, I would really encourage people to learn good uh, software design principles. I mean, it does not have to be solid and specific, but just go to the general uh, concepts that apply to software engineering, not to specific tools or frameworks or languages. So apart from learning specific tools, also try to learn uh, software, software design principles in general that I think that it will really help people in the long term in, in their career. Yep, sounds great. Like we just have some parts of a uh, follow up question. Uh, so yeah, it's here for Marcel looking at fast API and sync API. If someone wanted to contribute to implementing WS support, second part is where would you suggest a new contributor start reading code while trying to familiarize with the code base in the repo? Uh, well, the repository is not that extensive. Like, there's not much. the The idea is kind of copy what FastAPI does. So, FastAPI has the Open API schema, and then it populates it. And then uh, the idea is kind of the same, uh, having a way to populate the async API schema on on the FastAPI async API repository. So, a good way to start. Uh, like it's reading what I have there, uh, and reading the the fast API code also helps. Uh, specifically, fast API is uh, open API, like fast API slash open API. You have uh, some files there, and those are the ones that are mainly useful. Yeah, great. So uh, Actually, one, like, sorry, I, one more thing. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and also the person that asked that you can talk to me. I am on the fast API Discord server, so you can just on Twitter or whatever, you can just drop yeah. a message. Just go directly to <laughs> on this. So uh, what I yeah, what I want to say that it's huge. Thank you to all of you for participating in this event, for sharing your knowledge, skills, whatever you could share now and be so open and allowing people just go to you directly and clarify everything that they would like to. So again, thank you so much for being so openly and so, so so energetic today. So thank you again. And we have so much announcement more. So I don't want to take time from the rest. So thank you again and hope to see you at our next event that we will have. See you. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. So yes, now we will have one kind of announcement and then you will know who will get that iPhone setting. So, see you. Thank you, Influx Data, for sponsoring this event and for joining us as a presenters. And just a couple of words about the InfluxDB if you happen to miss Jay's presentation. So basically, if your app or the product that you're working with is using time series data, then for you, this is a very cool solution because you know that building real-time apps with legacy databases, it can be just a nightmare as uh, you have to spend more time basically managing the inference structures instead of shipping the code. But with InfluxDB, the leading time series platform, which was built actually from ground up to handle massive volumes of timestamp data produced by sensors, applications, and infrastructures, InfluxDB empowers us as developers to build real-time IoT, analytics, and cloud applications with ease. And you can easily start and scale InfluxDB, and it will give you the time to actually focus on the features and functionality that give your app the competitive edge. You can focus on things that you are best at and let the InfluxDB do the rest.
and you can get started for free today using the link in the chat. So it's influxdb.com slash cloud. And don't miss your opportunity to grab it for free right now. Okay, guys. Uh, hello again. I was in the intro. My name is Nick. I'm a director of events at Geekall. And I'm going to first, I'm going to be the next moderator for next block, but we'll still have a time before that. So I got to do the giveaway. So let me just finish preparing the document for that. Because first of all, I removed all those duplicate, like all, every single one of you that sent like countless of submissions. No, I let this is there was only one because. I'll remove all the duplicates. And second, I don't want to, to show too much of a personal data. So just a moment, I'll just gonna try to do this as much as proper way as I can. And then I'm gonna share my screen. So bear with me for a little moment. Uh, so. And yeah, by the way, thanks. Uh, one more time for a sponsor, InfluxDB, because the, you need to thank to them that we have these kinds of giveaway. Okay, so what was I looking for? Uh, so. All right, so here's my screen. I'm going to share a window. Uh, Right, so you should be able to, yeah, you should be able to see it. So yeah, I clipped those emails just a little bit, so I'm not showing too much of a personal data, but this is like 500, 500 submission that we received throughout today. This is all from our live viewers. And these are all your emails. You can check with how, 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 how have you filled those form to, to have it real. These are the latest ones. So what I'm going to do, just going to go to random.org, paste into the list uh, randomizer three times as a proper way. And then we'll have the first one will win the iPhone 13 and the other 12, 20 afterward. They will, uh, they will be rewarded with uh, a ticket to any of our event. Uh, including tomorrow so you can join like i'll i'll try to send uh, every one of you uh an email a short email with notification right after after this during the break or maybe during the next talk and then you'll be able to uh answer if you want to have a ticket for tomorrow or for another event later right so let me just copy these one just the email just the first half without having the full full email which is not going to be that big of a problem, but here is just uh, just the nicknames, so we see. And I have them like the 500, all the 500 were copied. Yes, and I'm just going to do randomize and then one more and then one more. Okay. So here is the handle of a person. I'm just going to do the control F. And here is the one who submitted at, uh, at 4 p.m. But that was probably my time uh, today. And so this is the email address that were that that one the iPhone, the wall. I won't going to try to read that. But the other 20 up to 21, these people uh, we'll get free tickets uh, to tomorrow live stream or to any other. So yeah, uh, I'm gonna go in, write emails to all of you. And also, by the way, I announced a little bit earlier that, uh, yeah, yeah, congratulations to the winner first. I forgot, I, I should I should say that. So congr congratulations to the winners and I'm gonna hide this. And I also promise that we'll give also five tickets for tomorrow's live stream. For people who were active during Q&A sessions, so I'm going to write all 21 of you first, and then I'm going to choose the winner for the for five additional tickets for tomorrow for being active in the in the Q&A session. Those also going to be random uh, for, like, I'll, I'll collect the, the people who are active in the Q&A session, collect, find their emails and database, and we'll also just send you a ticket uh, right away. 
Right, so let me take a look at the agenda. We have uh, our next talk actually pretty soon. So let's just have a very, very quick break, like three minutes, and we have a, then we have a second, next speaker. Uh, yeah, see you very soon. Okay, so I guess uh, we're gonna start the block. Here we go. So we have three speakers ahead of us during this block and the Q&A as before. And we also have another block after this, three more. So the first speaker, which is gonna be a recorded session is Jan. And Jan is a senior, learn a senior deep learning algorithm engineer and NVIDIA. So one more talk from a speaker from NVIDIA. So his talk uh, is, go is called uh, From Art to Engineering, the Programmatic Approach to the Time Series Forecasting. So let's listen to that. Here we go. Hi, everyone. My name is Jan. Uh, I work in NVIDIA in Deep Learning Algorithms team in Poland. Uh, as you have probably inferred from the abstract, my work is uh, related to application of deep learning uh, in the time series forecasting. Even though deep learning has been around for about 10 years now, uh, most of the industry still relies on simple statistical methods like uh, ARIMA or very popular boosting methods. Uh, this phenomenon is uh, associated usually with lack of explainability of deep learning models uh, and the cost of uh, introducing such solutions. Uh, there is ongoing research to improve interpretability uh, of time series deep learning models, but here we will focus mainly on uh, the cost reduction. Thus far, using contemporary mo uh, models required feature engineering, mathematical knowledge and loss of experience. I will show you today how to reduce the amount uh, of effort needed to make uh, good predictions to the absolute minimum. So let's start with a formal problem statement. Uh, time series forecasting problem is pretty st straightforward to explain. Uh, we have a historical uh, data on how certain series behaved, uh, and we want to predict how uh, it will behave in the future. <clears throat> but this is only a part of the story. Uh, what if we have more than one series we want to predict? Maybe there exists some uh, series external to the task that is uh, correlated with the series we want to predict. Maybe some of these series are known in advance. Mm, to have uh, a picture as complete as possible, uh, we propose a following data description format. Uh, we split the, uh, the data into three groups related to the, uh, the temporal knowledge and two groups related to data format. Uh, first, we have static variables, mm, uh, the ones that are constant throughout the whole series. For example, uh, the physical location of the sensor is assumed uh, to be uh, known and constant. 
Uh, there are known variables, uh, the ones that we know in advance, like uh, days of the week uh, or event calendars, etc. And we have also observed uh, variables, uh, the ones uh, on which our knowledge extends uh, only up to the present. Uh, each uh, type subdivides into two data formats. Uh, continuous, the data that is represented uh, by uh, a real value, like temperature, and uh, categorical, the data uh, that comes uh, only in discrete values, like uh, day of a week. In these terms, uh, uh, our target series can be viewed as an uh, observed variable, because we don't uh, know it uh, uh, past the uh, present boundary. Uh, to solve the problem uh, stated in this way, we developed time series prediction platform. Uh, TSPP is a modular tool uh, that allows you to bring your own data set and train stock models uh, with it, or implement your own model uh, and test it against other models. Uh, it's like having uh, the best of two worlds, uh, AutoML and research utilities. Uh, uh, it is great for beginners because uh, it allows no-code in interaction. Uh, everything is configurable from the command line. Uh, it's easily modifiable uh, for researchers. Uh, it is written entirely in Python. Uh, and uh, it implements a set of uh, the most commonly used deep learning uh, techniques like curriculum learning or spatial, uh, spatial temporal um, forecasting. So let's download it from uh, GitHub and uh, uh, put our yellow helmets on and start engineering. Uh, let's assume the case in which we are working for a cab startup company in California. Uh, we want to build a model for uh, traffic speed estimation, which we'll use later for some downstream tasks, uh, something like arrival time prediction. Uh, we don't have access to Uber-like databases, and also we can't afford uh, uh, an, uh, an experienced data scientist to build a, a custom model for our case. So, um, then what do we do? Fortunately, uh, the California uh, Department of Transportation uh, owns a performance measurement system, uh, PEMS for short, uh, which collects traffic data uh, from thousands of uh, loop detectors. Uh, loop detector is a simple coil uh, that detects the presence uh, uh, of a vehicle, uh, and can estimate its speed. You can read uh, whole docs uh, on the PEMS here and here. Um, but of course, we don't have time for this. Time is money and we don't have a lot. Uh, fortunately, Caltrans uh, has uh, aggregated data from the system, uh, which we can uh, freely download. Uh, go to uh, Data Clearing House. When you spend a moment exploring the website, you'll see that the data volume is huge. We can't afford years uh, worth of GPU work. We are located in Bay Area, and anyway, software engineers are our uh, target group, so uh, Bay Area data will suffice. Uh, we go to 5-minute aggregates and select uh, District 4. Uh, this is a uh, district uh, number four uh, for Bay Area. Uh, we still see that uh, the volume is enormous. Uh, every single bar contains monthly uh, data, uh, and every single day uh, is uh, more than 25 megabytes of uh, raw data. Uh, for past tw uh, 20 years, uh, it's more than 200 gigabytes of raw data. Um, so maybe we'll shrink it a bit. Uh, we know that recent global uh, events may have uh, influenced um, the distribution of the data, so let's assume that the year uh, 2017 was extraordinarily boring uh, and take data from January to July. Uh, I'm not making this up. This is actually a benchmark data set for, uh, used for evaluating traffic predicting models. I've already downloaded the data so uh, we can see how it looks like. Let's go to CD data sets, PAMS. Uh, as you can see, data comes in uh, compressed text files. So let's extract one of them and see its content. As you can see, uh, the data comes in one file per day a CSV format with uh, no headers. Uh, this is actually a, quite a common problem uh, with most publicly available uh, data sets. Uh, it comes with no explanation whatsoever. Uh, but fortunately, uh, here after digging in the PAMS documentation, uh, we can find description of the, these columns. 
uh, first thing we want to do is to parse uh, this data into rather a standard format, uh, a single data frame uh, with uh, named columns. Unfortunately, there is no golden bullet uh, for this problem. Uh, different datasets can come in uh, any kind of exotic uh, uh, format, so this step has to be done uh, by hand, case by case. Uh, uh, I implemented the parsing function uh, in the uh, slash data uh, script download data by yeah uh, this isn't the most exciting part of the platform but for the sake of completeness let's uh, skim over it uh, as I mentioned this function has to be written by hand uh, so it doesn't have to be super clean it uh, serves purpose only uh, of parsing data to a common format uh, so we define range of the data from uh, January 2017 till July 2017. Uh, we uh, check for completeness of the data uh, to be sure that we obtain all the relevant files uh, uh, from the data host. And here is uh, where the interesting part happens. Time series data usually comes uh, with a gaps in it. Uh, maybe some sensor uh, went offline during the period of uh, collection data uh, and then went back online, leaving a gap in the data set. Uh, so uh, to remember this, we group uh, our data set uh, into groups of uh, sensor IDs uh, and then use uh, uh, linear interpolation from pandas package to fill the gaps. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's good enough for short gaps. Uh, then we um, concatenate uh, columns uh, parsed from uh, other types of columns. Uh, so we uh, from the timestamp column we can uh, get a time signal, uh, specifically day of week, month, day, hour and minute. Uh, here we have headers that we uh, obtain from from the data host to uh, provide context for uh, for the, the data frame. And here, this mysterious table contains sensor IDs that we select for for our prediction. Uh, uh, if we dig uh, deeply enough into the documentation, we'll see that uh, many sensors um, are located nearly uh, uh, one meter. Uh, uh, of each other uh, because they are uh, monitoring uh, the same uh, point uh, on the road but on a different lanes so uh, we know that they will be really closely correlated that's why we select only a subset of the nodes for prediction to uh, make our model smaller and uh, our computation cheaper uh, then we concatenate the uh, remaining data and dump it to uh, one single csv file So, uh, to see how it looks like, finally, as you can see, uh, the data is now organized into a single CSV file uh, with captioned columns, uh, and the only ones that are of interest to us. Uh, this is where our solution comes in handy. Uh, the next step is to write a description of the data that splits uh, these columns into six aforementioned classes. So, uh, for this description to be visible by TSPP, it has to be placed under conf uh, slash uh, dataset directory under the base uh, uh, directory of the TSPP. Uh, and I already prepared uh, such a configuration file uh, so we can inspect it. Uh, this file is used by TSPP for uh, loading, pre-processing and feeding data to a model. So it con uh, contains a couple extraneous fields like the source path that points to uh, the CSV file we constructed in the previous step, uh, destination path uh, that is used for storing pre-processed data, train valid and test ranges, uh, scalar mode. Uh, scalar mode decides whether uh, we want to scale uh, uh, data, data set as a whole or we want to uh, make scaling by uh, time series ID. Uh, different uh, data sets react uh, the, differently to this variable depending on the scale of, of time series, so it's beneficial to play with it a bit. Encoder length uh, defines a lookback window uh, uh, that we base our 
uh, predictions on and example length uh, is a joint uh, encoder length plus uh, a prediction horizon so in this setup uh, we will predict uh, 12 steps in the future based on uh, 12 steps in the past and of course creme de la creme features uh, this the list maps uh, columns of our previously constructed uh, CSV file uh, to a specific classes. Uh, at least one uh, column has to be uh, an ID column that will map uh, a specific uh, time series to, to its scalar. Uh, there has to be uh, one uh, time column that will uh, be used for splitting data into uh, train valid and test ranges and at least one uh, target column uh, that we want to predict. Uh, rest on the, uh, of the columns uh, are the features of the uh, data. Uh, uh, those are the uh, correlating uh, series uh, with our uh, target. So <clears throat> uh, station freeway number, direction of travel and station length uh, rarely change because the loop station is uh, literally bound to, to a road. Uh, so uh, we'll mark them as uh, static. Uh, also, station, freeway number, and direction of travel come only in uh, discrete var values, so we will mark them as categorical. Uh, station length uh, is defined in meters, and meters come in continuous spectrum, so we'll mark it as continuous. Uh, for this continuous uh, variable, we'll use a standard scalar, which uh, scales our um, data into the uh, zero centered and unit variance uh, distribution. Uh, average occupancy and total flow uh, are the variables that we observe only uh, after measuring by uh, by the loop detector. So uh, we don't know them into the uh, into the future, so we'll mark them as observed. And uh, time signal. Uh, day of the week, month, day, hour, and minute are uh, known in advance. We know that uh, after Monday there is Tuesday, and after uh, one o'clock there is two o'clock. So uh, we'll mark them as known. Uh, and the specific uh, data type uh, isn't uh, so obvious here. Uh, day of the week uh, usually comes in uh, only seven flavors. Uh, but uh, a month, day, hour, and minute can be viewed as a continuous signal, uh, like in a Fourier uh, transform. So uh, we can mark them as continuous, but uh, we can also view them as uh, categorical, uh, depending on the uh, model definition. Now that we have set up everything, we can uh, let the magic happen. We'll build an environment with a Docker file provided in the, in the um, uh, repository. As you can see, here is the definition of the environment. And we can build it just typing docker build and tagging this as tspp. And done. Uh, now, uh, let's uh, run it. We'll use IPC host and uh, host network interface. Uh, we'll uh, mount uh, our datasets into the Docker. Uh, and go. To preprocess uh, the CSV file that we produce, we just need to type Python launch preprocess dataset pems bay and go. Fast forward and our data is ready. Uh, now it's time to choose the model. Uh, we can choose not only deep learning models, but also classic ones uh, like Arima and more advanced like uh, XGBoost. Uh, but let's stick to deep learning. Uh, we'll use our flagship model TFT. 
Uh, TFT uh, is a general purpose time series model uh, that is best compromised between uh, training speed and accuracy. Uh, let's look at its uh, config file. Uh, this time we'll go to uh, cd conf slash model uh, and let's view tft config file. Model config files are a bit easier to understand than dataset config files. And for today's course, uh, the most relevant part is a config subdictionary. Config subdictionary contains parameters for instantiating the network, like uh, number of heads or hidden size or uh, drop of probability. But also we have uh, we see that um, it contains something like quantiles. It's because um, TFT can not only estimate a true value of uh, time series, but uh, it can estimate also its uncertainty uh, about this value's uh, evolution. And together with this uh, comes output selector that selects uh, from this list estimator of the true value. Uh, th this means uh, 50th uh, quantile. So let's uh, assume that we also want to uh, estimate 10th quantile and 19th quantile. Uh, and this forces us to uh, change output selector to 1 to uh, point to index uh, of uh, 50th quantile. TCP is built upon uh, Facebook's research uh, Hydra uh, tool that allows uh, for uh, modular config uh, creation and uh, easy instantiation of uh, the cl uh, classes. That's why we have this uh, fields like target that points to uh, model class. And also we have uh, this default subdictionary that uh, allows uh, gluing our config uh, together with uh, other configs. Now it's time for the easiest part, model training. Every config part is uh, modifiable from a uh, command line, so we can leverage that utility to quickly stitch our training script together. Let's go to, to uh, our root directory and type python launch training. Uh, we want to select model uh, tft and data set. Uh, this is our data uh, that is it, PEMS Bay. Uh, let's say we want to use a quantile criterion. This uh, criterion uh, was designed uh, especially to work with uh, TFT quantile loss and quantile estimation. Uh, let's say we want uh, to train uh, with a bigger batch size. And also, uh, we want to uh, dump our uh, predictions after the uh, training. Okay, but before we start, uh, we want to see if our config file uh, looks correct. So let's go to the beginning of the uh, uh, command line and type C job resolve this will uh, this command will print uh, our config and this is a configuration uh, stitch configuration file for our experiment as we can see uh, there is uh, here there is our model uh, uh, config part with quantiles number of heads hidden size as well as some training uh, utilities like uh, early stopping callback, uh, saving best checkpoint callback. Uh, there is uh, optimizer uh, part of config with uh, learning rates uh, and uh, epsilon for uh, fused atom optimizer. And also have uh, we have uh, our dataset config ready. Okay, so. Let's start uh, our training. A couple hours into the future and we have our model trained. The last line of the mm, training output contains a matrix computed against a test split of the data. So is 2.17 MA good enough? Uh, can we do better? 
this machine contains uh, only one GPU, so let's switch to something more powerful. Uh, here I have a DGX station with four uh, A100 GPUs. And this is uh, a kind of machine that you want to use for uh, full-fledged uh, HP searches. Uh, TSPP allows us to run a hyperparameter search uh, as easily as we run uh, the regular training. So let's inspect the script uh, we want to use. As you can see, the command line is a bit more complex than uh, regular training uh, command. Uh, and let's see main differences. So we run our command with uh, minus "-m", for uh, multiple trainings. Uh, here are strings uh, that represent uh, our choices of the uh, and ranges of the HP uh, that we want to use. So, for example, uh, we have a discrete value of a number of heads, uh, one, two, and four. Uh, and uh, also we have uh, something like continuous uh, logar logarithm uh, interval flow from uh, uh, one to the, the 10 to the minus five to uh, 10 to the minus two for uh, learning rate. Uh, also, we want to speed things up, so uh, we uh, subset our uh, training samples to uh, 1 million. Uh, and we want to optimize uh, MAE and uh, RMSC metrics. For this, we use uh, Optuna uh, Sweeper plugin. Uh, and let's say we want to parallelize uh, jobs with um, Joblib. Um, and we want to run uh, four simultaneous uh, jobs. Uh, and we want to sweep a uh, total of 256 uh, parameter sets. And let's go. Training takes a while, so let's look at the results of a, a really similar parameter search. Uh, Optuna, which helped us conduct this sweep, uh, is a very popular tool for uh, hyperparameter searches uh, and it comes with its own dashboard. In the first chart we can see a history of uh, optimization, uh, how the individual runs performed uh, and when uh, did we hit a minimum of uh, our uh, objective value. Rest of the charts uh, show different insightful statistics like uh, importance of uh, hyperparameters, uh, or a scatter plots of uh, single parameters against objective value. But let's focus on the list of uh, uh, all runs uh, and let's sort them by objective zero, which is in our case MAE. Here we can see that we uh, squeezed, uh, we were able to squeeze 1.6 MAE uh, out of the uh, TFT model. Uh, we can see which parameters uh, uh, the sweeper used for uh, achieving this value. but. Uh, what if uh, this is not enough for us? Uh, what uh, can we do better? And uh, yes, as I mentioned the, uh, at the beginning, TCP uh, allows uh, for integration uh, of your tailor-made uh, case-specific model. So uh, let's see uh, how it is done. Let's take a closer look at TFT uh, model implementation. What makes it work with TSPP? The first thing that you should care about is model config file, which makes your config uh, your model discoverable within TSPP. It should be placed under conf uh, slash model uh, directory together with other uh, model config files. So let's take a look at TFT config file again. In your config, uh, you have to uh, point to the class of your uh, model. Uh, in this case, it is uh, under models uh, slash TFT slash modeling slash uh, temporal fusion transformer. Uh, it also has to have these two enigmatic lines that uh, choose uh, a specific trainer. Uh, this line says that uh, you are training a deep learning model with continuous training loop trainer. Uh, and of course you have to uh, have your uh, arguments subconfig, which will be later uh, passed to uh, models init function. Okay, uh, let's look at our models code. Uh, CD models tft and let's go to modeling file so this is our uh, models code uh, as i mentioned init function takes only a single uh, argument uh, which is a dictionary with uh, its parameters uh, the other point of interface is models forward function here uh, tspp feeds uh, models with dictionaries um, and Let's see where does it go. It goes to embedding. 
embedding is an instance of TFT embedding. And let's go to uh, embeddings for our function. Okay, and here dictionary is unpacked. So we can see uh, these dictionary keys uh, are uh, are mentioned variables. Um, so here we have a static categorical, static continuous, known categorical and known continuous, and observed and target uh, variables. Uh, and the, uh, the last point of uh, interface is the output of the model here. So uh, model has to uh, output a 3D tensor, uh, which the dimensions mean batch size, uh, time and number of estimators uh, subsequ subsequently. And that's it. That's all we have to do to uh, interface our model with TSPP. So config file, one argument uh, in function, model digest dictionary uh, and returns 3D tensor. The rest is up to your uh, creativeness. And thank you for your attention. Uh, I hope that time series forecasting, uh, research and uh, production will be a bit easier for you with time series prediction platform. Uh, for now, we support only PyTorch in uh, TSPP, but uh, if we will get enough attention, uh, we will maybe expand to uh, other frameworks as well. Uh, for further reading, you can refer to these resources. So, uh, TSPP, Hydra, Optuna and uh, TFT, uh, which we men uh, all mentioned today. Uh, and once again, thank you for your attention. Okay. Um, yeah, I was going to pause uh, the reference links for a moment, but you can rewind the player and see them for yourself. Uh, and you'll be able to also to ask uh, Jan for some more links and references because we have a Q&A session and we expect Jan to join the Q&A session. Okay, so moving to the next session by Magda Konkiewicz. I hope I pronounced it correctly. And she will be talking about uh, managing the data labeling as a purely engineering task. So hi, Magda, welcome to the, to the live stream. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, can you see my slides already? Yes, yes, yes. Here are the okay, slides thank and you. good to go. Yes. The stage is yours. Thank you. So as Nick mentioned today, uh, my presentation title is Managing the Data Labeling as a Purely Engineering Task. And we're going to talk about it because I work for Toloka. And Toloka is a, a company that offers machine learning solutions. And what we have the most expertise in is actually data labeling. We've been doing it for over 10 years. The, you can see some brands we've been working uh, with in the past. And some industries that we power AI products, we power their uh, data. Uh, so you can see that the industries uh, span across pretty much uh, everything that we use in our everyday, everyday life, including things like search engines, translators, health apps, etc. And I've been working at Toloka for around a year now as a data evangelist. And previously, I worked as a data scientist, NLP engineer, and a programmer in different uh, companies across Europe and America. Uh, I also uh, have been involved in teaching data scientists, and I contribute to uh, pub medium pub publications such as Towards Data Science. Uh, you can find me here there uh, as well. And this is our agenda for today. Uh, so we're going to talk at the beginning why data annotation is so important in context uh, of ML and why you should care. I'm going to tell you what is crowdsourcing. And then the main part of the presentation will uh, focus on how to um, automate data labeling pipelines with Python. Uh, and uh, at the end, I also will give you an example of a more complex data labeling pipeline. Uh, so yeah, let's get started. Why data annotation is so important. So many of you uh, probably work in data science or AI, and you might be familiar with this concept that a lot of a, most of AI products are built on three pillars. And those are hardware, algorithms, and data. Uh, the first two have been vastly expo explored in recent uh, years. And if you look at the first pillar hardware, uh, we talk here about uh, cloud solutions, computing power, etc. 
and uh, we already have really good tools in this industry in this pillar so you can think here aws microsoft azure google cloud etc and then the second pillar algorithms this is something that our data science community has been focusing uh, heavily for the past 10 years and we really have again really good solutions that are available pretty much to everybody in this space you can think about uh, our deep learning libraries such as pytorch keras tensorflow or some other uh, ml uh, libraries such as CADBoost or scikit-learn and then if you look at this third pillar data uh, there until a year ago pretty much there was not so much happening in this space and this is why it kind of become now a bottleneck for AI products. And additionally, now, if you look at this graph, this has been published in Forbes a few years ago. And this says that most of the data scientists time, around 80% of their time actually, is spent preparing and managing data. And uh, if you ask me, this is actually a pretty, pretty big chunk. And ideally, we would have processes, tools that would help us to decrease this time and uh, be somehow uh, less time consuming. Uh, so, and why you especially should care. So if you work in AI industry, uh, you might know Kaggle as well. This is a website when a lot of data scientists compete. Uh, they are usually given a data set and they have to build an ML model that would be uh, the best scoring model according to some, to some metric. However, this is not real life. And if you've been working in, in ML industry, you, you know that the production looks very different. You actually have to compete within the whole pipeline of production of ML products, not only within a given data set. And that's why people who can manage the data well, they uh, win this battle here. So this is actually an example of ML pipeline, very simple one. Um, just uh, to explain you, we start with training and validation of the models. We then push model into production when it's ready and we control it in production and if needed, it's retrained. However, not many people uh, realize that every step in this production um, to, to some extent involves human involve humans. And it's not just a, a single, a very small effort, it's actually something that is happening on a large scale. And this is why I wanted to show you this revised pipeline here with a small human icon on every step, which uh, reflects this. So just to explain it, if you, when you start building your algorithm, you need some training data. And if you use uh, supervised machine learning, a lot of the time you need to label some of the data there. The same for the validation part. Uh, then you imagine you push your model into production, but how do you actually know if your model deviates? Ideally, you would actually have some gold standards, some labels taken from humans here. And um, obviously, if you need to retrain the model, you might need even more labeling here. So this is why it's so important to get this process automated and, and running all the time. And how do we annotate data? And obviously, this is something we have a lot of approaches. Probably the most simple one would be something like this in-house approach, where this is especially popular on small ML teams. Um, basically, uh, a machine learning engineer, data scientist uh, that has to develop a model might lab label some part of data and maybe then ask some people uh, from uh, the team, the help team, to label a bit more. But um, this is usually quite expensive using, um, uh, well, expensive machine le learning engineers time, et cetera. And it is actually especially hard to scale. This is why we propose a different approach here. And this is a crowdsourcing approach. So imagine here that in a crowdsourcing, you have a data set that needs to be labeled. Um, 
and we can break this labeling task into smaller pieces and distribute each individual labeling task to a different person in that lives anywhere in the world. Uh, every person just has to do very simple effort in this data labeling uh, problem, but then we aggregate the results and we have uh, the whole data set labeled. So this is the idea that is going to be presented here in this, uh, in this talk. So how do we automate the whole process? Um, we what we do here uh, at Toloka, we actually have a data labeling platform. So this is something you can see in the middle. And uh, to this platform, machine learning teams, so data scientists, uh, ML engineers, etc., can upload specific tasks. And on the other side, on the right hand side here, we have people, our crowd, who is ready to solve those problems, solve those simple tasks and get paid for them. The, uh, the platform automo automatically distributes those tasks according uh, to the needs, to the crowd that is available. So this is how it works in theory. And I would like you to imagine, it's always better to give a real example, that you work on ML team and you need to, uh, on actually an NLP team, and you need to label your data sets, uh, your, the headlines you have if with the tags, if it's a click byte or not a click byte. This is a, an example here of such an annotation. And, but imagine you don't have one, we have, we can see only one example here. You might have thousands or 10,000 or even millions of those to annotate. How can you do it quickly and efficiently? So it can be done uh, using Toloka and programming. First of all, I would like to tell you how uh, it can be done with GUI. So if you would like to create a project with Toloka, you would have to log in, create an account, and then basically fill a formula that you can see similar formula here on the screen with all the details. So you can see here that you have to give a um, name to the project, some description, then you have to set up interface, etc. But obviously we are programmers. We don't want to do it like this. Uh, so this is why we provide an a API and our API is wrapped into SDKs, Java and Python. The Python one, this is the one we will talk about today. It's called Toloka Kit. And basically it gives us full power of running Toloka tasks, Toloka labeling uh, using Python, either Jupyter Notebooks or any programming environment that you are using. So how you get started? Uh, once you you have to go to tolokaai.com, register as a requester. And once you do it, you will be able to log into the platform and obtain an authorization token. Um, you can see it in the integration tab. Um, once you have the token, you will be able to pip install Toloka. So anywhere on your environment, again, Colab, um, uh, Jupyter Notebooks, PyCharm environment, anything. And then you collect to Toloka using Toloka client object. This is when you are required to enter the token that you have copied. Once you've done it, you are ready to go and you can start sending different tasks to Toloka. Uh, so the first step, if you want to create a data labeling project, is designing the project itself, interface and instructions. So uh, again, I give you first an example how it would be done if we used a kind of a GUI config file. You can see again, we have to fill in here uh, basically a table with um, questions we want to ask to people, what, what type of answers they have. And here on the right, we can see a preview, how it would be seen by a person. So uh, again, we have our 
title, we have a question, is it a clickbait or not? And two answers, clickbait or not clickbait. But obviously we want to do it with um, programming. So this is how it can be done. Uh, first of all, the first snippet is actually creating an actual Toloka project. This is when we give the public name and the description of the project. This is something that uh, people when uh, see your project will will actually see first. And uh, then the second snippet here is actually um, defining this user interface you have seen here on the previous picture. Uh, so you can see this is using something that we called template builder. This is um, a tool that the building components tool that we have created, especially for building these interfaces for Toloka. It gives you ready components such as group of buttons, etc., to create them. Obviously, I don't have uh, too much time in this presentation to explain every little bit of uh, this detail here, but you can check out all the possibilities in the documentation. In this case, we basically just create uh, two uh, possible options, which is click by not click by. We also add here some hotkey plugins, which a user that use computer desktop could use uh, with shortcuts instead of clicking manually on each option. Uh, so once we have our interface ready, what this is again for every type of data labeling project, uh, you need to uh, specify input and output for the project. So in our case, input is the headline. So the headline is just a string and the output specification again is a, a category. It's clickback or not clickback. This is type of string again. Um, if you want to use different types, uh, there are many things available. Often your input could be an image and video. Uh, probably those are the most popular one. There could be several inputs. So you need to set that all here. Um, and then the second uh, step is giving instructions. This is uh, what this second snippet is doing here. And this is basically uh, HTML code. So you can see it uses the normal HTML tags and then this is how it will be displayed for the user. Once you have it set it all up, you can create the project into local. And uh, the next step when everything interface instructions are ready is actually selecting people that will take part in your project. And why you have to select them? This is because uh, the crowd that is available is distributed all over the world, might speak different languages, live in different countries, be in different time zones. So you want to somehow control who you are inviting to your projects. There are several ways that this could be done. And the most simple way, as I mentioned before, could be by country or a language they speak. We could also filter people by some computed properties, such as what browser they use uh, or where, where do they connect uh, from, the IP address. Or this one, probably a very important one, by some skills they possess. So actually in Toloka, you can add um, add uh, some type of training and provide it to the users. And based on how well they do in, in this training, you could invite them to your project. So uh, to make it more clear, this is another example of how we create, how we choose those people and create this setup in Toloka. Uh, the, we call the, those settings pools. So pools are basically places where we uh, decide who we will invite to our project and how uh, the, the task will be displayed to them. So. I actually divided it here into training and main pool here. The training here is the first snippet and the main pool is the second snippet. 
And basically what I tell in the training part is uh, I just set up some uh, basic information such as how many um, tasks should be available on one page. In the task interface, you show only one task. But we actually might have, want people to see 10 different um, tasks on the same page so they can do it a bit quicker. Uh, so basically, I'm setting it all up for training and then for the main pool. Additionally, in the main pool, I also add some specific filtering, such as uh, in this specific case, I ask people to speak English and either use the local app or a browser. Uh, I also uh, here specify how much I'm going to pay them for assignment. So in this case, uh, I'm paying them one cent for doing the whole tasks with here. Um, and once I've set it up, I can just connect my training pool to the main pool. This means that in order to take part in the main pool, people have to pass training first. And I specifically, in this first snippet at the end, I um, set the value to be 90%. So they have to pass my training at 90% level. And uh, additionally, what I want people to do, once I have my main pool running, I want to... Uh, I want to have very strict quality control rules. So this is what I again add here to my main pool. And you can see that the first quality control is about some submit, uh, fast submitted responses. So that means if someone is doing my task too quickly, I might think that they are not really doing them correctly. And the second part here sets up uh, something called golden set rules. So basically, I'm, cre I'm going to create some golden sets. Uh, those will be, they, they also called control tasks. Those are tasks that I know the answer to, and I will mix them through the normal tasks and check how well people are doing on them. And I'm specifically setting here that they, in order to be continue to be on my project, they have to uh, do on those control tasks above 90% here. If not, I will, I will just remove them from my project. And um, just uh, wanted to show you how this um, can be done here. So when I talk about control tasks, what I do is I create these CSV files, which have basically two inputs. One is the headline and one is the golden category. One line, it's uh, one example. So you can see that the first example is gunman on the loose in Melbourne, and it's not a click byte. So I could specify as many as I want, and I can supply this CSV file um, to be either the training or control tasks included within main tasks in the pool. Um, on the contrary, this is how the tasks that I will add to main pool look like. So you can see there is no golden tasks. There is only the title and people will be required to label it. And uh, this is actually a code snippet that sets it up. So it kind of takes this uh, structure that I have shown you and basically add those to Toloka. So it creates uh, both first training task and then main tasks. Um, and once I have it set it all up, this is probably the most interesting part of the code. And this is something that uh, if you talk about the automation that, that you will use a lot, you want to open those pools and close them. In this case, we are just opening them now. So we open both training and main pool this means from this moment right now, when you run this code, people will be able to label your tasks. So th those will be live. This is why usually the next step is writing this uh, similar uh, code to what you can see here. 
again, we're not gonna go through in details through what it does, but in general, it periodically, every 60 seconds, uh, sends a ping to Toloka. Hey, is my pool finished yet? If yes, close it. Uh, so basically, this is what this line is, uh, this loop is doing here. And um, once it is finished, it's time to finally gather the results. This is uh, basically you connect with through the local client, you get assignments. And uh, in this case, we've done, we've collected 300 different answers. We just printed this result here. And um, this leads us to a new, uh, a new problem here. We've, uh, we've, we've gathered our results, but how we can use them now? Usually what happens in crowdsourcing, the same task is not sent to one person, but it's rather sent to multiple people. So then you have to somehow aggregate the results. And this is why we have created a separate library. So crowd, it's called CrowdKit, and it specifically deals with this aggregation problem. So um, just to give you an example here of aggregation, this is the simplest aggregation I can think of. It's called majority vote. And well, the essence is basically it's if two out of three people say something, it's a cut, we think it's a cut because majority says so. Something very sensible, we use it in life probably a lot. And obviously they are more um, complex algorithms that uh, are used for aggregation. Actually, there are many more complex algorithms, but this is the one that is also used quite often in aggregation for this classification task. It's called David Skin algorithm. And it's the iterative algorithm and which basically try to fit into our data. And what does it mean? It kind of relies on the idea that if uh, people answer, score, answer correctly to our tasks, their answer should match with each other. This is what is visualized here on the picture. The second and the third responder, their answer match. So we believe they are more correct than the first responder who might be just giving thing, uh, random answers. So that one makes sense that they do not match with the rest. So this is how, in essence, the, the David Skin algorithm works. And this is how you can call it from the CrowdKit. First of all, you have to install the library. As I mentioned, it's a new library, different from the local kit. It's called CrowdKit, so pip installed CrowdKit. And then you can individually download every type of aggregation algorithm there is. In this case, it's David's game algorithm. We imagine that we, we have collected our results. We had our task. We had a label and we have a performer and we run it for 20 iterations. And as a result, we have each headline with one single label in this case. And as I mentioned, uh, there are many different aggregation possibilities and depending also on the task you are doing, uh, you have different options. So for categorical responses, this is something similar to our clickbait examples. We can use majority vote or Davis skin that you can see here on the first table, but many, many more that uh, are available to you. Also, if you work with text, they are those uh, algorithms you can see here on the right-hand side available to you. And if you work with images, meet images, and they, you require to do image segmentation, you have, again, this available to you. And pairwise comparisons, they have Bradley Terry and Noisley Bradley Terry options. Those are all implemented in CrowdKit and uh, you can uh, see examples how to use them as in the library as well. And uh, I wanted to tell you at the end about complex pipelines because this is actually when the real power of the automation uh, comes into place. Uh, so for this, I want you to quickly imagine that you want to uh, do some visual labeling project. 
imagine you want to uh, label all the traf uh, traffic signs uh, on the picture that you, you see. Seems very trivial, but usually how we um, do it in um, Taloka or how we do it using crowdsourcing, we don't use one project for this, but we actually use at least two annotation projects. And this is uh, so we can validate if the bounding boxes drawn by the someone are correct. So how we uh, do it is we have the first project where we ask someone, hey, you need to draw these bounding boxes. And then we have a second project uh, where we check a different person should check if those bounding boxes are correct. We only want to pay people from the first project if they are validated by the second. So this is actually when you don't want to do all this setup via GUI, you want this data to flow. So uh, you also ideally do not want to wait for first project to be closed uh, until starting the second one. So this is possible with Toloka and then um, we're not going to go into details, but it's possible basically due to two uh, objects that are helpful with this assignments observer and a pipeline. So in basically what you would need to do is create two different projects and one uh, create an observer project and verification of the observer. And um, you register them to the pipeline and basically, once something is labeled in your first project, it automatically um, uh, notifies the second project, downloads the results from the first one, and fast forwards it to the second project. Um, this is uh, just to give you an idea. The whole code to set it up is a bit more complex. Uh, actually, I, I have some uh, link for you here. Uh, I know you kind of click on them right now, but I think I might add them in the Q&A session later. And uh, I've added here links for different levels. So there is a link for this advanced project, the advanced pipeline I have shown you at the end. You will be able to see the full code for this. And i have also going to add a link to the ClickByte project. This is a project we've been talking about um, in the middle of the presentation. And if you did not understand anything that I've been talking about here, I, we have a very simple project which basically will um, allow you to learn the basics. So I'm gonna include all of them in Q&A session in, in a chat there. And to summarize what we have been talking about. So um, we talked about the importance of data and data annotation and how crowdsourcing can be a very effective tool and scalable for uh, data labeling. And then at the end, we talked a lot about how it can be achieved with uh, Python. And you had an example of this more complex pipeline. Uh, also, I would like to give you a promo code. Uh, so if you would like to run some of the data labeling pipelines yourself, uh, we, you can register in Toloka and use this promo code. It's Toloka Geeko. It should give you $30 uh, for uh, annotations that you would like to do. Also, uh, yes, uh, I invite you to the Q&A session afterwards to ask me any questions. Additionally, if you cannot attend or you want to ask something outside of here, please join our community. Uh, this is the QR code and uh, you can actually directly message me there and I'll be able to answer as well. So I think that will be it. Thank you so much and see you on the QA. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for your presentation. Yeah, it was, it was a very, very, very interesting topic, like lots of lots of stuff to, to digest for our audience. And yeah, there are already some questions. We'll have them saved for the Q&A session. And yeah, so you will send the, your slide because there were some links you cannot see in the slide. So you'll exactly. save you'll, you'll send it. Okay, yeah, we'll just, just send a link here to the private chat and we'll post it in, in, uh, in, in our chat. And yeah, so thank you very much for the presentation. We'll see you in...
in yes. around 30 minutes. Yeah. See you. All right. So we have last speaker for this block, uh, who is uh, Christopher Caro, and uh, he will be talking about modeling credit risk with Python. So let's have it on stage. Hi, Christopher. Okay, you're muted. Yes. Sorry about that. Hello. No worries. Okay. So, uh, so yeah. How are you? How are you doing today? How are you feeling? I'm doing great. Okay. Thanks. How are you doing? Awesome. Awesome. Let's. I guess without any further ado, let's just start with your presentation. Here are your slides, and the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Thank you all for coming to this talk. Uh, thank you for Pygibo for for holding this event. Uh, today I will be talking about uh, modeling credit risk with Python. And this presentation might be a little bit different from what you have seen today, since uh, as you will see later, that uh, modeling credit risk is actually not very technical, Python-wise and Python code-wise. It has mostly something to do with data manipulation. Um, so we'll get into that. Uh, but so it might be that this is more uh, uh, relevant for people working with data analysis and data science, but of course, credit is something that we'll probably we will all uh, have to apply for at some point in, a, in our life. So I think it'll also be very beneficial to know what is actually going on behind the scenes uh, in banks and other credit institutions uh, when uh, actually assessing credit risk. So uh, my name is uh, Christopher. I'm 25 years old, uh, and I work at Experian as a data model. I was born and raised in Denmark, and I also work in Copenhagen, Denmark, for Experian. And uh, from a background uh, I got last year, I graduated as a master's in uh, mathematical modeling and computing from the Technical University of Denmark. And I also have a bachelor's degree from there in mathematics and technology. Um, and what is in com common for both these is that it has something to do with applied mathematics. So it is you know, statistics and programming, uh, machine learning, AI. Uh, or that sort of operations research. Uh, so that is my general background. And as I said, I work at Experian, and uh, Experian is a global corporation. We are around 20,000 employees around the globe. And uh, in the north, so now in Denmark, and in most of the world, we are what we would call a credit bureau. And what that essentially means is that we are data. Uh, we are a data company. We have a lot of data about companies and, and people uh, for us. So that, that people can use for making credit assessments. But another part of the business is also our consultancy work. That's where I work in delivery analytics. And what we do there is we make custom analytical solutions for banks uh, or other credit businesses. And it is usually for modeling and predicting credit risk. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I work with on the data level. Uh, we also known as a credit score provider, and you might have heard this term before credit score. And in the UK and the US, it's, it's massive, and everybody knows about that. But um, actually, uh, we also measure or calculate credit scores all around the world, but it's just not something that is on the person, it's something that banks use for assessing credit risk, which I'll get into. So as I have lined, lined out on the slides here, the credit risk is a lot of different things. It is, uh, you can see that I've just, it is just some of the, the examples of what credit risk is. What they all have in common is that these are predictive models. So we are trying to predict the future and predict this, uh, this risk of credit for, for consumers or companies. And we only have 30 minutes today, so uh, I cannot go into details about all of these topics. So I've chosen just to focus on uh, what we call education models. Um, these, these are probably the one we do the most of. Uh, for, for other banks and credit, uh, credit institutions. And what they are used for is uh, what, when you apply for a loan, an application model uh, has to be in place in a credit institution to actually assess uh, what is the credit risk. Uh, for you. Uh, and I'll show you the same of this, uh, this later. Uh, so yeah, today I will just be going through the application models, the background, both in the regulatory, uh, why do we need these application models? Uh, but also I want to go through the modeling steps that we take as I said, it's not very technical. It's mostly about data manipulation. So we will not be showing you a lot of uh, Python code because it's not very general. But I will just explain uh, like a crash course, a step-by-step -step guide on how we actually do this application models. So we have essentially two goals for today. One is just to understand uh, what credit risk is and what, why is it needed. 
uh, and also once you have this overview over how the application model is, is, is done. And therefore, we will have a, you know, essentially just, uh, we will just know what will, what goes on in the background when, when you apply for a loan and apply for credit in a bank or in another institution. So I have um, three uh, topics, or maybe you could just say two topics because the last one is very, very short. Uh, the first one is uh, what is credit risk? I'll be showing an example uh, that hopefully explains this explains as well, and also uh, why we need this. And then I will be uh, discussing this application model, this step by step guidance into uh, how to do that. And I'll be spending uh, the next 20 minutes on this. So, yeah, let's get to it. The first thing is what is credit risk? Um, so, oh, on the right here, you see Thomas, and uh, Thomas Old Cap Group. And he wants to get a new one, not only to get to work, but also to impress his friends. So he wants a, a nice thing. Well, but Thomas, he either doesn't have the money to buy this car, or he doesn't want to use the money he has, has saved up to actually buy this car. But he had heard about the opportunity to get a car in. Uh, so what Thomas does is he, he goes to the bank and he wants to see if he can get a, a car loan from the bank to get enough money to buy this uh, this new fancy car. But what happens uh, then in the bank when he, when he tries to do that? Well, the bank will ask for a lot of information from Thomas. So this could be, uh, this could, for example, be how much he makes his income, uh, how many years of, uh, he has been employed, uh, his current employer, how many years he has lived at his address, uh, and maybe more obviously, how much money does he want to live. And all of these different information he will uh, send to the bank because they are asking for it in order for him to get the loan. This information is then used by the bank in their own application button. And this application button actually pro produces a credit score for some us. Uh, it is the bank's own internal credit score, but the credit score is used for assessing how likely is it that Thomas can, can pay off his loan. So if we give him this loan, what is the probability that Thomas can actually pay out the payback. So they will both get a score and equivalently they will also get a probability action. And the probability will be, what is the probability that he's a bad payer, bad payer essentially. Um, and this probability of being a bad payer is what we call credit risk. Uh, this credit risk is, is used for decision making in the bank uh, first and foremost. So they're using this probability to decide if he can get a loan or he cannot get a loan. Uh, and, uh, and they are freely to use this information as they want in the score, but uh, they have to have this uh, probability and score in place, or the probability have to be in place. And why is that? Well, there are two main reasons why you would want this probability, uh, probability of being adapted. And one of them is very obvious, and the other one is, is actually regulatory. So first of all, they want this uh, to ensure that they have a healthy portfolio. Obviously, the bank doesn't want to give out loans, uh, give out money to people that are not able to pay them back, because then the bank will lose money. Uh, and that, of course, they're not interested in that. And actually, they are not allowed to give out too many loans to people who cannot afford it. Um, but also, it also works the other way around. They also want to make sure uh, to secure the consumer, to, to ensure that Thomas can actually pay back the loan. Because if, if they give him a loan that he cannot pay back, he will go in debt. Uh, and that is, of course, uh, not something that uh, Thomas or the bank wants. So that is one, uh, one reason why. But the other one is actually regulatory. So it is required uh, in Europe and most of the world that uh, banks uh, have to estimate this probability uh, of default or of being a bad payer for all their accounts. Um, and this is something that has happened after the financial crisis we had in the, in the 2000s, because uh, they need to ensure that they have enough capital, enough money in the bank to actually account for all, uh, all the loans they are estimating will go bad uh, within the next 12 months. So they need to have enough money in the bank so they won't go bankrupt. Um, this is to secure that these banks that are too big to fail actually have enough provisions to pay off uh, pay off the loans if they go bad and if they cannot pay them back. So it is all it is to secure the bank and to secure all the other customers in the bank that, that might have their pensions there. So, 
This also leads us to some regulatory requirements to the model. So when we do a application model and do a credit score model, you must have enough unbiased historical data to ensure that the model is actually fair, that, is, that each individual will be assessed in a fair way. It must be representative of the portfolio. So uh, Thomas was applying for car loan. We need to have data about car loans in order to make this model. Uh, one thing I would go back to uh, later is also that it must follow business logic. Uh, and this is because it must be possible for the bank to explain Thomas why he was rejected if he was rejected. They, they should be able to say, oh, it's because your income is too low or because your age and income is too low, something like that. They have to make sure that they can actually describe to Thomas why did he get his loan. Uh, and this is uh, perhaps also one of the reasons why uh, the one you will see is very simple, uh, because it's easy to explain. So if we go into the application model uh, and how that actually works, it is, uh, as I said, simple. It is a simple classification model. What we want to predict is, is this person going to be a good or bad player? So we are focused on a binary target, but of course we have to output a, a probability as well. Uh, and what we do in majority of the cases, uh, almost all is using logistic regressions. Uh, it is also possible to use uh, more say, hardcore machine learning models, but logistic regressions have been used for many years and this is what the banking industry does most of the time. Uh, and this is what I will be explaining today. Uh, how do we actually do this logistic regression? Uh, because there are some steps involved, mainly before we fit the model uh, to ensure that this actually is stable and follows business logic. So I used to say that credit risk models are compromised between statistics and business logic. Um, but this, this is because you could have the best model in the world. It could be so, so good at discriminating between good and bad payers. But if it doesn't follow the business logic, say that if you have a higher income, you're more likely to have a bad uh, probability, a higher probability than that, then you wouldn't actually accept this model will have to have a model that also follows business logic. So it is sort of like a battle between the, 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 those two, where you have to compromise some of your statistical results in order to also you know, have the business logic in, in the model. Um, and this is another reason why logistic regressions are used. It's much easier to actually assess. It's, uh, it, it does the model follow the business logic, but uh, there are also ways to do it using machine learning. So uh, this is, would be a step-by-step -step guide. I have outlined the five major steps on the right. Of course, there are many things uh, to do this. It is a highly regulated topic, which means that you will do, have to do a lot of documentation when doing a model, uh, which is also a, a big part of the work. But the major main thing is, of course, to have the model uh, ready and correct. And these five steps uh, on the right is what we do in Python, uh, usually using pandas and NumPy. But, uh, and, and a bit of other stuff, but this is uh, the essence of making this model. Uh, and if we have these five steps down, we are very close to actually being able to have a model that can, that can uh, have a bank use. And in the bottom of these slides, I've just uh, put this, these five steps up, down so we can see where we are uh, when we talk about them. Um, of course, when you do a model, you have to have uh, good data. Uh, and I don't know if any of you work in, uh, in this industry, but uh, there's a lot of data uh, that is very ugly. And uh, what we usually say is we must have it at least two years of historical data to do this model. It must be significant, meaning that we must have enough variables to actually predict this risk and predict the risk profile of, uh, of, of Thomas or any other applicant. So there must be enough variables in the data that we can use. And we also have to ensure that the distributions make sense and the, and the data is clean. So an example that comes up quite a lot is actually the age of, uh, of applicants. So the historical applications the bank has received, we see sometimes that somebody is age 150 or 200 years old. Of course, this doesn't align with the reality, so we will have to remove our solution like that. And there will be a lot of exclusion rules where we just exclude our spaces simply because it doesn't make sense. Uh, when you were or maybe having a negative income, for example. Uh, sometimes it could make sense, but usually it doesn't. We also remove uh, duplicates and we report how many missing values there are, and there are sometimes a lot. 
And we have to make this data ready for what we call classing. Um, classing is maybe the most important thing about doing this work. I want to get back to, back to that later. And also just to underline what kind of uh, Python toolbox we use. Uh, I put an experiment as well because we have a lot of reporting tools, uh, but it actually isn't a big part of, of doing the model itself. We actually only need pandas, numpy, uh, matplotlib to assess the data and the cycle to, uh, to fit the model. And once, uh, once you have those four packages, we're actually good to go. We just need some data and we can start working on an application model. Uh, when the data is clean and uh, we are ready to move, on, move forward, we of course need a target. So as I said, uh, we are always predicting whether or not an applicant is bad, but how do we define that? Well, in this uh, field or line of work, it is actually very easy because uh, the regulators have already defined what the target should be for us. Uh, so this target would be what we call a uh, good fall within the next 12 months. So what we look at is for an application, uh, after the application has been accepted historically, what happens in the next 12 months? Uh, so let's say Thomas here, he was actually a, a historical uh, data point. We will then observe him for the next 12 months and we will see it's in 90 days past due. 90 days past due just means 90 days later on his payment uh, within these 12 months. If that is a yes, then we flag him and say he is a bad uh, applicant, he's a bad account. And if this is no, he has not been 90 days past due uh, for the first 12 months, then we say that he's a good, uh, good observation. Good account, good and this also uh, uh, maybe underlines why we need those two years of, of data. We actually need at least 12 months just for the application information. That means we need 12 months uh, of data of, of applications. But we also need at least 12, uh, we also need 12 months of outcome data so where we can actually assess the performance of these applications. Uh, that means that usually we have more than 12 months, but at least 12 months but to remove seasonality effects, because that will sometimes happen that some banks get, or some credit institution get more applicants at some points in the, in the year. Uh, and then we have this broad window, so we just need 12 months of data for assessing the performance. And that's the target, and we can define that in the data fairly easily once the data is clean. And of course, if we cannot define a target for the situation, we cannot use it. So this is added to the to the data set. So now we have the target as well. So now the most important and the most time consuming task in doing this application scorecards are what we call classing or classing developers. Uh, usually split up to finding course class. And I will just talk, talk about what it is to class the variables. And we use the classing of the variables. There, there may be two major reasons. One is to assess if the variables are actually following the business logic. Uh, so we can, uh, of course, we just look at one applicant, we can only see if he's good or bad. But if you look at classes of, of applicants, like intervals of applicants, we can, of course, see how many in this interval was good and how many in this interval was bad. Or bad. Uh, and we actually apply this to all variables to assess them, do they follow the business logic. I will show you an example in just a second. <clears throat> Another reason why we do the classing is to define our variables later on, but, but also to keep it stable. So the, the industry uh, usually doesn't make new models too often, you know, we train models too often, so we need something that is stable over time. And this classing of variables also ensures that it's more stable than if we just use the uh, variables uh, themselves. So on the right here, I have an example of uh, the annual income uh, and where we have classed it into uh, five different intervals. And this is the information we need. Uh, we need, of course, the values in this class within. So we have here my, in minus infinity is essentially zero to 5,000, 7,500, and so on. We can see how many good applicants we have. We can see how many bad applicants we have. And then we can also see the bad rate. The bad rate is, is very simple. It's just the number of deaths divided by the total amount of observations in this class. And what we expect to see when we look at the annual income is that the higher the income is, the, the, the less risk, the lower the bad rate. And that also holds true for the four classes below, but it actually doesn't hold true for the first one. You see this bad rate is 5.7%, and we uh, would expect this to be higher than 11.1%. And that's a way to fix this without doing anything major to the 
to the, to the data. And one might be asking the client, if we would be the client, if we would think, why would this occur? But a way we can fix it is to just combine these two. And that is totally legit. We can combine classes in a way that we think would make sense. And if we then combine these two, two classes, we would just have a single class uh, going from zero to 10,500. And what we see now on the right is that the bad rate makes sense. So the higher the income is, uh, the lower the bad rate is. Uh, and, and as you can see here, we have these intervals of income. It makes sense that it would be more stable in the future instead of using the, just the, the values. For, for example, uh, a variable like income is something that could grow over time due to inflation. But at least we ensure that, we, that the what we have a few more years when we have this class. And this is also the industry standard that we're doing in experience. And when we then have the, the, the classing and we're happy with it, we have assessed all of the different variables and ensured that all of the class, classes make sense and they follow business logic. If we cannot make them follow business logic, we unfortunately just have to remove them from the business logic. Once we have done that, we can then calculate something called the weight of evidence, uh, which I've shown here. And the weight of evidence is, it is essentially just another way to measure the bad rate of these people. Uh, but the Good thing about the weight of evidence, you might see that from the mathematical formula, is that it is distributed around zero. So it is a very standardized number. So we see here the lowest one has a negative of 0.34, and the highest, the best one has a, has a value of 0.76. So it is a standardized number, uh, very close to zero, or distributed around zero, uh, and it is a directly related to this. But we can use this as, as variable values for our model, and that is what we usually do. When, uh, when doing uh, yeah, when doing uh, uh, models like this. So the weight of evidence, if you have Chava, for example, and now we have uh, looked at this data, and we have seen, okay, we have these four variables. We have income, age, civil status, and whether or not it's employed. And we can see what kind of class does he belong to. Uh, so he's in the income, this income bucket, he's between 20 and 25 years old, single, and he is employed. Uh, then we can actually convert this. So first of all, we can convert all of our observations into these classes, and then we can convert these classes into our weight of evidence. Uh, so we will have now have these values for every single variable. Doesn't matter if it's categorical or it's numeric. It doesn't matter what kind of range the, uh, the numeric values are. We will have these standardized numbers. And what we usually do is we use this as our variable uh, or variable values when we fit our model. So we are going we're going to do that with all the observations, and then we'll have our x, our uh, variables we want to fit, and we'll also have our target, which we defined earlier. So that is what we're going to do. We're going to do that with all the data, and then we have uh, to fit this logistic condition. And that, at this point, we are essentially done with the model. We have the data, we are, we're happy with it. Usually, it takes a lot of going. Uh, Back, uh, back to the classing to make sure that it, it, is, uh, it is as we want it and it follows the business logic. But then we can fit the model uh, using just a single line of code and, and uh, we can, uh, we, then after, what, uh, after we fit it, we have some things we have to ensure. Um, for example, that the variables are uncorrelated or at least not too correlated with each other. That all the variables are important. This is uh, very, Important actually that all the variables we have in terms of model is important enough and significant. And also that no variables are too important. Uh, because if some variables are too important, uh, this might not uh, be very stable in the future. Say that the bank, say that we have income as one of the most important variables, and this it maybe account for 50% of the money. Then uh, if suddenly the bank stops reporting uh, on the, or starts collecting the income information or the income is switching because they have switched their, their, their business, then we would see that the model would perform much worse than before. So we must have a, a, a balance in how important the variables are. They must be important, but not too important. And now to the credit score. So how do we actually take this logistic regression uh, and turn it into a, a, a scorecard? And scorecards are a tool that the banks use for giving you the credit score. Usually the banks, they are not talking probabilities unless they are calculating probabilities, they're talking scores. That's much easier for the, 
for, for, for people to understand. Uh, okay, this score is related to this project. And usually they are pinned into buckets, but we have a, a scorecard. And the scorecard, once you have done the logistic regression, it's very easy to do. It doesn't actually include more information than the logistic uh, regression does, but it's just a nicer way to assess each profile. Uh, so what we do is we take these estimates from the logistic regression, we'll get some estimates, we we'll get the rate of evidence we have for each class, and we we'll multiply that by 100 and then round it. Then we'll have some score distribution. And another thing that we also actually have to do, I will not be going too much into this, in this uh, we don't have time to go into this in this uh, presentation, but we also have to calibrate it to some uh, pretty level. But that is just like a linear regression. So even though the scores will still mean a lot, it will still give us the uh, information that we need. A, a higher score would then be a lower risk of being a uh, bad uh, And that is the scorecard, and that is what all banks use to assist their profiles. So to summarize, uh, as I said, it's a pretty simple to do uh, application, but this is the way it has been done uh, almost all the time a credit score has existed. It is, uh, of course, it's much easier now with all the tools we have in Python. Uh, first of all, we take a, we look at the data, we clean it, we define the predefined target we get from regulations. We have the class of variables uh, into a class that makes sense and then follows business logic. We create the model and we create the score plan. And then after you have done that, it is ready to be sent to the bank. So now uh, when a guy like Thomas comes and apply uh, for Carlo, he will send the information to the bank. The bank will then take this information, and this information is highly dependent on how the model you have made looks. Uh, then we, they will put that into the model. They will get out the score, and they will, uh, they will check his hand for, for the new loan and new card. Uh, so that is essentially all the, the institute, all the institute and application model. Uh, of course, as I said, machine learning is also on the table. We see that. More, the market is moving towards using machine learning for calculating these probabilities. Uh, we're not there yet. Uh, we will hopefully get there, but it's also with all the regulatory requirements that are that after this application model will be a challenge to go into, but it is moving towards that. And maybe for the less important models, so not the application ones, we see more machine learning uh, happening. And I also just want to underline this before, uh, uh, before ending it. Uh, these two books are giving you a lot of information about how to do this. So especially the last one, uh, you can see that it's quite old, but it is very, very good. Uh, if you find it interesting to, to learn about these uh, credit scoring models, uh, this one uh, essentially has everything I've just said, uh, plus a, a bunch more about uh, the different things you have to think about in the credit data and the credit models. And the one above is a statistical book, just showing you how the statistics work. But I would really recommend these two books if you find, find this interesting. Uh, and if you want to get into the credit risk model, or both in terms of education and in terms of uh, all the other uh, topics I showed you in the, in the start of the presentation. So, with that being said, uh, thank you so much for, for watching this talk. I hope uh, it was somewhat interesting. I know it's a little bit different from what we saw uh, before. Uh, uh, probably also the other talks uh, earlier today. Uh, this is more about data manipulation. This is a case by case how it's done. But once you have the data ready, then uh, the then methods are up to you. Uh, so, yeah, thank you for watching. I will see you in the QA session. Okay, thank you so much, Christopher, for your presentation. Also, also fascinating talk. And yeah, we're starting our QA session right away, right now. So, let me get. We have Jan right here with us. So Jan, welcome to the live stream. And we have here with us. Uh, right. So uh, let's start with question to Jan. I'll go, I'm gonna go with order of talks. And yeah, we have pretty long questions here. So Jan, for the forecasting parameters, are there tools processes built into the package? That can help to define the settings you chose. I think they were in YAML. Uh, clients struggle to provide consistent data and some products, for example, don't have same history and others. Do you need to create a cross join of the data or resample it to get the conflict levers? 
or can the package provide these values? Okay, so um, every program has to run some assumptions. So our assumption uh, is that um, user provides that data in CSV for, uh, format uh, sampled equally throughout the time, so uh, gaps uh, of the timestamps has to be equal. Uh, and uh, this uh, lies on the user. Mm. Of course, we lose the losing the constraints uh, as much as we could. So, uh, if there uh, if there is not sufficient data uh, into the past, uh, your um, series can be at uh, different lengths. Um, so, for example, if you have a product A that uh, you have uh, data on uh, for uh, two years and product B that you have data on for only one year, so uh, we can digest it. But uh, the constraint is that uh, this uh, mm, series must align. Uh, yeah, that's the, I think that is the one part of the question. Um, regarding uh, configs that uh, were in the YAMLs, YAMLs. Um, <clears throat> so part of these configs that were, uh, was the problem definition. So uh, this is actually uh, dependent on the task. So if you want to forecast whether uh, two weeks into the future, this is a different task than forecasting uh, weather uh, tomorrow. Uh, so uh, this is uh, actually uh, defining what we want to achieve. But the other parameters, like model parameters, yes, there is an inbuilt package, uh, Optuna, that uh, allows you to uh, so, uh, aim for the best parameters for solving the uh, task you specified. Uh, yeah, and the third part of the question? Uh, yeah, I already, already answered that. Thanks. Yeah, you, uh, I think you covered it. Thanks so much for the for the extensive re reply. And so the next also pretty long question is for Magda. So about Toloco, can Toloco auto classify the values as the first pass and then provide output for future editing by client? Uh, the idea is for correction of Pay labels, verification of labels in the UI provided by the logo instead of having to abstract that verification process for a client. Okay, I think someone have probably asked this question at the beginning of the presentation. So the last part, the complex pipeline actually <laughs> answers this question. So yes, it's possible. It's setting up two projects. The first project is just uh, the labeling project. And then the second project is the verification project. Yes. Uh, all right. So also, by the way, I thought like you, you, the probably rushed through the last part of the presentation. Maybe you had something to add uh, yeah. in your to your session. Maybe some. Yeah, maybe sorry, some I thought we were actually running out of the time. But oh, uh, we have yeah, time right now. But yeah, if, if there is something very valuable you want to 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 say, uh, yeah. this is just probably. Yeah, I didn't have time to spend a lot of this, but this is actually when the automation uh, really. Uh, takes well it's important here so you want to start those projects whenever you want so once you have set up a project in toloca or those two projects in toloca you can stop and start the automatic labeling imagine that you have you might have even another project a third project that would be a monitoring project where you have uh, maybe your model it's already built and uh, you are validating if those outputs are right with Toloka again. And once this model, this actually validation starts to drop down, for example, we can start the relabeling process in Toloka again. So this is um, actually how it all connects. And I think this is actually when it makes sense. If you have more than one project, it really makes sense to connect them and use uh, well, either Python SDK or API, just API or Java SDK. Okay, thank you very much for for this uh, this commentary uh, on your talk. And we have one question for Christopher. So, Christopher, how do you manage which uh, machine learning model has which business logic associated with it, and then define better performance when moving from one model to another with different business logic? since they are no longer comparing apples with apples. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> so uh, the way to, or the way we at 
uh, experience looked into how do we actually explain these uh, machine learning models and make sure that that they follow the business logic is using uh, the shared package in Python or shared key values. Um, I don't know how many knows about this, but it's a pretty uh, good way to, to look at how does each variable impact the decisioning of, uh, of, of, of a more black box model. Um, so it is of course not data for logistic regressions, it can also be used for those. But uh, for more complex uh, black box models, we use these shared values and, and investigate them. Uh, and we, the performance, uh, we calculate this as uh, the Gini coefficient is usually the one that is, uh, is used, uh, either the Gini coefficient or the KS statistic. Uh, this is just a measure for, uh, for if, if you split up your entire portfolio into bands, you then look at how well does these bands separate between the good and bad accounts. Uh, it's just a number for that. Okay, thank you for the answer. So yeah, I remind you that we have still time for the question. So put yours in the Q&A tab or just in the chat, we'll ask them. So meanwhile, uh, Jan, so maybe you have something you'd like to add to your video that we just had as a talk, as I asked also Magda to as if she was planning to add something. So uh, we have a uh, bit of time for that. Yeah, so maybe I'll advertise a bit. Uh, so uh, our plans for the future uh, is to add um, a model zoo to easy development and uh, uh, compare a couple uh, the most uh, popular models uh, and uh, release the, um, the results uh, uh, of excessive HP search. Like uh, we will do this on NBITS or uh, on DPR, on TFT, uh, and on couples uh, state of the art special temporal models. So um, may maybe I'll tell a story why uh, this project came to being. Uh, we wanted uh, to implement uh, a state of the art uh, time series uh, model uh, and optimize it, but it turned out that there there is no single state of the art time series model. Uh, because uh, everyone uh, uses different metrics, uh, everyone uses different uh, data sets, uh, and uh, actually, actually uh, everyone uses uh, their own code base. So um, we wanted to uh, do a fair comparison between uh, the models and uh, select a clear winner. But uh, it turned out that, uh, of course, different models uh, are uh, good in different things like uh, NBIT uh, trains uh, extremely fast uh, and uh, TFT is a general purpose model uh, and for example, special temporal models are uh, mm, very good in predicting uh, traffic. So uh, yeah, so that, that's uh, how we came with this uh, modular approach and now we will uh, De develop a couple uh, opt will optimize a couple models to uh, to show uh, how fast and uh, uh, how easily we can r run them using uh, NVIDIA hardware. Well, thank you for this additional information. And yeah, like it's it's always good good to hear like both story and and plans plans for uh, for development of any projects. Uh, right. So. Um, yeah, so I guess people got a little bit tired for like it's it's already tenth hour of live stream we have today, and so I just wanted to wrap up with Christopher. So maybe you have something you'd like to add uh, to your presentation, and this is this is the spot, the time spot for you right now. Uh, yeah, sure, I can add something. So uh, I've mentioned a lot that the <clears throat> that regulators have to find a lot of stuff for us. For example, the time. That is uh, also true to an extent, but you see a lot of projects we have I actually also have other packets uh, depending on what they want. So what we always do is uh, we define the target that we want, um, uh, and then uh, we actually make the model depending on that target, then we, afterwards we recalibrate the target to the, to, to the one that I, uh, that I mentioned. And this, um, and maybe I can also mention that I presented application models here. Uh, actually, uh, each bank or each credit institution, every month, they have to calculate this PD again, this probability of the ball or probability of that for the next 12 months. 
I don't know if you saw it, but I mentioned behavior models, uh, or I did, did mention it, but it was on my slide, and that is what they use there. So they are actually every month uh, for the entire portfolio, practically both releases uh, of their portfolio being best. So they know exactly what the likely outcome is for them this year. Uh, and those models are done exactly the same way. The data is just different. All right. Thank you also so much for for uh for this and yeah i think we're gonna give uh our audience some time break because there wasn't actually planned any before the next uh blog but yeah we're gonna very very short break thank you all so much for joining for your presentation for uh for giving your speeches about your imaging projects and yeah i hope to see you on our future events uh thank you so much for joining see ya thank you thank you bye thank you bye. Yeah. Bye. Alrighty, so yeah, let me check with the timing. We should have like six minutes before the next talk. So let's go in a short break. And before that, we have an announcement. Also want to say a huge thank you to our friends from Scout for joining us once again and sponsoring this event. And as the application engineer landscape continues to evolve, the state of observability has become more and more exciting. With tools like Scout, you can get insights into your stack without having to be an observability expert. So with open telemetry, with a new open source project providing an unified standard for telemetry data, such as metrics, traces, and logs. Now with the open telemetry, Scout is building a new observability platform to help simplify telemetry data into actionable insights and is now accepting beta testers. If you want to know more about open telemetry and become a beta tester for Scout's new observability product, go to scoutamp.com slash observability to learn more and participate. Link is in the chat.
Hello. Well, welcome everyone to uh, our last but not least session of the day. Um, just uh, before going with uh, our speakers, uh, let me just give you a friendly reminder. If, if you have questions, uh, comments, or whatever, just leave it uh, there in the comments. Um, we are going to be reading them uh, later after uh, after the talks, right? So, um, going with our uh, first speaker, Jason Ku. Uh, Jason Ku is a video editor turned Pythonista. He is a Neo4j uh, resident Python developer advocate. He has gone from working behind the scenes in Hollywood to develop developing app apps for Silicon Valley companies. And um, he now leverages uh, both experiences to advocate developer technologies in visually oriented formats. Um, he's going to be speaking about uh, graph database for Python developers. And um, before going to, I mean, before going with the presentation, just to clarify that uh, he was having some internet issues. So we are going to be using um, a recorded session uh, this time, uh, but hopefully we are going to have him for the Q&A session. So yeah, just uh, go ahead and start the presentation. Hey everyone, welcome to our session on graph databases for Python developers. As many of you know, the Python namesake comes from a British comedy troupe from the 1960s, Monty Python. And one of their most famous movies was Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Now in this movie, King Arthur and his merry band of knights are on a quest to find the Holy Grail. And kind of early on in the movie, there is this almost insignificant scene where a famous historian comes on and is recapping uh, a segment of King Arthur's story to, I think, to sort of kind of speed this part of the movie along. But midway through this historian's monologue, a mysterious knight on horseback comes down and cuts, cuts him down um, and rides off. His wife comes screaming, running into the scene, trying to figure out what is happening. Then the movie cuts back to following King Arthur and his knights. And as the movie progresses, every once in a while, they come back to the police investigating the untimely demise of this historian. Until finally, at, toward the, well, at the climax of the entire movie. So uh, hopefully I'm not spoiling a movie that is uh, more than 40 years old for anyone. But at the end, the British army uh, uh, under King Arthur's uh, control is facing off with a French army uh, protecting a castle. But right before these two armies engage, a pair of police cars come roaring in, the police comes, come out, and they arrest King Arthur and his knights, uh, thereby uh, preventing them from ever finding the Holy Grail. Now, many folks, including myself, have wondered over the years, why did the police suspect King Arthur as, uh, as the, the prime suspect in this historian's murder. So I like to think uh, in the background or maybe in uh, the writer's cutting room floor that the police and the investigator were using this Hollywood style crime board to try and figure out who the culprit was. Now, these boards don't actually, uh, don't actually uh, belong or in are used by police but for tv shows and movies these are great right because they very succinctly visualize what um what evidence has been presented thus far in a tv show or in a movie uh, in a very compact manner right and something that i have noticed now in preparing for this this presentation is all the strings all the lines connecting different pieces of information none of them are labeled but we contextually, we inherently know what they mean, right? So if you have a string tying the murder weapon to a given suspect, we sort of instantly assume that that weapon either belongs or was found in possession of that suspect. Um, that or something earlier in the TV show has, has kind of described that, that, that contextual relationship. Okay, so if the rest of this presentation, nothing sticks, walk away knowing that a graph database is essentially 
this sort of crime map board in digital form as a database. Okay. All right. So why, uh, why graph databases? Why are we interested in graph databases? Well, if you are an individual Python developer who has to manage and create your own databases, you should probably look at all databases in general, just so you know what the right tool for the right uh, job or application is. If you're like uh, the other uh, half of the group who works for a large company where you don't manage the database, right? You don't, you don't handle the schema, you don't keep it running. All you deal with essentially is maybe integrating uh, some calls with an existing database. Now, so in that case, your teammates, your coworkers are interested in graph databases, right? The data analyst who takes all the uh, various um, points of data and, uh, oops, sorry, I'm staring at too many screens, um, who takes all, all the data within a company and puts it into BI tools. Uh, your data scientist who goes through your, you know, your data warehouses, your data lakes, looking for insights or following trend lines. And then of course, management who have, you know, who have okayed the assignments of these analysts and scientists to go just make these, discover these insights and give them information are interested in that information so they can make good business decisions. Okay. So why are they interested in graph databases or why should they be interested in graph databases? Well, according to Gartner, the overwhelming majority of data analytics innovations is going to emerge from graph technologies in just the next couple of years. And to you know, kind of following that trend line, there's this very graph database friendly chart from DB engines showing the change of popularity between different database technologies. Now, this is not showing the relative ranking between technologies against each other. They're just, this is just showing the change of popularity for each particular uh, technology set. So we can, you, you, we can see here that uh, relational databases, it's ever so slightly decreasing in popularity, but still today it, it is, takes up the overwhelming majority of uh, popularity and, and uh, the number of companies using uh, RDMS is, uh, is vastly bigger than these other technologies. But we can see over time that uh, this is likely to change. And leading the pack is of course graph databases with that very fast moving green line. Okay, so uh, what are graph databases? Like, you know, how do they work? You know, what are the details? Um, in general, graph databases fall into one of four categories of no SQL database types, right? We have key value, column, and document. An uh, example of key value would be uh, Redis uh, or An Amazon DynamoDB, column uh, Snowflake or Cassandra, and then in the document area, of course, MongoDB is, uh, is, is a very famous use case for document stores. Okay, so graph databases uh, internally. Okay, so here I'm going to describe one, one type of graph database known as a labeled property graph. So in a labeled property graph, uh, or all graph databases in general, kind of stem from graph theory, right? So in, in graph theory, uh, you have dots and lines. Dots are vertices, lines are edges, and a whole ton of amazing algorithms are built on top of that. For property graph databases, the dots or the circles are known as nodes and the lines, or in this case, arrows are relationships. Now in property graphs, you can have directed and undirected relationships, right? So you can have one node kind of leading to another node, some relationship, uh, or there could be just, you know, an undirected line that just connects the two nodes. Now, both nodes and relationships can be labeled. So you can denote certain types of nodes as say in this case, person, another type of node are goals or objectives, and then relationships, we're gonna mark it as seeking. So, you know, people wanting to achieve some sort of goal and both no, or nodes can be given properties. So we can give them, you know, uh, thumbnail images and give them names, date of birth, uh, et cetera, et cetera, to give more, um, I give more uh, data, more details um, to the nodes, but also relationships can also be given data. So here we can basically weight the relationship, right? How long has King Arthur been looking for the Holy Grail? How intensely has he been looking for it? Okay. And that relationship information um, in other database types is something that is temporarily created Right? It's not uh, part of the data store, but in graph databases, 
Uh, this is one of the, the major differences, is that they are first class citizens within um, the stored data. So the relationships uh, and, and any sort of data associated with it is stored along with the nodes, right? Nodes would be something akin to uh, rows inside a, a more uh, tabular uh, data store. Okay, so when you have relationships as part of the, the data store, you don't have to do kind of weird, ungainly joins, right? So this, this can be very popular with data scientists who are really struggling with complex join queries to just get to the point of, you know, walking through their data and kind of getting a sense of what's going on. You don't ha generally have to do that with graph databases. Um, and we'll see a little bit of that when we look at the actual query language. Okay, so first let's go into use cases. So there are actually, uh, I mean, you could use graph databases for anything, but there are particular scenarios that they're very good for, right? Pathfinding is a great one. If you want to find the quickest way from one node to another, uh, it's very easy to run a, a pathfinding algorithm and, and have the graph database tell you what the shortest uh, paths are between existing nodes. So this is also good for like uh, geospatial applications, right? You know, you know, I'm starting off at my home. I'm trying to get to some location. That is basically a, a graph problem. And, uh, and I've also I've noted that uh, it's good for data discovery. So with visualization tools and knowing uh, a number of uh, query, uh, not query language, but getting at least a few basic queries of whatever graph you're using, you can really start to explore hit, sort of hidden information within your graph, right? Things you may not have thought to look for will become apparent when you start perusing through these sorts of visualization tools. Now, Investigations. So graph data science brings uh, a lot of power to the table when coupled with graph databases. And one of my favorite features or one of my favorite algorithms is link prediction. So link prediction can basically look at all the, the information that you have in a database and either A, predict where future relationships will occur, uh, depending on you know other existing data and behavior, or point out relationships that should exist, but is not officially notated within the database, right? So in this example, I've got this sort of uh, uh, imaginary scenario where the culprit is actually Patsy, um, King Arthur's uh, uh, help. And he also runs the coconut. So he's kind of like the horse and the help. I don't know. So anyways, so in this, this graph, I'm suggesting that, uh, that, that Patsy is the, um, is the culprit. Okay. Uh, moving on. So other use cases. So again, too many to really list, but I'm just grabbing six really, uh, big ones. Uh, recommendation engine is probably one of the easiest to kind of noodle and, uh, widely applicable to a lot of different applications. So retail is a great example of this. So Say you have a purchase history and other people have purchased the same type of products as you. And a lot of them, these other people that you don't know who have purchased, who just happen to have purchased the same things you have, have also purchased some other thing that you have yet to purchase. That other thing can then be recommended to you uh, based on your, your previous purchase history. Social networks, obviously sort of naturally has, is a graph, right? Friends of friends. Uh, six degrees of Kevin Bacon. You want to know, you know, how you're connected to someone or who you should be connected. Great use case. Fraud detection and, and analytics. Uh, unusual behavior kind of sticks out in graph databases, so you can kind of uh, see them uh, easier, even just, you know, kind of visually looking at it, much less running uh, more interesting algorithms. Although for like fraud rings and like bigger, uh, um, big, bigger crime rings, then, uh, then definitely you'll be running uh, things like community detection and trying to um, uh, do entity resolution, oh, which is another great use case, which I didn't write down, is entity resolution or entity identity management can be done very easily with a graph. Uh, and uh, I'll just end with life sciences, which is an amazing uh, category of uh, the, the science is well above me, but pharmaceutical companies are using graph databases to to do drug discovery, to basically suss out through uh, what is known about other drugs and their effects on people, to be able to basically in data only kind of guess what a new compound will do. And all this without actually, you know, starting off with making the chemical. Okay, 
So, uh, graph databases have been around for a little more than 10 years, modern graph databases. So there are quite a number of players and um, uh, different technologies are available for you to, uh, to use. Okay, so again, according to DB Engines, this is the list of top 10 graph databases uh, according to their, their, their metrics that they're using to track. Now for you, uh, your personal top three, top 10 is probably going to be different because it's going to depend highly on what uh, tech stack you might already have in place and what skill sets may already exist on your team. So obviously if you're an Amazon house, Amazon Neptune is going to go way up. If you're Microsoft, that'll get bumped up. Uh, and if you have people on your team who are already very knowledgeable, very experienced with a given query language, then you'll probably only look at the graph databases that can operate with uh, that given uh, graph query language. Okay, so these databases can be grouped into three general categories. Property graphs, which we've talked about earlier, and semantic graphs, or RDFs, or triple stores, uh, store the data slightly different than the earlier example. So for semantic graphs, they store it in a triple pattern, right? So everything is stored as a subject, a predicate, and an object, or a subject, predicate, and some literal value, right? So if you had King Arthur as a subject, you could tie, like, his name is, you know, King Arthur, right? The King Arthur object is named this, and it could have a relationship to another object, right? So King Arthur knows Merlin, All right? So semantic graphs, the nodes do not contain uh, internal data, right? Because all that data can be represented through uh, sets of triples. Okay, the last group are multi-model databases. Now, multi-model databases are um, capable of ingesting lots of different data types, right? CSVs, JSON, XML, even uh, property graphs and semantic graphs can be ingested. And under the hood, they'll have, you know, some combination of, of the two and allow you to access those different data stores under one query language, ideally. Okay. And those top 10 graph databases, uh, here I've broken them up into their respective categories, uh, or at least what they're, you know, generally, uh, uh, known for their primary technology stack. So property graphs, of course, Neo4j, ArangoDB, and TigerGraph. Semantic graphs would be Amazon Neptune, uh, Virtuoso, and Stardog. And then multi-model, uh, OrientDB, and Janus Graph, and Azure Cosmos DB, uh, very famous, also graph database, or graph DB, uh, which is from Ontotext. Ono, um, uh, they make and run graph DB. Okay, so these are the major vendors. Okay. Because we have so many different technologies, we also have kind of a zoo of query languages. It's not quite a one language to one product. Uh, it's not that that deep, but uh, there are quite a number of, of languages to consider. Now, fortunately, uh, there is a working languages group uh, from some of the major graph database vendors have gotten together and they are trying to create a single graph query language, right? A kind of SQL um, standard. And these are the 10 query languages that they've decided to use as reference. Now, we don't have time, and I'm not proficient in that many query languages to kind of go over them, but uh, we will just look at three of what I think are the, the most widely used query languages, OpenCypher, Gremlin, and Sparkle. Okay, we'll start with Sparkle. Sparkle probably looks most like SQL, right? You can see the select is a, a keyword, and it, you can identify it uh, with two main things, right? There's this question mark syntax, which is in front of everything. So a question mark denotes that that thing is a variable, right? So that's not a literal value you're looking for. In this case, you know, give me, you know, uh, all the, uh, all the uh, person objects, which actually you're just giving it the variable person. It's the database actually doesn't um, delineate that at this level. Uh, but you can see that there's this triple pattern as well too, right? We've got the subject, predicate, and object. And you use this pattern to pool the data of interest that you want from this database. And this statement uh, is just returning all the names of King Arthur's friends. And here on the right is an example of a JSON output from that, that query. 
Okay, if you want to play with Sparkle, there is uh, a couple places you could do this. Stardog, uh, I believe, has a free tier that you could log in and upload your own data. But probably easier is starting with uh, this, this online tool called Sparkle Playground. Uh, the URL is down at the bottom. Now, this, uh, this tool has preloaded data, so you can just practice like read, uh, read uh, statements. I don't believe you can actually write anything to this database, though I haven't tried that yet. Okay, Gremlin, uh, also a very popular graph query language. Now here, this is, this is a very different style, right? This is more of a builder style pattern. And here, this query is doing basically the same thing. It's returning the names of all of uh, King Arthur's friends. But uh, actually, now that I'm looking at this statement, uh, I'm missing one thing that, that limits the search to other vertices that are persons, right? So this is actually returning everything that is the name of every vertice linked to uh, King Arthur. So, uh, you know, it would be like his horse or uh, his sword, basically uh, everything. But uh, since I had only populated a sample database with the names of the other knights, uh, this is an, ex an example of JSON output uh, of this statement. Okay. Now, if you want to play with Gremlin, there is this great online free tool called Gremlify, and it has, I think, basically kind of everything you need to kind of get started with a graph database, right? It's got a schema visualizer and kind of builder on the right, and a kind of graph output visu visu visualization also on the right, and then um, you can run your queries. And they have some pre-built templates with pre-built information, uh, pre-built data sets, uh, but you could you start off with a blank one and upload all, all your own data um, and play around with it there. Okay, uh, Cypher, which is used by Neo4j and Memgraph and some other companies. Uh, you can see here that Cypher uses kind of an ASCII art style approach to, uh, to pattern matching, pattern finding. So here, uh, here we've got match instead of select and everything in a parenthesis is a node and information related to a node and everything in brackets are relationships. So here you can visually see that we're looking for, you know, person node named King Arthur and, you know, looking at the pattern of nodes to other people. And in the return statement, I'm asking specifically, return me the names of all these people nodes that you find. And here's an example of an output from, from that query. Now, if you want to play with Cypher, uh, Neo4j has uh, free sandboxes that you can spin up. Um, so th there's quite a few different data sets you can play with, some that have graph data science included and some that don't, but uh, lots of different options for you to kind of go in and play with. And once that sandbox is, is spun up, you can write additional data to it to kind of play with it or just you know work with uh, doing reads on it. Okay, now, since we're, we're all Python developers, great thing is there are Python drivers for all, all these major um, query languages that I've talked about. And a lot of companies will also have their own uh, company sponsored or supported uh, drivers that may have additional features. So here we've got the Sparkle wrapper, which um, you can see here is pretty straightforward. The only thing to note here is that the Sparkle query has to be injected as a string uh, to the driver, All right? And this is also true for the Neo4j's uh, Python driver. So here, <clears throat> again, we are putting the cipher statement as a string into a function that uh, in this case is run by a context manager for the session, which you know takes care of retries and error handling. Okay, so you can see Sparkle and Cypher uh, drivers are somewhat similar. The Gremlin, um, driver is different because it's using that builder pattern. They've basically brought that into the driver. And so when you're writing Gremlin uh, query, it basically, as far as I know, uh, looks exactly like uh, Gremlin query. You can just do it right in uh, Python, I believe. Cool. Okay. So in summary, um, again, why you would be interested in graph databases, it's becoming increasingly popular among data engineering teams. The gr thing to remember most about graph databases is the relationships are first-class citizens. 
right? So that allows for really uh, fast traversals and interesting graph uh, data science algorithms to be used. <coughs> Pardon me. There are lots of technologies in this space. So whatever your tech stack, whatever your query language preferences are, there's probably a technology to meet that needs. Um, and there is, you know, a standard uh, graph query language that, you know, the, the industry is hoping to produce in the next few years. And uh, again, there are, are drivers for everything that, or there are Python drivers for uh, most of the major graph technologies that you might want to use. Okay, so in conclusion, if, uh, if you're still not sure if graph databases are for you, there's this great little graphic from uh, Introduction to Data Science from Manning Publishing. Uh, this is a slightly modified graphic of it, but uh, you can see here where the different SQL and NoSQL technologies are kind of, of stacked on this XY graph, right? On the Y side, we have the size of the data, right? So as you go up, if you have increasingly large uh, data set, uh, you may want to consider moving from, if you're already using SQL, moving to like a key value if the complexity of the data is very narrow. But graph databases basically um, are the top choice if the, your data set is very interconnected, very complex, right? A great use case would be internal data at a company between you know, staff, vendors, clients, projects. Uh, basically, if you wanna create a knowledge graph of everything that, that involves running your company, graph is going to be the way to go. Okay. All right. So I've uh, probably hit my time here. So thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me uh, through email or LinkedIn. Uh, I'm, a, I'm on Twitter a little bit, but uh, LinkedIn is probably the best way to reach me. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, um, great presentation, really, um, very interesting one. Um, I really didn't know much about uh, graph database, but at least I know now, uh, I know more <laughs> for sure. Okay, um, let's continue now with uh, Peter Wang. Um, Peter has been developing commercial scientific computer and visualization software for over 15 years. He has extensive experience in software design and development across a broad range of areas. Um, Peter's interest in the fundamentals of vector computer and interactive uh, visualization led him to co-found Anaconda. As a creator of uh, PyData community and conferences, uh, he devotes time, to, time and energy to growing um, the Python data science community and advocating and teaching Python at conferences around the world. He's going to be explaining about uh, programming for everyone. So um, I just give him uh, the welcome and yeah, you can go ahead, Peter. Hi everyone. So thank you very much for having me. Let me go ahead and share my slides here. Okay, the slides are already there, beautiful. Great. So today I'm going to be talking about PyScript um, and how it enables programming for everyone and why, why I care about it, why we care about it here at Anaconda and, and what it's all about. So, um, so I like to start this off by sort of asking, you know, folks to think about if you use Python, um, you know, and if you like it, let's hope, um, what are some of the things that are awesome about Python? And, and some of these things that I've listed here on the slide are the sorts of things that people talk about when they think, when they say, you know, what's Python good for? Um, you know, it's definitely got a really rich uh, packaging ecosystem with all sorts of tools, especially for doing things in data and visualization. Um, there's a lot of great communities around different areas of science and uh, web programming and, you know, all manner of things, you know, doing robots and things like that. Um, and the other thing about the Python language that's interesting is that it um, it's easy for newcomers to learn how to program it because the language can be quite small. You can learn just a little bit and you can learn by example from other people's things. Um, but for those who are not so familiar with Python or who only sort of know about it as one of many different languages they might use, one of the things that I think is underappreciated about Python is that it has this really interesting design or architectural sort of thing, um, which is that it, uh, under the hood, it has a low level C API for the Python interpreter, the virtual machine that runs the Python code. That virtual machine 
um, can be extended with extensions like NumPy and SciPy, Pandas, Scikit-Learn, Matplotlib, all these tools that people doing the data stuff really, really enjoy and, and have made uh, have, have uh, become quite popular. Um, and those things allow Python to wrap other languages, but not just wrap them and call them, but actually sort of like ingest their innards into the Python runtime process itself and then engage with those things. So Python as a scripting language is is that has this interesting way of swallowing up these other kinds of libraries in a deep way. And I, I talk about it as sort of being like a Honda Civic that has mounting bolts that you can put warp drives on top of. Um, and while those warp drives are built with Fortran or C++, it doesn't matter. Python can really do nice things with them. And, and the whole thing works pretty well. But the thing that Python's never really gotten you know, uh, any kind of foothold in is actual programming in the browser, which we can all admit that is the realm of JavaScript. Even though things like CoffeeScript and TypeScript exist, and there are certain projects that allow you to do a little bit of Python in the browser. Historically, the bulk of what makes Python powerful, this, this low-level extension and C library sort of ecosystem, that has never made it into the browser for obvious reasons, right? The browser only runs JavaScript. Um, and so the thing that's changed very recently is that WebAssembly has become a standard. And um, what, what WebAssembly allows you to do is it allows... Um, it exposes essentially the, the web browser runtime environment, which JavaScript runs on. It exposes that entire browser runtime environment in the sandbox as a sort of a virtual machine or a virtual CPU. And that virtual CPU is uh, actually quite powerful. It's, it's got a four gigabyte memory space. It's a full sort of 64-bit CPU. You can do 64-bit math in it. Um, and most recently, uh, or most importantly, a, uh, a set of tools have emerged that allow you to compile most C and C++ things that target like a POSIX backend, it lets you compile those to WebAssembly. And that project is called mscripted. So what that means is, oh, the other thing about, Py about WebAssembly is even though the standard only came out in 2019, it's quite ubiquitously supported. So when you look at who all supports it, there's about 4 billion installed devices, I think by uh, estimating about 4 billion installed devices around the world that, that will run it. So the most popular browsers on desktop and in mobile will run WebAssembly. It's not some bleeding edge exotic thing. It actually you know, is, is here now. Um, and the Python interpreter itself is getting official WebAssembly support. Again, what that means is treating the WebAssembly like a CPU, just like uh, you know, uh, Intel x86, or uh, x86-64 or ARM, you know, WebAssembly is just another chip that CPython will target and, and be supported on. And this just happened essentially in December of last year, less than a year ago. And um, uh, well, the announcement of it getting official support happened um, really quite recently. So um, this is all pretty cutting edge and new. And so what is PyScript then? PyScript is a framework for creating rich Python applications in the browser. And this includes, this includes the scientific and data libraries for Python. That includes Matplotlib and Scikit-Learn, of course, NumPy and SciPy, right? Pandas, uh, Bokeh, a lot of different libraries will work. This includes all of Jupyter, actually. There's a project called Jupyter Lite, which runs all of the Jupyter environment in just in the browser tab with no server required. So what PyScript does is it, is as a framework, it lets you interleave Python code in your HTML and you have full access to the DOM. You can call and be called by JavaScript libraries. You can import JS into your Python code in your PyScript code and then call JS dot whatever, right? You can, get you can get a reference to the window object. You can write things to the console. So all of this um, logic and code lets you write everything in the, in the browser. It's just HTML. And you don't have to have a server. You don't have to run a run a, a Flask or a Django server. You just need to have HTML with this PyScript stuff in, inside. So here's what it looks like. Here's what a simple script could look like with some annotations on it. So in the head, we put a script link to PyScript.js. Now, in this particular snippet of example, it points to a local build. You can see examples where it points to our CDN hosted build of the PyScript.js JavaScript file. And then that creates a set of web components. It gives you access to a set of web components, um, bracket py-script and a few others. And that py-script um, web component, it then lets you write Python code, P 
pure Python code. And here we're importing the date time module from the standard library. And we're um, then calling a function on it. And that example, if you go to pyscript.net and you go to examples and you click the simple hello world example, this will just run. Um, and by default, the standard output of your script will go to any print statement will print into the DOM itself just as another text element. Um, but you can configure the output to go to a different div if you like. We have examples of how that works also on the PyScript example site. Um, and again, keep in mind, there's no server with this. This is just HTML. So I take this HTML file and I can, end it, I can enter it into, you know, in, my, in any text editor on the planet, I can put this into an HTML file um, and then someone could double click that HTML file and they would have a running Python environment uh, in their web browser. So how does this actually work? Well, under the hood, there's a bunch of different things going on. So the PyScript framework actually is kind of this green tier here. It's got a bunch of JavaScript wiring, a bunch of different kinds of pieces that then call back to a Python for WebAssembly runtime called Pyodide, which is a different project. It's existed for a few years and PyScript sort of builds on top of that project. And PyScript is a, what we would call an opinionated client side web framework. So you have full access to the DOM, um, we have ways of converting the objects back and forth from JavaScript to Python. And it really runs what we call true serverless. So um, no, no server needed. Um, now, if you want to, you can run this with a server. You can serve up localhost and serve up this file. And then anyone can connect to your, to your machine. And, and you know, that would work as well. So you can host this if you want to. But there doesn't need to be a persistent connection to the server for you to write full-on application code in Python. So there's some more examples. I, I'm not going to show live examples or demos here in this particular um, talk. But if you go to pyscript.net slash examples, you can click on these and you can play with them. Um, there's a full-on scikit-learn interactive machine learning in the browser example. The one front and center here, this is uh, using DeckGL. So we can wrap JavaScript libraries. We don't just expose Python libraries. We can wrap and interact with JavaScript libraries. So this is interacting with uh, DeckGL and is using pandas. And it's running on like a million row data set of the New York City taxi cab data. And it lets you click around and interact with these sliders and basically do all these fun things. And the code for it's all in Python sitting there in the HTML. And on the right, um, the top right example is an animated WebGL. Uh, it's using 3GS, uh, sorry, 3JS uh, as the library. And if you look at the source code for that example, you'll see that it's literally importing 3JS and then calling various JavaScript functions on it. Um, and that works great. So that runs on, these will run on tablets and they'll run on, on even on your, on your phone if your phone is, uh, uh, has, has the CPU for it. Um, so this is really a really fun, cool thing. And just to recap, right, you can do Python, data science, MLAI now in the browser. It's actually quite performant. There's a small performance hit relative to uh, native running Python natively, but that will get better over time. We're already finding ways to kind of optimize that. Um, and the key thing here is that it is zero install. You know, people like to complain about Python packaging. Getting Python up and going on a system can be quite hard. If uh, if a beginner, let's say they create some Python notebook or script or whatever, and they import some libraries, trying to get that onto someone else's machine is actually really really hard a lot of times. And so this allows you to do it all from within just an HTML file. And that's your UI. That's where all your stuff lives. It's really, really simple then to share that with friends and to expose that um, for, uh, for other people to, to use. So um, we announced this project at PyCon uh, earlier in the spring at PyCon US. Um, in the last four months since that announcement, we've had a, a you know, great, great positive reception from the community. A lot of people have shown interest in, in using PyScript and incorporating into the things they're doing. Um, since that time, what we've done at Anaconda is we've hired a full team to work on this project. And it, again, is open source. It is permissively licensed open source. Um, it, you know, we're just really excited about this technology and having this advanced Python. So we are, uh, we, we've staffed up a, a team to work on this. We're also adding additional backends besides just the Pyodide runtime. So that includes MicroPython, which is much, much smaller, much faster loading. Doesn't have all the bells and whistles of standard C Python, um, but that will be really nice for people in kind of embedded use cases or lower end devices. Or sometimes you just need a little bit of Python to do some stuff because you don't want to write in JavaScript. You can just pull in MicroPython with a simple PyScript tag. Um, we're also working with a broader community of people who've also been working on Python and WebAssembly to figure out the right way to package and ship Python WebAssembly modules um, that is more, 
you know, web friendly, web native than, um, than kind of the current wheel or Conda package infrastructure that exists today. And, and of course, you know, we've done a lot of code cleanup. We, we really sprinted hard to get the alpha release out for uh, PyCon. And so we've had to do a little bit of cleanup and organization on the back end of that. Um, and also given the reception that people have had and how eager people are to use this for real things, we, we sat down and did some API design to try to really make it be something that we feel good about people building on um, you know, it well into the future and also make it easy for people to build extensions and for us to build an extension ecosystem of capabilities around PyScript. Now, that being said, um, while most of the Python community is quite supportive, a lot of people in the, uh, in the broader Twitter, Hacker News, and just global tech community were quite, um, well, some, some of them were less than excited about this, right? Uh, some people felt that this was just a return to an even worse thing than PHP, if that were possible. Uh, literally a comment on now, Hacker News. Um, oh, this will just be a security nightmare. This is terrible. Why don't people just learn JavaScript? Or, you know, if JavaScript sucks, why don't we learn TypeScript? Or why don't we just do Rust, you know? And so this is the kind of thing that you end up with, I guess, when you put anything out there in the world and Hacker News has an opinion on it. Um, but the general question, I think that was a use, that was a good question is why? Why would you do this crazy thing? I mean, we're coders, we can learn JavaScript. Most of us know JavaScript. Um, even if you don't like it, it's not that terrible. Why would you do this horrible thing of slamming Python into this, into HTML, like, like it was PHP, you know, in 99. And there's, a, there's a, a deep reason for this that I care about, and this gets to the theme of the talk. There's a reason why we code and why we care. So at Anaconda, we were uh, responsible for kind of 10 years ago, really trying to, we were investing a lot of effort into putting Python for data science and Python for numerics and numerical analysis, really pushing that into Python for data analytics and business data processing in general. It took a real push. And the reason we cared about that was because we felt that a lot of that kind of analysis and a lot of the data analysis that people were going to want to do in the era of big data would require these kinds of capabilities that we had in the Python ecosystem. Furthermore, it was important for that to be open source. It was really important for it to be accessible, that people could learn it without becoming you know, PhDs in computer science. So that idea that data analysis, modern, cutting edge, scalable, performant data analysis should be accessible to uh, everyone. That was one of the uh, real key motivation for us doing what we did with PyData and with Anaconda and, and all of the ecosystems around this stuff. Um, and, uh, and it was a strong um, counterpoint to, I think, certain others who felt that this would always be uh, a deeply technical thing that required you to learn a bunch of Java, maybe a bunch of Scala. You have to learn a bunch of this and that and the other. You really have, if you're a geneticist or if you're an astrophysicist or if you're a cancer researcher or if you're a biologist or a, 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 an oceanographer, you have to also become a programming expert to learn how to use computers to do your data problems. We we saw the PyData ecosystem, the, Sci, the SciPy ecosystem as a, as a, a counterpoint to that. We strongly believe that data tools should be accessible to everyone. We want to take something like Python, which people have, uh, you know, quite I would say voted with their feet to say this is a useful language to, to teach programming in and for people to learn as the first language. Let's make that learnable, accessible language as accessible as possible for data analysis. Now with PyScript, we're taking that one more step further, right? Doing it, if you, if you see a lot of people using uh, these Jupyter Notebooks, doing Python in them, a lot of times what they want to do is publish those notebooks and turn them into web artifacts they can share with their friends. Because for a lot of scientists and for a lot of data science type people, that's the first time they could actually author something in the browser that wasn't you know, typing into a social media app or something, or typing into a food, you know, a, a review site of food or on you know, like an Amazon or something, but actually to go and create a piece of HTML, a piece of a web document that was rich, that had all the promises of, of hypermedia, to really do that, if you're a lay person who's not a computer science major, who's not a software engineer by trade, that's actually really quite difficult and quite, if you look at the stack of what's needed to deploy a bunch of JavaScript today, it's horrible, right? So it's horrible even for devs whose professional full-time job is to do that. So um, with PyScript, we wanted to eliminate a bunch of that complexity to reduce a lot of the client server complexity of deployment and put it all, take this Python language, which people have, um, you know, uh, I think generally agreed is very accessible and easy to learn, put that right in the middle of HTML, which is also pretty easy to learn. 
and make it so that people can build useful things and fun things and quirky things. Um, and another thing I really want to drive home is that um, the number of software developers in the world is, depending on who you ask, 25 to 40 million people, which is seems like a lot of people, but at the same time, it's not a lot of people compared to the number of non-programmer people in the world. So every single box here, you know, represents um, a million people. And, you know, on the left, we have sort of 25 million software developers against 8 billion people on the planet. It's a very tiny number. And then if you think about how many software developers understand data analysis and statistics, machine learning, it's even smaller than that. So we cannot build a future that is driven by data that the world and policy decisions and governments are making decisions on the basis of so much of these data computing infrastructure pieces where only the tiniest fraction of a percent of people understand how it works or what it does or why. So we have to radically democratize access to these tools. We have to radically increase the number of people who are able to do this kind of work in order for us to continue um, to, to, to really, I would say, um, shore up the very principles, the very concept of self-governance and, and, and democratic institutions in the world. Um, so that brings us down to this fundamental point about programming for the, what I call the programming for the 99%, right? That I want for children to have a very easy, simple and fun time doing programming and they can build all sorts of interesting things, whether it's AI gesture detection with a webcam, whether they're making little games, things like that. And they should be able to do it very simply. And it should be without having to learn a tremendous amount of complex cloud deployment, orchestration, everything. Um, by doing this with a browser, doing this with HTML, we're able to reuse a lot of the educational materials that are already out there for HTML and CSS and Python. Um, and really our focus as a project is to improve the quality of life for what I call casual programmers. So this is not necessarily the expert hacker news crowd. Um, this may not even not be for many of the people here on this call where your full-time job is to understand the deep internals of things like JavaScript and web technologies. This is for casual programmers and for people who wanna do something beyond a spreadsheet, who wanna make fun little things like Jupyter Notebooks to do their data analysis for work and they wanna share with their colleagues. So all of this is really around that easy to remix easy to uh, share, and really ultimately want to make the web a friendly and hackable place where anyone can make interesting things. You'll see we have some ex fun little examples of whatnot in PyScript. And this is really going to be our focus uh, and vision for the project. So if you're interested, check us out on GitHub. You can also follow PyScript Dev on Twitter. And uh, of course, I encourage you to go and play with some of the examples yourself at pyscript.net slash examples. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Peter. Like, very great presentation. Um, I'm very excited to see what's going to be the next thing here in PyScript. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great project uh, indeed. So we'll see. Thank you. No, you're welcome. Uh, well, um, we are going to having some video here now uh, from our sponsors. So I leave you with, with that. Thank you, Influx Data, for sponsoring this event and for joining us as a presenters. And just a couple of words about the InfluxDB if you happen to miss Jay's presentation. So basically, if your app or the product that you're working with is using time series data, then for you, this is a very cool solution because you know that building real-time apps with legacy databases, it can be just a nightmare as uh, you have to spend more time basically managing the infrastructures instead of shipping the code. But with InfluxDB, the leading time series platform, which was built actually from ground up to handle massive volumes of timestamp data produced by sensors, applications, and infrastructures, InfluxDB empowers us as developers to build real-time IoT, analytics, and cloud applications with ease. And you can easily start and scale InfluxDB, and it will give you the time to actually focus on the features and functionality that give your app the competitive edge. You can focus on things that you are best at and let the InfluxDB do the rest. And you can get started 
for free today using the link in the chat. So it's influxdb.com slash cloud. And don't miss your opportunity to grab it for free right now. Okay, well, uh, moving on with our next speaker, we have uh, Leandro Sartini. Uh, he's a data scientist working for Mercado Libre Brazil. Uh, he loves to deep dive into uh, studies and understand the things that are happening around him. He has a strong love for data. He loves to transmit information and give uh, his knowledge to other people. Uh, he has already promoted some coding um, courses throughout companies he has been working with. And he's going to be talking about uh, enhance your time series training, test, and validation data set in a smart way. Okay, all yours, Leandro. Thanks. Let me just share my screen here. Okay. So, I think you guys can see my screen. I'll start now. Uh, just let's go with a little bit of introductions. I think Mauricio just did that, but just so that you guys know me a little bit better. I'm, I'm 26, 26 years old. I work right now for Mercado Livre. I have been to other companies like Bayer and Tango Teaser. I work as a data scientist right now, focus on the marketplace side. Uh, I have graduated as a computer engineer. And I have for hobbies, for the big part, I'm a gamer. I love gym. And the most recent is that I'm a snowboarder. Uh, so let's start now. Uh, this is the agenda. Uh, what I'll talk about first in the, with about the models usage. Uh, on this presentation, uh, on, on what I'm explaining to you. Uh, on XGBoost as a time series, since I'm talking about time series, uh, some some persons like uh, might have questions uh, as does XGBoost, can, can XGBoost, XGBoost work as a time series? And so how can we use that as a time series? Validation method, especially about out of time validation and out of safe, out, out of safe, out of sample validation, and of course what is train test and validation, and some conclusion and links afterwards. Uh, so let's start now. Uh, first, let's begin with the models. I'm talking about profit and XGBoost. Uh, profits very very easy to use. You can run a profit in a very small amount of lines. Uh, it's, it has a good response uh, when it's time series models. Uh, and you just, the, the main thing you have to do is mostly transform your data variable into DS, rename it to DS, and then the output variable uh, SY. Uh, it has nice built-in features. You can plot the components of the time series uh, then you can check if the signal is a noise or not, not, and if you can predict things there. But there are some drawbacks. It's not really a category fringe because you have to build a model for each of the categories you have. Uh, you see in some examples that I've posted uh, that if I have like houses and apartments, and also I have postal codes and I need to build a, mod, a model for each house and postal code and also each apartment and postal code, there will be like one model for each one of the combination of categories. Uh, you, can be, uh, you can be creative, creative with, with profits by edging regressors, but it's not like something that can impact a lot. So it helps, but it's not, um, of, you, you cannot do too, make, too much things to enhance what it has there. Uh, then there is XGBoost. That's a decision tree model, not, not a time series model. But there is some things we can do to make it work like a time series. Uh, and since it's a, a decision tree model, you can customize all of its parameters you can be loads of you can have loads of creativity because you can create new variables that will feed the model. Uh, it is a category friend because you just need like a model to everything, so it helps when you are automating it. Uh, but of course, it's a little bit harder to use because to make it work like a time series, you have to follow some steps before. 
Uh, so these are the drawbacks of each, uh, and of course the con the, the pros. Uh, then let's go to XGBush as time-based model. Uh, what what is the step by step that we need to do to make it work as a time-based model? First, we have to define how long how long we we need to predict. So for example, uh, I need to predict in one month, uh, one month ahead. Uh, one week, one week, 24 hours, one year. Uh, why do we need to have this earlier on? Because we need to create a sliding window, uh, which will make like a shift of the variables on this time. So uh, we, we fix on how much it can predict. If I define one month, like the example that I, I'll show you, then um, you, you can only predict one month ahead and nothing more than that. Of course, you can use like predictions of predictions and then have uh, your your response, but that's not the, the best thing to do. Uh, then you can aggregate your custom variables, whatever you created or whatever you have on your database. And then it comes to the final steps, evaluation, prediction, and etc. cetera. Uh, there is some things that we have to be careful to avoid mistakes. First, uh, since we have data variables there, we have to break our data variable into day, month, and year because we want it to function as a time series and it cannot comprehend the data variable there. So we break it into three columns. You can have then week and, and holidays and other things. Uh, and since our, our problem is a time series, there is another thing that we have to be careful, uh, especially when we are talking like about sales. Uh, let's suppose uh, we use 30 days. We'll have like a difference in shift because Monday will be fitting with Wednesday and not another Monday or Monday from the past. So it's better to use like seven days, 14 days, 21 days, 28 days, everything that can align your Monday with a Monday from the past. So on this example, I do one month of prediction and uh, there will be 28 days before of data uh, so going on just showing some examples it's really simple here uh, we have to create our time variables so this is a df that i had there i create the day the month the year and we have this here uh, then we need to do the sliding window and how do we do that first we have to do a sort uh, on our variables so that we can uh, make sure that it's uh, on the correct order, uh, it's sorted correctly. And then afterwards, we do a group by with a shift, which we can see here. So we will make for each of these groups, uh, the variables that we want to shift 28, to 28 days. And this is with your aggregated columns. So I'm doing this with bedrooms because I want bedrooms uh, to be 28 days for the same apartment or postal and postal code to be 20 day, 28 days head on. Uh, and then we can make this sliding window on, on, on where it, 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 it will have the data on the future so that it can predict. Now, just showing you a little bit of real world scenario results. results. Uh, let's focus on category B and E. Uh, this is market data. So uh, uh, this is something that we actually tested and worked. Category B and D were like volat the most volatile categories that we had uh, in example, and we couldn't really predict so well. Um, when we see category B and E that has XGBush as one of the uh, variable, uh, one of the models that we were testing, what we could see is could predict uh, very uh, a lot better than the other models uh, since we could create more variables and, and feed it with more things. Uh, and it was a little bit more stable over time. We have here a LSTM profit, a custom profit with like, with like loads of uh, random parameter search and, and also some auto regressors, but XGBoost could have more impact than the other ones. And then we have the other thing, which is, I just showed you how to do XGBush. 
on, on time series. But there is another, another topic that's very important when we are doing uh, a time series model, which is train test and validation. Well, first train, uh, that also known as Fitch, I, 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 I do know that you guys know how, how what it is. So it's where we, we give our model data so it can learn. Uh, then we have test, and sometime, sometimes and in some regions it can be called validation. We have, uh, I think here in Brazil, we call what, test, val test validation and validation test, which is different in some regions. Uh, for test here, which is the second step, is where we, 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 we test our, our model hyperparameters. So we are testing uh, to see how we can enhance our model just by moving our hyperparameters. And then by the end of it, we have validation, which could be like a step to prove that your model will, will work over time or will work if a new user comes, for example, uh, which leads us to our other topic, which is out of time validation. So here is an example. Uh, we can see here our data set and we can do we, we what is a, a good principle and a good thing you can, you, you can do when doing time series is having like a little bit of period of validation. It doesn't have to be like the whole year like I did here. It's, it's just for examples. It could be like two months, one month, or three months. It depends on, on the business, on, 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 on what you are working with. Uh, so the thing is, we have to create a train test, which will be the bigger portion, which where our model will work, it doesn't have to be a bigger portion. There is like you can do cross validation, and it will get like a little time, time fra fractions of this of this area. But the most important thing is that we separate a period out of time so that we can validate that our model will work afterwards. So, for example, uh, I have a model. And uh, I trained it up until August of this, uh, no, oh, uh, yeah, beginning of August of this year. And then I want you to see if my model will deprecate a lot over the time. So I could use August, the whole August and the whole September to validate if it's deprecating and how much it's deprecating. Uh, and this uh, this is useful because uh, you get like some sort of weight out of you uh, when putting it to automation because you know it will work for some kind of period. It could be like six months, it could be a year. It depends on the business, the problem, the and, and, and other things. And there is uh, so here is an example of out of time validation. So very easy to here we have there the the train DF here, which goes out up until uh, 2019. Uh, and then we have uh, the test DF, which gets like just one month, which is the month of May of 2019. And then we have the validation, which gets everything uh, after this the, the, the test period. And then with this after part, it's like two months, we can like take this stress out and see how much it will deprecate. We, we cannot like measure too much of that, but uh, it will take like that weight off and you, you can say, no, it will work for some time. Uh, and then we have out of sample validation where you separate a part of your sample. So it could be like users. And that's where I get of example. We have here for training and tests like uh, user X and Y, X and Y, and X and Y. It's the same users on all parts of the time. And then for validation, I can use any period and it could be sorted, but using user Z. So I'm getting an, another part of this sample that I have, which is another use, which my model doesn't work uh, to make it predict that. That's very useful. That's very useful on risk models, for example. Uh, and of course, you can mix both things. You could mix out of time with uh, out of sample if there is a, a case for that. But uh, then you have these uh, these two methods to use. Uh, and then uh, this is some helpful links which I'll be I'll be giving to you. Now I want to jump to the uh, use case which I'll be showing on my Gitch. And I won't be running anything because I already I have already 
run everything and and profit took takes a little bit of time to run so it's just better to to show so first here we have the import of the lips and the raw sales which i've got from kego i leave the the, the link for, for for you here uh this is the house property sales uh that data set uh then i have some some analysis just a little bit because this is this has to be simple so you guys can understand. Uh, I transform the date surge into a date time variable because I uh, it's better to work with. Uh, then I just check how many property types I have and I see that I have houses and units and how many postcodes. So just to give an example here, if every house and every unit has every postcode for a profit, we would need to have like fifty four uh models there of course you can create like dictionaries with all of these and store them all there it's just uh more models but we can we we, we pythonists can make some ways to make this easier for us uh then i start to do the the thing that profit asks us which is turn the date soldier into ds and the variable that we want to predict which is price in y uh, then I just check which is my minimum uh, and, and which, which is my maximum. And one thing, we don't always need to use all of the data to train. Uh, since we've gone through pandemics and there is loads of variables there, companies that grow for a lot and other things, uh, sometimes it will be better to use less time, which uh, corresponds to what we, we had of uh, uh in this period of time then using the whole data whole data can make like a, a more generalist model but sometimes it can, it can get confused it can get confused uh then i do my out of time validation here and for profit i just do with postcode 2602 because if i did with every postcode it should be a little bit uh would, would it be fair to like have a profit that predicts all everything to to houses uh and then my xbus knows what is what is uh the the postcode 2602 so then i just lock on this here because we just do one model i start my profit uh then i do my trend df here and my test df i do my fitch uh and then i get some mean absolute error my mae as we can see, we get like uh, an, an error of 300, 300k of the houses of this postal code. And what I do is just do a little bit because since we know this, maybe we can enhance it with hyperparameter turning. And then I do again my, my hyperparameter optimi optimization. I do the fitch. And then we can get a little bit uh, a, a better result with this hyperparameter turning that I've did. It could be done with random search uh, grid and other techniques, techniques, but that's just to show you moving a little bit can improve. And we are checking this on test. And then we want to do what validate our model uh, by using our validation data frame or out of time period. Uh, and as we can see, it does the package. That's why it's important to check because it got like 50K more uh, on these two months that we have of, uh, of period of validation. Uh, it does the package, deprecation. That's expected because all models deprecate over time. Uh, so then we move to Actibush. Actibush is a little bit more complex to create. We have to first, uh, transform our property type, which is houses and units, into a bool. Think if we had more categories there, we would need to do like a one-hot encoding or other techniques like uh, encoding with map or original encoding there. But here it's it's just true. Then we can do like transform it into a boolean, and we know what is what. Uh, then we do the creation of the time variables into columns, and we have this data frame. Uh, and after that, it's the, the area that I showed you, I've shown you, uh, where you guys can see that I do the search, and then afterwards I do the shift on the bedrooms var, which will be a variable that will be on the future for me. 
Uh, for final steps, we do create our out of time validation uh, here, which I've also shown you. And then we create our models. So I start here in actually bush regressor with just 800 uh, estimators. Uh, I do a fit here using the variables. And then by locking the, the, the postcode here, because we want to be fair and compare fairly things, uh, we can see that comparing to the other profit, which was just a, a, like a default profit with this actually bush, we get a gain of like 90, 90K uh, of error. So it's 90k less error than the profit. Uh, and also I do some, uh, since I've got the test here, I'll do some hyperparameter turning. And so I just move two variables so that we can see like estimators to, uh, to this and learning h to 0, 0, 0 0.3. And then we do another fit and also we get results, which decrease even more or error. It's now in almost half of the first profit, the default profit, and also almost half of the uh, the hyper parameter tonnage custom profit. Uh, and then we have to check our validation, which here got a little bit less on the uh, on the normal model, uh, and here too on the other model it got a little bit less. And it could be like uh, it has since it's it has loads of variables there. Uh, it could be many things that page that uh, because it's using all data. So it could be something that happened, happened in the past and then appeared here in this same data. Uh, that's it. I hope you enjoyed the class, the material. Uh, this is my linkage. I'll be posting. Uh, I think it's already there. So I'll be posting the link to the Git uh, to use to you guys on the chat. So that you can you guys can have this. It has the presentation there too. If you have any questions on how I did that or how I would create something, I also know a little bit of LSTM and and uh, recurrent neural networks. We can we can talk. We can share figures and and do these kind of things. That's it. Thanks a lot, guys. Okay. Thank you, Leandro. What's up? Very great presentation, uh, very lightly uh, regarding time series. Um, I think we are a, li a little bit ahead of schedule. Probably we can do uh, a small break. I don't know, um, guys, what do you think? And we can uh, come back with the uh, Q&A session. Um, I don't know, uh, Nick, what do, you, what do you think? Yeah, let's do that. Uh, just a uh, small break of uh, five, let's say 10 minutes, and we'll be back to the session. Yeah, I think you can, you can start with, with the Q&A session with just Leandro, and uh, then we'll just wait while, while the next speakers are connecting. No okay, worries, no, yeah. no need for a break. OK, yeah. OK, go ahead. Uh, we still don't have uh, questions, right? But yeah, I have, I have uh, a couple of my own, so. Um, I know, Leandro, I mean, you already mentioned it, but um, in your case, uh, did COVID, COVID affect your time series? And yes. by this, I, I'm, I'm meaning that, for example, you have to uh, somehow rerun or, or reanalyze all your models probably after the pandemic? Yes, uh, that's a very good question. Yes, we did have to do that because firstly, the models had like data from our, our history, uh, but now, uh, uh, as I was analyzing and rerunning re re models, because it deprecated a lot, I had to use a shorter period of time. So uh, on the company that I've I've been working with, Mercado Livre, it had, it had like an exponential growth on the last years. So I had to use less data, like 2021, 2020 and 2021 to recreate these models so that they could have like, better errors uh, and our since our, our goals there are a little bit aggressive so we needed to, to to be like a little bit more creative creative there so yes we, we had to rerun re because of covid and yeah and by removing i mean that data i mean because actually you 
started with a, a small threat because I mean, pandemic was only uh, two years ago. Uh, how uh, those models uh, went? I mean, they perform well, more or less. Yes. Uh, so before, when before pandemics, when you had everything, it was working fine. Like uh, we had like something around ten to fifteen percent of MAPE there. Uh, and then, uh, just so that everyone here, MAPE is the mean average percentage error. Uh, we use that there because it's easier to be for the business to understand. Uh, so we had like 15% and after pandemics, it got to like 30, 35% and that was very bad. And then after removing the data, we got to like 10 and 12% again. <laughs> Back to normal. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, and usually, do you work only with data from Brazil, or do you also combine it with other countries like Uruguay, Argentina? Uh, no, here we just work with data from Brazil. Brazil is very, very big on sales, and it's it, we, if we mix with Argentina, like they have other uh, they the the purchase there, the way the the people purchase things there is different. It's very different for us. And also in Chile, Uruguay. So Brazil is like uh, in another bubble. But I think that's with all countries. They all have uh, different aspects of purchase here. So uh, if we needed to do a model, it has to be data from Brazil, then data from Argentina for Argentina, data from Uruguay to Uruguay. Good. And that's it. Peter. Hello. Hi, Peter. Well, Hi. Uh, probably one more, one more question for for Leandro, and then we can go with with Peter. Um, for example, Leandro, which is the time series that uh, surprised you the most? I mean, for its behavior, or I don't know, whatever thing uh, you you can can think um, from the ones that you have like analyzed in your work. Okay. Uh... So one of my slides I had the category, I think B and E there, uh, these were like very volatile. We could never predict these guys, never, never, never. Uh, and then after I didn't, I had never used XGBoost for that before. And then I, tr I thought, let's try to use XGBoost, why not? It's a good model. Uh, there is some way to use it as a time series. So maybe we can predict these guys, which are volatile and hard to do. Uh, and then I've used a Jack Bush and it was a surprise because we, 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 we could never predict that. Not even with business knowledge, business doing it by hand, it was like the worst category ever. But now, but then we can predict that with Jack Bush. I think uh, that was the most impactful thing that we did. Good, good to know. Okay, Peter, um, for you, um, when we are going to be seeing this uh, pie script uh, fully live and ready for, for production? Oh, yeah. So I think we definitely, uh, uh, so good news, bad news, people are already taking the alpha release and trying to use it in things. And we're like, this is a preview, stop. Um, we did, one of the things we did in the last four months is we, we put in um, what our versioning strategy will be. So people can rely on, you know, certain versions of it, pin it, things like that. Um, I would say once we get the new runtime interface well-defined, so we can reliably and robustly swap in, you know, MicroPython versus CPython WASM versus Pyodide, I would say that would be a good time to start using it. I would feel better telling people that at that point you can use it in production a little bit more. Um, I do think loading time is an issue as long as we're using Pyodide. It's a, it's a fairly large thing that has to download. So... I would encourage people to start playing with it now and trying to do what you can, you know, break it in various ways, give us feedback, leave issues on GitHub. But um, but uh, once we, I think we have the MicroPython runtime, that'll be exciting because then people can use it in a variety of different kinds of contexts and I won't feel so bad about the loading time issues. Okay, thank you. Welcome, mm -hmm. Jason. Um, thank you. Let okay, me... so now that everyone's here, I'm going to direct uh, Mauricio that we have lots of questions. We have collected to on the right, there is banners, you should see them. And for example, I'm going to just put up one question that we have. Uh, so yeah, you can read it. Okay, uh, what are loading times and size bundles when using Python in browser? Does it load full size of all the packages using in the app? 
or is there some tool to prune and use it code similarly, similarly to have us JavaScript bundlers? Yeah, so right now there's not a tool to, it's, it's a mix, right? So it will load things in as you import them, but um, uh, you only need the packages that you need. So PyoDi, the distribution includes dozens and dozens of packages. If you use Inscript and Forge, you can actually get a different build with uh, many more packages and it only loads the ones that you want, but they can still be quite large. So the default runtime is gonna be in the tens of megabytes. Um, just for Python, the standard lib alone, I think it's in the 20 something megabytes. This is why I'm excited about MicroPython because it'll probably weigh in at one to two megabytes. Um, but that being said, one of the things that we're doing is we're trying to get you know, many different interested parties together to figure out the right way to do packaging, WebAssembly packaging for Python. So we can do these things like pruning, you know, bundling for distribution, uh, you know, deferring imports and deferring load during runtime. All that stuff will be coming, um, but that's not ready yet. But we're absolutely, we know that's a problem we have to solve very, very soon. Okay, good. I have another one for Jason. Um, are there any performance benefits for graph database in our backends, or are they only aimed towards analysts and data scientists? Yeah, uh, great question. So yes, so if you're going to use the graph database to do sort of normal data store, like you would a lot of other databases, a lot of transactions, you're not going to get a, a performance boost. But if you're going to do something interesting, uh, like real time, like you want to do like that pathfinding or link prediction, then graph databases are going to do that much faster than, than other databases. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's go one for, actually it's for, I think it's for Leandro for the kind of question. Um, when you break your data, your date, sorry, into day, week, month, year, do we need to index the week to be year week or for day to be year day and month to be year month? And it goes, or does it help with seasonality to not index it uh, with the year before? Wondering about time series needing to understand the sequence over the end of the year one into the beginning of the year two. Okay, uh, so can you just go back to one slash two? Sure. Just, yeah. Okay. Uh, no, we don't need to create an index of the YYY, WW, or DD, or MM, uh, because since we have that split into different columns, and we are going to, we are, we just do that on an XGBoost model, which doesn't comprehend the data, uh, it, we will already have the things there. So it has the year to know which year goes with which each each week or each year with each day, each, each year with each month. Uh, but something that I've got to understand uh, on, uh, on when I was doing the tests is using the year uh, most of the times didn't help me too much. It, does, it didn't improve too much because since it's a decision tree, it doesn't know 2023. So it will be like it will just use day and other variables uh, to do that. So that's uh, for the first part. Uh, can you go to the second part? Uh, wondering about... Uh... So I think that the, the first part pretty much uh, answers the second. Because since we have everything there, it will know when it's end of year two, beginning of end, end of year one, one, and beginning of year two, uh, and then it can help itself there. I think that's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me see one for Peter. Um, how do we allow for custom functions to be passed and read from clients and executed uh, using PyScript? without exposing it, exposing it for issues, uh, similar to worries about uh, SQL injection. Uh, you're, you're muted. Yeah, sorry about that. Yes, that's a great question. <laughs> um, we are designing it to take into account a couple of different things. So we do, first of all, whenever we talk about security with PyScript, the thing I want to remind everyone of is we run inside the WebAssembly sandbox, which is the same as the JavaScript sandbox that runs everyone's tabs, for everything, via Gmail, Amazon, Netflix, all of it. So from that perspective, it's quite secure within there. Now, the question, of course, asks deeper, if you're writing a PyScript app and you want to take client input and then run that, or take user input and run that, what do we do there? So one of the things that we're doing with PyScript is in addition to this API for spinning up um, different engines and backends, we're also, as part of that, we are adding this namespace capability. 
So essentially, it's almost like running sub interpreters and leveraging that. We're hoping that using that kind of infrastructure, it will allow people to run um, user input Python in a way that is uh, that is separate from the logic running the app itself. So that namespacing sort of approach is going to be what we're going to initially use to do that kind of isolation. Um, but um, but yeah, that's that's kind of how we're thinking about it now. Obviously, we got to you know we'll see as use cases come up, we'll figure out you know <laughs> deeper ways to what we have to protect and, and whatnot. Of course, that's a way to to people to use it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, question for Jason: um, How do we take the output of a graph database and join it? Uh, sorry, and join that with the existing client uh, BI, assuming something like NSQL database, then uh, that then reads into Power BI in a consumable. And the second part, in a consumable way that can be uh, used or report on within existing joints or even cubes. It feels like we uh, need a path or a uh, closer structure from the graph DB, but is uh, there a better way to do that? Uh, yes. So different uh, services, different products will have uh, different sort of uh, BI connectors. Uh, Neo4j does have a BI connector, so I would invite uh, anyone interested in using that, uh, using you know uh, some sort of BI tool to look at that connector to get the data, get the information from a graph database directly into the BI tool without having to do this sort of like um, sort of data wrangling. Okay. Thank you. And one more for uh, Leandro. How do you augment your data with events like Easter or other events that have a clear pattern? And second part, in other forecasting systems, I believe like Sarima, call them Xandrus variable. This sounds like it would be just an extra feature. Yes. Uh, for Profit, we have a, a parameter there which you can pass like uh, some important, important data, these events. Uh, so it's built in there. We just have to like pass. If I remember correctly, I don't. I don't. I don't quite remember. I think you need to pass a JSON with like data and then uh, the the category of the event, uh, or just the data list of data. I don't quite remember. But there is a parameter on Profit for that. Uh, uh, the thing is, be careful when you are placing event data to not use like every event because in your business. Uh, there will be different events that can or cannot uh, impact on your model. And for XBoost, it can be like uh, an extra feature. You can create like maybe uh, ordinal encoding ver a, a, a ordinal variable that will make it will be like uh, sorted by its impact. Let's suppose you have like 10 events and the event number 10 is like the over the years you analyze it that it's the most impactful for you, and then you can classify it by 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, up and to 1. And then uh, with that, you can augment your model. But that that's just one way to do. There there could be like any other, many many other ways, because actually Bush, Bush will let you do that. Yeah, thank you. OK, one more for uh, Peter. Um, what is the processing done on PyScript? Is it on the device and on single threader through JavaScript, or it does somehow pass that work off? I know you mentioned it for Gigabyte Sandbox, uh, but what about lower and mobile devices, which can read the website? Will it still try to use the four gigabytes, taking of data, data processing on the device, but the device only having four gigabytes in total on the device? Yeah, so the processing happens definitely in the browser tab itself. When I said four gigabytes, what I mean is that the CPU has four gigabytes of virtual memory address space, right? That does not mean that you can safely go and try to access and allocate all four of it and expect it to come back with a success every time. So this is also dependent then on the device that it's running on, um, how they want to handle things like that. It, it could just end the process saying we don't have memory or it could try doing some kind of paging thing. Who knows? Um, so this is not an area that we've explored a lot on low end mobile stuff. But that being said, I do think from what I've seen, um, if you are not using all of it and the device is capable of running WebAssembly, it will run it, right? And it will let you, it will give you the memory you need up till the point that it can't anymore. So the processing definitely happens locally on the machine. Now, the first part of the question, um, where does it run? Does it run inside the JavaScript process space? Right now, the way that we work, yes, we are sort of synchronously 
we're, we're synchronous kind of in the JavaScript um, runtime space. However, one of the things that we're doing, the runtime refactoring and putting runtimes into their own namespaces and through APIs is we are going to leverage taking, uh, we're, we're gonna take advantage of web workers. And that is what will allow us to have multiple different kinds of backends or different instances of a backend um, for safety purposes or whatever else and have explicit object passing between them. That's work that's kind of in process right now. But um, for right now, when you're doing stuff, it will uh, it will run it sort of inside that same um, single threaded process. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we have another one for Jason. Uh, Jason, can graph uh, database handle big data? Are there any querying uh, engine uh, solutions like Presto or Starbust to enable querying large data set directly from the cloud storage? Uh, yes. So graph databases can handle big data. Almost all the uh, different services that have products out there have either cluster options or other uh, ingenious ways of distributing uh, that, that process. And there are services that can stack on top that offer the ability to query uh, that, those large data, data sets, right? Because with the kind of the demonstrators that I showed, those are for much smaller uh, data sets. But there are uh, third party uh, applications and community um, uh, services that, that allow you to do these much larger queries. Uh, I just don't remember the name of any of them off the top. Right? Yeah, <laughs> it happens. <laughs> Um, well, I don't know if we, if we have uh, time for more one round of questions, Nick. It's okay? Okay. Um, let's go with Leandro again. Um, someone asked, why did you reset your index when creating uh, the train and test? Surely you want the original index to join back in and map against for uh, model fitness uh, testing. Yes. Uh that's just a bad manner of me <laughs> that I usually do when I'm uh, coding. I like to reset in index of the data frames. I know that it's not uh, very well. But the thing is, here we have a time series model, and it is time-based. So to remap and redoing everything, it's just joining uh, and then sorting values again, and they'll have the same index as before. Uh, there is not much of, of a problem there. Uh, for other models, there would be. Thank you. Uh, Peter, one more for you. Uh, can you load local files into the PyScript environment and then pass that back into chase, uh, GS uh, slash DOM uh, to use with data tables, for example? Yes, absolutely. You can reference local files um, to load in through a PyEnv uh, sort of tag in the, in the header. You can also, um, uh, we're also adding better ways to do IO um, into the, the, the PyScript library as a convenience utility function. Um, so definitely, and then anything you grab from the PyScript side, you can pass data back and forth to JavaScript pretty seamlessly. We have an example actually where we're orchestrating two JavaScript libraries. Uh, and actually we have another example where we wrap D3 and so we're passing data into D3 to render. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's all definitely doable. Thank you. And um, I have actually uh, a question of my own for, for Jason. Um, why do you think Garner thinks that it's going to have such a growth? I mean, the uh, graph database, when you show, show the, 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 the chart in your presentation. Oh, why it's becoming so popular? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's primarily popular, uh, at least my sense, among data scientists and people wanting to glean the sort of information that graph data science and other interesting ML uh, models can 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 provide from the graph data, right? Because I mean, neural nets look uh, are basically graphs, right? So graph data fits yeah. really well with that that workflow. Yeah, that's right. They are. <laughs> okay. Well, I think uh, that's it. Thank you all. Uh, I will let Nick to enter now and uh, give the final speech to to end the session. Oh, thank you. No, thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. Hello, hello. Hello, Hi, everyone.
One second. Thank you, guys. Thank you for this day. Thank you to join us. Mm. Yes. And uh, I don't know. Mm. Yeah, I'm Julia. We met in the morning. I am community manager of Pagico Summit. And I'm here to say to you many thanks to say um, that uh, we are really appreciate that you, that you join us. To say many thanks our uh, team, our speakers, our, commun uh, our community, our program committee, our partners, our sponsors, moderators, and other people who join us today. Uh, also, um, I hope you are still alive because it's, it was really hard day. It was uh, 12 hours of our content and uh, I hope you enjoy our, uh, our little adventure <laughs> in this Python world. And um, uh, what I want to say that we will send you feedback forms. So please check your mail and uh, fill out this form because we have to know that we do something useful for you, for somebody. <laughs> and uh, also, I am waiting for you tomorrow. Tomorrow we are going to provide our senior track. So if you have tickets, join us we are waiting for incredible for amazing speakers and uh, it's gonna be something interesting for seniors so see you there and uh, now i have to i don't know send you this mails so please check it and see you i'm going to sleep and wish you a good night good evening good morning and uh, good days <laughs> see you guys bye